Chapter 9 All things are governed in the bosom of this triad. Lettuce, Demensibus, 20. Thrice let the heaven be turned on its perpetual axis. Ovid, Fasti, 4. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven oxen, and seven rams. Numbers 23, 1, 2. In seven days all creatures who have offended me shall be destroyed by a deluge. But thou shalt be secured in a vessel miraculously formed. Take therefore, and with seven holy men, your respective wives, and pairs of all animals, enter the ark without fear. Then shalt thou know God face to face, and all thy questions shall be answered. Bhagavad Gita And the Lord said, I will destroy man from the face of the earth, but with thee I will establish my covenant. Come thou and all thy house into the ark for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth. Genesis 6, 7 the Tetractis was not only principally honored because all symphonies are found to exist within it, but also because it appears to contain the nature of all things. Theos of Smyrna, Matham, P147 Our task will have been ill-performed if the preceding chapters have not demonstrated that Judaism, earlier and later Gnosticism, Christianity, and even Christian Masonry have all been erected upon identical cosmic myths, symbols, and allegories, whose full comprehension is possible only to those who have inherited the key from their inventors. In the following pages, we will endeavor to show how much these have been misinterpreted by the widely different yet intimately related systems enumerated above, and fitting them to their individual needs. Thus, not only will a benefit be conferred upon the student, but a long-deferred and now a much-needed act of justice will be done to those earlier generations whose genius has laid the whole human race under obligation. Let us begin by once more comparing the myths of the Bible with those of the sacred books of other nations, to see which is the original, which copies. There are but two methods which, correctly explained, can help us to this result. They are the Vedas, Brahmanical literature, and the Jewish Kabbalah. The former has, in most philosophical spirit, conceived these grandiose myths. The latter, borrowing them from the Chaldeans and Persians, shaped them into a history of the Jewish nation, in which their spirit of philosophy was buried beyond the recognition of all but the elect, and under a far more absurd form than the Arian had given them. The Bible of the Christian Church is the latest receptacle of this scheme of disfigured allegories which have been erected into an edifice of superstition such as never entered into the conceptions of those from whom the church obtained her knowledge. The abstract fictions of antiquity, which for ages have filled the popular fancy but with flickering shadows and uncertain images, have in Christianity assumed the shapes of real personages and become accomplished facts. Allegory metamorphosed becomes sacred history, and pagan myth is taught to the people as a revealed narrative of God's intercourse with his chosen people. The myths, says Horace in his Ars Poetica, have been invented by wise men to strengthen the laws and teach moral truths. While Horace endeavored to make clear the very spirit and essence of the ancient myths, Euhemerus pretended, on the contrary, that myths were the legendary history of kings and heroes, transformed into gods by the admiration of the nations. It is the latter method which was inferentially followed by Christians, when they agreed upon the acceptation of Euhemerized patriarchs and mistook them for men who had really lived. But in opposition to this pernicious theory, which has brought forth such bitter fruit, we have a long series of the greatest philosophers the world has produced. Plato, Epicharmus, Socrates, Empedocles, Plotinus, and Porphyry, Proclus, Damascus, Origen, and even Aristotle, the latter plainly stating this verity by saying that a tradition of the highest antiquity, transmitted to posterity under the form of various myths, teaches us that the first principles of nature may be considered as gods. 
For the divine permeates all nature. All the rest, details and personages, were added later for the clearer comprehension of the vulgar. And but too often with the object of supporting laws invented in the common interest. Fairy tales do not exclusively belong to nurseries. All mankind, except those few who in all ages have comprehended their hidden meaning and tried to open the eyes of the superstitious, have listened to such tales in one shape or the other, and after transforming them into sacred symbols called the product religion. We will try to systematize our subject, as much of the ever-occurring necessity to draw parallels between the conflicting opinions that have been based on the same myths will permit. We will begin by the book of Genesis and seek for its hidden meaning in the Brahmanical traditions and the Chaldeo-Judaic Kabbalah. The first scripture lesson taught us in our infancy is that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Hence, a peculiar solemnity is supposed to attach to the seventh day. And the Christians, adopting the rigid observances of the Jewish Sabbath, have enforced it upon us with the superstition of the first, instead of the seventh day of the week. All systems of religious mysticism are based on numerals, with Pythagoras, the monas, or unity, emanating the duad and thus forming the trinity, and the quaternary of Arba'il, the mystic four, composed the number seven. The sacredness of numbers begins with the great first, the one and ends with the knot or zero, symbol of the infinite and boundless circle which represents the universe. All the intervening figures in whatever combination, or however multiplied, represent philosophical ideas, from vague outlines down to a definitely established scientific axiom, relating either to a moral or a physical fact of nature. They are a key to the ancient views on cosmogony, in its broad sense, including man and beings, and the evolution of the human race, spiritually as well as physically. The number seven is the most sacred of all and is undoubtedly of Hindu origin. Everything of importance was calculated by and fitted into this number by the Aryan philosophers, ideas as well as localities. Thus, they have the Sapta Rishi, or seven sages, typifying the seven Diluvian primitive races, post Diluvian, as some say. Sapta Loka, the seven inferior and superior worlds, hence each of these rishis proceeded, and whither he returned in glory before reaching the final bliss of Moksha. Sapta Kula, or seven castes, the Brahmins assuming to represent the direct descendants of the highest of them. Then again the Sapta Pura, seven holy cities. Sapta Dwipa, seven holy islands. Sapta Samudra, the seven holy seas. Sapta Pavarta, the seven holy mountains. Sapta Arania, the seven deserts. Sapta Vruksha, the seven sacred trees, and so on. In the Chaldeo Babylonian incantation, this number reappears again as prominently as among the Hindus. The number is dual in its attributes, i.e., holy in one of its aspects, it becomes nefast under other conditions. Thus, the following incantation we find traced in the Assyrian tablets, now so correctly interpreted. The evening of evil omen, the region of the sky which produces misfortune. Message of pest, deprecators of Ninki Gal, the seven gods of the vast sky, the seven gods of the vast earth, the seven gods of blazing spheres, the seven gods of celestial legion, the seven gods maleficent. The seven phantoms, bad. The seven phantoms of maleficent flames. Bad demon, bad alal, bad gigim. Bad demon, bad alal, bad gijim, bad talal. Bad god, bad maskin. Spirit of seven heavens, remember. Spirit of seven earths, remember, etc. This number reappears likewise on almost every page of Genesis and throughout the Mosaic books. And we find it conspicuous, see following chapter, in the book of Job and the Oriental Kabbalah. If the Hebrew Semitics adopted it so readily, we must infer that it was not blindly, but with a thorough knowledge of its secret meaning. Hence, that they must have adopted the doctrines of their heathen neighbors as well. It is but natural, therefore, that we should seek in heathen philosophy for the interpretation of this number. 
which again reappeared in Christianity with its seven sacraments, seven churches in Asia Minor, seven capital sins, seven virtues, four cardinal and three theological, etc. Have the seven prismatic colors of the rainbow seen by Noah no other meaning than that of the covenant between God and man to refresh the memory of the former? To the Kabbalist, at least, they have a significance inseparable from the seven labors of magic the seven upper spheres, the seven notes of the musical scale, the seven numerals of Pythagoras, the seven wonders of the world, the seven ages, and even the seven steps of the Masons, which lead to the Holy of Holies after passing the flights of three and five. Whence the identity, then, of these enigmatical, ever-recurring numerals that are found in every page of the Jewish scriptures, as in every ola and sloka of the Buddhistic and Brahmanical books? whence these numerals that are the soul of the Pythagorean and Platonic thought, and that no unilluminated Orientalist nor biblical student has ever been able to fathom. And yet they have a key ready in their hand, did they but know how to use it. Nowhere is the mystical value of human language and its effects on human action so perfectly understood as in India, nor any better explained than by the authors of the oldest Brahmanas ancient as their epic is now found to be. They only try to express in a more concrete form the abstract metaphysical speculations of their own ancestors. Such is the respect of the Brahmins for the sacrificial mysteries, that they hold that the world itself sprang into creation as a consequence of a sacrificial word, pronounced by the first cause. This word is the ineffable name of the Kabbalists, fully discussed in the last chapter. The secret of the Vedas, sacred knowledge, though they may be, is impenetrable without the help of the Brahmanas. Properly speaking, the Vedas, which are written in verse and compromised in four books, constitute that portion called the mantra, or magical prayer, and the Brahmanas, which are in prose, contain their key. While the mantra part is alone holy, the Brahmana portion contains all the theological exegesis and the speculations and explanations of the sacerdotal. Our Orientalists, we repeat, will make no substantial progress toward a comprehension of Vedic literature until they place a proper valuation upon the works now despised by them. For instance, the Atareya and Kashataki Brahmanas, which belong to the Rig Veda. Zoroaster was called a Mantran, or Speaker of Mantras and according to Haug, one of the earliest names for the sacred scriptures of the Parsis was Mantra Spenta, the power and significance of the Brahmin who acts as the Hotri priest at the Soma sacrifice, consists in his possession and full knowledge of the uses of the sacred word or speech, Bach. The latter is personified in Sarasvati, the wife of Brahma, who is the goddess of the sacred or secret knowledge. She is usually depicted as riding upon a peacock with its tail all spread. The eyes upon the feathers of the bird's tail symbolize the sleepless eyes that see all things. To one who has the ambition of becoming an adept of the secret doctrines, they are a reminder that he must have the hundred eyes of Argus to see and comprehend all things. And this is why we say that it is not impossible to solve fully the deep problems underlying the Brahmanical and Buddhistic sacred books without having a perfect comprehension of the esoteric meaning of the Pythagorean numerals. The greatest power of this vak, or sacred speech, is developed according to the form which is given to the mantra by the officiating hotri. And this form consists wholly in the numbers and syllables of the sacred meter. If pronounced slowly and in a certain rhythm, one effect is produced. If quickly and with another rhythm, there is a different result. Each meter, says Haug, is the invisible master of something visible in this world. It is, as it were, its exponent and ideal. This great significance of the metrical speech is derived from the number of syllables of which it consists. For each thing has, just as in the Pythagorean system, a certain numerical proportion. All these things, meters, chandas, stomas, and pristas, are liable to be as eternal and divine as the words themselves they contain. The earliest Hindu divines did not only believe in a primitive revelation of the words of the sacred texts, 
but even in that of the various forms. These forms, along with their contents, the everlasting Veda words, are symbols expressive of things of the invisible world, and in several respects comparable to the Platonic ideas. This testimony from an unwilling witness shows again the identity between the ancient religions as to their secret doctrine. The Gayatri meter, for example, consists of thrice eight syllables and is considered the most sacred of meters. It is the meter of Agni, the fire god, and becomes at times the emblem of Brahma himself, the chief creator and fashioner of man in his own image. Now, Pythagoras says that the number eight, or the octad, is the first cube, that is to say, squared in all senses, as a die, proceeding from its base to or even number, so is man for square or perfect. Of course, few except the Pythagoreans and Kabbalists can fully comprehend this idea, but the illustration will assist in pointing out the close kinship of the numerals with the Vedic mantras. The chief problems of every theology lie concealed beneath this imagery of fire and the varying rhythm of its flames. The burning bush of the Bible, the Zoroastrian and other sacred fires, Plato's universal soul, and the Rosicrucian doctrines of both soul and body of man being evolved out of the fire. The reasoning and immortal element which permeates all things, and which according to Heraclitus, Hippocrates, and Parmenides is God, have all the same meaning. Each meter in the Brahmanas corresponds to a number, and is shown by Haug, as it stands in the sacred volumes, is a prototype of some visible form on earth, and its effects are either good or evil. The sacred speech can save, but it can kill as well. Its many meetings and faculties are well known but to the Dikshita, the adept, who has been initiated into many mysteries and whose spiritual birth is completely achieved. The Vak of the mantra is a spoken power, which awakes another corresponding and still more occult power, each allegorically personified by some god in the world of spirits, and according as it is used, responded to either by the gods or the Rakshasas, bad spirits. In the Brahmanical and Buddhist ideas, a curse, a blessing, a vow, a desire, an idle thought can each assume a visible shape and so manifest itself objectively to the eyes of its author, or to him that it concerns. Every sin becomes incarnated, so to say, and like an avenging fiend persecutes its perpetrator. There are words which have a destructive quality in their very syllables as though objective things, for every sound awakens a corresponding one in the invisible world of spirit, and the repercussion produces either a good or bad effect. Harmonious rhythm, a melody vibrating softly in the atmosphere, creates a beneficent and sweet influence around and acts most powerfully on the psychological as well as physical natures of every living thing on earth. It reacts even on inanimate objects, for matter is still spirit in its essence, invisible as it may seem to our grosser senses. So with the numerals, turn wherever we will, from the prophets to the apocalypse, and we will see the biblical writers constantly using the numbers 3, 4, 7, and 12. And yet we have known some partisans of the Bible who maintained that the Vedas were copied from the Mosaic books. The Vedas, which are written in Sanskrit, a language whose grammatical rules and forms, as Max Muller and other scholars confess, were completely established long before the days when the great wave of emigration bore it from Asia all over the Occident, are there to proclaim their parentage of every philosophy, and every religious institution developed later among Semitic peoples, and which of the numerals most frequently occur in the Sanskrit chants whose sublime hymns to creation, to the unity of God and the countless manifestations of his power. 1, 3, and 7. Read the hymn by Dragatamas, to him who represents all the gods. The god here present, our blessed patron, our sacrificer, has a brother who spreads himself in midair. There exists a third brother whom we sprinkle with our libations. It is he whom I have seen master of men and armed with seven rays. And again, seven bridles aid in guiding a car which has but one wheel, and which is drawn by a single horse that shines with seven rays. 
The wheel has three limbs, an immortal wheel, never wearying, whence hang all the worlds. Sometimes seven horses drag a car of seven wheels, and seven personages mount it, accompanied by seven fecund nymphs of the water. And the following again, in honor of the fire god Agni, who is so clearly shown but a spirit subordinate to the one god. Every one, although having three forms of double nature, androgynous, he rises, and the priests offer to God, in the act of sacrifice, their prayers which reach the heavens, borne aloft by Agni. Is this a coincidence, or rather, as reason tells us, the result of the derivation of many national cults from one primitive universal religion? A mystery for the uninitiated, the unveiling of the most sublime, because correct and true, psychological and physiological problems for the initiate? Revelations of the personal spirit of man, which is divine, because that spirit is not only the emanation of one supreme God, but is the only God man is able, in his weakness and helplessness, to comprehend, to feel within himself? This truth the Vedic poet clearly confesses when saying, The Lord Master of the universe and full of wisdom has entered with me, into me, weak and ignorant, and has formed me of himself in that place where the spirits obtain, by the help of science, the peaceful enjoyment of the fruit, as sweet as ambrosia. Whether we call this fruit an apple from the tree of knowledge, or the papala of the Hindu poet, it matters not. It is the fruit of esoteric wisdom. Our object is to show the existence of a religious system in India for many thousands of years before the exoteric fables of the Garden of Eden and the deluge had been invented. Hence the identity of doctrines. Instructed in them, each of the initiates of other countries became, in his turn, the founder of some great school of philosophy in the West. Who of our Sanskrit scholars has ever felt interested in discovering the real sense of the following hymns? Palpable as it is, Papala, the sweet fruit of that tree upon which come spirits who love the science, and where the gods produce all marvels. This is a mystery for him who knows not the father of the world. Or this one again. These stanzas bear at the head a title which announces that they are consecrated to the Visvadevas, that is to say, to all the gods. He who knows not the being whom I sing in all his manifestations will comprehend nothing of my verses. Those who do know him are not strangers to this reunion. This refers to the reunion and parting of the immortal and mortal parts of man. The immortal being, says the preceding stanza, is in the cradle of the mortal being. The two eternal spirits go and come everywhere. Only some men know the one without knowing the other. The Gatmas. Who can give a correct idea of him, of whom the Rig Veda says? That which is one, the wise call it in diverse manners. That one is sung by the Vedic poets in all its manifestations in nature, and the books considered childish and foolish teach how at will to call the beings of wisdom for our instruction. They teach, as Porphyry says, a liberation from all terrene concerns, a flight of the alone to the alone. Professor Max Muller, whose every word is accepted by his school as philological gospel, is undoubtedly right in one sense when in determining the nature of the Hindu gods. He calls them masks without an actor, names without being, not beings without names. For he but proves thereby the monotheism of the ancient Vedic religion. But it seems to us more than dubious whether he or any scientist of his school needed to hope to fathom the old Aryan thought without an accurate study of those very masks. To the materialist, as to the scientist, who for various reasons endeavors to work out the difficult problem of compelling facts to agree with either their own hobbies or those of the Bible, they may seem but the empty shells of phantoms. Yet such authorities will ever be, as in the past, the unsafest of guides, except in matters of exact science. The Bible patriarchs are as much masks without actors, as the Prajapatis. And yet, if the living personage behind those masks is but an abstract shadow, there is an idea embodied in every one of them which belongs to the philosophical and scientific theories of ancient wisdom. 
And who can render better the service in this work than the native Brahmins themselves or the Kabbalists? To deny point blank any sound philosophy in the later Brahmanical speculations upon the Rig Veda is equivalent to refusing to ever correctly understand the mother religion itself, which gave rise to them and which is the expression of the inner thought of the direct ancestors of these later authors of the Brahmanas. If learned Europeans can so readily show that all the Vedic gods are but empty masks, they must also be ready to demonstrate that the Brahmanical authors were as incapable as themselves to discover these actors anywhere. This done, not only the three other sacred books, which Max Muller says, do not deserve the name of Vedas, but the Rig Veda itself becomes a meaningless jumble of words. For what the world-renowned and subtile intellect of the ancient Hindu sages failed to understand, no modern scientist, however learned, can hope to fathom. Poor Thomas Taylor was right in saying that philology is not philosophy. It is, to say the least, illogical to admit that there is a hidden thought in the literary work of a race perhaps ethnologically different from our own. And then, because it is utterly unintelligible to us whose spiritual development during the several thousand intervening years has bifurcated into quite a contrary direction, deny that it has any sense in it at all. But this is precisely what, with all due respect for erudition, Professor Max Muller and his school do in this instance, at least. First of all, we are told, albeit cautiously and with some effort, yet we may still walk in the footsteps of these authors of the Vedas. We shall feel that we are brought face to face and mind to mind with men yet intelligible to us after we have freed ourselves from our modern conceits. We shall not succeed always. Words, verses, nay, whole hymns in the Rig Veda will and must remain to us a dead letter. For, with a few exceptions, the whole world of the Vedic ideas is so entirely beyond our own intellectual horizon that instead of translating, we can as yet only guess and combine. And yet, to leave us in no possible doubt as to the true value of his words, the learned scholar in another passage expresses his opinion on these same Vedas, with one exception. Thus, the only important, the only real Veda is the Rig Veda. The other so-called Vedas deserve the name of Veda no more than the Talmud deserves the name of a Bible. Professor Muller rejects them as unworthy of the attention of anyone, and as we understand it, on the ground that they contain chiefly sacrificial formulas, charms, and incantations. And now a very natural question. Are any of our scholars prepared to demonstrate that, so far, they are intimately acquainted with the hidden sense of these perfectly absurd sacrificial formulas, charms, and incantations, and magic nonsense of Artharva Veda? We believe not, and our doubt is based on the confession of Professor Muller himself, just quoted, if the whole world of the Vedic ideas, the Rig Veda, cannot be included alone in this world, we suppose is so entirely beyond our own, the scientists, intellectual horizon that, instead of translating, we can as yet only guess and combine. And the Yagurveda, Samaveda, and Artharvaveda are childish and foolish, and the Brahmanas, the Sutras Yaska and Sayana, though nearest in time to the hymns of the Rig Veda, indulge in the most frivolous and ill-judged interpretations. How can either himself or any other scholar form any adequate opinion of either of them? If again the authors of the Brahmanas, the nearest in time to the Vedic hymns, were already incompetent to offer anything better than ill-judged interpretations, then at what period of history, where and by whom, were written these grandiose poems, whose mystical sense has died with their generation? Are we then so wrong in affirming that if sacred texts are found in Egypt to have become, even to the priestly scribes of 4,000 years ago, wholly unintelligible? And the Brahmanas offer but childish and foolish interpretations of the Rig Veda. At least as far back as that, then, first, both the Egyptian and Hindu religious philosophies are of an untold antiquity. Far antedating ages cautiously assigned them by our students of comparative mythology. 
and second, the claims of ancient priests of Egypt and modern Brahmins as to their age are, after all, correct. We can never admit that the three other Vedas are less worthy of their name than the Rig hymns, or that the Talmud and the Kabbalah are so inferior to the Bible. The very name of the Vedas, the literal meaning which is knowledge or wisdom, shows them to belong to the literature of these men who, in every country, language, and age, have been spoken of as those who know. In Sanskrit, the third person singular is Veda, he knows. And the plural is Vida, they know. This word is synonymous with the Greek, which Plato uses when speaking of the wise, the magicians, and with the Hebrew, Hakamin, wise men. Reject the Talmud and its old predecessor, the Kabbalah, and it will be simply impossible ever to render correctly one word of that Bible so much extolled at their expense. But then it is, perhaps, just what its partisans are working for. To banish the Brahmanas is to fling away the key that unlocks the door of the Rig Veda. The literal interpretation of the Bible has already borne its fruits. With the Vedas and the Sanskrit sacred books in general, it will be just the same. With this difference, that the absurd interpretation of the Bible has received a time-honored right of eminent domain in the department of the ridiculous and will find its supporters against light and against proof. As to the heathen literature, after a few more years of unsuccessful attempts at interpretation, its religious meaning will be regulated to the limbo of exploded superstitions, and people will hear no more of it. We beg to be clearly understood before we are blamed and criticized for the above remarks. The vast learning of the celebrated Oxford professor can hardly be questioned by his very enemies. Yet we have a right to regret his precipitancy to condemn that which he himself confesses, entirely beyond our own intellectual horizon. Even in what he considers a ridiculous blunder on the part of the author of the Brahmanas, other more spiritually disposed persons may see quite the reverse. Who is the greatest of the gods? Who shall first be praised by our songs? Says an ancient Rishi of the Rig Veda, mistaking, as Professor M imagines, the interrogative pronoun who for some divine name. Says the professor, a place is allotted in the sacrificial invocations to a god who, and hymns addressed to him are called whoish hymns. And is a god who less natural as a term than a god I am or whoish? Hymns less reverential than I amish, psalms? And who can prove that this is really a blunder, and not a premeditated expression? Is it so impossible to believe that the strange term was precisely due to a reverential awe which made the poet hesitate before giving a name, as form to that which is justly considered as the highest abstraction of metaphysical ideals, God? Or that same feeling made the commentator who came after him to pause and so leave the work of anthropomorphizing the unknown, the who, to future human conception. These early poets thought more for themselves than for others, remarks Max Muller himself. They sought rather in their language to be true to their own thought than to please the imagination of their hearers. Unfortunately, it is this very thought which awakes no responsive echo in the minds of our philologists. Farther, we read the sound device to students of the Rig Vedic hymns to collect, collate, sift, and reject. Let him study the commentaries, the sutras, the brahmanas, and even the later works in order to exhaust all the sources from which information can be derived. He, the scholar, must not despise the traditions of the brahmins, even where their misconceptions are palpable. Not a corner in the Brahmanas, the Sutras, Yaska, and Sayana should be left unexplored before we propose a rendering of our own. When the scholar has done his work, the poet and philosopher must take it up and finish it. Poor chance for a philosopher to step into the shoes of a learned philologist and presume to correct his errors. We would like to see what sort of a reception the most learned Hindu scholar in India would have from educated people of Europe and America, if he should undertake to correct a savant after he had sifted, accepted, rejected, explained, and declared what was good and what absurd and childish in the sacred books of his forefathers? 
That which would finally be declared Brahmanic misconceptions by the conclave of European and especially German savants would be as little likely to be reconsidered at the appeal of the most erudite pundit of Benares or Ceylon as the interpretation of Jewish scripture by Mammonides and philo Judaeus by Christians after the councils of the church had accepted the mistranslations and explanations of Arrhenius and Eusebius. What pundit or native philosopher of India should know his ancestral language, religion, or philosophy as well as an Englishman or a German? And why should a Hindu be more suffered to expound Brahmanism than a rabbinical scholar to interpret Judaism or the Isaiah prophecies? Safer and far more trustworthy translators can be had near or home. Nevertheless, let us still hope that we may find at last, even though it be in the dim future, a European philosopher to sift the sacred books of the wisdom religion and not be contradicted by every other of his class. Meanwhile, unmindful of any alleged authorities, let us try to sift for ourselves a few of these myths of old. We will search for an explanation within the popular interpretation and feel our way with the help of the magic lamp of Trismegistus, the mysterious number seven. There must have been some reason why this figure was universally accepted as a mystic calculation. With every ancient people, the creator or demiurge was placed over the seventh heaven. And were I to touch upon the initiation into our sacred mysteries, says Emperor Julian the Kabbalist, which the Chaldean backized respecting the seven-rayed God lifting up the souls through him, I should say things unknown and very unknown to the rabble, but well known to the blessed theurgists. In Lydus, it is said that the Chaldeans called the god Io, and Sabbath he is often called, as he who is over the seven orbits, heavens or spheres. That is the Demiurge. One must consult the Pythagoreans and Kabbalists to learn the potentiality of this number. Exoterically, the seven rays of the solar spectrum are represented concretely in the seven-rayed god Heptactes. These seven rays, epitomized into three primary rays, namely the red, blue, and yellow, form the solar trinity, and typify respectively spirit matter and spirit essence. Science has also reduced of late the seven rays to three primary ones, thus corroborating the scientific conception of the ancients of at least one of the visible manifestations of the invisible deity, and the seven divided into a quaternary and a trinity. The Pythagoreans called the number seven the vehicle of life, as it contained body and soul. They explained it by saying that the human body consisted of four principal elements, and that the soul is triple, comprising reason, passion, and desire. The ineffable word was considered the seventh and highest of all. For there are six minor substitutes, each belonging to a degree of initiation. The Jews borrowed their Sabbath from the ancients, who called it Saturn's Day, and deemed it unlucky and not the latter from the Israelites when Christianized. The people of India, Arabia, Syria, and Egypt observed weeks of seven days, and the Romans learned the hebdomadal method from these foreign countries when they became subject to the empire. Still, it was not until the 4th century that the Roman kalends, nones, and ides were abandoned, and weeks substituted in their place, and the astronomical names of the days, such as Dies Solus, day of the sun, dies Luna, day of the moon, dies Martis, day of Mars, dies Mercury, day of Mercury, dies Jovis, day of Jupiter, dies Venaris, day of Venus, and dies Saturni, day of Saturn. Prove that it was not from the Jews that the week of seven days was adopted. Before we examine this number Kabbalistically, we propose to analyze it from the standpoint of the Judaico-Christian Sabbath. When Moses instituted the Yom Shabbat, or Shabang, Shabbath, the allegory of the Lord God resting from his work of creation on the seventh day was but a cloak, or, as the Sohar expresses it, a screen to hide the true meaning. The Jews reckoned then, as they do now, their days by number, as day the first, day the second, and so on, Yom Ahad, Yom Shenai, Yom Shilisho, Yom Rabis, Yom Shamishi, Yom Sheshashi, Yom Shaba. The Hebrew seven, consisting of three letters, S-B-O, has more than one meaning. 
First of all, it means age or cycle. Shabang, Shabbath, can be translated old age as well as rest, as in the old Coptic. Sabi means wisdom, learning. Modern archaeologists have found that, as in Hebrew, Sab also means gray-headed, and that, therefore, the Sabbath day was the day on which the gray-headed men, or aged fathers of a tribe, were in the habit of assembling for councils or sacrifices. Thus, the week of six days and the seventh, the Sabbath, or Sapta, day period, is the highest antiquity. The observance of the lunar festivals in India shows that the nation held hebdomadal meetings as well. With every new quarter, the moon brings changes in the atmosphere. Hence, certain changes are also produced throughout the whole of our universe, of which the meteorological ones are the most insignificant. On this day of the seventh and most powerful of the prismatic days, the adepts of the secret science meet as they met thousands of years ago to become the agents of occult powers of nature, emanations of the working God, and commune with the invisible worlds. It is in this observance of the seventh day by the old sages, not as the resting day of the deity, but because they had penetrated into its occult power, that lies the profound veneration of all the heathen philosophers for the number seven, which they term the venerable, the sacred number. The Pythagorean Tetractis, revered by the Platonists, was the square placed below the triangle, the latter or the trinity embodying the invisible monad, the unity, and deemed too sacred to be pronounced except within the walls of a sanctuary. The aesthetic observance of the Christian Sabbath by Protestants is pure religious tyranny, and does more harm we fear than good. It really dates only from the enactment in 1678 of the 29th of Charles II, which prohibited any tradesman, artificer, workman, laborer, or other person to do or exercise any worldly labor, etc., etc., upon the Lord's Day. The Puritans carried this thing to extremes, apparently to mark their hatred of Catholicism, both Roman and Episcopal. That it was no part of the plan of Jesus that such a day should be set apart is evident not only from his words, but acts. It was not observed by the early Christians. When Trypho the Jew reproached the Christians for not having a Sabbath, what does the martyr answer them? The new law will have you keep a perpetual Sabbath. You, when you have passed a day in idleness, think you are religious. The Lord is not pleased with such things as these. If any be guilty of perjury or fraud, let him reform. If he be an adulterer, let him repent. And he will then have kept the kind of Sabbath truly pleasing to God. The elements are never idle and keep no Sabbath. There was no need of the observance of Sabbaths before Moses, neither now is there any need of them after Jesus Christ. The heptactis is not the supreme cause, but simply an emanation from him, the first visible manifestation of the unrevealed power, his divine breath, which violently breaking forth condensed itself, shining with radiance until it evolved into light, and so became cognizant to external sense, says John Ruchelin. This is the emanation of the highest, the demiurge, a multiplicity in a unity, the Elohim, whom we see creating our world, or rather fashioning it in six days and resting on the seventh. And who are these Elohim but the euhemerized powers of nature, the faithful manifested servants, the laws of him who is immutable law and harmony itself? They remain over the seventh heaven, or spiritual world, for it is they who, according to the Kabbalists, formed in succession the six material worlds, or rather, attempts at worlds that preceded our own, which they say is the seventh. If, in laying aside the metaphysical spiritual conception, we give our attention but to the religio-scientific problem of creation in six days, over which our best biblical scholars have vainly pondered so long, we might perchance be on the way to the true idea underlying the allegory. The ancients were philosophers consistent in all things. Hence, they taught that each of these departed worlds, having performed its physical evolution and reached through birth, growth, maturity, old age, and death, the end of its cycle, had returned to its primitive subjective form of a spiritual earth. Thereafter, it had to serve through all eternity, as the dwelling of those who had lived on it as men, and even animals, but were now spirits. 
this idea, were it even as incapable of exact demonstration as that of our theologians relating to paradise, is at least a trifle more philosophical. As well as man and every other living thing upon it, our planet has had its spiritual and physical evolution, from an impalpable idea of thought under the creative will of him, of whom we know nothing, but dimly conceive in imagination, this globe became fluidic and semi-spiritual, then condensed itself more and more until its physical development, matter, the tempting demon, compelled it to try its own creative faculty. Matter defied spirit, and the earth, too, had its fall. The allegorical curse under which it labors is that it only procreates, it does not create. Our physical planet is but the handmaiden, or rather the maiden of all work, of the spirit, its master. Cursed be the ground, thorns and thistles shall it bring. The Elohim are made to say, In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. The Elohim say this both to the ground and the woman. And this curse will last until the minutest particle of matter on earth shall have outlived its days, until every grain of dust has, by gradual transformation through evolution, become a constituent part of a living soul, and until the latter shall rescind the cyclic arc and finally stand, its own metatron, or redeeming spirit, at the foot of the upper step of the spiritual worlds, as at the first hour of its emanation. Beyond that lies the great deep, a mystery. It must be remembered that every cosmogony has a trinity of workers at its head, father, spirit, mother, nature, or matter, and the manifested universe, the sun or result of the two. The universe also, as well as each planet which it comprehends, passes through four ages, like man himself. All have their infancy, youth, maturity, and old age, and these four added to the other three make the sacred seven again. The introductory chapters of Genesis were never meant to present even a remote allegory of the creation of our earth. They embrace, chapter 1, a metaphysical conception of some indefinite period in the eternity, when successive attempts were being made by the law of evolution at the formation of the universes. This idea is plainly stated in the Sohar. There were old worlds which perished as soon as they came into existence, were formless, and were called sparks. Thus, the smith, when hammering the iron, lets the sparks fly in all directions. The sparks are the primordial worlds which could not continue, because the sacred-aged Sephira had not as yet assumed its form. Of androgyne or opposite sexes, of king and queen, Sephira and Cadmon, and the master was not yet at his work. The six periods or days of Genesis refer to the same metaphysical belief. Five such ineffectual attempts were made by the Elohim, but the sixth resulted in worlds like our own, i.e. all the planets and most of the stars are worlds, and inhabited, though not like our earth. Having formed this world at last in the sixth period, the Elohim rested in the seventh. Thus the Holy One, when he created the present world, said, This pleases me, the previous ones did not please me. And the Elohim saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Genesis 1. The reader will remember that in chapter 4, an explanation was given of the day and night of Brahma. The former represents a certain period of cosmic activity, the latter an equal one of cosmical repose. In the one, worlds are being evolved and passing through their allotted four ages of existence. In the latter, the inbreathing of Brahma reverses the tendency of the natural forces. Everything visible becomes gradually dispersed. Chaos comes, and a long night of repose reinvigorates the cosmos for its next term of evolution. In the morning of one of these days, the formative processes are gradually reaching their climax of activity. In the evening, imperceptibly diminishing the same until the pralaya arrives, and with it night, one such morning and evening do, in fact, constitute a cosmic day. And it was a day of Brahma that the Kabbalistic author of Genesis had in mind each time when he said, And the evening and the morning were the first, or fifth, or sixth, or any other day. Six days of gradual evolution, one of repose, and then evening. Since the first appearance of man on our earth, there has been an eternal Sabbath, or rest, for the Demiurge. 
The cosmogonical speculations of the first six chapters of Genesis are shown in the races of sons of God, giants, etc., of chapter 6. Properly speaking, the story of the formation of our earth, or creation, as it is very improperly called, begins with the rescue of Noah from the deluge. The Chaldeo-Babylonian tablets recently translated by George Smith leave no doubt of that in the minds of those who read the inscriptions esoterically. Ishtar, the great goddess, speaks in column 3, of the destruction of the sixth world and the appearance of the seventh. Thus, six days and nights, the wind, deluge, and storm overwhelmed. On the seventh day, in its course was calmed the storm and all the deluge, which had destroyed like an earthquake quieted the sea he caused to dry, and the wind and deluge ended. I perceived the shore at the boundary of the sea. To the country of Nizir went the ship, Arga, or the moon. The mountain of Nizir stopped the ship, the first day and the second day, the mountain of Nizir the same, the fifth and the sixth, the mountain of Nizir the same. On the seventh, in the course of it, I sent forth a dove, and it left. The dove went and turned, and the raven went and did not return. I built an altar on the peak of the mountain. By seven herbs I cut, at the bottom of them I placed reeds, pines, and simgar. The gods, like flies over the sacrifice, gathered. From of old, also the great god in his course. The great brightness, the sun, of Anu had created. When the glory of those gods, the charm around my neck would not repel, etc. All this has a purely astronomical, magical, and esoteric relation. One who reads these tablets will recognize at a glance the biblical account, and judge at the same time how disfigured is the great Babylonian poem by Euhomeric personages, degraded from their exalted positions of gods into simple patriarchs. Space prevents our entering fully into this biblical travesty of the Chaldean allegories. We shall therefore but remind the reader that the confession of the most unwilling witnesses, such as Lenormand, first the inventor and then champion of the Akkadians, the Chaldeo-Babylonian triad placed under Ilon, the unrevealed deity, is composed of Anu, Nua, and Bel. Anu is the primordial chaos the god time and work at once, the uncreated matter issued from the one and fundamental principle of all things. As to Nua, he is, according to the same Orientalist, the intelligence, we will willingly say the verbum, which animates and fecundates matter, which penetrates the universe, directs and makes it live, and at the same time Nua is the king of the humid principle, the spirit moving on the waters. Is not this evident? Nua is Noah floating on the waters in his ark, the latter being the emblem of the Arga, or moon, the feminine principle. Noah is the spirit falling into matter. We find him as soon as he descends upon the earth, planting a vineyard, drinking of the wine, and getting drunk on it, i.e. the pure spirit becoming intoxicated as soon as it finally gets imprisoned in matter. The seventh chapter of Genesis is but another version of the first. Thus, while the latter reads, And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In chapter 7, it is said, And the waters prevailed, and the ark went with Noah, the Spirit, upon the face of the waters. Thus, Noah, if the Chaldean Nua is the Spirit vivifying matter, chaos represented by the deep or waters of the flood, in the Babylonian legend, it is Istar. Astaroth, the moon, which is shut up in the ark and sends out a dove, emblem of Venus and other lunar goddesses, in search of dry land. And whereas in the Semitic tablets it is Zesuthras, or Hasisadra, who is translated to the company of the gods for his piety. In the Bible it is Enoch, who walks with and being taken up by God, was no more. The successive existence of an incalculable number of worlds before the subsequent evolution of our own was believed and taught by all the ancient peoples. The punishment of the Christians for despoiling the Jews of their records and refusing the true key to them began from the earliest centuries. And thus it is that we find the holy fathers of the church laboring through an impossible chronology and the absurdities of literal interpretation, 
while the learned rabbis were perfectly aware of the real significance of their allegories. So not only in the Sohar, but also in the other Kabbalistic works accepted by Talmudists, such as Midrash, Barashef, or the Universal Genesis, which with the Merkaba, the chariot of Ezekiel, composes the Kabbalah, may be found the doctrine of a whole series of worlds evolving out of the chaos and being destroyed in succession. The Hindu doctrines teach of two pralayas, or dissolutions, one universal, the maha pralaya, the other partial, or the minor pralaya. This does not relate to the universal dissolution which occurs at the end of every day of Brahma, but to the geological cataclysms as the end of every minor cycle of our globe. This historical and purely local deluge of Central Asia, the traditions of which can be traced in every country and which, according to Bunsen, happened about the year 10,000 BC, had not to do with the mythical Noah or Nua. A partial cataclysm occurs at the close of every age of the world, they say, which does not destroy the latter but only changes its general appearance. New races of men and animals and a new flora evolve from the dissolution of the precedent ones. The allegories of the fall of man and the deluge are the two most important features of the Pentateuch. They are, so to say, the Alpha and Omega, the highest and the lowest keys of the scale of harmony on which resounds the majestic hymns of the creation of mankind. For they discovered to him who questions the Zura, figurative gematria, the process of man's evolution from the highest spiritual entity unto the lowest physical, the post-Diluvian man. As in the Egyptian hieroglyphics, every sign of the picture writing which cannot be made to fit within a certain circumscribed geometrical figure may be rejected as only intended by the sacred hierogrammatist for a premeditated blind. So many of the details in the Bible must be treated on the same principle, that portion only being accepted which answers to the numerical methods taught in the Kabbalah. The deluge appears in the Hindu books only as a tradition. It claims no sacred character, and we find it but in the Mahabharata, the Puranas, and still earlier in the Zitapatha, one of the latest Brahmanas. It is more than probable that Moses, or whoever wrote for him, used these accounts as the basis of his own purposely disfigured allegory, adding to it, moreover, the Chaldean Barosian narrative. In Mahabharata, we recognize Nimrod under the name of King Dathya, the origin of the Grecian fable of the Titan scaling Olympus, and the other of the builders of the Tower of Babel, who seek to reach heaven, is shown in the impious Datha, who sends imprecations against heaven's thunder and threatens to conquer heaven itself with its mighty warriors, thereby bringing upon humanity the wrath of Brahma. The Lord then resolved, says the text, to chastise his creature with a terrible punishment which should serve as a warning to survivors and to their descendants. Vevasvara, who is in the Bible becomes Noah, saves a little fish, which turns out to be an avatar of Vishnu. The fish warns that just man, that the globe is about to be submerged, that all that inhabit it must perish and order him to construct a vessel in which he shall embark with all his family. When the ship is ready and Vevasvada has shut up in it with his family, the seeds of plants and pears of all animals and the rain begins to fall, a gigantic fish, armed with a horn, places itself at the head of the ark. The holy man, following its orders, attaches a cable to this horn, and the fish guides the ship safely through the raging elements. In the Hindu tradition, the number of days during which the deluge lasts agrees exactly with that of the Mosaic account. When the elements were calmed, the fish landed the ark on the summit of the Himalayas. The fable is considered by many orthodox commentators to have been borrowed from the Mosaic scriptures. But surely if such a universal cataclysm had ever taken place within man's memory, some of the monuments of the Egyptians, of which many are of such a tremendous antiquity, would have recorded that occurrence, coupled with that of the disgrace of Ham, Canaan, and Mizraim, their alleged ancestors. But till now there has not been found the remotest allusion to such a calamity, although Mizraim certainly belongs to the first generation after the deluge, if not actually an antediluvian himself, 
On the other hand, the Chaldeans preserved the tradition, as we find Barossus testifying to it, and the ancient Hindus possessed the legend as given above. Now, there is but one explanation of the extraordinary fact that of two contemporary and civilized nations like Egypt and Chaldea, one has preserved no tradition of it whatever, although it was the most directly interested in the occurrence, if we credit the Bible, and the other has. The deluge noticed in the Bible, in one of the Brahmanas, and in the Barosis fragment, relates to the partial flood, which, about 10,000 years BC, according to Bunsen, and according to the Brahmanical computations of the Zodiac, also changed the whole face of Central Asia. Thus, the Babylonians and the Chaldeans might have learned of it from their mysterious guests, christened by some Assyriologists, Akkadians, or what is still more probable, they themselves, perhaps, were the descendants of those who had dwelt in the submerged localities. The Jews had the tale from the latter, as they had everything else. The Brahmins may have recorded the traditions of the lands which they first invaded, and then perhaps inhabited before they possessed themselves of the Punjab. But the Egyptians, whose first settlers had evidently come from southern India, had less reason to record the cataclysm since it had perhaps never affected them indirectly, as the flood was limited to Central Asia. Bernouf, noticing the fact that the story of the deluge is found only in one of the most modern Brahmanas, also thinks that it might have been borrowed by the Hindus from the Semitic nations. Against such an assumption are ranged all the traditions and customs of the Hindus. The Aryans, and especially the Brahmins, never borrowed anything at all from the Semitists. And here we are corroborated by one of those unwilling witnesses, as Higgins calls the partisans of Jehovah and the Bible. I have never seen anything in the history of the Egyptians and Jews, writes Abbe Dubois, 40 years a resident of India, that would induce me to believe that either of these nations, or any other on the face of the earth, have been established earlier than the Hindus, and particularly the Brahmins. So I cannot be induced to believe that the latter have drawn their rights from foreign nations. On the contrary, I infer that they have drawn them from an original source of their own. Whoever knows anything of the spirit and character of the Brahmins, their stateliness, their pride, and extreme vanity, their distance and sovereign contempt for everything that is foreign, and of which they cannot boast to have been the inventors, will agree with me that such a people cannot have consented to draw their customs and rules of conduct from an alien country. This fable, which mentions the earliest avatar, the Matsya, relates to another yuga than our own. That of the first appearance of animal life, perchance, who knows, to the Devonian age of our geologists. It certainly answers better to the latter than the year 2348 BC. Apart from this, the very absence of all mention of the deluge from the oldest books of the Hindus suggests a powerful argument when we are left utterly to inferences as in this case. The Vedas and Manu, says Jack Oliot, those monuments of the old Asiatic thought existed far earlier than the Diluvian period. This is an incontrovertible fact, having all the value of an historical truth. For besides the tradition which shows Vishnu himself as saving the Vedas from the deluge, a tradition which, notwithstanding its legendary form, must certainly rest upon a real fact. It has been remarked that neither of these sacred books mention the cataclysm. While the Puranas and the Mahabharata and a great number of other more recent books describe it with the minutest detail, which is a proof of the priority of the former. The Vedas certainly would never have failed to contain a few hymns on the terrible disaster which, of all other natural manifestations, must have struck the imagination of the people who witnessed it. Neither would Manu, who gives us a complete narrative of the creation with a chronology from the divine and heroic ages, down to the appearance of man on earth, have passed in silence an event of such importance. Manu, Book 1, Sloka 35, gives the names of ten eminent saints who he calls Prajapatis, more correctly, Pragapadis, in whom the Brahmin theologians see prophets, ancestors of the human race, and the pundits simply consider as ten powerful kings who lived in the Krita Yuga, or the Age of Good, the Golden Age of the Greeks. The last of these Prajapadis is Brigul, 
enumerating the succession of these eminent beings who, according to Manu, have governed the world, the old Brahmanical legislator names as descending from Brigu, Swarochika, Atami, Tamasa, Revata, the glorious Chakucha, and the son of Vivsvat, every one of the six having made himself worthy of the title of Manu, divine legislator, a title which had equally belonged to the Prajapatis, and every great personage of primitive India. The genealogy stops at this name. Now, according to the Puranas and the Mahabharata, it was under a descendant of this son of Vivasvada, named Vavasvada, that occurred the great cataclysm, the remembrance of which, as will be seen, has passed into a tradition and been carried by emigration into all the countries of the East and West, which India has colonized since then. The genealogy given by Manu stopping, as we have seen it, at Vivasvada, it follows that this work of Manu knew nothing either of Vavasvada or the Deluge. The argument is unanswerable, and we commend it to those official scientists who, to please the clergy, dispute every fact proving the tremendous antiquity of the Vedas and Manu. Colonel Vans Kennedy had long since declared that Babylonia was, from her origin, the seat of Sanskrit literature and Brahmin learning. And how or why should the Brahmins have penetrated there, unless it was as the result of intestine wars and emigration from India? The fullest account of the deluge is found in the Mahabharata of Vedavasya, a poem in honor of the astrological allegories on the wars between the solar and the lunar races. One of the versions states that Vivasvada became the father of all the nations of earth through his own progeny. And this is the form adopted for the Nokian story. The other states that, like Deucalion and Pyra, he had but to throw pebbles into the illus left by the retiring waves of the flood to produce men at will. These two versions, one Hebrew and the other Greek, allow us no choice. We must either believe that the Hindus borrowed from pagan Greeks as well as from monotheistic Jews, or, what is far more probable, that the versions of both of these nations are derived from the Vedic literature through the Babylonians. History tells us of the stream of immigration across the Indus, and later of its overflowing the Occident, and of populations of Hindu origin passing from Asia Minor to colonize Greece. But history says not a single word of the chosen people, or of the Greek colonies having penetrated India early than the 5th or 4th centuries BC when we first find vague traditions that make some of the problematical lost tribes of Israel take from Babylon the route to India. But even were the story of the ten tribes to find credence and the tribes themselves be proved to have existed in profane as well as in sacred history, this does not help the solution at all. Colebrook, Wilson, and other eminent Indianists show that the Mahabharata, if not the Satapatha Brahmana, in which the story is also given, has by far antedated the age of Cyrus, hence the possible time of the appearance of any of the tribes of Israel and India. Orientalists accord the Mahabharata an antiquity of between 12 and 1500 years BC. As to the Greek version, it bears as little evidence as the other, and the attempts of the Hellenists in this direction have as signally failed. The story of the conquering army of Alexander penetrating into northern India itself becomes more doubted every day. No Hindu national record, not the slightest historical memento throughout the length and breadth of India offers the slightest trace of such an invasion. If even such historical facts are now found to have been all the while fictions, what are we to think of narratives which bear on their very face the stamp of invention? We cannot help sympathizing at heart with Professor Muller when he remarks that it seems blasphemy to consider these fables of the heathen world as corrupted and misinterpreted fragments of divine revelation, once granted to the whole race of mankind. Only can this scholar be held perfectly impartial and fair to both parties, unless he includes in the number of these fables those of the Bible. And is the language of the Old Testament more pure or moral than the books of the Brahmins, 
or any fables of the heathen world more blasphemous and ridiculous than Jehovah's interview with Moses? Exodus 33, 23. Are any of the pagan gods made to appear more fiendish than the same Jehovah in a score of passages? If the feelings of a pious Christian are shocked at the absurdities of Father Kronos eating his children and maiming Uranus, or of Jupiter throwing Vulcan down from heaven and breaking his leg, on the other hand, he cannot feel hurt if a non-Christian laughs at the idea of Jacob boxing with the Creator, who, when he saw that he prevailed not against him, dislocated Jacob's thigh, the patriarch still holding fast to God and not allowing him to go his way, notwithstanding his pleading. Why should the story of Deucalion and Pyra, throwing stones behind them and thus creating the human race, be deemed more ridiculous than that of Lot's wife being changed into a pillar of salt, or of the Almighty creating men of clay and then breathing the breath of life into them? The choice between the latter mode of creation and that of the Egyptian ram-horned god fabricating man on a potter's wheel is hardly perceptible. The story of Minerva, goddess of wisdom, ushered into existence after a certain period of gestation in her father's brain, is at least suggestive and poetical as an allegory. No ancient Greek was ever burned for not accepting it literally, and at all events, heathen fables in general are far less preposterous and blasphemous than those imposed upon Christians. Ever since the Church accepted the Old Testament and the Roman Catholic Church opened its register of thaumaturgical saints. Many of the natives of India, continues Professor Muller, confess that their feelings revolt against the impurities attributed to the gods by what they call their sacred writings. Yet there are honest Brahmins who will maintain that these stories have a deeper meaning that immorality being incompatible with the divine being, a mystery must be supposed to be concealed in these time-hallowed fables, a mystery which an inquiring and reverent mind may hope to fathom. This is precisely what the Christian clergy maintain in attempting to explain the indecencies and incongruities of the Old Testament. Only instead of allowing the interpretation to those who have the key to the seeming incongruities, they have assumed to themselves the office and right, by divine proxy, to interpret these in their own way. They have not only done that, but have gradually deprived the Hebrew clergy of the means to interpret their scriptures as their fathers did. So that to find among the rabbis in the present century a well-versed Kabbalist is quite rare. The Jews have themselves forgotten the key. How could they help it? Where are the original manuscripts? The oldest Hebrew manuscript in existence is said to be the Bodleian Codex, which is not older than between eight and nine hundred years. The break between Ezra and this Codex is thus fifteen centuries. In 1490, the Inquisition caused all the Hebrew Bibles to be burned, and Torquemada alone destroyed six thousand volumes at Salamanca, except a few manuscripts of the Torah, Ketubim and Nibim used in the synagogues, and which are of quite a recent date. We do not think there is one old manuscript in existence which is not punctuated, hence, completely misinterpreted and altered by the Mesorites. Were it not for this timely invention of the Mesorah, no copy of the Old Testament could possibly be tolerated in our century. It is well known that the Mesorites, while transcribing the oldest manuscripts, put themselves to task to take out, except in a few places which they have probably overlooked, all the immodest words and put in places sentences of their own, often changing completely the sense of the verse. It is clear, says Donaldson, that the Mesoretic school at Tiberias were engaged in settling or unsettling the Hebrew text until the final publication of the Mesorah itself. Therefore, had we but the original texts, judging by the present copies of the Bible in our possession, it would be really edifying to compare the Old Testament with the Vedas and even with the Brahmanical books. We verily believe that no faith, however blind, could stand before such an avalanche of crude impurities and fables. If the latter are not only accepted but enforced upon millions of civilized persons, who find it respectable and edifying to believe in them as divine revelation, why should we wonder that Brahmins believe their books to be equally a shruti, a revelation? 
Let us thank the Mazarets by all means, but let us study at the same time both sides of the metal. Legends, myths, allegories, symbols, if they but belong to the Hindu, Chaldean, or Egyptian tradition, are thrown into the same heap of fiction. Hardly are they honored with a superficial search into their possible relations to astronomy or sexual emblems. The same myths, when and because mutilated, are accepted as sacred scriptures, more the word of God. Is this impartial history? Is this justice to either the past, the present, or the future? He cannot serve God and mammon, said the reformer 19 centuries ago. He cannot serve truth and public prejudice. Would be more applicable to our own age. Yet our authorities pretend they serve the former. There are a few myths in any religious system, but have an historical as well as scientific foundation. Myths, as Pocock ably expresses it, are now proved to be fables, just in proportion as we misunderstand them, truths in proportion as they were once understood. Our ignorance it is which has made a myth of history, and our ignorance is a Hellenic inheritance, much of it the result of Hellenic vanity. Bunsen and Champollion have already shown that the Egyptian sacred books are by far older than the oldest parts of the book of Genesis. And now a more careful research seems to warrant the suspicion, which with us amounts to a certainty, that the laws of Moses are copied from the code of the Brahmanic Manu. Thus, according to every probability, Egypt owes her civilization, her civil instructions, and her arts to India. But against the latter assumption, we have a whole army of authorities arrayed. And what matters if the latter do deny the fact at present? Sooner or later, they will have to accept it, whether they belong to the German or French school. Among, but not of those who so readily compromise between interest and conscience, there are some fearless scholars who may bring out to light incontrovertible facts. Some twenty years since, Max Muller, in a letter to the editor of the London Times, April 1857, maintained most vehemently that nirvana meant annihilation in the fullest sense of the word. See Chips, etc., Volume 1, page 287, on the meaning of nirvana. But in 1869, in a lecture before the general meeting of the Association of German Philologists at Kiel, he distinctly declares his belief that the nihilism attributed to Buddha's teaching forms no part of his doctrine, and that it is wholly wrong to suppose that nirvana means annihilation. Trubner's American and Oriental Library Record, October 16, 1869. Also Inman's Ancient Faiths and Modern, page 128. Yet, if we mistake not, Professor Muller was as much of an authority in 1857 as in 1869. It will be difficult to settle, says now this great scholar, whether the Vedas is the oldest of books, and whether some of the portions of the Old Testament may not be traced back to the same or even an earlier date than the oldest hymns of the Veda. But his retraction about the nirvana allows us a hope that he may yet change his opinion on the question of Genesis likewise, so that the public may have simultaneously the benefit of truth and the sanction of one of Europe's greatest authorities. It is well known how little the Orientalists have come to anything like an agreement about the age of Zoroaster, and until this question is settled, it would be safer perhaps to trust implicitly in the Brahmanical calculations by the Zodiac than to the opinions of scientists Leaving the profane horde of unrecognizable scholars, those we mean who yet wait their turn to be chosen for public worship as idols symbolical of scientific leadership, where can we find among the sanctioned authorities of the day two that agreed as to this age? There's Bunsen, who places Zoroaster at Bactra, and the emigration of Bactrians to the Indus at 3784 BC and the birth of Moses at 1392. Now, it is rather difficult to place Zoroaster anterior to the Vedas, considering that the whole of this doctrine is that of the earlier Vedas. True, he remained in Afghanistan for a period more or less problematical before crossing into the Punjab, but the Vedas were begun in the latter country. They indicate the progress of the Hindus as the Avesta that of the Iranians. And there is Haug, who assigns to the 
Atareya Brahmanam, a Brahmanical speculation and commentary upon the Rig Veda, of a far later date than the Veda itself, between 1400 and 1200 BC, while the Vedas are placed by him between 2000 and 2400 years BC, Max Muller cautiously suggests certain difficulties in this chronological computation, but still does not altogether deny it. Let it, however, be as it may, in supposing that the Pentateuch was written by Moses himself, notwithstanding that he would thereby be made to twice record his own death. Still, if Moses was born, as Bunsen finds in 1392 BC, the Pentateuch could not have been written before the Vedas, especially if Zoroaster was born 3784 BC. If, as Dr. Haug tells us, some of the hymns of the Rig Veda were written before Zoroaster accomplished his schism, something like 37 centuries BC, and Max Muller says himself that Zoroastrians and their ancestors started from India during the Vedic period. How can some of the portions of the Old Testament be traced back to the same or even an earlier date than the oldest hymns of the Veda? It has generally been agreed among Orientalists that the Aryans, 3,000 years BC, were still in the steppes east of the Caspian and united. Rawlinson conjectures that they flowed east from Armenia as a common center, while two kindred streams began to flow, one northward over the Caucasus and the other westward over Asia Minor and Europe. He finds the Aryans at a period anterior to the 15th century before our era, settled in the territory watered by the upper Indus. Thence Vedic Aryans migrated to the Punjab, and Zendic Aryans westward, establishing the historical countries. But this, like the rest, is a hypothesis, and only given as such. Again, Rawlinson, evidently following Max Muller, says, The early history of the Aryans is for so many ages an absolute blank. But many learned Brahmins, however, have declared that they found trace of the existence of the Vedas as early as 2100 BC. And Sir William Jones, taking for his guide the astronomical data, places the Yagar Veda 1580 BC. This would be still before Moses. It is upon the supposition that the Aryans did not leave Afghanistan for the Punjab prior to 1500 BC, that Max Muller and other Oxford savants have supposed that portions of the Old Testament may be traced back to the same or even an earlier date than the oldest hymns of the Veda. Therefore, until the Orientalists can show us the correct date at which Zoroaster flourished, no authority can be regarded as better for the ages of the Vedas than the Brahmins themselves. As it is a recognized fact that the Jews borrowed most of their laws from the Egyptians, let us examine who were the Egyptians. In our opinion, which is but a poor authority, of course, they were the ancient Indians. And in our first volume, we have quoted passages from the historian Kaluka Bata that support such a theory. What we mean by ancient India is the following. No region on the map except it be the ancient Scythia is more uncertainly defined than that which bore the designation of India. Ethiopia is perhaps the only parallel. It was the home of Kushite, or Hamitic races, and lay to the east of Babylonia. It was once the name of Hindustan, when the dark races, worshippers of Bala Mahadeva and Bahavani Mahadevi, were supreme in that country. The India of the early sages appears to have been the region at the sources of the Oxus and Jakartes. Apollonius of Tyana crossed the Caucasus, or Hindu Kush, where he met with a king who directed him to the abode of the sages. Perhaps the descendants of those whom Ammianus terms the Brahmins of Upper India, and whom Hystaspes, the father of Darius, or more probably Darius Hystaspes himself, visited and having been instructed by them, infused their rites and ideas into the Magian observances. This narrative about Apollonius seems to indicate Kashmir as the country which he visited, and the Nagas, after their conversion to Buddhism, as his teachers. At this time, Aryan India did not extend beyond the Punjab. To our notion, the most baffling impediment in the way of the ethnological progress has always been the triple progeny of Noah 
and the attempt to reconcile post-Diluvian races with the genealogical descent from Shem, Ham, and Japhet, the Christian-esque Orientalists have set themselves a task impossible of accomplishment. The biblical Nokian Ark has a Procrustean bed to which they had to make everything fit. Attention has therefore been diverted from veritable sources of information as to the origin of man, and a purely local allegory mistaken for historical record emanating from an inspired source. Strange and unfortunate choice, out of all the sacred writings of all the branch nations sprung from the primitive stock of mankind, Christianity must choose for its guidance the national records and scriptures of a people perhaps the least spiritual of the human family, the Semitic a branch that has never been able to deploy out of its numerous tongues a language capable of embodying ideas of a moral and intellectual world, whose form of expression and drift of thought could never soar higher than the purely sensual and terrestrial figures of speech, whose literature has left nothing original, nothing that was not borrowed from the Aryan thought, and whose science and philosophy are utterly wanting in those noble features which characterize the highly spiritual and metaphysical systems of the Indo-European Japetic races. Bunsen shows Kamism, the language of Egypt, as a very ancient deposit from Western Asia, containing the germs of the Sermetic, and thus bearing witness to the primitive cognate unity of the Semitic and Aryan races. We must remember in this connection that the peoples of Southwestern and Western Asia including the Medes, were all Aryans. It is yet far from being proved who were the original and primitive masters of India. That this period is now beyond the reach of documentary history does not preclude the probability of our theory that it was the mighty race of builders. Whether we call them Eastern, Ethiopians, or dark-skinned Aryans, the word meaning simply noble warrior, a brave. They ruled supreme at one time over the whole of ancient India, enumerated later by Manu as the possession of those whom our scientists term the Sanskrit-speaking people. These Hindus are supposed to have entered the country from the northwest. They are conjectured by some to have brought with them the Brahmanical religion, and the language of the conquerors was probably the Sanskrit. On these three meager data, our philologists have worked ever since the Hindustani and its immense Sanskrit literature was forcibly brought into notice by Sir William Jones, all the time with the three sons of Noah clinging around their necks. This is exact science, free from religious prejudices. Verily, ethnology would have been the gainer if this Nokian trio had been washed overboard and drowned before the ark reached land. The Ethiopians are generally classed in the Semitic group, but we have to see how far they have a claim to such a classification. We will also consider how much they might have had to do with the Egyptian civilization, which, as a writer expresses it, seems referable in the same perfection to the earliest dates, and not to have had a rise in progress as was the case with that of other peoples. For reasons that we will now adduce, we are prepared to maintain that Egypt owes her civilization, commonwealth and arts, especially the art of building, to the pre-Vedic India, and that it was a colony of the dark-skinned Aryans, or those whom Homer and Herodotus termed the Eastern Ethiopians, i.e. the inhabitants of southern India, who brought to it their ready-made civilization in the anti-chronological ages, of what Bunsen calls the pre-Menite but nevertheless epochal history. In Polkux, India in Greece, we find the following suggested paragraph. The plain account of the wars carried on between the solar chiefs, Osras, Osiris, the prince of the Goklas, and Tupu, is the simple historical fact of the wars of the Apians, or sun tribes of Ud, with the people of Tupu, or Tibet, who were, in fact, the lunar race, mostly Buddhists, and opposed by Rama and the Ethiopias, or people of Ud, subsequently the Ethiopians of Africa. We would remind the reader in this connection that Ravan, the giant who, in the Ramayana, wages such a war with Ramachandra, is shown as King of Lanka, which was the ancient name for Ceylon, and that Ceylon in those days perhaps formed a part of the mainland of southern India and was peopled by the eastern Ethiopians, 
conquered by Rama, the son of Dasarada, the solar king of ancient Ud, a colony of these emigrated to northern Africa. If, as many suspect, Homer's Iliad and much of his account of the Trojan War is plagiarized from the Ramayana, then the traditions which served as a basis for the latter must date from a tremendous antiquity. Ample margin is thus left in the pre-chronological history for a period, during which the eastern Ethiopians might have established the hypothetical Mizraic colony with their high Indian civilization and arts. Science is still in the dark about cuneiform inscriptions. Until these are completely deciphered, especially those cut in rocks found in such abundance within the boundaries of the old Iran, who can tell the secrets they may yet reveal? There are no Sanskrit monumental inscriptions older than Chandragupta, 315 BC, and the Persepolitan inscriptions are found 220 years older. There are even now some manuscripts and characters utterly unknown to philologists and paleographists, and one of them is, or was, some time since in the Library of Cambridge, England. Linguistic writers class the Semitic with the Indo-European language, generally including the Ethiopian and the ancient Egyptian in the classification. But if some of the dialects of the modern northern Africa, and even the modern Gies or Ethiopian, are now so degenerated and corrupted as to admit of false conclusions as to the genetical relationship between them and the other Semitic tongues. We are not at all sure that the latter have any claim to such a classification, except in the case of the old Coptic and the ancient Giz. That there is more consanguinity between the Ethiopians and the Aryan, dark-skinned races, and between the latter and the Egyptians, is something which yet may be proved. It has been found that the ancient Egyptians were of the Caucasian type of mankind, and the shape of their skulls is purely Asiatic. If they were less copper-colored than the Ethiopians of our modern day, the Ethiopians themselves might have had a lighter complexion in days of old. The fact that with the Ethiopian kings, the order of succession gave the crown to the nephew of the king, the son of his sister, and not to his own son, is extremely suggestive. It is an old custom which prevails until now in southern India. The Raja is not succeeded by his own sons, but by his sister's sons. Of all the dialects and tongues alleged to be Semitic, the Ethiopian alone is written from left to right like the Sanskrit and the Indo-Aryan people. Thus, against the origin of the Egyptians being attributed to an ancient Indian colony, there is no graver impediment than Noah's disrespectful son Ham, himself a myth. But the earliest form of Egyptian religious worship and government, theocratic and sacerdotal, and her habits and customs all bespeak an Indian origin. The earliest legends of the history of India mention two dynasties now lost in the night of time. The first was the dynasty of kings, of the race of the sun, who reigned in Ayodhya, now Uyd. The second, that of the race of the moon, who reigned in Pruyag, Allahabad. Let him who desires information on the religious worship of these early kings read the Book of the Dead, of the Egyptians and all the peculiarities attending this sun-worship and the sun-gods. Neither Osiris nor Horus are ever mentioned without being connected with the sun. They are the sons of the sun. The Lord and adorer of the sun is his name. The sun is the creator of the body, the engenderer of the gods who are the successor of the sun. Pocock, in his most ingenious work, strongly advocates the same idea and endeavors to establish still more firmly the identity of the Egyptian, Greek, and Indian mythology. He shows the head of the Rajput solar race, in fact the great Kuklapos, Cyclop, or Builder, called the Great Sun, in the earliest Hindu tradition. This Gokla prince, the patriarch of the vast bands of Inakanzis, he says, This great sun was deified at his death and according to the Indian doctrine of the metempsychosis, his soul was supposed to have transmigrated into the bull, Apis, the Serapis of the Greeks, and the Surapas, or sun chief, of the Egyptians. Osiris, properly Usra, signifies both a bull and a ray of light. 
Surapas, Serapis, the sun chief, for the sun in Sanskrit is Surya, Champollion's manifestation to the light, reminds in every chapter of the two dynasties of the kings of the sun and the moon. Later, these kings became all deified and transformed after death into solar and lunar deities. Their worship was the earliest corruption of the great primitive faith, which justly considered the sun and its fiery life-giving rays as the most appropriate symbol to remind us of the universal and visible presence of him who is master of life and death. And now it can be traced all around the globe. It was the religion of the earliest Vedic Brahmins, who call in the oldest hymns of the Rig Veda, Surya, the sun, and Agni, fire, the ruler of the universe the lord of men and the wise king. It was the worship of the Magians, the Zoroastrians, the Egyptians and Greeks, whether they called him Mithra or Ahura Mazda or Osiris or Zeus, keeping in honor of his next of kin, Vesta, the pure celestial fire. And this religion is found again in the Peruvian solar worship, in the Sabianism and Heliolatry of the Chaldees, in the Mosaic burning bush, the hanging of the heads or chiefs among the people toward the Lord, the sun, and even in the Abrahamic building of fire altars and the sacrifices of the monotheistic Jews to Astart, the Queen of Heaven. To the present moment, with all the controversies and researches, history and science remain as much as ever in the dark as to the origin of the Jews. They may as well be the exiled Chandalas or Pariahs of old India, the bricklayers mentioned by Venusvadi, Vedayasa and Manu, as the Phoenicians of Herodotus, or the Hyksos of Josephus, or descendants of Pali shepherds, or a mixture of all these. The Bible names the Tyrians as a kindred people and claims dominion over them. There is more than one important character in the Bible whose biography proves him a mythical hero. Samuel is indicated as the personage of the Hebrew commonwealth. He is the doppel of Samson, of the book of Judges, as will be seen. Being the son of Anna and Elkanah, as Samson was of Manua, or Manoah, Both were fictitious characters, as now represented in the revealed book. One was the Hebrew Hercules and the other Ganesa. Samuel is credited with establishing the Republic, as putting down the Canaanite worship of Baal and Astarte, or Adonis and Venus, and setting up that of Jehovah. Then the people demanded a king, and he anointed Saul, and after him David of Bethlehem. David is the Israelitish King Arthur. He did great achievements and established the government in all Syria and Edomia. His dominion extended from Armenia and Assyria on the north and northeast, the Syrian desert and Persian Gulf on the east, Arabia on the south, and Egypt and the Levant on the west. Only Phoenicia was accepted. His friendship with Hiram seems to indicate that he made his first expedition from that country into Judea and his long residence at Hebron, the city of the Kabiri, Arba, or Four, would seem likewise to imply that he established a new religion in the country. After David came Solomon, powerful and luxurious, who sought to consolidate the dominion which David had won. As David was a Jehovah worshipper, a temple of Jehovah, Tukt Solima was built in Jerusalem, while shrines of Moloch, Hercules, Chemosh, and Astart were erected on Mount Olivier. These shrines remained till Josiah. There were conspiracies formed, revolts took place in Udimaya and Damascus, and Ahaja, the prophet, led the popular movement which resulted in deposing the house of David and making Jeroboam king. Even after the prophets dominated in Israel, where the calf worship prevailed, the priests ruled over the weak dynasty of David, and the lascivious local worship existed over the whole country. After the destruction of the house of Ahab and the failure of Jehu and his descendants to unite the country under one head, the endeavor was made in Judah. Isaiah had terminated the direct line in the person of Ahaz, Isaiah 7.9 and placed on the throne a prince from Bethlehem, Micah v. 2.5. This was Hezekiah. On the ascending the throne, he invited the chiefs of Israel to unite in alliance with him against Assyria, 
2 Chronicles 31, 21, 31, 1, 5, 2 Kings 18, 7. He seems to have established a sacred college, Proverbs 25, 1, and to have utterly changed the worship. I, even unto breaking into pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. This makes the story of Samuel and David and Solomon mythical. Most of the prophets who were literate seem to have begun about this time to write. The country was finally overthrown by the Assyrians, who found the same people and institutions as in the Phoenician and other countries. Hezekiah was not the lineal, but the titular son of Ahaz, Isaiah the prophet, belonging to the royal family, and Hezekiah was reputed his son-in-law. Ahaz refused to ally himself with the prophet and his party, saying, I will not tempt, depend on, the Lord, Isaiah 7.12. The prophet had declared, If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established, foreshadowing the deposition of his direct language. Ye weary, my God, replied the prophet, and predicted the birth of a child by an Alma, or temple woman, and that before it shall attain full age, Hebrews v. 14, Isaiah 7, 16, 8, 4, the king of Assyria should overcome Syria with Israel. This is the prophecy which Arrhenius took such pains to connect with Mary and Jesus, and made the reason why the mother of the Nazarene prophet is represented as belonging to the temple and consecrated to God from her infancy. In the second song, Isaiah celebrated the new chief to sit on the throne of David. 9, 6, 7, 11, 1 who should restore to their homes the Jews whom the Confederacy had led captive. Isaiah 8, 2-12, Joel 3, 1-7, Obadiah 7, 11, 14. Micah, his contemporary, also announced the same event. 9, 7-13, V, 1-7. The Redeemer was to come out of Bethlehem, in other words, was of the house of David, and was to resist Assyria, to whom Ahaz had sworn allegiance, and also to reform religion. 2 Kings, 18.4-8. This Hezekiah did. He was grandson of Zechariah the seer. 2 Chronicles, 29.1, 26.5. The counselor of Uzziah. And as soon as he ascended the throne, he restored the religion of David and destroyed the last vestiges of that Moses i.e. the esoteric doctrine declaring our fathers have trespassed. 2 Cron 19, 6-9 He next attempted a reunion with the northern monarchy, there being an interregnum in Israel, 2 Cron 31, 2, 6, 31, 1, 6, 7. It was successful, but resulted in an invasion by the king of Assyria. But it was a new regime, and all this shows the course of two parallel streams in the religious worship of the Israelites, one belonging to the state religion and adopted to fit political exigencies, the other pure idolatry, resulting from ignorance of the true esoteric doctrine preached by Moses. For the first time since Solomon built them, the high places were taken away. It was Hezekiah who was the expected Messiah of the exoteric state religion. He was the scion from the stem of Jess, who should recall the Jews from a deplorable captivity, about which the Hebrew historians seem to be very silent, carefully avoiding all mention of this particular fact, but which the irascible prophets imprudently disclose. If Hezekiah crossed the exoteric ball worship, he also tore violently away the people of Israel from the religion of their fathers and the secret rites instituted by Moses. It was Darius Hystaspes who was the first to establish a Persian colony in Judea. Zorobabel was perhaps the leader. The name Zorobabel means the seed or son of Babylon, as Zoroaster is the seed, son, or prince of Ishtar. The new colonists were doubtless Judea. This is a designation from the east. Even Siam is called Judea, and there was an Oyodia in India. The temples of Solemn or Peace were numerous. 
Throughout Persia and Afghanistan, the names of Saul and David are very common. The law is ascribed in turn to Hezekiah, Ezra, Simon the Just, and the Asmonean period. Nothing definite, everywhere contradictions. When the Asmonean period began, the chief supporters of the law were called Sidians, or Kazdim, Chaldeans, and afterward Pharisees, or Farsi, Parsis. This indicates that Persian colonies were established in Judea and ruled the country, while all the people that are mentioned in the books of Genesis and Joshua lived there as a commonality. See Ezra 9.1. There is no real history in the Old Testament, and the little historical information one can glean is only found in the indiscreet revelations of the prophets. The book, as a whole, must have been written at various times, or rather invented as an authorization of some subsequent worship, the origin of which may be very easily traced partially to the Orphic mysteries, and partially to the ancient Egyptian rites in familiarity with which Moses was brought up from his infancy. Since the last century, the church has been gradually forced into concessions of usurped biblical territory to those to whom it of right belonged inch by inch, has been yielded, and one personage after another been proved mythical and pagan. But now, after the recent discovery of George Smith, the much-regretted Assyriologist, one of the secretest props of the Bible has been pulled down. Sargon and his tablets are about demonstrated to be older than Moses. Like the account of Exodus, the birth and story of the lawgiver seem to have been borrowed from the Assyrians as the jewels of gold and jewels of silver were said to be from the Egyptians. On page 224 of Assyrian Discoveries, Mr. George Smith says, In the palace of Sennacherib at Koyinjik, I found another fragment of the curious history of Sargon, a translation in which I published in the Transactions of the Society of Biblical Archaeology, Volume 1, Part 1, page 46. This text relates that Sargon, an early Babylonian monarch, was born of royal parents. But concealed by his mother, who placed him on the Euphrates in an ark of rushes, coated with bitumen like that in which the mother of Moses hid her child, see Exodus 2, Sargon was discovered by a man named Aki, a water carrier who adopted him as his son, and he afterward became king of Babylonia. The capital of Sargon was the great city of Agadi, called by the Semites Akkad, mentioned in Genesis as a capital of Nimrod, Genesis 10.10. And here he reigned for 45 years. Akkad lay near the city of Sippara, on the Euphrates and north of Babylon. The date of Sargon, who may be termed the Babylonian Moses, was in the 16th century and perhaps earlier. G. Smith adds in his Chaldean account that Sargon was a Babylonian monarch who reigned in the city of Akkad about 1600 BC. The name of Sargon signifies the right, true, or legitimate king. This curious story is found on the fragments of tablets from Koyunik and reads as follows. 1. Sargona, the powerful king, the king of Akkad, am I. 2. My mother was a princess. My father I did not know. A brother of my father ruled over the country. 3. In the city of Azuparana, which is by the side of the river Euphrates. 4. My mother, the princess, conceived me. In difficulty she brought me forth. 5. She placed me in an ark of rushes. With bitumen, my exit, she sealed up. 6. She launched me in the river which did not drown me. 7. The river carried me to Aki, the water carrier it brought me. 8. Aki, the water carrier, in tenderness of bowels, lifted me, etc., etc. And now Exodus 2. And when she, Moses' mother, could not longer hide him, she took him for an ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river brink. The story, says Mr. G. Smith, is supposed to have happened about 1600 B.C., 
rather earlier than the supposed age of Moses. As we know that the fame of Sargon reached Egypt, it is quite likely that this account had a connection with the event related in Exodus 2. For every action, when once performed, has a tendency to be repeated. The ages of the Hindus differ, but little from those of the Greeks, Romans, and even the Jews. We include the Mosaic computation advisedly and with intent to prove our position. The chronology which separates Moses from the creation of the world by only four generations seems ridiculous, merely because the Christian clergy would enforce it upon the world literally. The Kabbalists know that these generations stand for ages of the world. The allegories which, in the Hindu calculations, embrace the whole stupendous sweep of the four ages are cunningly made in the Mosaic books. Through the obliging help of the Mazora to cram into the small period of two millenniums and a half. 2513. The exoteric plan of the Bible was made to answer also to four ages. Thus, they reckon the golden age from Adam to Abraham, the silver from Abraham to David, copper from David to captivity, thenceforward the iron. But the secret computation is quite different and does not vary at all from the zodiacal calculations of the Brahmins. We are in the Iron Age, or Kali Yuga, but it began with Noah, the mythical ancestor of our race. Noah, or Nua, like all the humorized manifestations of the unrevealed one, Swayambhuva, or Swayambhu, was androgyne. Thus, in some instances, he belonged to the purely feminine triad of the Chaldeans, known as Nua, the Universal Mother. We have shown in another chapter that every male triad had its feminine counterpart, one in three like the former. It was the passive complement of the active principle, its reflection. In India, the male trimurti is reproduced in the sakti trimurti, the feminine, and in Chaldea, Anna, Balita, and Devkina answered to Anu, Bel, Nua. The former three resumed in one, Balita, were called Sovereign goddesses, lady of the nether abyss, mother of gods, queen of the earth, queen of fecundity. As the primordial humidity, whence proceeded all, Belita is Tamti, or the sea, the mother of the city of Eric. The great Chaldean necropolis, therefore an infernal goddess. In the world of stars and planets, she is known as Istar, or Astareth. Hence, she is identical with Venus and every other queen of heaven to whom cakes and buns were offered in sacrifice. And as all the archaeologists know, with Eve, the mother of all that live, and with Mary. The ark in which are preserved the germs of all living things necessary to repeople the earth represents the survival of life and the supremacy of spirit over matter through the conflict of the opposing powers of nature. In the astro-theosophic chart of the Western Rite, the Ark corresponds with the navel and is placed at the sinister side, the side of the woman, the moon. One of those symbols is the left pillar of Solomon's temple, Boaz. The umbilicus is connected with the receptacle in which are fructified the germs of the race. The Ark is the sacred Arga of the Hindus, and thus the relation in which it stands to Noah's Ark may be easily inferred when we learn that the Arga was an oblong vessel used by the high priests as a sacrificial chalice in the warships of Isis, as Tart and Venus Aphrodite, all of whom were goddesses of the generative powers of nature, or of matter, hence representing symbolically the Ark containing the germs of all living things. We admit that pagans had, and now have, as in India, Strange symbols, which, to the eyes of the hypocrite and Puritan, seem scandalously immoral. But did not the ancient Jews copy most of these symbols? We have described elsewhere the identity of the lingam with Jacob's pillar. And we could give a number of instances from the present Christian rites bearing the same origin. Did but space permit, and were not all these noticed fully by Inman and others? See Inman's ancient faiths embodied in ancient names. Describing the worship of the Egyptians, Mrs. Lydia Maria Child says, This reverence for the production of life, introduced into the worship of Osiris, the sexual emblems so common in Hindustan, 
A colossal image of this kind was presented to his temple in Alexandria by King Ptolemy of Philadelphus. Reverence for the mystery of organized life led to the recognition of a masculine and feminine principle in all things, spiritual or material. The sexual emblems everywhere conspicuous in the sculptures of their temples would seem impure in description, but no clean and thoughtful mind could so regard them while witnessing the obvious simplicity and solemnity with which the subject is treated. Thus speaks this respected lady and admirable writer, and no truly pure man or woman would ever think of blaming her for it. But such a perversion of the ancient thought is but natural in an age of Kant and prudery like our own. The water of the flood, when standing in the allegory for the symbolic sea, Tamti typifies the turbulent chaos, or matter, called the great dragon. According to the Gnostic and Rosicrucian medieval doctrine, the creation of woman was not originally intended. She is the offspring of man's own impure fancy, and as the hermetists say, an obtrusion. Created by an unclean thought, she sprang into existence at the evil seventh hour, when the supernatural real worlds had passed away and the natural or delusive worlds began evolving along the descending microcosmos, or the arc of the great cycle, in plainer phraseology. First Virgo, the celestial virgin of the zodiac, she became Virgo Scorpio. But in evolving his second companion, man had unwittingly endowed her with his own share of spirituality, and this new being, whom his imagination had called into life, became his savior from the snares of Eve Lilith, the first Eve, who had a greater share of matter in her composition than the primitive, spiritual man. Thus woman stands in the cosmogony in relation to matter, or the great deep, as the virgin of the sea who crushes the dragon under her foot. The flood is also very often shown in symbolical phraseology as the great dragon. For one acquainted with these tenets, it becomes more than suggestive to learn that with the Catholics, the Virgin Mary is not only the accepted patroness of Christian sailors, but also the Virgin of the Sea. So was Dido, the patroness of the Phoenician mariners. And together with Venus and other lunar goddesses, the moon having such a strong influence over the tides was the virgin of the sea. Mar, the sea, is the root of the name Mary. The blue color, which was the ancients symbolical of the great deep or the material world, hence of evil, is made sacred to our blessed lady. It is the color of Notre Dame de Paris, on account of its relation to the symbolical serpent. This color is held in the deepest aversion by the ex-Nazarenes, disciples of John the Baptist, now the Mendeans of Basra. Among the beautiful plates of Maurice, there is one representing Krishna crushing the head of the serpent. A three-peaked mitre is on his head, typifying the trinity, and the body and tail of the conquered serpent encircles the figure of the Hindu god. This plate shows whence proceeded the inspiration for the makeup of a later story extracted from an alleged prophecy. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The Egyptian Orante is also shown with his arms extended as on a crucifix, and treading upon the serpent and Horus, the Logos, is represented piercing the head of the dragon, Typhon, or Apophis. All this gives us a clue to the biblical allegory of Cain and Abel. Cain was held as the ancestor of the Hivites, the serpents, and the twins of Adam are the evident copy from the fable of Osiris and Typhon. Apart from the external form of the allegory, however, it embodied the philosophical conception of the eternal struggle of good and evil. But how strangely elastic, how adaptable to any and everything this mystical philosophy proved after the Christian era. When were ever facts irrefutable, irrefragable, and beyond denial less potential for the re-establishment of truth than in our century of casuistry and Christian cunning? Is Krishna proved to have been known as the Good Shepherd ages before the year AD 1, to have crushed the serpent Kalinaga? and to have been crucified? All this was but a prophetic foreshadowing of the future. 
Or the Scandinavian Thor, who bruised the head of the serpent with his cruciform mace, and Apollo, who killed Python, likewise shown to present the most striking similarities with the heroes of the Christian fables? They become but original conceptions of heathen minds, working upon the old patriarchal prophecies respecting the Christ, as they were contained in the one universal and primeval revelation. The flood, then, is the old serpent, or the great deep of matter, Isaiah's dragon in the sea, 27.1, over which the ark safely crosses on its way to the Mount of Salvation. But if we have heard of the ark and Noah and the Bible at all, it is because the mythology of the Egyptians was ready at hand for Moses, if Moses ever wrote any of the Bible, and that he was acquainted with the story of Horus, standing on his boat of a serpentine form, and killing the serpent with his spear, and with the hidden meaning of these fables, and the real origin. This is also why we find in Leviticus and other parts of his books whole pages of laws identical with those of Manu. The animals shut up in the ark are the human passions. They typify certain ordeals of initiation and the mysteries which were instituted among many nations in commemoration of this allegory. Noah's ark rested on the 17th of the seventh month. Here we have again the number, as also in the clean beasts that he took by sevens into the ark. Speaking of the water mysteries of Byblos, Lucian says, On the top of one of the two pillars which Bacchus set up, a man remains seven days. He supposes this was done to honor Deucalion. Elijah, when praying on top of Mount Carmel, sends his servant to look for a cloud toward the sea and repeats, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time, behold, there arose a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. Noah is a revolutio of Adam, as Moses is a revolutio of Abel and Seth, says the Kabbalah. That is to say, a repetition or another version of the same story. For instance, beginning with Cain, the first murderer, every fifth man in his line of descent is a murderer. Thus there come Enoch, Irad, Mahuel, Methuselah, and the fifth is Lamech, the second murderer, and he is Noah's father. By drawing the five-pointed star of Lucifer, which has its crown point downward, and writing the name of Cain beneath the lowest point, and those of his descendants successively at each of the other points, it will be found that each fifth name, which would be written beneath that of Cain, is that of a murderer. In the Talmud, this genealogy is given complete, and thirteen murderers range themselves in line below the name of Cain. This is no coincidence. Siva is the destroyer, but he is also the regenerator. Cain is a murderer, but he is also the creator of nations and an inventor. This star of Lucifer is the same one that John sees falling down to earth in his apocalypse. In Thebes, or Theba, which means Ark, Th, Abba, being synonymous with Cartha or Tyre, Astu or Athens, and Herbs or Rome, and meaning also the city, are found the same foliations as described on the pillars of the Temple of Solomon. The bicolored leaf of the olive, the three-lobed fig leaf, and the lancelot-shaped laurel leaf had all esoteric as well as popular or vulgar meanings with the ancients. The researches of Egyptologists present another corroboration of the identity of the Bible allegories with those of the lands of the pharaohs and Chaldeans. The dynastic chronology of the Egyptians, recorded by Herodotus, Manetho, Aristophanes, Diodorus, Siculus, and accepted by our antiquarians, divided the period of Egyptian history under four general heads. The dominion of gods, demigods, heroes, and mortal men. By combining the demigods and heroes into one class, Bunsen reduces the periods to three. The ruling gods, the demigods or heroes, sons of gods, but born of mortal mothers, and the manes, who are the ancestors of individual tribes. These subdivisions, as any one may perceive, correspond perfectly with the biblical Elohim, sons of God, giants, and mortal Nokian men. Theodorus of Sicily and Barossus give us the name of the twelve great gods who presided over the twelve months of the year and the twelve signs of the zodiac. 
These names, which include Nua, are too well known to require repetition. The double-faced Janus was also at the head of twelve gods, and in his representations of him, he is made to hold the keys to the celestial domains. All these, having served as models for the biblical patriarchs, have done still further service, especially Janus, by furnishing copy to St. Peter and his twelve apostles. The former, also double-faced in his denial and also represented as holding the keys of paradise. The statement that the story of Noah is but another version in its hidden meaning of the story of Adam and his three sons gathers proof on every page of the book of Genesis. Adam is the prototype of Noah. Adam falls because he eats of the forbidden fruit, of celestial knowledge. Noah because he tastes of the terrestrial fruit, the juice of the grape representing the abuse of knowledge in an unbalanced mind. Adam gets stripped of his spiritual envelope. Noah, of his terrestrial clothing, and the nakedness of both makes them feel ashamed. The wickedness of Cain is repeated in Ham. But the descendants of both are shown as the wisest of races on earth, and they are called on this account snakes and the sons of snakes, meaning the sons of wisdom, and not of Satan, as some divines would be pleased to have the world understand the term. Enmity has been placed between the snake and the woman, only in this mortal phenomenal world of man, as born of woman. Before the carnal fall, the snake was Ophis, the divine wisdom, which needed no matter to procreate men, humanity being utterly spiritual. Hence the war between the snake and the woman, or between spirit and matter. If in its material aspect the old serpent is matter, and represents Ophiomorphos, in its spiritual meaning it becomes Ophis Christos. In the magic of the old Syrio-Chaldeans, both are conjoint in the zodiacal sign of the androgyne, of Virgo Scorpio, and may be divided or separated whenever needed. Thus, as the origin of good and evil, the meaning of the SS and ZZ has always been interchangeable. And if upon some occasions the SS on sigils and talismans are suggestive of serpentine evil influence and denote a design of black magic upon others, The double SS are found on the sacramental cups of the church and mean the presence of the Holy Ghost, or pure wisdom. The Midianites were known as the wise men, or son of snakes, as well as Canaanites and Hamites. And such was the renown of the Midianites that we find Moses, the prophet, led on and inspired by the Lord, humbling himself before Hobab, the son of Ragel, the Midianite, and beseeching him to remain with the people of Israel. Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. Further, when Moses sends spies to search out the land of Canaan, they bring as a proof of the wisdom, Kabbalistically speaking, and goodness of the land, a branch with one cluster of grapes, which they are compelled to bear between two men on a staff. Moreover, they add We saw the children of Anak there. They are the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Anak is Enoch, the patriarch, who dies not, and who is the first professor of the mirific name, according to the Kabbalah and the ritual of Freemasonry. Comparing the biblical patriarchs with the descendants of Veviswada, the Hindu Noah, and the old Sanskrit traditions about the deluge and the Brahmanical Mahabharata, we find them mirrored in the Vedic patriarchs who are the primitive types upon which all the others were modeled. But before comparison is possible, the Hindu myths must be comprehended in their true significance. Each of these mythical personages bears, besides an astronomical significance, a spiritual or moral and an anthropological or physical meaning. The patriarchs are not only humorized gods, the pre-Diluvian answering to the twelve great gods of Barosis and to the ten Prajapati, and the post-Diluvian to the seven gods of the famous tablet in the Ninevin library, but they stand also as the symbols of the Greek aeons, the Kabbalistic Sephiroth, and the zodiacal signs, as types of a series of human races. This variation from 10 to 12 will be accounted for presently and proved on the very authority of the Bible. 
only they are not the first gods described by Cicero, which belong to a hierarchy of higher powers, the Elohim, but appertain rather to the second class of the twelve gods, the De Menores, and who are the terrestrial reflections of the first, among whom Herodotus places Hercules. Alone, out of the group of twelve, Noah, by reason of his position at the transitional point, belongs to the highest Babylonian triad, Noah, the spirit of the waters. The rest are identical with the inferior gods of Assyria and Babylonia, who represented the lower order of emanations, introduced around Bel the Demiurge and help him in his work, as the patriarchs are shown to assist Jehovah, the Lord God. Besides these, many of which were local gods, the protecting deities of rivers and cities, there were the four classes of genius. We see Ezekiel making them support the throne of Jehovah in his vision, a fact which, if it identifies the Jewish Lord God with one of the Babylonian trinity, connects at the same time the present Christian God with the same triad inasmuch as it is these four cherubs, if the reader will remember, on which Arrhenius makes Jesus ride, and which are shown as the companions of the evangelists. The Hindu Kabbalistic derivation of the books of Ezekiel and Revelation are shown in nothing more plainly than in its description of the four beasts, which typify the four elementary kingdoms, earth, air, fire, and water. As is well known, they are the Assyrian sphinxes, but these figures are also carved on the walls of nearly every Hindu pagoda. The author of the Revelation copies faithfully in his text, see chapter 4, verse 7, the Pythagorean pentacle, of which Levi's admirable sketch is reproduced on page 452. The Hindu goddess Adonirai, or as it might be properly written, Adonirai, since the second A is pronounced almost like the English O, is represented as surrounded by the same figures. It fits exactly Ezekiel's wheel of the Adonai, known as the cherub of Jehoshkiel, and indicates beyond question the source from which the Hebrew seer drew his allegories. For convenience of comparison, we have placed the figure in the pentacle, see page 453. Above these beasts were the angels or spirits, divided in two groups, the Ejili, or celestial beings, and the Am Anakai, or terrestrial spirits, the giants, children of Anak, of whom the spies complained to Moses. The Kabbalah Denudata gives to the Kabbalists a very clear, to the profane, a very muddled account of permutations or substitutions of one person for another. So, for instance, it says that the scintilla, spiritual spark or soul, of Abraham was taken from Michael, the chief of the aeons and highest emanation of the deity. So high indeed that in the eyes of the Gnostics, Michael was identical with Christ. And yet Michael and Enoch are one in the same person. Both occupy the junction point of the cross of the zodiac as man. The scintilla of Isaac was that of Gabriel, the chief of the angelic host and the scintilla of Jacob was taken from Uriel, named the fire of God, the sharpest sighted spirit in all heaven. Adam is not the Cadmon, but Adam Primus, the Microprosopus. In one of his aspects, the latter is Enoch, the terrestrial patriarch and father of Methuselah. He that walked with God and did not die is the spiritual Enoch, who typified humanity eternal in spirit and as eternal in flesh. Though the latter does die, death is but a new birth, and spirit is immortal. Thus humanity can never die, for the destroyer has become the creator. Enoch is the type of the dual man, spiritual and terrestrial. Hence his place in the center of the astronomical cross. But was this idea original with the Hebrews? We think not. Every nation which had an astronomical system, and especially India, held the cross in the highest reverence, for it was the geometrical basis of the religious symbolism of their avatars, the manifestation of the deity, or of the creator in his creature, man, of God in humanity, and humanity in God as spirits. The oldest monuments of Chaldea, Persia, and India disclose the double or eight-pointed cross, 
this symbol, which very naturally is found, like every other geometrical figure in nature, in plants, as well as in the snowflakes, has led Dr. Lundy, in his super-Christian mysticism, to name such cruciform flowers as form the eight-pointed star by the junction of the two crosses, the prophetic star of the Incarnation, which joined heaven and earth, God and man together. The latter sentence is perfectly expressed, only the old Kabbalistic axiom, as above, so below, answers still better, as it discloses to us the same God for all humanity, not alone for the handful of Christians. It is the mundane cross of heaven repeated on earth by plants and dual man, the physical man superseding the spiritual at the junction point of which stands the mythical Libra Hermes Enoch. The gesture of one hand pointing to heaven is balanced by the other pointing down to earth. Boundless generations below, boundless regenerations above. The visible, but the manifestation of the invisible. The man of dust abandoned to dust. The man of spirit reborn in spirit. Thus it is finite humanity which is the son of the infinite God. Abba the father, Amoria the mother, the son, the universe. This primitive triad is repeated in all the theogenies, Adam, Cadmon, Hermes, Enoch, Osiris, Krishna, Ormazd, or Christos, are all one. They stand as metatrons between body and soul, eternal spirits which redeem flesh by the regeneration of flesh below, and soul by the regeneration above, where humanity walks once more with God. We have shown elsewhere that the symbol of the cross, or Egyptian Tau, was by many ages earlier than the period assigned to Abraham, the alleged forefather of the Israelites, for otherwise Moses could not have learned it of the priests, and that the Tau was held as sacred by the Jews as by other pagan nations is proved by a fact admitted now by Christian divines as well as by infidel archaeologists. Moses and Exodus... 1222, orders his people to mark their doorposts and lintels with blood, lest the Lord God should make a mistake and smite some of his chosen people, instead of the doomed Egyptians. And this mark is a towel, the identical Egyptian handled cross, with the half of which talisman Horus raised the dead, as is shown on a sculptured ruin at Philae. How gratuitous is the idea that all such crosses and symbols were so many unconscious prophecies of Christ, is fully exemplified in the case of the Jews upon whose accusation Jesus was put to death. For instance, the same learned author remarks in Monumental Christianity that the Jews themselves acknowledged this sign of salvation until they rejected Christ, and in another place he asserts that the rod of Moses— used in his miracles before Pharaoh, was no doubt this Cruxensata, or something like it, also used by the Egyptian priests. Thus, the logical inference would be that, one, if the Jews worshipped the same symbols as the pagans, then they were no better than they, and two, if being so well versed as they were in hidden symbolism of the cross, in the face of their having waited for centuries for the Messiah, they yet rejected both the Christian Messiah and Christian cross, then there must have been something wrong about both. Those who rejected Jesus as the Son of God were neither the people ignorant of religious symbols nor the handful of atheistical Sadducees who put him to death, but the very men who were instructed in the secret wisdom, who knew the origin as well as the meaning of the cruciform symbol and who put aside both the Christian emblem and the Savior suspended from it, because they could not be parties to such a blasphemous imposition upon the common people. Nearly all of the prophecies about Christ are credited to the patriarchs and prophets. If a few of the latter may have existed as real personages, every one of the former is a myth. We will endeavor to prove it by the hidden interpretation of the Zodiac and the relations of its signs to these antediluvian men. If the reader will keep in mind the Hindu ideas of cosmogony, as given in chapter 6, he will better understand the relation between the biblical antediluvian patriarchs and that puzzle of commentators, Ezekiel's wheel. Thus be it remembered 
One, that the universe is not a spontaneous creation, but an evolution from pre-existent matter. Two, that it is only one of an endless series of universes. Three, that eternity is pointed off into grand cycles, in each of which twelve transformations of our world occur, following is partial destruction by fire and water, alternately. So that when a new minor period sets in, the earth is so changed, even geologically, as to be practically a new world. For that of these twelve transformations, the earth after each of the first six is grosser and everything on it, man included, more material than after the preceding one. While after each of the remaining six, the contrary is true, both earth and man growing more and more refined and spiritual with each terrestrial change. 5. That when the apex of the cycle is reached, a gradual dissolution takes place, and every living and objective form is destroyed. But when that point is reached, humanity has become fitted to live subjectively as well as objectively, and not humanity alone, but also animals, plants, and every atom. After a time of rest, say the Buddhists, when a new world becomes self-formed, the astral souls of animals and of all beings, except such as have reached the highest nirvana, will return on earth again to end their cycles of transformations and become men in their turn. This stupendous conception the ancients synthesized for the instruction of the common people into a single pictorial design, the zodiac or celestial belt. Instead of the twelve signs now used, there were originally but ten to the general public, viz. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricornus, Aquarius, and Pisces. These were exoteric. But in addition, there were two mystical signs inserted, which none but initiates comprehended, viz. at the middle, or junction point, where now stands Libra and at this sign now called Scorpio, which follows Virgo. When it was found necessary to make them exoteric, these two secret signs were added under their present appellations as blinds to conceal the true names, which gave the key to the whole secret of creation, and divulged the origin of good and evil. The true Sabean astrological doctrine secretly taught that within this double sign was hidden the explanation of the gradual transformation of the world, from its spiritual and subjective into the two-sexed sublunary state. The twelve signs were therefore divided into two groups. The first six were called the ascending, or the line of macrocosm, the great spiritual world. The last six, the descending line, or the microcosm, the little secondary world, the mere reflection of the former, so to say. This division was called Ezekiel's Wheel and was completed in the following way. First came the ascending five signs, the humorized into patriarchs, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and the group concluded with Virgo, Scorpio. Then came the turning point, Libra, after which the first half of the sign Virgo Scorpio was duplicated and transferred to lead the lower or descending group of microcosm, which ran down to Pisces or Noah, Deluge. To make it clear, the sign Virgo Scorpio, which appeared originally thus, became simply Virgo, and the duplication or Scorpio was placed between Libra, the seventh sign, which is Enoch, or the angel Metatron, or mediator between spirit and matter, or God and man, it now became Scorpio or Cain, which sign or patriarch led mankind to destruction. Lines of Generations Sethite, good principle, 1. Adam, 2. Seth, 3. Enos, 4. Canaan, 5. Mahalalil, 6. Jared, 7. Enoch, 8. Methuselah, 9. Lamech, 10. Noah. Kenite, the evil principle, 1. Adam, 2. Cain, 3. Enoch, 4. Irad, 5. Mahuel, 6. Methusel, 7. Lamech, 8. Jubal, 9. Jabal, 10. Tubal Cain. The above are the ten biblical patriarchs, identical with Hindu Prajapatis and the Sephiroth of the Kabbalah. 
We say ten patriarchs, not twenty, for the Kenite line was devised for no other purpose than, one, to carry out the idea of dualism, on which is founded the philosophy of every religion, for these two genealogical tables represent simply the opposing powers or principles of good and evil, and two, as a blind for the uninitiated masses. Suppose we restore them to their primitive form by erasing these premeditated blinds. These are so transparent as to require but a small amount of perspicacity to select, even though one should use only his unaided judgment, and were not, as we are, enabled to apply the test of the secret doctrine. By ridding ourselves, therefore, of the Kenite names that are mere duplications of the Sethite, or of each other, we get rid of Adam, of Enoch, who in one genealogy is shown the father of Irad, and in the other the son of Jared of Lamech, son of Methusel, whereas he, Lamech, is the son of Methuselah in the Sethite line, of Irad, Jared, Jubal, and Jabal, who with Tubal Cain form a trinity in one, and that one the double of Cain, of Mahuel, who is but Mahalalil, differently spelled, and Methusel, Methuselah, this leaves us in the Canite genealogy of chapter 4. One only, Cain, who the first murderer and fratricide. De Rossi of Parma says of the Masoretes in his Compendus, volume 4, page 7, It is known with what carefulness Esdras, the most excellent critic they have had, had reformed the text and corrected it, and restored it to its primary splendor. Of the many revisions undertaken after him, none are more celebrated than those of the Masoretes, who came after the 6th century, and all the most zealous adorers and defenders of the Mesora, Christians and Jews, ingeniously accorded and confessed that, such as it exists, is deficient, imperfect, interpolated, full of errors, and a most unsafe guide. The square letter was not invented till after the 3rd century is made to stand in this line as father of Enoch, the most virtuous of men, who does not die but is translated alive. Turn we now to the Sethite table, and we find that Enos, or Enoch, comes second from Adam, and is father to Cain then. This is no accident. There was an evident reason for this inversion of paternity, a palpable design, that of creating confusion and baffling inquiry. We say, then, that the patriarchs are simply the signs of the zodiac, emblems in their manifold aspects of the spiritual and physical evolution of human races, of ages, and of divisions of time. In astrology, the first four of the houses in the diagrams of the twelve houses of heaven, namely the first, tenth, seventh, and fourth, or the second inner square placed with its angles upward and downward, are termed angles, as being of the greatest strength and power. They answer to Adam, Noah, Cain, An, and Enoch, Alpha, Omega, evil and good, leading the whole. Furthermore, when divided, including the two secret names, into four trigons or triads, viz. fiery, airy, earthy, and watery, we find the latter corresponding to Noah. Enoch and Lamech were doubled in the table of Cain to fill out the required number ten in both generations. In the Bible, instead of employing the secret name, and in order that the patriarchs should correspond with the ten Kabbalistic Sephiroth, and fit at the same time the ten, and subsequently twelve signs of the Zodiac, in a manner comprehensible only to the Kabbalists. And now Abel, having disappeared out of that line of descent, he is replaced by Seth, who was clearly an afterthought suggested by the necessity of not having the human race descend entirely from a murderer. This dilemma being apparently first noticed when the Canaanite table had been completed, Adam is made, after all the generations had appeared, to beget his son, Seth. It is a suggestive fact that, whereas the double-sexed Adam, of chapter 5, is made in the likeness of the Elohim, see Genesis chapter 1, 27, and version 1 of the same, Seth, version 3, is begotten in Adam's own likeness, thus signifying that there were men of different races. 
Also, it is most noticeable that neither the age nor a single other particular respecting the patriarchs in the Kenite table is given, whereas the reverse is the case with those in the Sethite line. Most assuredly, no one could expect to find, in a work open to the public, the final mysteries of that which was preserved for countless ages as the grandest secret of the sanctuary. But without divulging the key to the profane, or being taxed with undue indiscretion, we may be allowed to lift a corner of the veil which shrouds the majestic doctrines of old. Let us then write down the patriarchs as they ought to stand in their relation to the zodiac, and see how they correspond with the signs. The following diagram represents Ezekiel's wheel, as given in many works, among others in Hargrave Jennings' Rosicrucians. Ezekiel's Wheel, Exoteric There is a diagram of the microcosmos descending with a snake-like line with different numerals and characters, the macrocosmos ascending, the microcosmos descending, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 at the top, and their translation into different characters and symbols, and then 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 at the bottom with 7 in the middle. These signs are, follow numbers, 1 Aries, 2 Taurus, 3 Gemini, 4 Cancer, 5 Leo, 6 Virgo, or the ascending line of the grand cycle of creation. After this comes 7 Libra, man, which though it is found right in the middle or the intersection point leads down the numbers. 8 Scorpio, 9 Sagittarius, 10 Capricornus, 11 Aquarius, and 12 Pisces. While discussing the double sign of Virgo, Scorpio, and Libra, Hargrave Jennings observes, page 65, All this is incomprehensible, except in the strange mysticism of the Gnostics and the Kabbalists. And the whole theory requires a key of explanation to render it intelligible, which key is only darkly referred to as possible but refused absolutely by these extraordinary men, is not permissible to be disclosed. The said key must be turned seven times before the whole system is divulged. We will give it but one term, and thereby allow the profane one glimpse into the mystery. Happy he who understands the whole. Ezekiel's Wheel, Esoteric is the same snake-like line through the middle with a circle around the edge with the constellations or the zodiacal signs around the outside. To explain the presence of Yodiva, or what is generally termed the tetragram, and of Adam and Eve, it will suffice to remind the reader of the following verses in Genesis, with their right meaning inserted in brackets. One and God, Elohim, created man in his, their own image. Male and female created he, them, him. Chapter 127. Two, male and female created he, them, him, and called their, his, name Adam. V2. When the ternary is taken in the beginning of the tetragram, it expresses the divine creation spiritually, i.e., without any carnal sin taken at its opposite, and it expresses the latter, its feminine. The name of Eve is composed of three letters. That of the primitive or heavenly Adam is written with one letter, Yod or Yod. Therefore, it must not be read Jehovah, but Aiva or Eve. The Adam of the first chapter is the spiritual, therefore pure androgyne, Adam Cadmon. When the woman issues from the left rib of the second atom of dust, the pure Virgo is separated and falling into generation, or the downward cycle becomes Scorpio, emblem of sin and matter. While the ascending cycle points at the purely spiritual races, or the ten pre-Diluvian patriarchs, the Prajapatis and Sephiroth, are led on the creative deity itself, who is Adam Kadmon or Yolchiva, the lower one is that of the terrestrial races, led on by Enoch, or Libra, the seventh, who, because he is half divine, half terrestrial, is said to have been taken by God alive. Enoch, or Hermes, or Libra, are one. All are the scales of universal harmony. Justice and equilibrium are placed at the central point of the zodiac. The grand circle of the heavens, so well discoursed upon by Plato and his Timaeus, symbolizes the unknown as a unity, 
and the smaller circles which form the cross, by their division on the plane of the zodiacal ring, typify at the point of their intersection life, the centripetal and centrifugal forces as symbols of good and evil, spirit and matter, life and death, are also those of the creator and the destroyer, Adam and Eve, or God and the devil, as they say in common parlance. In the subjective as well as in the objective worlds, they are the two powers, which through their eternal conflict keep the universe of spirit and matter in harmony. They force the planets to pursue their paths and keep them in their elliptical orbits, thus tracing the astronomical cross and their revolution through the zodiac. In their conflict, the centripetal force, were it to prevail, would drive the planets and living souls into the sun, type of the invisible spiritual sun, the paratma, or great universal soul, their parent, while the centrifugal force would chase both planets and souls into the dreary space, far from the luminary of the objective universe, away from the spiritual realm of salvation and eternal life, and into the chaos of final cosmic destruction and individual annihilation. But the balance is there, ever sensitive at the intersection point. It regulates the action of the two combatants. And the combined effort of both causes planets and living souls to pursue a double diagonal line in their revolution through zodiac and life, and thus preserving strict harmony, invisible and invisible heaven and earth. The forced unity of the two reconciles spirit and matter and Enoch is said to stand a Metatron before God, reckoning from him down to Noah and his three sons. Each of these represent a new world, i.e. our earth, which is the seventh, and after every period of geological transformation, gives birth to another and distinct race of men and beings. Cain leads the ascending line, or macrocosm, for he is the son of the Lord, not of Adam. Genesis 4.1 the Lord is Adam Cadmon, Cain, the son of sinful thought, not the progeny of flesh and blood. Seth, on the other hand, is the leader of the races of earth, for he is the son of Adam, and begotten in his own likeness after his image. Genesis 5.3 Cain is Canu, a Syrian, and means eldest, while the Hebrew word means a smith, an artificer. Our science shows that the globe has passed through five distinct geological phases each characterized by a different stratum, and these are in reverse order, beginning with the last. One, the quaternary period, in which man appears as a certainty. Two, the tertiary period, in which he may have appeared. Three, secondary period, that of gigantic saurians, the megalosaurus, ichalosaurus, and plesiosaurus, no vestige of man. Four, the paleozoic period, that of gigantic crustacea. 5. Or first, the Azoic period, during which science asserts organic life had not yet appeared. And is there no possibility that there was a period and several periods when man existed and yet was not an organic being, therefore could not have left any vestige of himself for exact science? Spirit leaves no skeletons or fossils behind, and yet few are the men of earth who doubt that man can live both objectively and subjectively. At all events, the theology of the Brahmins, hoary with antiquity, and which divides the formative periods of the earth into four ages, and places between each of these a lapse of 1,728,000 years, far more agrees with official science and modern discovery than the absurd chronology notions promulgated by the councils of Nice and Trent. The names of the patriarchs were not Hebrew. Though they may have been Hebraized later, they are evidently of Assyrian or Aryan origin. Thus Adam, for instance, stands in the explained Kabbalah as a convertible term and applies nearly to every other patriarch, as every Sephiroth to each Sephirah, and vice versa. Adam, Cain, and Abel form the first triad of the twelve. They correspond in the Sephiral tree to the crown, wisdom, and intelligence, and in astrology to the three trigons, the fiery, the earthy, and the airy, which fact we are allowed to devote more space than we have to its elucidation, would perhaps show that astrology deserves the name of science as well as any other. 
Adam, Kadmon, or Ares, ram, is identical with the Egyptian ram. Headed god Amon, fabricated man on the potter's wheel. His duplication, therefore, or the Adam of dust, is also Ares, Amon, when standing at the head of his generations. For he fabricates mortals also in his own likeness. In astrology, the planet Jupiter is connected with the first house, Ares. The color of Jupiter, as seen in the stages of the seven spheres, on the lower, of Borsipa, or Beers Nimrud, was red, and in Hebrew Adam means red as well as man. The Hindu god Agni, who presides at the sign of Pisces, next to that of Aries in their relation to the twelve months, February and March, is painted of a deep red color with two faces, male and female three legs and seven arms, the whole forming the number twelve. So also Noah, Pisces, who appears in the generations as the twelfth patriarch. Counting Cain and Abel is Adam again under another name, for he is the forefather of a new race of mankind. And with his three sons, one bad, one good, and one partaking of both qualities, is the terrestrial reflection of the superterrestrial Adam and his three sons. Agni is represented mounted on a ram, with a tiara surmounted by a cross. Cain, presiding over the Taurus, bull of the zodiac, is also very suggestive. Taurus belongs to the earthly trigon, and in connection with this sign, it will not be amiss to remind the student of an allegory from the Persian Avesta. The story goes that Ormazd produced a being, source and type of all the universal beings, called life, or bull in the Zend. Araman, Cain, kills this being, Abel, from the seed of which Seth, new beings, are produced. Abel, in Assyrian, means son, but in Hebrew it means something ephemeral, not long-lived, valueless, and also a pagan idol, as Cain means a Hermaic statue, a pillar, the symbol of generation. Likewise, Abel is the female counterpart of Cain, male, for they are twins and probably androgynous, the latter answering to wisdom, the former to intelligence. So with all other patriarchs, Enos is homo again, a man or the same Adam, and Enoch in the bargain, and Canaan is identical with Cain. Seth is Teth or Thoth or Hermes, and this is the reason, no doubt, why Josephus in his first book, chapter 3, shows Seth so proficient in astrology, geometry, and other occult sciences. Foreseeing the flood, he says, he engraved the fundamental principles of his art on two pillars of brick and stone, the latter of which he saw himself, Josephus, to remain in Syria in his own time. Thus it is that Seth is identified also with Enoch, to whom Kabbalists and Masons attribute the same feat, and at the same time with Hermes or Cadmus again. For Enoch is identical with the former. Henoch means a teacher, an initiator, or an initiate in Grecian mythology, Anakas. We have seen the part he has made to play in the zodiac. Mahalil, if we divide the word and write Mahala, means tender, merciful, and therefore is he made to correspond with the fourth Sephira, love or mercy, emanated from the first triad. Irad, or Yerid, is, minus the vowels, precisely the same. If from the verb it means descent, if from Arad it means offspring, and thus corresponds perfectly with the Kabbalistic emanations. Lamech is not Hebrew but Greek. Lam Ak means Lamb, the father, and Ulam Ak is the father of the age, or the father of him. Noah, who inaugurates a new era or period of creation after the praleia of the deluge. Noah, being the symbol of a new world, the kingdom, Malkuth, of the Sephiroth, hence his father, corresponding to the ninth Sephiroth, is the foundation. Furthermore, both father and son answer to Aquarius and Pisces in the zodiac, and thus the former belonging to the airy and the latter to the watery trigons. They close the list of the biblical myths. But if, as we see, every patriarch represents, in one sense, like each of the Prajapatis, a new race of antediluvian human beings, and if, as it may as easily be proved, 
They are the copies of the Babylonian Saros, or ages, the latter themselves copies of the Hindu Ten Dynasties of the Lords of Beings. Yet, however we may regard them, they are among the profoundest allegories ever conceived by philosophical minds. In the Nuktamaron, the evolution of the universe and its successive periods of formation, together with the gradual development of the human races, are illustrated as fully as possible in the twelve hours into which the allegory is divided. Each hour typifies the evolution of a new man, and in its turn is divided into four quarters or ages. This work shows how thoroughly was the ancient philosophy imbued with the doctrines of the early Aryans who were the first to divide the life on our planet into four ages. If one would trace this doctrine from its source in the night of the traditional period down to the seer of Patmos, we need not go astray among the religious systems of all nations. The Babylonians he would find teaching that in four different periods four Oanes, or sons, appeared. The Hindus asserting their four yuga, the Greeks, Romans, and others firmly believing in the golden, silver, brazen, and iron ages, each of the epochs being heralded by the appearance of a savior. The four Buddhas of the Hindus and the three prophets of the Zoroastrians, Oshadar Kami, Oshadarma, and Sosayosh, preceded by Zarathustra, are the types of these ages. In the Bible, the very opening tells us that before the sons of God saw the daughters of men, the latter lived from 365 to 969 years. But when the Lord God saw the iniquities of mankind, he concluded to allow them at most 120 years of life. Genesis 6.3 To account for such a violent oscillation in the human mortality table is only possible by tracing this decision of the Lord God to its origin. Such incongruities, as we meet at every step in the Bible, can only be attributed to the facts that the book of Genesis and the other books of Moses were tampered with and remodeled by more than one author, and that in their original state they were, with the exception of the external form of the allegories, faithful copies from the Hindu sacred books. In Manu, book one, we find the following. In the first age, neither sickness nor suffering were known. Men lived four centuries. This was in the Krita, or Satya Yug. The Krita Yug is the type of justice. The bull, which stands firm on its four legs, is its image. Man adheres to truth, and evil does not as yet direct his actions. But in each of the following ages, primitive human life loses one-fourth of its duration. That is to say, in Treta Yug, man lives 300, in Dwarpa Yug, 200, and in Kali Yug, or our own age, but 100 years generally at the most. Noah, son of Lamech, Ulam Ak, or father of the age, is the distorted copy of Manu, son of Swayambhu. And the six Manus or Rishis issued from the Hindu first man are the originals of Tara, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Moses, the Hebrew sages, who, beginning with the Tara, were all alleged to have been astrologers, alchemists, inspired prophets, and soothsayers, or in more profane but plainer language, magicians. If we consult the Talmudistic Mishnah, we find therein the first emanated divine couple, the androgyne demiurge Chokma, or Hakma, Akamoth, and Bina building themselves a house with seven pillars. They are the architects of God, wisdom and intelligence, and his compass and square. The seven columns are the future seven worlds, or the typical seven primordial days of creation. Chokma immolates her victims. These victims are the numberless forces of nature which must die, expend themselves, in order that they should live. When one force dies out, it is but to give birth to another force, its progeny. It dies but lives in its children, and resuscitates at every seventh generation. The servants of Chokma, or wisdom, are the souls of H. Adam, for in him are all the souls of Israel. There are twelve hours in the day, says the Mishnah, and it is during these hours that is accomplished the creation of man.
Would this be comprehensible unless we had Manu to teach us that this day embraces the four ages of the world and has a duration of 12,000 divine years of the devas? The creators, Elohim, outline in the second hour the shape of a more corporeal form of man. They separate it into two and prepare the sexes to become distinct from each other. Such is the way that Elohim proceeded in reference to every created thing. Every fish, fowl, plant, beast, and man was androgyne at the first hour. Says the commentator, the great Rabbi Simeon, O companions, companions, man as emanation was both man and woman as well as on the side of the father, as on the side of the mother. And this is the sense of the words, and Elohim spoke, Let there be light, and it was light, and this is the twofold man. The spiritual woman was necessary as a contrast for the spiritual man. Harmony is the universal law. In Taylor's translation, Plato's discourse upon creation is rendered so as to make him say, Of this universe, that he was caused it to move with a circular motion. When therefore that God who is perpetually reasoning divinity cogitated about that God, man, who was destined to subsist at some certain period of time, he produced his body smooth and even in every way and whole from the center and made it perfect. This perfect circle of the created God he decussitated in the form of the letter X. The italics of both these sentences from Timaeus belong to Dr. Lundy, the author of that remarkable work mentioned once before, Monumental Christianity. And attention is drawn to the words of the Greek philosopher, with the evident purpose of giving them the prophetic character which Justin Martyr applied to the same. When accusing Plato of having borrowed his physiological discussion in the Timaeus concerning the Son of God placed crosswise in the universe, from Moses and his serpent of brass. The learned author seems to fully accord an unpremeditated prophecy to these words. Although he does not tell us whether he believes that like Plato's created God, Jesus was originally a sphere, smooth and even, and every way even and whole from the center, even if Justin Martyr were excusable for his perversion of Plato, Dr. Lundy ought to know that the day for that sort of casistry is long gone by. What the philosopher meant was man, who before being encased in matter had no use for limbs, but was a pure spiritual entity. Hence, if the deity and his universe and the stellar bodies are to be conceived as spheroidal, this shape would be archetypal man's, and his enveloping shell grew heavier. There came the necessity for limbs, and the limbs sprouted. If we fancy a man with arms and legs naturally extended at the same angle, by backing him against the circle that symbolizes his prior shape as a spirit, we would have the very figure described by Plato, the X cross within the circle. All the legends of the creation, the fall of man, and the resultant deluge belong to universal history and are no more the property of the Israelites than that of any other nation. What specially belongs to them, Kabbalists accepted, are the disfigured details of every tradition. The Genesis of Enoch is by far anterior to the books of Moses, and Guliam Postel has presented it to the world, explaining the allegories as far as he dared. But the groundwork is still unexposed. For the Jews, the book of Enoch is as canonical as the Mosaic books. And if the Christians accepted the latter as an authority, we do not see why they should reject the former as an apocrypha. No more can the age of one than that of the other be determined with anything like certainty. At the time of the separation, the Samaritans recognized only the books of Moses and that of Joshua, says Dr. Jost. In 168 BC, Jerusalem had its temple plundered, and all the sacred books were destroyed. Therefore, the few MSS that remained were to be found only among the teachers of tradition. The Kabbalistic Tanaim and their initiates and prophets had always practiced its teachings in common with the Canaanites, the Hamites, and Midianites, Chaldeans, and all other nations. The story of Daniel is a proof of it. There was a sort of brotherhood or Freemasonry among the Kabbalists scattered all over the world, since the memory of man, 
and like some societies of the medieval masonry of Europe, they called themselves companions and innocents. It is a belief founded on knowledge among the Kabbalists that no more than the hermetic rolls are the genuine sacred books of the 72 elders, books which contain the ancient word lost, but that they have been preserved from the remotest times among secret communities. Emanuel Swedenborg says as much, and his words are based, he says, on the information he had from certain spirits who assured him that they performed their worship according to this ancient word. Seek for it in China, adds the great seer. Peri adventure, you may find it in great Tartary. Other students of occult sciences have had more than the word of certain spirits to rely upon in this special case. They have seen the books. We must choose, therefore, perforce between two methods, either to accept the Bible exoterically or esoterically. Against the former, we have the following facts. That after the first copy of the Book of God has been edited and launched on the world by Hilkiah, this copy disappears, and Ezra has to make a new Bible, which Judas Maccabeus finishes. That when it was copied from the horned letters into square letters, it was corrupted beyond recognition. That the Masora completed the work of the destruction. That finally we have a text not 900 years old, abounding with omissions, interpolations, and premeditated perversions. And that consequently, as this Masoretic Hebrew text has fossilized its mistakes, and the key to the world of God is lost, no one has a right to enforce upon so-called Christians the divagations of a series of hallucinated and perhaps spurious prophets under the unwarranted and untenable assumption that the author of it was the Holy Ghost in propria personae. Hence, we reject this pretended monotheistic scripture, made up just when the priests of Jerusalem found their political prophet in violently breaking off all connection with the Gentiles. It is at this moment only that we find them persecuting Kabbalists and banning the old wisdom of both pagans and Jews. The real Hebrew Bible was a secret volume, unknown to the masses, and even the Samaritan Pentateuch was far more ancient than the Septuagint. As for the former, the fathers of the church never even heard of it. We prefer decidedly to take the word of Swedenborg that the ancient word is somewhere in China or Great Tartary. The more so as the Swedish seer is declared at least by one clergyman named the Reverend Dr. R. L. Taffel of London, to have been in a state of inspiration from God while writing his theological works. He has given even the superiority over the penmen of the Bible, for while the latter had the words spoken to them in their ears, Swedenborg was made to understand them rationally and was therefore internally and not externally illuminated. When, says the reverend author, a conscientious member of the new church hears any charges made against the divinity and the infallibility of either the soul or the body of the doctrines of the new Jerusalem, he must at once place himself on the unequivocal declaration made in those doctrines that the Lord has effected his second coming in and by means of those writings which were published by Emanuel Swedenborg as his servant, and that Therefore, those charges are not and cannot be true. And if it is the Lord that spoke through Swedenborg, then there is a hope for us that at least one divine will corroborate our assertions. That the ancient word of God is nowhere but in the heathen countries, especially Buddhistic Tartary, Tibet, and China. The primitive history of Greece is the primitive history of India, exclaims Pocock in his India in Greece. In view of subsequent fruits of critical research, we may paraphrase the sentence and say, the primitive history of Judea is a distortion of Indian fable engrafted on that of Egypt. Many scientists encountering stubborn facts and being reluctant to contrast the narratives of the divine revelation with those of the Brahmanical books merely present them to the reading public. Meanwhile, they limit their conclusions to criticisms and contradictions of each other. So Max Muller opposes the theories of Spiegel, and someone else, and Professor Whitley, those of the Oxford Orientalists, and Dr. Haug, made onslaughts on Spiegel, while Dr. Spiegel chose some other victim, 
And now even the time-honored Akkadians and Turanians have had their day of glory. The Proto-Kazdians, Kazdio-Siths, Sumerians, and whatnot have to make room for some other fictions. Alas, for the Akkads, Halevi, the Assyriologist, attacks the Akkado-Sumerian language of Old Babylon and Chabas. The Egyptologist, not content with dethroning the Turanian speech, which has rendered such eminent services to Orientalists when perplexed, calls the venerable parent of the Akkadians, Francois Lenormand, himself a charlatan. Profiting by the learned turmoil, the Christian clergy take heart for their fantastic theology, on the ground that when the jury disagree, there is a gain of time at least for the indicted party. And thus is overlooked the vital question whether Christendom would not be better for adopting Christism in place of Christianity, with its Bible, its vicarious atonement, and its devil. But to so important a personage as the latter, we cannot do less than devote a special chapter. Chapter 10 Get thee behind me, Satan, Jesus to Peter, Matt, 16.23 Such a deal of skimble-scamble stuff as puts me from my faith. I'll tell you what, he held me last night, at least nine hours, in reckoning up the several devil's names. King Henry IV, Part 1, Act 3 Bad as he is, the devil may be abused, be farsely charged and cautiously accused, when men, unwilling to be blamed alone, shift off those crimes on him which are their own. Defoe, 1726. Several years ago, a distinguished writer and persecuted Kabbalist suggested a creed for the Protestant and Roman Catholic bodies, which may be thus formulated. Protevangelium. I believe in the devil, the father almighty of evil, the destroyer of all things, perturbator of heaven and earth, and an antichrist, his only son, our persecutor, who was conceived of the evil spirit, born of a sacrilegious, foolish virgin, was glorified by mankind, reigned over them, and ascended to the throne of almighty God, from which he crowds him aside, and from which he insults the living and the dead. I believe in the spirit of evil, the synagogue of Satan, the coalition of the wicked, the perdition of the body, and the death and hell everlasting. Amen. Does this offend? Does it seem extravagant, cruel, blasphemous? Listen, in the city of New York, on the ninth day of April 1877, that is to say, in the last quarter of what is proudly styled the century of discovery and the age of illumination, the following scandalous ideas were broached. We quote from the report in the sun of the following morning. The Baptist preachers met yesterday in the Mariner's Chapel in Oliver Street. Several foreign missionaries were present. The Reverend John W. Sorrells of Brooklyn read an essay in which he maintained the proposition that all adult heathen, dying without the knowledge of the gospel, are damned eternally. Otherwise, the reverend essayist argued, the gospel is a curse instead of a blessing. The men who crucified Christ served him right, and the whole structure of revealed religion tumbles to the ground. Brother Stoddard, a missionary from India, endorsed the views of the Brooklyn pastor. The Hindus were great sinners. One day after he had preached in the marketplace, a Brahmin got up and said, We Hindus beat the world in lying, but this man beats us. How can he say that God loves us? Look at the poisonous serpents, tigers, lions, and all kinds of dangerous animals around us. If God loves us, why doesn't he take them away? The Reverend Mr. Pixley of Hamilton, New York, heartily subscribed to the doctrine of Brother Sorrels' essay and asked for $5,000 to fit out young men for the ministry. And these men, we will not say teach the doctrine of Jesus, for that would be to insult his memory but are paid to teach his doctrine. Can we wonder that intelligent persons prefer annihilation to a faith encumbered by a, such a monstrous doctrine? We doubt whether any respectable Brahmin would have confessed to the vice of lying, an art cultivated only in those portions of British India, where the most Christians are found. 
But we challenge any honest man in the wide world to say whether he thinks the Brahmin was far from the truth in saying of the missionary's daughter, This man beats us all in lying. What else would he say, if the latter preached to them the doctrine of eternal damnation? Because, indeed, they had passed their lives without reading a Jewish book of which they never heard, or asked salvation of a Christ whose existence they never suspected. But Baptist clergymen who need a few thousand dollars must devise terrifying sensations to fire the congregational heart. We abstain as a rule from giving our own experience when we can call acceptable witnesses, and so upon reading missionary Stoddard's outrageous remarks, we requested our acquaintance, Mr. William L. D. O'Grady, to give a fair opinion upon the missionaries. This gentleman's father and grandfather were British Army officers, and he himself was born in India, and enjoyed lifelong opportunities to learn what the general opinion among the English is of these religious propagandists. Following is his communication in reply to our letter. You ask me for my opinion of the Christian missionaries in India. In all the years I spent there, I never spoke to a single missionary. They were not in society, and from what I heard of their proceedings and could see for myself, I don't wonder at it. Their influence on the natives is bad. Their converts are worthless, and as a rule, of the lowest class. Nor do they improve by conversion. No respectable family will employ Christian servants. They lie, they steal, they are unclean, and dirt is certainly not a Hindu vice. They drink, and no decent native of any other belief ever touches intoxicating liquor. They are outcasts from their own people and utterly despicable. Their new teachers set them a poor example of consistency. While holding forth to the pariah that God makes no distinction of persons, they boast intolerably over the stray Brahmins, who, very much off-color, occasionally, at long intervals, fall into the clutches of these hypocrites. The missionaries get very small salaries, as publicly stated in the proceedings of the societies that employ them but in some unaccountable way managed to live as well as officials with ten times their income. When they come home to recover their health, shattered, as they say, by their arduous labors, which they seem to be able to afford to do quite frequently, when supposed richer people cannot, they tell childish stories on platforms, exhibit idols as procured with infinite difficulty, which is quite absurd, and give an account of their imaginary hardships, which is perfectly harrowing but untrue from beginning to end. I lived some years in India myself, and nearly all my blood relations have passed or will pass the best years of their life there. I know hundreds of British officials, and I never heard from one of them a single word in favor of the missionaries. Natives of any position look on them with the supremest contempt, although suffering chronic exasperation from their arrogant aggressiveness. And the British government, which continues endowments to pagodas, granted by the East India Company, and which supports unsectarian education, gives them no countenance whatever. Protected from personal violence, they yelp and bark at natives and Europeans alike, after the fashion of ill-conditioned curs. Often recruited from the poorest specimens of theological fanaticism, they are regarded on all sides as mischievous. Their rabid, reckless, vulgar, and offensive propagandism caused the Great Mutiny of 1857. They are noisome humbugs. W. M. L. D. O'Grady, New York, June 12, 1877. The new creed, therefore, with which we open this chapter, coarse as it may sound, embodies the very essence of the belief of the Church as inculcated by her missionaries. It is regarded as less impious, less infidel, to doubt the personal existence of the Holy Ghost, or the equal Godhead of Jesus, than to question the personality of the devil. But a summary of Koheleth is well nigh forgotten. Whoever quotes the golden words of the prophet Micah, or seems to care for the exposition of the law as given by Jesus himself. The bull's eye in the target of modern Christianity is the simple phrase to fear the devil. The Catholic clergy and some of the lay champions of the Roman Church fight still more for the existence of Satan and his imps. If de Mousseau maintains the objective reality of spiritual phenomena with such an unrelenting ardor, it is because, in his opinion, the latter are the most direct evidence of the devil at work. The Chevalier is more Catholic than the Pope, 
and his logic and deductions from never-to-be and non-established premises are unique, and prove once more that the creed offered by us is one which expresses the Catholic belief most eloquently. If magic and spiritualism, he says, were both but chimeras, we would have to bid an eternal farewell to all the rebellious angels, now troubling the world. For thus we would have no more demons down here, and if we lost our demons, we would lose our Savior likewise. For from whom did that Savior come to save us? And then there would be no more Redeemer. For from whom or what could that Redeemer redeem us? Hence there would be no more Christianity. O Holy Father of evil, sainted Satan, we pray thee do not abandon such pious Christians as the Chevalier du Mousseau and some Baptist clergymen. For our part, we would rather remember the wise words of J. C. Colcaun, who says that those persons who in modern times adopt the doctrine of the devil— in its strictly literal and personal application, do not appear to be aware that they are in reality polytheists, heathens, idolaters. Seeking supremacy and everything over the ancient creeds, the Christians claim the discovery of the devil officially recognized by the Church. Jesus was the first to use the word legion when speaking of them, and is on this ground that M. de Mousseau thus defends his position in one of his demonological works. Later, he says, when the synagogue expired, depositing its inheritance in the hands of Christ, were born into the world and shown the fathers of the church, who have been accused by certain persons of a rare and precious ignorance of having borrowed their ideas as to the spirits of darkness from the theurgists. Three deliberate, palpable, and easily refuted errors, not to use a harsher word, occur in these few lines. In the first place, the synagogue, far from having expired, is flourishing at the present day in nearly every town of Europe, America, and Asia. And of all the churches in Christian cities, it is the most firmly established as well as the best behaved. Further, while no one will deny that many Christian fathers were born into the world, always, of course, excepting the twelve fictitious bishops of Rome who were never born at all. Every person who will make the trouble to read the works of the Platonists of the old academy, who were theurgists before Amblichus, will recognize therein the origin of Christian demonology as well as the angelology, the allegorical meaning of which was completely distorted by the fathers. Then it could be hardly admitted that the fathers ever shone, except perhaps in the refulgence of their extreme ignorance. The Reverend Dr. Shuckford, who passed the better of his life trying to reconcile their contradictions and absurdities, was finally driven to abandon the whole thing in despair. The ignorance of the champions of Plato must indeed appear rare and precious by comparison with the fathomless profundity of Augustine, the giant of learning and erudition, who scouted the sphericity of the earth. For if true, it would prevent the Antipodes from seeing the Lord Christ when he descended from heaven at the second advent. Or of Lactantius, who rejects with pious horror Pliny's identical theory, on the remarkable ground that it would make the trees at the other side of the earth grow, and the men walk with their heads downwards. Or again, of Cosmas in Cadoplistes, whose orthodox system of geography is embalmed in his Christian topography. Or finally, of Bidi, who assures the world that the heaven is tempered with glacial waters, lest it should be set on fire, a benign dispensation of providence most likely to prevent the radiance of their learning from setting the sky ablaze. Be this as it may, these resplendent fathers certainly did borrow their notions of the spirits of darkness from the Jewish Kabbalists and pagan theurgists, with the difference, however, that they disfigured and outdid in absurdity all that the wildest fancy of the Hindu, Greek, and Roman rabble had ever created. There is not a dev in the Persian pandemonium half so preposterous as a conception as de Mousseau's incubus revamped from Augustine. Typhon, symbolized as an ass, appears a philosopher in comparison with the devil caught by the Normandy peasant in a keyhole, and is certainly not Araman or the Hindu Vricha, 
who would run away in rage and dismay when addressed as Saint Satan by a native Luther. The devil is the patron genius of theological Christianity. So holy and reverend is his name in modern conception, that it may not, except occasionally from the pulpit, be uttered in ears polite. In like manner, anciently, it was not lawful to speak the sacred names or repeat the jargon of the mysteries, except in the sacred cloister. We hardly know the names of the Samothracian gods, but cannot tell precisely the number of the Kabiri. The Egyptians considered it blasphemous to utter the title of the gods of their secret rites. Even now, the Brahmin only pronounces the syllable Om in silent thought, and the rabbi the ineffable name. Hence, we who exercise no such veneration have been led into the blunders of miscalling the names of Hesiris and Yava by the mispronunciations, Osiris and Jehovah. The similar glamour bids fair, it will be perceived, to gather round the designation of the dark personage of whom we are treating. And in the familiar handling, we shall be very likely to shock the peculiar sensibilities of many who will consider a free mentioning of the devil's names as blasphemy, the sins of sins that hath never forgiveness. Several years ago, an acquaintance of the author wrote a newspaper article to demonstrate that the Diabolos, or Satan, of the New Testament denoted the personification of an abstract idea, and not a personal being. He was answered by a clergyman, who concluded the reply with the depreciatory expression, I fear that he has denied his Savior. In his rejoinder, he pleaded, Oh no, we only denied the devil. But the clergyman failed to perceive the difference. In his conception of the matter, the denying of the personal objective existence of the devil was itself the sin against the Holy Ghost. This necessary evil, dignified by the epithet of father of lies, was, according to the clergy, the founder of all the world religions of ancient time, and of the heresies, or rather heterodoxies, of later periods, as well as the deus ex machina of modern spiritualism. In the exceptions which we take to this notion, we protest that we do not attack true religion or sincere piety. We are only carrying on a controversy with human dogmas. Perhaps in doing this we resemble Don Quixote, because these things are only windmills. Nevertheless, let it be remembered that they have been the occasion and pretext for the slaughtering of more than 50 million of human beings, since the words were proclaimed, Love your enemies. It is a late day for us to expect the Christian clergy to undo and amend their work. They have too much at stake. If the Christian church should abandon or even modify the dogma of an anthropomorphic devil, it would be like pulling the bottom card from under a castle of cards. The structure would fall. The clergyman to whom we have alluded perceived that upon the relinquishing of Satan as a personal devil, the dogma of Jesus Christ as the second deity in their trinity must go over in the same catastrophe. Incredible, or even horrifying as it may seem, the Roman Church bases its doctrine of the Godhood of Christ entirely upon the Satanism of the fallen archangel. We have the testimony of Father Ventura, who proclaims the vital importance of this dogma to the Catholics. The Reverend Father Ventura, the illustrious ex-general of the Theatins, certifies that the Chevalier de Mousseau, by his treatise, Mors et Pratique des Demons, has deserved well of mankind and still more of the most holy Catholic and apostolic church. With this voucher, the noble Chevalier, it will be perceived, speaks as one having authority. He asserts explicitly that to the devil and his angels we are absolutely indebted for our Savior, and that but for them we would have no Redeemer, no Christianity. Many zealous and earnest souls have revolted at the monstrous dogma of John Calvin, the Pope Kin of Geneva that sin is the necessary cause of the greatest good. It was bolstered up, nevertheless, by logic like that of de Mousseau, and illustrated by the same dogmas. The execution of Jesus, the God-man on the cross, was the most prodigious crime in the universe, yet it was necessary that mankind, those predestined to everlasting life, might be saved. 
De Aubigny cites the quotation by Martin Luther from the canon and makes him exclaim in ecstatic rapture, O bieta culpa, quitalem meristi redemptorum, O blessed sin which didst merit such a redeemer. We now perceive that the dogma which has appeared so monstrous is after all the doctrine of Pope Calvin and Luther alike, that the three are one. Mohammed and his disciples, who held Jesus in great respect as a prophet, remarks Eliphas Levi, used to utter when speaking of Christians the following remarkable words. Jesus of Nazareth was verily a true prophet of Allah and a grand man. But lo, his disciples all went insane one day and made a god of him. Max Muller kindly adds, It was a mistake of the early fathers to treat the heathen gods as demons or evil spirits, and we must take care not to commit the same error with regard to the Hindu gods. But we have Satan presented to us as the prop and mainstay of sacerdotism, an atlas holding the Christian heaven and cosmos upon his shoulders. If he falls then, in their conception, all is lost and chaos must come again. This dogma of the devil and redemption seems to be based upon two passages in the New Testament. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And there was this war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Let us then explore the ancient theogenies in order to ascertain what was meant by these remarkable expressions. The first inquiry is whether the term devil, as here used, actually represents the malignant deity of the Christians, or an antagonistic blind force, the dark side of nature. By the latter, we are not to understand the manifestation of any evil principle that is malum in se, but only the shadow of the light, so to say. The theories of the Kabbalists treat it as a force which is antagonistic, but at the same time essential to the vitality, evolving, and vigor of the good principle. Plants would perish in their first stage of existence if they were kept exposed to a constant sunlight. The night, alternating with the day, is essential for their healthy growth and development. Goodness, likewise, would speedily cease to be such, were it not alternated by its opposite. In human nature, evil denotes the antagonism of matter to the spiritual, and each is accordingly purified thereby. In the cosmos, the equilibrium must be preserved. The operation of the two contraries produce harmony, like the centripetal and centrifugal forces, and are necessary to each other. If one is arrested, the action of the other will immediately become destructive. This personification, denominated Satan, is to be contemplated from three different planes the Old Testament, the Christian Fathers, and the ancient Gentile Altitude. He is supposed to have been represented by the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Nevertheless, the epithet of Satan is nowhere in the Hebrew sacred writings, applied to that or any other variety of Ophidian. The brazen serpent of Moses was worshipped by the Israelites as a god, being the symbol of Esmund Asclepius, the Phoenician Io. Indeed, the character of Satan himself is introduced in the first book of Chronicles, in the act of instigating King David to number the Israelitish people, an act elsewhere declared specifically to have been moved by Jehovah himself. The inference is unavoidable that the two, Satan and Jehovah, were regarded as identical. Another mention of Satan is found in the prophecies of Zechariah. This book was written at a period subsequent to the Jewish colonization of Palestine, and hence the Assyrians may fairly be supposed to have brought the personification thither from the east. It is well known that this body of sectaries were deeply imbued with the Mazdean notions, and that they represented Araman, or Anramanyas, by the god names of Syria, Set or Sat An, the god of the Hittites, and Hyksos, and Beelzebub, the oracle god, afterward the Grecian Apollo. The prophet began his labors in Judea in the second year of Darius, Hystasipes, the restorer of the Mazdean worship, 
He thus describes the encounter with Satan. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to be his adversary. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? We apprehend that this passage which we have quoted is symbolical. There are two allusions in the New Testament that indicate that it was so regarded. The Catholic Epistle of Jude refers to it in this peculiar language. Yet Michael the archangel, which contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, did not venture to utter to him a reviling judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. The archangel Michael is thus mentioned as identical with the Lord, or angel of the Lord, of the preceding quotation, and thus is shown that the Hebrew Jehovah had a twofold character, the secret and that manifested as the angel of the Lord, or Michael the archangel. A comparison between these two passages renders it plain that the body of Moses over which they contended was Palestine, which as the land of the Hittites was the peculiar domain of Seth their tutelar god. Michael, as the champion of the Jehovah worship, contended with the devil or adversary, but left judgment to his superior. Belial is not entitled to the distinction of either god or devil. The term Belial is defined in the Hebrew lexicons to mean a destroying, waste, uselessness, or the phrase Es Belial or Belial man signifies a wasteful, useless man. If Belial must be personified to please our religious friends, we would be obliged to make him perfectly distinct from Satan and to consider him as a sort of spiritual diaka. The demonographers, however, who enumerate nine distinct orders of demonia, make him chief of the third class, a set of hobgoblins, mischievous and good for nothing. Asmodeus is no Jewish spirit at all, his origin being purely Persia. Briel, the author of Hercule et Cacus, show that he is the Parsi Eshemdev or Ashmedev, the evil spirit of concupiscence, whom Max Muller tells us is mentioned several times in the Avesta as one of the devs, originally gods who became evil spirits. In the same far guard as the Vendadad, the Brahmin divinities are involved in the same denunciation with Ashmadeva, I combat India, I combat Saru, I combat, page 483, the Deva Noanahati. The Ananator explains them to be the Vedic gods Indus, Gorya, or Siva, and the two Aswins. There must be some mistake, however, for Siva at the time of the Vedas were completed, was an aboriginal or Ethiopian god, the Bala or Bel of Western Asia. He was not an Aryan or Vedic deity. Perhaps Surya was the divinity intended. Samael is Satan, but Brian and a good many other authorities show it to be the name of the Simuan the wind of the desert, and the Samuan is called Atabul Os or Diablos. Plutarch remarks that by Typhon was understood anything violent, unruly, and disorderly. The overflowing of the Nile was called by the Egyptians Typhon. Lower Egypt is very flat, and any mounds built along the river to prevent the frequent inundations were called Typhonian or Taphos, hence the origin of Typhon. Plutarch, who was a rigid Orthodox Greek and never known to much compliment the Egyptians, testifies in his Isis and Osiris to the fact that, far from worshipping the devil, of which Christians accuse them, they despised more than they dreaded Typhon. In his symbol of the opposing, obstinate power of nature, they believed him to be a poor, struggling, half-dead divinity. Thus, even at that remote age, we see the ancients already too enlightened to believe in a personal devil. As Typhon was represented in one of his symbols under the figure of an ass at the festival of the sun's sacrifices, the Egyptian priests exhorted the faithful worshippers not to carry gold ornaments upon their bodies for fear of giving food to the ass. Three and a half centuries before Christ, Plato expressed his opinion of evil by saying, there is in matter a blind, refractory force, 
which resists the will of the great artificer. This blind force under Christian influx was made to see and become responsible. It was transformed into Satan. His identity with Typhon can scarcely be doubted upon reading the account in Job of his appearance with the sons of God before the Lord. He accuses Job of a readiness to curse the Lord to his face upon sufficient provocation. So Typhon, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, figures as the accuser. The resemblance extends even to the names, for one of Typhon's appellations was Seth, or Seph, as Satan in Hebrew means an adversary. In Arabic, the word is shatana, to be adverse, to persecute. And Manetho says he had treacherously murdered Osiris and allied himself with the Shemites, the Israelites. This may possibly have originated the fable told by Plutarch that from the fight between Horus and Typhon, Typhon, overcome with fright at the mischief he had caused, fled seven days on an ass and escaping, begat the boys Jerusalemness and Judeos and Jerusalem and Judea. Referring to an invocation of Typhon Seth, Professor Reuvens says that the Egyptians worshipped Typhon under the form of an ass, and according to him, Seth appears gradually among the Semites as the background of their religious consciousness. The name of the ass in Coptic, Ao, is a phonetic Io, and hence the animal became a pun symbol. Thus, Satan is a later creation sprung from the overheated fancy of the fathers of the church. By some reverse of fortune to which the gods are subjected in common with mortals, Typhon Seth tumbled down from the eminence of the deified son of Adam Cadmon to the degrading position of subaltern spirit, a mythical demon ass. Religious schisms are as little free from the frail pettiness and spiteful feelings of humanity as the partisan quarrels of a layman. We find a strong instance of the above in the case of the Zoroastrian reform when Magianism separated from the old faith of the Brahmins. The bright devas of the Veda became, under the religious reform of Zoroaster, devas or evil spirits of the Avesta. Even Indra, the luminous god, was thrust far back into the dark shadow in order to show off in a brighter light Ahura Mazda, the wise and supreme deity. The strange veneration in which the Ophites held the serpent, which represented Christos, may become less perplexing if the students would but remember that at all ages the serpent was the symbol of divine wisdom, which kills in order to resurrect, destroys but to rebuild the better. Moses is made a descendant of Levi, a serpent tribe. Gautama Buddha is of a serpent lineage, through the Naga, serpent, race of kings who reigned in Magda. Hermes, or the god Taut, Thoth, and his snake symbol is Tet. And according to the Ophite legends, Jesus, or Christos, is born from a snake, divine wisdom, or Holy Ghost. I.e., he became a son of God through his initiation into the serpent science. Vishnu, identical with the Egyptian Neph, rests on the heavenly seven-headed serpent. The red or fiery dragon of the ancient time was the military ensign of the Assyrians. Cyrus adopted it from them when Persia became dominant. The Romans and Byzantines next assumed it, and so the great red dragon from being the symbol of Babylon and Nineveh became that of Rome. The temptation or probation of Jesus is, however, the most dramatic occasion in which Satan appears. As if to prove the designation of Apollo, Aesculapius and Bacchus, Diabolos, or son of Zeus, he is also styled Diabolos, or accuser. The scene of the probation was the wilderness, and the desert about the Jordan and Dead Sea were the abodes of the sons of the prophets and the Essenes. These aesthetics used to subject their neophytes to probations, analogous to the tortures of the Mithraic rites, and the temptation of Jesus was evidently a scene of this character. Hence, in the Gospel according to Luke, it is stated that the Diablos, having completed the probation, left him for a specific time, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. But the, or devil, in this instance, is evidently no malignant principle, but one exercising discipline. In this sense, the terms devil and Satan are repeatedly employed. 
Thus, when Paul was liable to undue elation by reason of the abundance of revelations or apoptic disclosures, there was given him a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satanas, to check him. The story of Satan in the book of Job is of a similar character. He is introduced among the sons of God, presenting themselves before the Lord as a mystic initiation. Micaiah, the prophet, describes a similar scene where he saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him, with whom he took counsel, which resulted in putting a lying spirit into the mouth of the prophets of Ahab. The Lord counsels with Satan and gives him carte blanche to test the fidelity of Job. He is stripped of his wealth and family and smitten with a loathsome disease. In his extremity, his wife doubts his integrity and exhorts him to worship God as he is about to die. His friends all beset him with accusations, and finally the Lord, the chief hierophant himself, taxes him with the uttering of words in which there is no wisdom and with contending with the Almighty. To this rebuke, Job yielded, making this appeal, I will demand of thee, and thou shalt declare unto me. Wherefore do I abhor myself and mourn in dust and ashes? Immediately he was vindicated. The Lord said unto Eliphaz, Ye have not spoken to me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. His integrity has been asserted, and his prediction verified. I know that my champion liveth, and that he will stand up for me at a later time on the earth. And though after my skin my body itself be corroded away, Yet even without my flesh shall I see God. The prediction was accomplished. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But now mine eye seeth thee. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. In all these scenes there is manifested no such malignant diabolism as is supposed to characterize the adversary of souls. It is an opinion of certain writers of merit and learning that the Satan of the book of Job is a Jewish myth containing the Mazdian doctrine of the evil principle. Dr. Haug remarks that the Zoroastrian religion exhibits a close affinity, or rather identity, with the Mosaic religion and Christianity, such as the personality and attributes of the devil and the resurrection of the dead. The war of the apocalypse between Michael and the dragon can be traced with equal facility to one of the oldest myths of the Aryans. In the Avesta, we read of the war between Tretona and Azdi Dehaka, the destroying serpent. Bornuf has endeavored to show that the Vedic myth of Ahi, or the serpent, fighting against the gods, has been gradually humorized into the battle of a pious man against the power of evil in the Mazdian religion. By these interpretations, Satan would be made identical with Zohak or Azhi Dehaka, who is a three headed serpent with one of the heads a human one. Beelzebub is generally distinguished from Satan. He seems in the apocryphal New Testament to be regarded as the potentate of the underworld. The name is usually rendered Ball of the Flies, which may be a designation of the scarabai or sacred beetles. More correctly, it shall read, as it has always been given in the Greek text of the Gospels, Beelzebub, or Lord of the Household, as is indeed intimated in Matthew X25. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? He was also styled with the prince of Archon, of Damons. Typhon figures in the Book of Dead as the accuser of souls when they appear for judgment, as Satan stood up to accuse Joshua, the high priest, before the angel, and as the devil came to Jesus to tempt or test him during his great fast in the wilderness. He was also the deity denominated Baal Sephon, or God of the Crypt, in the book of Exodus, and Seth, or the Pillar. During this period, the ancient or archaic worship was more or less under the ban of the government. In figurative language, Osiris had been treacherously slain and cut in fourteen, twice seven pieces, and coffined by his brother Typhon, and Isis has gone to Byblos in quest of his body. We must not forget in this relation that Saba or Sabazios of Phrygia and Greece was torn by the Titans into seven pieces, and that he was, like Heptactes of the Chaldeans, the seven-rayed god. 
Siva, the Hindu, is represented crowned with seven serpents, and he is the god of war and destruction. The Hebrew Jehovah, the Sabbath, is also called the Lord of Hosts. Seba, or Saba, Bacchus, or Dionysus, Sabazios, so that all these may easily be proved identical. Finally, the princes of the older regime, the gods who had, on the assault of the giants, taken the forms of animals and hidden in Ethiopia, returned and expelled the shepherds. According to Josephus, the Hyksos were the ancestors of the Israelites. This is doubtless substantially true. The Hebrew scriptures, which tell a somewhat different story, were written at a later period and underwent several revisions before they were promulgated with any degree of publicity. Typhon became odious in Egypt and shepherds an abomination. In the course of the 20th dynasty, he was suddenly treated as an evil demon, insomuch that his effigies and name are obliterated on all the monuments and inscriptions that could be reached. In all the ages, the gods have been liable to be humorized into men. There are tombs of Zeus, Apollo, Hercules, and Bacchus, which are often mentioned to show that originally they were only mortals. Shem, Ham, and Japhet are traced in the divinities, Shamas of Assyria, Kam of Egypt, and Ipatos the Titan. Seth was god of the Hyksos, Enoch or Anakus of the Argives, and Abraham, Isaac, and Judah have been compared with Brahma, Ishwaka, and Yadu of the Hindu pantheon. Typhon tumbled down from Godhead to devilship, both in his own character and as brother of Osiris, and as the Seth, or Satan, of Asia. Apollo, the god of day, became, in his older Phoenician garb, no more Baal Sibyl, the oracle god, but prince of demons, and finally the lord of the underworld. The separation of Mazdianism from Vedism transformed the devas or gods into evil potencies. Indra, also in the Vandadad, is set forth as the subaltern of Araman, created by him out of the materials of darkness, together with Siva, Surya, and the two Aswins. Even Jahai is the demon of lust, probably identical with Indra. The several tribes and nations had their tutelar gods and vilified those of inimical peoples. The transformation of Typhon, Satan, and Beelzebub are of this character. Indeed, Tertullian speaks of Mithra, the god of the mysteries, as a devil. In the twelfth chapter of the Apocalypse, Michael and his angels overcame the dragon and his angels. And the great dragon was cast out, that archaic Ophis called Diablos and Satan, that deceiveth the whole world. It is added, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb, or Christ, had to descend himself to hell, the world of the dead, and remain there for three days before he subjugated the enemy, according to the myth. Michael was denominated by the Kabbalists and the Gnostics, the Savior, the Angel of the Sun, and Angel of Light probably from to manifest in God. He was the first of the aeons and was well known to antiquarians as the unknown angel represented on the Gnostic amulets. The writer of the Apocalypse, if not a Kabbalist, must have been a Gnostic. Michael was not a personage originally exhibited to him in his vision, Apoptia, but the savior and dragon slayer. Archaeological explorations have indicated him as identical with Anubis, whose effigy was later discovered upon an Egyptian monument, with a cuirass and holding a spear. Like St. Michael and St. George, he is also represented as slaying a dragon that has the head and tail of a serpent. The student of Lipsius, Champollion, and other Egyptologists will quickly recognize Isis as the women with child, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, whom the great fiery dragon persecuted, and to whom were given two wings of the great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Typhon was red-skinned. The two brothers, the good and evil principles, appeared in the myths of the Bible as well as those of the Gentiles and Cain and Abel. Typhon and Osiris, Esau and Jacob, Apollo and Python, etc. Esau, or Usu, is represented when born as red all over like a hairy garment. He is the Typhon, or Satan, opposing his brother. From the remotest antiquity, the serpent was held by every people in the greatest veneration, as the embodiment of divine wisdom and the symbol of spirit.
And we know from Sanchoniathon that it was Hermes, or Thoth, who was the first to regard the serpent as the most spirit-like of all the reptiles. And the Gnostic serpent with the seven vowels over the head is but the copy of Ananta, the seven-headed serpent on which rests the god Vishnu. We have experienced no little surprise to find upon reading the latest European treaties upon serpent worship that the writers confess that the public is still almost in the dark as to the origin of the superstition in question. Mr. C. Staniland Wake, M.A.I., from whom we now quote, says, The student of mythology knows that certain ideas were associated by the peoples of antiquity with the serpent and that it was the favorite symbol of particular deities. But why that animal, rather than any other, was chosen for the purpose is yet uncertain. Mr. James Ferguson, FRS, who gathered together such an abundance of material upon this ancient cult, seems to have no more suspicion of the truth than the rest. Our explanation of the myth may be of little value to students of symbology. And yet, we believe that the interpretation of the primitive serpent worship, as given by the initiates, is the correct one. In Volume 1, P. 10, we quote from the serpent mantra in the Eritrea, Brahmana, a passage which speaks of the earth as the Sarparajni, the queen of the serpents, and the mother of all that moves. These expressions refer to the fact that before our globe had become egg-shaped or round, it was a long trail of cosmic dust or fire mist, moving and writhing like a serpent. This, say the explanations, was the serpent of God moving on the chaos until its breath had incubated cosmic matter and made it assume the annular shape of a serpent with its tail and its mouth. Emblem of eternity in its spiritual and of our world in its physical sense. According to the notions of the oldest philosophers, as we have shown in the preceding chapter, the earth, serpent-like, casts off its skin and appears after every minor pralaya in a rejuvenated state, and after the great pralaya resurrects or evolves again from its subjective into objective existence. Like the serpent, it not only puts off its old age, says Sanchoniathon, but increases in size and strength. This is why not only Serapis and later Jesus were represented by a great serpent, but even why, in our own country, big snakes are kept with a sacred care in Muslim mosques. For instance, in that of Cairo. In Upper Egypt, a famous saint is said to appear under the form of a large serpent. And in India, in some children's cradles, a pair of serpents, male and female, are reared with the infant. And snakes are often kept in houses, as they are thought to bring a magnetic aura of wisdom, health, and good luck. They are the progeny of Sarpa Rajni, the earth, and endowed with all her virtues. In the Hindu mythology, Vasaki, the great dragon, pours forth upon Durga, from his mouth a poisonous fluid which overspreads the ground. But her consort, Siva, caused the earth to open her mouth and swallow it. Thus, the mystic drama of the celestial virgin, pursued by the dragon, seeking to devour her child, was not only depicted in the constellations of heaven, as has been mentioned, but was represented in the secret worship of the temples. It was the mystery of the god's soul, and inscribed on a black image of Isis. The divine boy was chased by the cruel Typhon. In an Egyptian legend, the dragon is said to pursue Thusis. Isis, while she is endeavoring to protect her son. Ovid describes Dion, the consort of the original Pelasian Zeus and mother of Venus, as flying from Typhon to the Euphrates, thus identifying the myth as belonging to all the countries where the mysteries were celebrated. Virgil sings the victory. Hail, dear child of gods, great son of Jove, receive the honors great. The time is at hand. The serpent will die. Albertus Magnus, himself an alchemist and student of occult science, as well as a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church, in his enthusiasm for astrology, declared that the zodiacal sign of the celestial virgin rises above the horizon on the 25th of December, at the moment assigned by the Church for the birth of the Savior. The sign and myth of the mother and child were known thousands of years before the Christian era. The drama of the mysteries of Demeter represent 
Persephone, her daughter, is carried away by Pluto or Hades into the world of the dead. And when the mother finally discovers her there, she has been instilled as queen of the realm of darkness. This myth was transcribed by the church into the legend of Saint Anna, going in quest of her daughter Mary, who has been conveyed by Joseph into Egypt. Persephone is depicted with two ears of wheat in her hand. So is Mary in the old pictures. So was the celestial virgin of the constellation. Albumazar, the Arabian, indicates the identity of the several myths as follows. In the first decan of the Virgin rises a maid, called in Arabic, Adiranosa, Adhanari, that is, pure immaculate virgin, graceful in person, charming in countenance, modest in habit, with loosened hair, holding in her hands two ears of wheat, sitting upon an embroidered throne, nursing a boy, and rightly feeding him in the place called Hebre, a boy, I say, named Isis by certain nations, which signifies Issa, whom they also call Christ in Greek. At this time, Grecian, Asiatic, and Egyptian ideas had undergone a remarkable transformation. The mysteries of Dionysus, Sabazius, had been replaced by the rites of Mithras, whose caves superseded the crypts of the former god, from Babylon to Britain. Serapis, or Shriapa, from Pontus, had usurped the place of Osiris. The king of eastern Hindustan, Asoka, had embraced the religion of Siddhartha and sent missionaries clear to Greece, Asia, Syria, and Egypt to promulgate the Evangel of Wisdom. The Essenes of Judea and Arabia, the Therapeutists of Egypt and the Pythagorists of Greece and Magna Grecia, were evidently religionists of the new faith. The legends of Gautama superseded the myths of Horus, Anubis, Adonis, Attis, and Bacchus. These were wrought anew into the mysteries and gospels, and to them we owe the literature known as the Evangelists and the Apocryphal New Testament. They were kept by the Ebionites, Nazarenes, and other sects as sacred books, which they might show only to the wise, and were so preserved till the overshadowing influence of the Roman ecclesiastical polity was able to wrest them from those who kept them. At the time, that was the high priest Hilkiah, is said to have found the Book of the Law. The Hindu Puranas, scriptures, were known to the Assyrians. These last had for many centuries held dominion from the Hellespont to the Indus, and probably crowded the Aryans out of Bactriana into the Punjab. The Book of the Law seems to have been a Purana. The learned Brahmins, says Sir William Jones, pretend that five conditions are requisite to constitute a real Purana. One, to treat of the creation of matter in general. Two, to treat of the creation or production of secondary material and spiritual beings. Three, to give a chronological abridgment of the great periods of time. Four, to give a genealogical abridgment of the principal families that reigned over the country. And five, lastly, to give the history of some great man in particular. It is pretty certain that whoever wrote the Pentateuch had this plan before him as well as those who wrote the New Testament, had become thoroughly well acquainted with Buddhistic ritualistic worship, legends and doctrines, through the Buddhist missionaries who were many in those days in Palestine and Greece. But no devil, no Christ. This is the basic dogma of the Church. We must hunt the two together. There is a mysterious connection between the two, more close than perhaps is suspected, amounting to identity, If we collect together the mythical sons of God, all of whom were regarded as first begotten, they will be found dovetailing together and blending in this dual character. Adam Cadmon bifurcates from the spiritual concept of wisdom into the creative one, which evolves matter. The Adam made from dust is both son of God and Satan, and the latter is also a son of God, according to Job. Hercules was likewise the first begotten, He is also Bel, Baal, and Baal, and therefore Siva, the destroyer. Bacchus was styled by Euripides, Bacchus the son of God, 
As a child, Bacchus, like the Jesus of the apocryphal Gospels, was greatly dreaded. He is described as benevolent to mankind. Nevertheless, he was merciless in punishing whomever failed of respect to his worship. Pentheus, the son of Cadmus and Hermion, was, like the son of Rabbi Hanan, destroyed for his want of piety. The allegory of Job, which has already been cited, if correctly understood, will give the key to this whole matter of the devil, his nature and office, and will substantiate our declarations. Let no pious individual take exception to this designation of allegory. Myth was the favorite and universal method of teaching in archaic times. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, declared that the entire story of Moses and the Israelites was typical, and in his epistle to the Galatians, asserted that the whole story of Abraham, his two wives, and their sons was an allegory. Indeed, it is a theory amounting to certitude that the historical books of the Old Testament were of the same character. We take no extraordinary liberty with the book of Job when we give it the same designation which Paul gave the stories of Abraham and Moses. But we ought, perhaps, to explain the ancient use of allegory and symbology. The truth in the former was left to be deduced. The symbol expressed some abstract quality of the deity, which the laity could easily apprehend. Its higher sense terminated there, and it was employed by the multitude thenceforth as an image to be employed in idolatrous rites. But the allegory was reserved for the inner sanctuary, when only the elect were admitted. Hence the rejoinder of Jesus when his disciples interrogated him, because he spoke to the multitude in parables. To you, said he, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not, for him shall be taken away, even that he hath. In the minor mysteries, a soul was washed to typify the purification of the neophyte, as her return to the mire indicated the superficial nature of the work that had been accomplished. The mythos is the undisclosed thought of the soul. The characteristic trait of a myth is to convert reflection into history, a historical form. As in the epos, so in the myth the historical element predominates. Facts, external events, often constitute the basis of a myth, and with these religious ideas are interwoven. The whole allegory of Job is an open book to him who understands the picture language of Egypt, as it is recorded in the Book of the Dead. In the scene of judgment, Osiris is represented sitting on his throne, holding in one hand the symbol of life the hook of attraction, and in the other the mystic Bacchic fan. Before him are the sons of God, the forty-two assessors of the dead. An altar is immediately before the throne, covered with gifts and surmounted with the sacred lotus flower, upon which stands four spirits. By the entrance stands the soul about to be judged, whom Thmi, the genius of truth, is welcoming to this conclusion of the probation. Thoth, holding a reed, makes a record of the proceedings in the Book of Life. Horus and Anubis, standing by the scales, inspect the weight which determines whether the heart of the deceased balances the symbol of truth, or the latter preponderates. On pedestal sits a bitch, the symbol of the accuser. Initiation into the mysteries, as every intelligent person knows, was dramatic representation of scenes in the underworld. Such was the allegory of Job. Several critics have attributed the authorship of this book to Moses. But it is older than the Pentateuch. Jehovah is not mentioned in the poem itself. And if the name occurs in the prologue, the fact must be attributed to either an error of the translators or the premeditation exacted by the later necessity to transform polytheism into a monotheistic religion. The plan adopted was the very simple one of attributing the many names of the Elohim, gods, to a single god. So in one of the oldest Hebrew texts of Job, in chapter 12, 9, there stands the name of Jehovah, whereas all other manuscripts have Adonai. But in the original poem, Jehovah is absent. In place of this name, we find Al, Alim, El, Shaddai, Adonai, etc. 
Therefore, we must conclude that either the prologue and epilogue were added at a later period, which is inadmissible for many reasons, or that it has been tampered with like the rest of the manuscripts. Then we find in this archaic poem no mention whatever of the sabbatical institution, but a great many references to the sacred number seven, of which we will speak further, and a direct discussion upon Sabianism, the worship of the heavenly bodies prevailing in those days in Arabia. Satan is called in it a son of God, one of the council which presents itself before God, and he leads him into tempting Job's fidelity. In this poem, clearer and plainer than anywhere else, do we find meaning of the appellation Satan. It is a term for the office or character of public accuser. Satan is the Typhon of the Egyptians, barking his accusations in Amenthi an office quite as respectable as that as the public prosecutor in our own age. And if, through the ignorance of the first Christians, he became later identical with the devil, it is through no connivance of his own. The book of Job is a complete representation of ancient initiation, and the trials which generally precede the grandest of all the ceremonies. The neophyte perceives himself deprived of everything he valued and afflicted with foul disease. His wife appeals to him to adore God and die. There was no more hope for him. Three friends appear on the scene by mutual appointment. Eliphaz, the learned Temanite, full of the knowledge which wise men have told from their fathers, to whom alone the earth was given. Bildad, the conservative, taking matters as they come, and judging Job to have done wickedly, because he was afflicted, and so far, intelligent and skillful, with generalities, but not interiorly wise. Job boldly responds, If I have erred, it is a matter with myself. You magnify yourselves and plead against me in my reproach. But it is God who has overthrown me. Why do you persecute me and are not satisfied with my flesh thus wasted away? But I know that my champion lives, and that at a coming day he will stand for me in the earth. And though together with my skin all this beneath it shall be destroyed, yet without my flesh I shall see God. He shall say, Why do we molest him? For the root of the matter is found in me. This passage, like all others in which the faintest allusions could be found to a champion, deliverer, or vindicator, was interpreted into a direct reference to the Messiah. But apart from the fact that in the Septuagint this verse is translated, For I know that he is eternal, who is about to deliver me on earth, to restore this skin of mine which endures these things, etc. In King James's version, as it stands translated, it has no resemblance whatever to the original. The crafty translators have rendered it, I know that my redeemeth liveth, etc., and yet Septuagint, Vulgate, and Hebrew original have all to be considered as an inspired word of God. Job refers to his own immortal spirit, which is eternal, and which, when death comes, will deliver him from his putrid earthly body and clothe him with a new spiritual envelope. In the mysteries of Eleusinia, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and all other works treating on matters of initiation, this eternal being has a name. With the Neoplatonists, it was the Nous, the Ogaldis. With the Buddhists, it is Agra and with the Persians, Farewer. All of these are called the Deliverers, the Champions, the Metatrons, etc. In the Mithraic scriptures of Persia, the Farewer is represented by a winged figure hovering above in the air, its object or body. It is the luminous self, the Atman of the Hindus, or immortal spirit, who alone can redeem our soul, and will if we follow him instead of being dragged down by our body. Therefore, in the Chaldean texts, the above reads, My deliverer, my restorer, i.e., the spirit who will restore the decayed body of man and transform it into a clothing of ether. And it is this noose, a godis, fair word, agra, spirit of himself, that the triumphant Job shall see without his flesh, i.e., when he has escaped from his bodily prison, and that the translators call God. Not only is there not the slightest allusion in the poem of Job to Christ, 
But it is now well proved that all those versions by different translators, which agree with that of King James, were written on the authority of Jerome, who has taken strange liberties in his Vulgate. He was the first to cram into the text this verse of his own fabrication. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last day I shall arise from the earth, and again shall be surrounded with my skin, and in my flesh I shall see my God. All of which might have been a good reason for himself to believe in it, since he knew it, but for others who did not, and who moreover found in the text a quite a different idea, it only proves that Jerome had decided, by one more interpolation, to enforce the dogma of a resurrection at the last day, and in the identical skin and bones which we had used on earth. This is an agreeable prospect of restoration indeed. Why not the linen also in which the body happens to die? And how could the author of the book of Job know anything of the New Testament, when evidently he was utterly ignorant even of the old one? There is a total absence of allusion to any of the patriarchs, And so evidently it is in the work of an initiate that one of the three daughters of Job is even called by a decidedly pagan mythological name. The name of Karen Hapak is rendered in various ways by the many translators. The Vulgate has horn of antimony, and the LXX has the horn of Amalthea, the nurse of Jupiter and one of the constellations, emblem of the horn of plenty. The presence in the Septuagint of this heroine of pagan fable shows the ignorance of the transcribers of its meaning as well as the esoteric origin of the book of Job. Instead of offering consolations, the three friends of the suffering Job seek to make him believe that his misfortune might have come in punishment of some extraordinary transgressions on his part. Hurling back upon them all their imputations, Job swears that while his breath is in him, he will maintain his cause. He takes in view the period of his prosperity, when the secret of God was upon his tabernacles, and he was a judge, who sat chief and dwelt as a king in the army, or one that comforteth the mourners, and compares with it the present time, when vagrant Bedouins held him in derision, men viler than the earth, when he was prostrated by misfortune and foul disease. Then he asserts his sympathy for the unfortunate, his chastity, his integrity, his probity, his strict justice, his charities, his moderation, his freedom from the prevalent sun worship, his tenderness to enemies, his hospitality to strangers, his openness of heart, his boldness for the right. Though he encountered the multitude and the contempt of families, and invokes the Almighty to answer him, and his adversary to write down of what he had been guilty. To this there was not and could not be any answer. The three had sought to crush Job by pleadings and general arguments, and he had demanded consideration for his specific acts. Then appeared the fourth, Elahu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the kindred of Ram. Elihu is the hierophant. He begins with a rebuke, and the sophisms of Job's false friends are swept away like the loose sand before the west wind. And Elihu, the son of Barakel, spoke and said, Great men are not always wise. There is a spirit in man. The spirit within me constraint me. God speaketh once, yet twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon man, in slumberings upon the bed. Then he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction. O Job, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall teach thee wisdom. And Job, who to the dogmatic fallacies of his three friends in the bitterness of his heart, had exclaimed, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. Miserable comforters are ye all. Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies, ye are physicians of no value. The sore eaten visited Job, who in the face of the official clergy, offering for all hope the necessarianism of damnation, had in his despair nearly wavered in this patient faith, answered, What ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior unto you. Man cometh forth like a flower, and is cut down. He fleeth 
also as a shadow, and continueth not. Man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? If a man die, shall he live again? When a few years are come, then I shall go all the way whence I shall not return. O oh, that one might plead for a man with God, as a man pleadeth for his neighbor. Job finds one who answers to his cry of agony. He listens to the wisdom of Elihu, the hierophant, the perfected teacher, the inspired philosopher. From his stern lips comes the just rebuke for his impiety in charging upon the supreme being the evils of humanity. God, says Elihu, is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not afflict. So long as the neophyte was satisfied with his own worldly vision and irreverent estimate of the deity and his purposes, so long as he gave ear to the pernicious sophistries of his advisers, the hierophant kept silent. But when this anxious mind was ready for counsel and instruction, his voice is heard, and he speaks with the authority of the Spirit of God that constraineth him. Surely God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. He respecteth not any that are wise at heart. What better commentary than this upon the fashionable preacher, who multiplieth words without knowledge? This magnificent prophetic satire might have been written to prefigure the spirit that prevails in all the denominations of Christians. Job hearkens to the words of wisdom, and then the Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind of nature, God's first visible manifestation. Stand still, O Job, stand still, and consider the wondrous works of God, for by them alone thou canst know God. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Him who maketh small the drops of water, but they pour down rain according to the vapor thereof, not according to the divine whim, but to the once established and immutable laws, which law removeth the mountains, and they know not, which shaketh the earth, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealed up the stars, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth also, but I perceive him not. Then, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge, speaks the voice of God through his mouthpiece, nature? Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Wast thou present when I said to the seas, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed? Knowest thou who hath caused it to rain on the earth, where no man is, on the wilderness, wherein there is no man? Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou send lightnings? that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are. Then Job answered the Lord. He understood his ways, and his eyes were opened for the first time. The supreme wisdom descended upon him. And if the reader remained puzzled before this final patroma of initiation, at least Job, or the man afflicted in his blindness, then realized the impossibility of catching Leviathan by putting a hook into his nose. The Leviathan is occult science, on which one can lay his hand, but do no more, whose power and comely proportion God wishes not to conceal. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? Of him whose scales are his pride, shut up together as with a closed seal. Through whose kneesings a light doth shine? and whose eyes are like the lids of the morning, who maketh a light to shine after him, for those who have the fearlessness to approach him. And then they, like him, will behold all things high, for he is king only over all the children of pride. Job, now in modest confidence, responded, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought of thine can be resisted. Who is he that maketh a show of arcane wisdom? of which he knoweth nothing. Thus have I uttered what I do not comprehend, things far above me which I did not know, 
Hear, I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and do thou answer me. I have heard thee with my ears, and now I see thee with my eyes. Wherefore am I loathsome, and mourn in dust and ashes? He recognized his champion, and was assured that the time for his vindication had come. Immediately the Lord, the priests, and the judges, Deuteronomy 19.17, saith to his friends, My wrath is kindled against thee, and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. So the Lord turned the captivity of Job, and blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Then in the judgment the deceased invokes four spirits who preside over the lake of fire, and is purified by them. He then is conducted to his celestial house, and is received by Athar and Isis, and stands before Atum the essential God. He is now Turu, the essential man, a pure spirit, and henceforth Onatai, the eye of fire, and an associate of the gods. This grandiose poem of Job was well understood by the Kabbalists. While many of the medieval hermetists were profoundly religious men, they were, in their innermost hearts, like Kabbalists of every age, the deadliest enemies of the clergy. How true the words of Paracelsus, when worried by fierce persecution and slander, misunderstood by friends and foes, abused by clergy and laity, he exclaimed, O ye of Paris, Padua, Montpellier, Salerno, Vienna, and Leipzig, ye are not teachers of the truth, but confessors of lies. Your philosophy is a lie. Would you know what magic really is? Then seek it in St. John's Revelation as you cannot yourselves prove your teachings from the Bible and the Revelation. Then let your farces have an end. The Bible is the true key and interpreter. John, not less than Moses, Elias, Enoch, David, Solomon, Daniel, Jeremiah, and the rest of the prophets, was a magician, Kabbalist, and diviner. If now all, or even any of those I have named, were yet living, I do not doubt that you would make an example of them in your miserable slaughterhouse and would annihilate them there on the spot, and if it were possible, the creator of all things too. That Paracelsus had learned some mysterious and useful things out of Revelation and other Bible books, as well as from the Kabbalah, was proved by him practically, so much so that he is called by many the father of magic and founder of the occult physics of the Kabbalah and magnetism. So firm was the popular belief in the supernatural powers of Paracelsus, that to this day the tradition survives among the simple-minded Alsatians, that he is not dead but sleepeth in his grave at Strasbourg. And they often whisper among themselves that the green sod heaves with every respiration of that weary breast, and that deep groans are heard as the great fire philosopher awakens to the remembrance of the cruel wrongs that he suffered at the hands of his cruel slanderers for the sake of the great truth. It will be perceived from these extended illustrations that the Satan of the Old Testament, the Diablos, or Devil of the Gospels and Apostolic Epistles, were but the antagonistic principle in matter, necessarily incident to it, and not wicked in the moral sense of the term. The Jews, coming from the Persian country, brought with them the doctrine of the two principles. They could not bring the Avesta, for it was not written. But they, we mean the Assidians and Farsi, invested Ormazd with the secret name of, and Araman with the name of gods of the land, Satan of the Hittites and Diablos, or rather Diabolos of the Greeks, the early church, at least the Pauline part of it, the Gnostics and their successors, further refined upon their ideas, and the Catholic church adopted and adapted them meanwhile putting their promulgators to the sword. The Protestant is a reaction from the Roman Catholic Church. It is necessarily not coherent in its parts, but a prodigious host of fragments beating their way round a common center, attracting and repelling each other. Parts are centripetally impelled towards old Rome, or the system which enabled old Rome to exist. 
parts still recoil under the centrifugal impulse and seek to rush into the broad ethereal region beyond Roman or even Christian influence. The modern devil is their principal heritage from the Roman Sibyl, Babylon, the great mother of the idolatrous and abominable religions of the earth. But it may be argued, perhaps, that Hindu theology, both Brahmanical and Buddhistic, is as strongly impregnated with belief in objective devils as Christianity itself. There is a slight difference. This very subtlety of the Hindu mind is a sufficient warrant that the well-educated people, the learned portion, at least, of the Brahmin and Buddhist divines, consider the devil in another light. With them, the devil is a metaphysical abstraction an allegory of necessary evil. While the Christians, the myth has become a historical entity, the fundamental stone on which Christianity, with its dogma of redemption, is built. He is as necessary, as de Mousseau has shown, to the church as the beast of the 17th chapter of the Apocalypse was to his rider. The English-speaking Protestants, not finding the Bible explicit enough, have adopted the diabology of Milton's celebrated poem, Paradise Lost, embellishing it somewhat from Goeth's celebrated drama of Faust. John Milton, first a Puritan and finally a Quietist and Unitarian, never put forth his great production except as a work of fiction, but it thoroughly dovetailed together the different parts of the scripture. The Ildeboath of the Ophites was transformed into an angel of light, and the morning star, and made the devil in the first act of the diabolic drama. Then the twelfth chapter of the Apocalypse was brought in for the second act. The great red dragon was adopted as the same illustrious personage as Lucifer, and the last scene in his fall, like that of Vulcan Hephaestus from heaven into the island of Lemnos. The fugitive hosts and their leader coming to hard bottom in pandemonium. The third act is the Garden of Eden. Satan holds a council in a hall erected by him for his new empire, and determines to go forth on an exploring expedition in quest of the new world. The next act relates to the fall of man, his career on earth, the advent of the Logos, or Son of God, and his redemption of mankind, or the elect portion of them, as the case may be. This drama of Paradise Lost comprises the unformulated belief of English-speaking, evangelical Protestant Christians. Disbelief of its main features is equivalent, in their view, to denying Christ and blaspheming against the Holy Ghost. If John Milton had supposed that this poem, instead of being regarded as a companion of Dante's Divine Comedy, would have been considered as another apocalypse to supplement the Bible, and complete its demonology, it is more than probable that he would have borne his poverty more resolutely and withheld it from the press. A later poet, Robert Pollock, taking his cue from this work, wrote another, The Course of Time, which bade fair for a season to take the rank of a later scripture. But the 19th century has fortunately received a different inspiration, and the Scotch poet is falling into oblivion. We ought perhaps to make a brief notice of the European devil. He is the genius who deals in sorcery, witchcraft, and other mischief. The fathers, taking the idea from the Jewish Pharisees, made devils of the pagan gods, Mithras, Serapis, and the others. The Roman Catholic Church followed by denouncing the former worship as commerce with the powers of darkness. The Maleficii and witches of the Middle Ages were thus but the votaries of the prescribed worship. Magic in all ancient times had been considered as divine science, wisdom, and the knowledge of God. The healing art in the temples of Asclepius and at the shrines of Egypt and the East had always been magical. Even Darius Hystasipes, who had exterminated the Median Magi and even driven out the Chaldean Theurgus from Babylon into Asia Minor, had also been instructed by the Brahmins of Upper Asia. And finally, while establishing the worship of Ormazd, was also himself denominated the Institutor of Magism. All was now changed. Ignorance was enthroned as the mother of devotion. Learning was denounced, and savants prosecuted the sciences in peril of their lives. They were compelled to enjoy a jargon to conceal their ideas from all but their own adepts, and to accept opprobrium, calumny, and poverty. 
The votaries of the ancient worship were persecuted and put to death on charges of witchcraft. The Albigenses, descendants of the Gnostics, and the Waldenses, precursors of the Protestants, were hunted and massacred under like accusations. Martin Luther himself was accused of companionship with Satan in proper person. The whole Protestant world still lies under the same imputation. There is no distinction in the judgments of the Church between dissent, heresy, and witchcraft. And except where civil authority protects, they are alike capital offenses. Religious liberty the Church regards as intolerance. But the Reformers were nursed with the milk of their mother. Luther was as bloodthirsty as the Pope, Calvin more intolerant than Leo or Urban. Thirty years of war depopulated whole districts of Germany, Protestants and Catholics cruel alike. The new faith, too, opened its batteries against witchcraft. The statute books became crimsoned with bloody legislation in Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Holland, Great Britain, and the North American Commonwealth. Whosoever was more liberal, more intelligent, more free-speaking than his fellows was liable to arrest and death. The fires that were extinguished at Smithfield were kindled anew for magicians. It was safer to rebel against a throne than to pursue abstruse knowledge outside the orthodox deadline. In the 17th century, Satan made a sortie in New England, New Jersey, New York, and several of the southern colonies of North America and Cotton Mather gives us the principal chronicles of his manifestation. A few years later, he visited the parsonage of Mora in Sweden, and life in Delcarlia was diversified with the burning alive of young children and the whipping of others at the church doors of Sabbath days. The skepticism of modern times has, however, pretty much driven the belief in witchcraft into Coventry and the devil in personal anthropomorphic form, with his Bacchus foot and his pan-like goat's horns, holds place only in the encyclical letters and other effusions of the Roman Catholic Church. Protestant respectability does not allow him to be named at all, except with bated breath in a pulpit enclosure. Having now set forth the biography of the devil from his first advent in India and Persia, his progress through Jewish and both early and later Christian theology down to the latest phases of his manifestation. We now turn back to review certain of the opinions extant in the earlier Christian centuries. Avatars, or incarnations, were common to the old religions. India had reduced them to a system. The Persians expected sosyosh, and the Jewish writers looked for a deliverer. Tacitus and Suetonius relate that the East was full of expectation of the great personage about the time of Octavius. Thus, doctrines obvious to Christians were the highest arcana of paganism. The Moneros of Plutarch was a child of Palestine, his mediator Mithras. The savior, Osiris, is the Messiah. In our present canonical scriptures are to be traced the vestigia of the ancient warships, and in the rites and ceremonies of the Roman Catholic Church we find the norms of the Buddhistical warship, its ceremonies and hierarchy. The first Gospels, once as canonical as any of the present four, contain pages taken almost entire from the Buddhistical narratives, as we are prepared to show. After the evidence furnished by Bernouf as Soma, Carosi, Beale, Hardy, Schmidt, and translations from the Tripitaka, it is impossible to doubt that the whole Christian scheme emanated from the other. The miraculous conception, miracles, and other incidents are found in full in Hardy's Manual of Buddhism. We can hardly realize why the Roman Catholic Church is anxious to keep the common people in utter ignorance of the Hebrew Bible and the Greek literature. Philology and comparative theology are her deadliest enemies. The deliberate falsifications of Arrhenius, Epiphanius, Eusebius, and Tertullian had become a necessity. The Sibylline books of that period seem to have been regarded with extraordinary favor. One can easily perceive that they were inspired from the same source as those of the Gentile nations. Here is a leaf from Galeas. New light has risen. Coming from heaven, it assumed a mortal form. Virgin, receive God in thy pure bosom. And the word flew into her womb. 
becoming incarnate in time and animated by her body. It was found in a mortal image, and a boy was created by a virgin. The new god sent star was adored by the magi. The infant swathed was shown in a manger, and Bethlehem was called God called country of the word. This looks at first sight like a prophecy of Jesus. But could it not mean as well some other creative god? We have like utterances concerning Bacchus and Mithras. I, son of Deus, am come to the land of the Thebans, Bacchus, whom formerly Semiel, the virgin, the daughter of Cadmus, the man from the east, brings forth, being delivered by the lightning-bearing flame, and having taken a mortal form instead of gods, I have arrived. The Dionysiacs, written in the 5th century, serve to render this matter very clear, and even to show its close connection with the Christian legend of the birth of Jesus. Cor Persephone, you were wived as the dragon's spouse. When Zeus, very coiled, his form and countenance changed, a dragon bridegroom, coiled in love, inspiring fold, gilded to dark Cor's maiden couch. Thus, by the alliance with the dragon of Ether, the womb of Persephone became alive with fruit, bearing Zagreus, the horned child. Here we have the secret of the Ophite worship and the origin of the Christian later revised fable of the Immaculate Conception. The Gnostics were the earliest Christians with anything like a regular theological system, and it is only too evident that it was Jesus who was made to fit their theology as Christos, and not their theology that was developed out of his sayings and doings. Their ancestors had maintained, before the Christian era, that the great serpent Jupiter, the dragon of life, the father and good divinity, had glided into the couch of Samiel, and now the post-Christian Gnostics, with a very trifling change, applied the same fable to the man Jesus, and asserted that the same good divinity, Saturn, Ildeboath, had, in the shape of the dragon of life, gilded over the cradle of the infant Mary. In their eyes, the serpent was the Logos, Christos, the incarnation of divine wisdom, through his father Enola and mother Sophia. Now my mother, the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, took me, Jesus is made to say in the Gospel of the Hebrews, thus entering upon his part Christos, the son of Sophia, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called Son of God, says the angel. Luke 5.35 God hath at the last of these days spoken to us by a son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the aeons. Paul, Hebrew 1. All such expressions are so many Christian quotations from the nonus verse. Through the ethereal draconteum, for ether is the Holy Ghost or third person of the Trinity, the hawk-headed serpent, the Egyptian Neph, emblem of the divine mind, and Plato's universal soul. I, wisdom, came out of the mouth of the Most High and covered the earth as a cloud. Pymander, the Logos, issues from the infinite darkness and covers the earth with clouds, which, serpentine-like, spread all over the earth. See Champollion's Egypt. The Logos is the oldest image of God, and he is the active Logos, says Philo. The Father is the latent thought. This idea being universal, we find an identical phraseology to express it, among pagans, Jews, and early Christians. The Chaldeo-Persian Logos is the only begotten of the Father in the Babylonian cosmogony of Eudemus. Him now, Eli, child of Deus, begins a Homeric hymn to the Son. Sol Mithra is an image of the Father, as the Kabbalistic Ser Anpin. That of all the various nations of antiquity, there were never one which believed a personal devil more than liberal Christians in the 19th century. Seems hardly credible. And yet, such is the sorrowful fact. Neither the Egyptians, whom Porphyry terms the most learned nation of the world, nor Greece, its faithful copyists, were ever guilty of such a crowning absurdity. We may add at once that none of them, not even the ancient Jews, believed in hell or an eternal damnation any more than in the devil. 
although our Christian churches are so liberal in dealing it out to the heathen. Wherever the word hell occurs in the translations of the Hebrew sacred texts, it is unfortunate. The Hebrews were ignorant of such an idea, but yet the Gospels contain frequent examples of the same misunderstanding. So when Jesus is made to say, Matthew 26, 18, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, in the original text it stands, the gates of death. Never is the word hell, as applied to the state of damnation, either temporary or eternal, used in any passage of the Old Testament. All hellists, to the contrary, notwithstanding. Taufe, or the Valley of Himnon, Isaiah 66.24, bears no such interpretation. The Greek term Gehenna has also quite a different meaning, as it has been proved conclusively by more than one competent writer that Gehenna is identical with the Homeric Tartarus. In fact, we have Peter himself as authority for it. In his second epistle, 2.2, the apostle in the original text, is made to say of the sinning angels that God cast them down into Tartarus. This expression, too inconveniently recalling the war of Jupiter and the Titans, was altered, and now it reads in King James's version, cast them down to hell. In the Old Testament, the expressions gates of death and the chambers of death simply allude to the gates of the grave, which are specifically mentioned in the Psalms and Proverbs. Hell and its sovereign are both inventions of Christianity, coeval with its ascension to power and resort to tyranny. They were hallucinations born of the nightmares of the SS, Anthony's in the desert. Before our era, the ancient sages knew the father of evil and treated him no better than an ass, the chosen symbol of Typhon, the devil. Sad degeneration of human brains. As Typhon was the dark shadow of his brother Osiris, so Python is the evil side of Apollo, the bright god of visions, the seer and the soothsayer. He is killed by Python, but kills him in his turn, thus redeeming humanity from sin. It was in memory of this deed that the priestesses of the sun god enveloped themselves in the snake skin, typical of the fabulous monster. Under its exhilarating influence, the serpent's skin being considered magnetic, the priestesses fell into magnetic trances, and receiving their voice from Apollo, they became prophetic and delivered oracles. Again, Apollo and Python are one and morally androgynous. The sun god ideals are all dual, without exception. The beneficent warmth of the sun calls the germ into existence, but excessive heat kills the plant. While playing on his seven-stringed planetary lyre, Apollo produces harmony, but as well as other sun gods, under his dark aspect, he becomes the destroyer Python. St. John is known to have traveled in Asia, a country governed by Magi and imbued with Zoroastrian ideas, and in those days full of Buddhist missionaries. He had never visited those places and come in contact with Buddhists. It is doubtful whether the revelation would have been written. Besides his ideas of the dragon, he gives prophetic narratives entirely unknown to the other apostles, and which, relating to the second advent, make of Christ a faithful copy of Vishnu. Thus, Ophios and Ophiomorphos, Apollo and Python, Osiris and Typhon, Christos and the serpent, are all convertible terms. They are all logi, and one is unintelligible without the other, as day could not be known had we no night. All are regenerators and saviors, one in a spiritual, the other in a physical sense. One ensures immortality for the divine spirit, the other gives it through regeneration of the seed. The savior of mankind has to die, because he unveils to humanity the great secret of the immortal ego. The serpent of Genesis is cursed because he said to matter, ye shall not die. In the world of paganism, the counterpart of the serpent is the second Hermes, the reincarnation of Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes is the constant companion and instructor of Osiris and Isis. He is the personified wisdom. So is Cain, the son of the Lord. Both build cities, civilize, and instruct mankind in the arts. It has been repeatedly stated by the Christian missionaries in Ceylon and India that the people are steeped in demonolatry. 
that they are devil worshippers in the full sense of the word. Without any exaggeration, we say that they are no more so than the masses of uneducated Christians. But even were they worshippers, which is more than believers in the devil, yet there is a great difference between the teachings of their clergy on the subject of a personal devil and the dogmas of the Catholic preachers and many Protestant ministers also, the Christian priests are bound to teach and impress upon the minds of their flock the existence of the devil, and the opening pages of the present chapter show the reason why. But not only will the Singhalese Opasampala, who belong to the highest priesthood, not confess to belief in a personal demon, but even the Seminera, the candidates and novices would laugh at the idea. Everything in the external worship of the Buddhists is allegorical and is never otherwise accepted or taught by the educated pungis, pundits. The accusation that they allow and tacitly agree to leave the poor people steeped in the most degrading superstitions is not without foundation, but that they enforce such superstitions we most vehemently deny. And in this they appear to advantage beside our Christian clergy, who at least those who have not allowed their fanaticism to interfere with their brains, without believing a word of it, yet preach the existence of the devil as the personal enemy of a personal god and the evil genius of mankind. St. George's dragon, which figures so promiscuously in the grandest cathedrals of the Christians, is not a whit handsomer than the king of snakes, the Buddhist Namadanama Narya, the great dragon. If the planetary demon Rahu is believed in the popular superstition of the Singhalese to endeavor to destroy the moon by swallowing it, and if in China and Tartary the rabble is allowed, without rebuke, to beat gongs and make fearful noises to drive the monster away from its prey during the eclipses, why should the Catholic clergy find fault or call this superstition? Do not the country clergy in southern France do the same, occasionally, at the appearance of comets, eclipses, and other celestial phenomena? In 1456, when Halley's Comet made its appearance, so tremendous was its apparition, writes Draper, that it was necessary for the Pope himself to interfere. He exercised and expelled it from the skies. It slunk away into the abysses of space, terror-stricken by the maledictions of Calixtus III and did not venture back for 75 years. We never heard of any Christian clergyman or pope trying to disabuse ignorant minds of the belief that the devil had anything to do with eclipses and comets. But we do find a Buddhist chief priest saying to an official who twitted him with his superstition, Our Singhalese religious books teach that the eclipses of the sun and moon denote an attack of Rahu one of the nine planets, not by a devil. The origin of the dragon myth, so prominent in the apocalypse and golden legend, and of the fable about Simeon Stylites converting the dragon, is undeniably Buddhistic and even pre-Buddhistic. It was Gautama's pure doctrines which reclaimed to Buddhism the Kashmirians, whose primitive worship was the Ophite or serpent worship. Frankincense and flowers replaced the human sacrifices and belief in personal demons. It became the turn of Christianity to inherit the degrading superstition about devils invested with pestilential and murderous powers. The Mahavansa, the oldest of the Silanese books, relates the story of King Coversipal, Cobra de Capello, the snake god, who was converted to Buddhism by a holy Rahat. And it is earlier by all odds that the golden legend which tells the same of Simeon the Stylity and his dragon. The Logos triumphs once more over the great dragon. Michael, the luminous archangel, chief of the Aeons, conquers Satan. It is a fact worthy of remark that so long as the initiate kept silent on what he knew, he was perfectly safe. So was it in the days of old, and so it is now. As soon as the Christian God, emanating forth from silence, manifested himself as the Word or Logos, the latter became the cause of his death. The serpent is the symbol of wisdom and eloquence, but it is likewise the symbol of destruction. To dare, to know, to will, and be silent are the cardinal axioms of the Kabbalist. 
Like Apollo and other gods, Jesus is killed by his logos. He rises again, kills him in his turn, and becomes his master. Can it be that an old symbol like this, like the rest of the ancient philosophical conceptions, more than one allegorical and never suspecting meaning? The coincidences are too strange to be results of mere chance. And now that we have shown this identity between Michael and Satan and the saviors and dragons of other people, what can be more clear than that all these philosophical fables originated in India, that universal hotbed of metaphysical mysticism? The world, says Ramastariar, in his comments upon the Vedas, commenced with a contest between the spirit of good and the spirit of evil, and so must end. After the destruction of matter, evil can no longer exist. It must return to naught. In the Apologia, Tertullian falsifies most palpably every doctrine and belief of the pagans as to the oracles and gods. He calls them indifferently demons and devils, accusing the latter of taking possession of even birds of the air. What Christian would now dare doubt such an authority? Did not the psalmist exclaim, All the gods of the nations are idols. And the angel of the school, Thomas Aquinas, explains, on his own Kabbalistic authority, the word idols by devils? They come to men, he says, and offer themselves to their adoration by operating certain things which seem miraculous. The fathers were prudent, as they were wise in their inventions. To be impartial, after having created a devil, they set to creating apocryphal saints. We have named several in the preceding chapters, but we must not forget Baronius, who having read in a work of Chrysostom about the holy Zenerus, the word meaning a pair, a couple, mistook it for a name of a saint, and proceeded forthwith to create of it a martyr of Antioch, and went on to give a most detailed and authentic biography of the blessed martyr. Other theologians made of Apollyon, or rather, Apolluon, the Antichrist. Apolluon is Plato's washer, the god who purifies, who washes off and releases us from sin. But he was thus transformed into him whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, devil. Max Muller says that the serpent in paradise is a conception which might have sprung up among the Jews and seems hardly to invite comparison with the much grander conceptions of the terrible power of Vritra and Araman in the Veda and Avesta. With the Kabbalists, the devil was always a myth, God or good reversed. That modern magus, Eliphas Levi, calls the devil Ires Astral. It is a blind force, like electricity, he says, and speaking allegorically, as he always did, Jesus remarked that he bebelled Satan like lightning, fall from heaven. The clergy insist that God has sent the devil to tempt mankind, which would be rather a singular way of showing his boundless love to humanity. If the Supreme One is really guilty of such unfatherly treachery, he is worthy, certainly, of the adoration only of a church capable of singing the Te Deum over a massacre of St. Bartholomew and of blessing Muslim swords drawn to slaughter Greek Christians. This is at once sound logic and good sound law. For is it not a maxim of jurisprudence? Qui facet per alium facet per se? The great dissimilarity which exists between the various conceptions of the devil is really often ludicrous. While bigots will invariably endow him with horns, tail, and every conceivable repulsive feature, even including an offensive human smell, Milton, Byron, Goethe, Lermontov, and a host of French novelists have sung his praise in flowing verse and thrilling prose. Milton's Satan and even Goethe's Mephistopheles are certainly far more commanding figures than some of the angels as represented in the prose of ecstatic bigots. We have but to compare two descriptions. Let us first award the floor to the incomparably sensational de Mousseau. He gives us a thrilling account of an incubus in the words of the penitent herself. 
Once, she tells us, during the space of a whole half hour, she saw distinctly near her an individual with a black, dreadful, horrid body, and whose hands, of enormous size, exhibited clawed fingers strangely hooked. The senses of sight, feeling, and smell were confirmed by that of hearing. And yet, for the space of several years, the damsel suffered herself to be led astray by such a hero. How far above this odiferous gallant is the majestic figure of the Miltonic Satan? Let the reader then fancy, if he can, this superb chimera, this ideal of the rebellious angel become incarnate pride, crawling into the skin of the most disgusting of all animals. Notwithstanding that the Christian catechism teaches us that Satan in propria, persona, tempted our first mother, Eve, in a real paradise, and that in the shape of a serpent, which of all animals was the most insinuating and fascinating, God orders him, as a punishment, to crawl eternally on his belly and bite the dust. A sentence, remarks Levi, which resembles in nothing the traditional flames of hell. The more so and the real zoological serpent, which was created before Adam and Eve, crawled on his belly and bit the dust likewise before there was any original sin. Apart from this, was not Ophion the daemon or devil like God called Dominus? The word God, deity, is derived from the Sanskrit word deva, and devil from the Persian deva, which words are substantially alike. Hercules, son of Jove and Alcmena, one of the highest sun gods and also Logos manifested, is nevertheless represented under a double nature, as all others. The Agathodaemon, the beneficent daemon, the same which we find later among the Ophites under the appellation of the Logos, or divine wisdom, was represented by a serpent standing erect on a pole in the Bacchanalian mysteries. The hawk-headed serpent is among the oldest of the Egyptian emblems and represents the divine mind, says Dian. Azazel is Moloch and Samael, says Movers. And we find Aaron, the brother of the great lawgiver Moses, making equal sacrifices to Jehovah and Azazel. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, Iho in the original, and one lot for the scapegoat, Azazel. In the Old Testament, Jehovah exhibits all the attributes of old Saturn, notwithstanding his metamorphosis from Adonai into Eloi, and God of gods, Lord of lords. Jesus is tempted on the mountain by the devil, who promises to him kingdoms and glory if he will only fall down and worship him. Matthew 4, 8, 9 Buddha is tempted by the demon Wasawarthi Mara, who says to him as he is leaving his father's place, Be entreated to stay, that you may possess the honors that are within your reach. Go not, go not. And upon the refusal of Gautama to accept his offers, gnashing his teeth with rage, and threatens him with vengeance. Like Christ, Buddha triumphs over the devil. In the Bacchic mysteries, a consecrated cup was handed around after supper, called the cup of the Agathodaemon. The Ophite rite of the same description is evidently borrowed from these mysteries. The communion consisting of bread and wine was used in the worship of nearly every important deity. In connection with the semi-Mithraic sacrament adopted by the Marcosians, another Gnostic sect, utterly Kabbalistic and theurgic, there is a strange story given by Epiphanius as an illustration of the cleverness of the devil. In the celebration of the Eucharist, three large vases of the finest and clearest crystal were brought among the congregation and filled with white wine. While the ceremony was going on, in full view of everybody, this wine was instantaneously changed into a blood red, a purple, and then into an azure blue color. Then the magus, says Epiphanius, hands one of these vases to a woman in the congregation and asks her to bless it. When it is done, the magus pours out of it into another vase of much greater capacity with the prayer, May the grace of God, which is above all, inconceivable, inexplicable, fill thy inner man, and augment the knowledge of him within thee, sowing the grain of mustard seed in good ground. Whereupon the liquor in the larger vase swells and swells until it runs over the brim. 
in connection with several of the pagan deities which are made after death and before their resurrection to descend into hell, it will be found useful to compare the pre-Christian with the post-Christian narratives. Orpheus made the journey, and Christ was the last of these subterranean travelers. In the Credo of the Apostles, which is divided in twelve sentences or articles, each particular article having been asserted by each particular apostle, according to St. Austin, the sentence, He descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead, is assigned to Thomas, perhaps as an atonement for his unbelief. Be it as it may, the sentence is declared a forgery. And there is no evidence that this creed was either framed by the apostles, or indeed that it existed as a creed in their time. It is the most important addition in the Apostles' Creed and dates since the year of Christ, 600. It was not known in the days of Eusebius. Bishop Parsons says that it was not in the ancient creeds or rules of faith. Irenaeus, Origen, and Tertullian exhibit no knowledge of the sentence. It is not mentioned in any of the councils before the 7th century. Theodore, Epiphanius, and Socrates are silent about it. It differs from the creed in St. Augustine. Rufinus affirms that in his time it was neither in the Roman nor in the Oriental creeds. Exposit in symbol apost 10. But the problem is solved when we learn that ages ago Hermes spoke thus to Prometheus chained on the arid rocks of the Caucasian mount. To such labors look thou for no termination, until some god shall appear as a substitute in thy pangs, and shall be willing to go both to gloomy Hades and to the murky depths around Tartarus. Asclius, Prometheus, 1027 FF This god was Heracles, the only begotten one, and the saviour and it is he who was chosen as a model by the ingenious fathers. Hercules, called Alexicos, for he brought round the wicked and converted them to virtue. Soter, or Savior, also called Nulos Emulos, the Good Shepherd. Astrocaton, the Star Clothed and the Lord of Fire. He sought not to subject nations by force, but by divine wisdom and persuasion, says Lucian. Heracles spread cultivation and a mild religion, and destroyed the doctrine of eternal punishment by dragging Kerberos, the pagan devil, from the netherworld. And as we see it, it was Heracles again who liberated Prometheus, the Adam of the pagans, by putting an end to the torture inflicted on him for his transgressions, by descending to the Hades and going round the Tartarus. Like Christ, he appeared as a substitute for the pangs of humanity by offering himself in a self-sacrifice on a funeral-burning pile. His voluntary immolation, says Bart, betokened the ethereal new birth of men. Through the release of Prometheus and the erection of altars, we behold in him the mediator between the old and the new faiths. He abolished human sacrifice wherever he found it practiced. He descended into the somber realm of Pluto as a shade, he ascended as a spirit to his father Zeus in Olympus. So much was antiquity impressed by the Heraclean legend that even the monotheistic Jews of those days, not to be outdone by their contemporaries, put him to use in their manufacture of original fables. Heracles is accused in his mythobiography of an attempted theft of the Delphian oracle. In Sefer told us Jeshu, the rabbins accused Jesus of stealing from their sanctuary the incommunicable name. Therefore, it is but natural to find his numerous adventures, worldly and religious, mirrored so faithfully in the descent into hell. For extraordinary daring of mendacity and unblushing plagiarism, the Gospel of Nicodemus, only now proclaimed apocryphal, surpasses anything we have read. Let the reader judge. At the beginning of chapter 16, Satan and the Prince of Hell are described as peacefully conversing together. All of a sudden, both are startled by a voice as of thunder, and the rushing winds, which bids them to lift up their gates, for the King of Glory shall come in. Whereupon the Prince of Hell, hearing this, begins quarreling with Satan for minding his duty so poorly, as not to have taken the necessary precautions against such a visit. 
The quarrel ends with the prince casting Satan forth from his hell, ordering at the same time his impious officers to shut the brass gates of cruelty, make them fast with iron bars, and fight courageously lest we be taken captives. But when all the company of the saints in hell heard this, they spoke with a loud voice of anger to the prince of darkness, Open thy gates, that the king of glory may come in, thereby proving that the prince needed spokesmen. And the divine prophet David cried out, saying, Did not I, when on earth, truly prophesy? After this, another prophet named Holy Isaiah spake in the same manner. Did not I rightly prophesy, etc.? Then the company of the saints and prophets, after boasting for the length of the chapter and comparing notes on their prophecies, begin a riot, which makes the prince of hell remark that the dead never durst before behave themselves so insolently towards us. The devils, 18.6. Feigning the while to be ignorant who it was claiming a mission. He then innocently asks again, Who is the king of glory? Then David tells him that he knows the voice well and understands its words, because he adds, I spake them by his spirit. Perceiving finally that the prince of hell would not open the brass doors of iniquity, notwithstanding the king psalmist's voucher for the visitor. He, David, concludes to treat the enemy as a Philistine and begins shouting, And now thou filthy and stinky prince of hell, open thy gates. I tell thee that the king of glory comes, let him enter in. While he was yet quarreling, the mighty lord appeared in the form of a man, upon which impious death and her cruel officers are seized with fear. Then they tremblingly begin to address Christ with a various flatteries and compliments in the shape of questions, each of which is an article of creed. For instance, And who art thou, so powerful and so great, who dost release the captives that were held in chains by original sin? asks one devil. Perhaps thou art that Jesus, submissively says another, of whom Satan just now spoke, that by the death of the cross thou wert about to receive the power over death etc. Instead of answering, the king of glory tramples upon death, seizes the prince of hell, and deprives him of his power. Then begins a turmoil in hell, which has been graphically described by Homer, Hesiod, and their interpreter, Preller. In his account, the astronomical Hercules Invictus, and his festivals at Tyre, Tarsus, and Sardis. Having been initiated in the Attic and Lucinia, the pagan god descends into Hades, and When he entered the netherworld, he spread such terror among the dead that all of them fled. The same words are repeated in Nicodemus. Follows a scene of confusion, horror, and lamenting. Perceiving that the battle is lost, the prince of hell turns tail and prudently chooses to side with the strongest. He against whom, according to Jude and Peter, even the archangel Michael durst not bring a railing accusation before the Lord is now shamefully treated by his ex-ally and friend, the Prince of Hell. Poor Satan is abused and reviled for all his crimes both by devils and saints, while the Prince is openly rewarded for his treachery. Addressing him, the King of Glory says thus, Beelzebub, the Prince of Hell, Satan, the Prince, shall now be subject to thy dominion forever, in the room of Adam and his righteous sons, who are mine. Come to me, all ye my saints who were created in my image, who were condemned by the tree of the forbidden fruit, and by the devil and death. Live now by the wood of my cross. The devil, the prince of this world, is overcome, and death is conquered. Then the Lord takes hold of Adam by his right hand, of David by the left, and ascends from hell, followed by all the saints, Enoch and Elias, and by the holy thief. The pious author, perhaps through an oversight, omits to complete the cavalcade by bringing up the rear with the penitent dragon of Simon Stylites and the converted wolf of St. Francis, wagging their tails and shedding tears of joy. In the Codex of the Nazarenes, it is Tobo who is the liberator of the soul of Adam, to bear it from Orcus, Hades, to the place of life. Tobo is Tob Adonaiah one of the twelve disciples, Levites, sent by 
Josaphat to preach to the cities of Judah the book of the law. 2 Cron 17. In the Kabbalistic books, these were wise men, magi. They drew down the rays of the sun to enlighten the Sheol, Hades, Orcus, and thus show the way out of the tenebrae, the darkness of ignorance, to the soul of Adam, which represents collectively all the souls of mankind. Adam, Athama, is Tammuz, or Adonis, and Adonis is the son Helios. In the Book of the Dead, 6, 231, Osiris is made to say, I shine like the sun in the star house at the Feast of the Sun. Christ is called the Son of Righteousness, Helios of Justice, Usib, Demons, EV, V29. Simply a revamping of the old heathen allegories, nevertheless, to have made it serve for such a use is no less blasphemous on the part of men who pretended to be describing a true episode of the earth pilgrimage of their god. Heracles, who has gone out from the chambers of earth, leaving the nether house of Pluton. At thee the Stygian lakes trembled. Phi, the janitor of Orcus, feared. Phi, not even Typhon, frightened. Hail, true son of Jove, glory added to the gods. More than four centuries before the birth of Jesus, Aristophanes had written his immortal parody on the descent into hell by Heracles. The chorus of the blessed ones, the initiated, the Elysian fields, the arrival of Bacchus, who is Iochus, Iho, and Sabbath, with Heracles, their reception with lighted torches, emblems of new life and resurrection from darkness, Death unto light, eternal life. Nothing that is found in the Gospel of Nicodemus is wanting in this poem. Wake, burning torches, for thou comest shaking them in thy hand. I act, phosphoric star of the nightly rite. But the Christians accept these post-mortem adventures of their God, concorded by those of his pagan predecessors, and derided by Aristophanes four centuries before our era, literally. The absurdities of Nicodemus we read in the churches, as well as those the shepherd of Hermas. Irenaeus quotes the latter under the name of Scripture, a divinely inspired revelation. Jerome and Asubius both insist upon it being publicly read in the churches. And Athanasius observes that the fathers appointed it to be read in confirmation of faith and piety. But then comes the reverse of this bright metal to show once more how stable and trustworthy were the opinions of the strongest pillars of an infallible church. Jerome, who applauds the book in his catalogue of ecclesiastical writers, in his later comments terms it apocryphal and foolish. Tertullian, who could not find praise enough for the shepherd of Hermas when a Catholic, began abusing it when a Montanist. Chapter 13 begins with the narrative given by the two resuscitated ghosts of Charinus and Lentheus, the sons of that Simeon who, in the Gospel according to Luke 2, 25-32, takes the infant Jesus in his arms and blesses God, saying, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. These two ghosts have arisen from their cold tombs on purpose, to declare the mysteries which they saw after death in hell. They are enabled to do so only at the importunate prayer of Annas and Caphias, Nicodemus, the author, Joseph of Arimathea, and Gamaliel, who beseech them to reveal to them the great secrets. Annas and Caphas, however, who bring the ghosts to the synagogue at Jerusalem, take the precaution to make the two resuscitated men who had been dead and buried for years, to swear on the book of the law by God Adonai and the God of Israel, to tell them only the truth. Therefore, after making the sign of the cross on their tongues, they ask for some paper to write their confessions. 12. 21. 25. They state how, when in the depth of hell, in the blackness of darkness, they suddenly saw a substantial purple-colored light illuminating the place. Adam, with the patriarchs and prophets, began thereupon to rejoice, and Isaiah also immediately boasted that he had predicted all that. While this was going on, Simeon, their father, arrived, declaring that 
the infant he took in his arms in the temple was now coming to liberate them. After Simeon had delivered this message to the distinguished company in hell, there came forth one like a little hermit, who proved to be John the Baptist. The idea is suggestive and shows that even the precursor and the prophet of the Most High had not been exempted from drying up in hell to the most diminutive proportions, and that to the extent of affecting his brains and memory, forgetting that Matthew 11, he had manifested the most evident doubts as to the messiahship of Jesus, the Baptist also claims his right to be recognized as a prophet. And I, John, he says, when I saw Jesus coming to me, being moved by the Holy Ghost, I said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And I baptized him, and I saw the Holy Ghost descending upon him, and saying, This is my beloved Son, etc. And to think that his descendants and followers, like the Mandians of Basra, utterly reject these words. Then Adam, who acts as though his own veracity might be questioned in this impious company, calls his son Seth and desires him to declare to his sons, the patriarchs and prophets, what the archangel Michael had told him at the gate of paradise, when he, Adam, sent Seth to entreat God with that he would anoint his head when Adam was sick. 14.2 and Seth tells them that when he was praying at the gates of paradise, Michael advised him not to entreat God for the oil of the tree of mercy, wherewith to anoint Father Adam for his headache, because thou canst by any means obtain it till the last day and times, namely till 5,500 years be passed. The private gossip between Michael and Seth was evidently introduced in the interests of patristic chronology and for the purpose of connecting Messiahship still closer with Jesus, on the authority of a recognized and divinely inspired gospel. The fathers of the early century committed an extricable mistake in destroying fragile images and mortal pagans, in preference to the monuments of Egyptian antiquity. These have become the more precious to archaeology and modern science since it is found they proved the King Manes and his architects Florist between four and five thousand years before Father Adam, and the universe, according to the biblical chronology, were created out of nothing. While all the saints were rejoicing, behold Satan, the prince and captive of death, says to the prince of hell, prepared to receive Jesus of Nazareth himself, who boasted that he was the Son of God, and yet was a man afraid of death, and said, My soul is sorrowful even to death. 15, 1, 2. There is a tradition among the Greek ecclesiastical writers that the heretics, perhaps Celsus, had sorely twitted the Christians on this delicate point. They held that if Jesus were not a simple mortal, who was often forsaken by the spirit of Christos, he could not have complained in such expressions as are attributed to him, neither would he have cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This objection is very cleverly answered in the Gospel of Nicodemus, and it is the Prince of Hell who settles the difficulty. He begins by arguing with Satan like a true metaphysician. Who is that so powerful prince? He sneeringly inquires. Who is he so powerful, and yet a man who is afraid of death? I affirm to thee that when, therefore, he said he was afraid of death, he designed to ensnare thee, and unhappy it will be to thee for everlasting ages. It is quite refreshing to see how closely the author of this gospel sticks to his New Testament text, and especially to the fourth evangelist, how cleverly he prepares the way for seemingly innocent questions and answers, corroborating the most dubious passages of the four gospels. Passages more questioned and cross-examined in those days of subtile sophistry of the learned Gnostics than they are now, a weighty reason why the fathers should have been even more anxious to burn the documents of their antagonists than to destroy their heresy. The following is a good instance. The dialogue is still proceeding between Satan and the metaphysical, half-converted prince of the underworld. Who then is that Jesus of Nazareth, naively inquires the prince, that by his word hath taken away the dead from me, without prayers to God? 
1560. Perhaps, replies Satan, with the innocence of a Jesuit, it is the same who took away from me Lazarus, after he had been four days dead, and did both stink and was rotten. It is the very same person, Jesus of Nazareth. I adjure thee by the powers which belong to thee and me, and thou bring him not to me, exclaims the prince. For when I heard of the power of his word, I trembled for fear, and all my impious company were disturbed. And we were not able to detain Lazarus, but he gave himself a shake, and with all the signs of malice he immediately went away from us. And the very earth in which the dead body of Lazarus was lodged presently turned him alive. Yes, thoughtfully, adds the Prince of Hell, I know now that he is Almighty God, who is mighty in his dominion, and mighty in his human nature, who is the Savior of mankind. Bring not, therefore, this person hither, for he will set at liberty all those I held in prison under unbelief, and will conduct them to everlasting life. 1520. Here ends the post-mortem evidence of the two ghosts. Chirinus, ghost number one, gives what he wrote to Annas, Cephas, and Gamaliel, and Lentheus, ghost number two, his to Joseph and Nicodemus, having done which both change into exceedingly white forms and were seen no more, to show furthermore that the ghosts had been all the time under the strictest test conditions, as the modern spiritualist would express it, the author of the gospel adds, but what they had wrote was found perfectly to agree, the one not containing one letter more or less than the other. The news spread in all the synagogues. The gospel goes on to state that Pilate went to the temple as advised by Nicodemus and assembled the Jews together. At this historical interview, Cephas and Annas are made to declare that their scriptures testify that he, Jesus, is the Son of God and the Lord and King of Israel, and close the confession with the following memorable words. And so it appears that Jesus, whom we crucified, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and true and almighty God. Amen. Notwithstanding such a crushing confession for themselves, and the recognition of Jesus as the Almighty God himself, the Lord God of Israel, neither the high priest, nor his father-in-law, nor any one of the elders, nor Pilate, who wrote those accounts, nor any of the Jews of Jerusalem, who were at all prominent, became Christians. Comments are unnecessary. This gospel closes with the words, In the name of the Holy Trinity, of which Nicodemus could know nothing yet, thus ends the acts of our Savior Jesus Christ, which the Emperor Theodosius the Great found at Jerusalem in the hall of Pontius Pilate among the public records, and which history purports to have been written in Hebrew by Nicodemus, the thing being acted in the nineteenth year of Tiberius Caesar, emperor of the Romans, and in the seventeenth year of the government of Herod, the son of Herod, king of Galilee, on the eighth before the calends of April, etc., etc. It is on the most barefaced imposture that was perpetrated after the era of pious forgeries opened with the first bishop of Rome, whoever he may have been. The clumsy forger seems to have neither known nor heard that the dogma of the Trinity was not propounded until 325 years later than this pretended date. Neither the Old nor the New Testament contains the word Trinity, nor anything that affords the slightest pretext for this doctrine. See page 177 of this volume, Christ's Descent into Hell. No explanation can palliate the putting forth of this spurious gospel as a divine revelation, for it was known from the first as a premeditated imposture. If the gospel itself has been declared apocryphal, nevertheless every one of the dogmas contained in it was and is still enforced upon the Christian world. And even the fact that itself is now repudiated is no merit, for the church was shamed and forced into it. And so we are perfectly warranted in repeating the amended credo of Robert Taylor, which is substantially that of the Christians. I believe in Zeus, the Father Almighty, and in his Son, Iaseus, Christ our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Ghost, 
Born of the virgin Electra, smitten with a thunderbolt, dead and buried, he descended into hell, rose again and ascended upon high, and will return to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the holy noose, in the holy circle of the great gods, in the community of divinities, in the expiation of sins, the immortality. In the expatiation of sins, the immortality of the soul, and the life everlasting. The Israelites have been proved to have worshipped Baal, the Syrian Bacchus, offered incense to the Sabazian or Asclepian serpent, and performed the Dionysian mysteries. And how could it be otherwise if Typhon was called Typhon Set, and Seth, the son of Adam, is identical with Satan, or Satan, and Seth was worshipped by the Hittites? Less than two centuries BC, we find the Jews either reverencing or simply worshipping the golden head of an ass in their temple. According to Appion, Antiochus Epiphanes carried it off with him and Zacharias is struck dumb by the apparition of the deity under the shape of an ass in the temple. In his able article, Bacchus the Prophet God, Professor A. Wilder remarks that Tacitus was mizzled into thinking that the Jews worshipped an ass, the symbol of Typhon or Seth, the Hyksos god. The Egyptian name of the ass was Ko, the phonetic of Io, and hence, probably he adds, a symbol that from mere circumstance. We can hardly agree with this learned archaeologist, for the idea that the Jews reverenced, for some mysterious reason, Typhon, under his symbolical representation, rests on more proof than one. And for one, we find a passage in the Gospel of Mary, is cited from Epiphanius, which corroborates the fact. It relates to the death of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, murdered by Herod, says the Protevangelion. Epiphanius writes that the cause of the death of Zacharias was that upon seeing a vision in the temple, he, through surprise, was willing to disclose it, but his mouth was stopped. That which he saw was at the time of his offering incense, and it was a man standing in the form of an ass. When he was gone out and had a mind to speak thus to the people, Woe unto you, whom do ye worship? He who had appeared unto him in the temple took away the use of his speech. Afterward, when he recovered it and was able to speak, he declared this to the Jews, and they slew him. They, the Gnostics, add in this book that on this very account the high priest was commanded by the lawgiver Moses to carry little bells, that whensoever he sent into the temple to sacrifice, he whom they worshipped, hearing the noise of the bells, might have time enough to hide himself and not be caught in that ugly shape and figure. Epiph. El, the sun god of the Syrians, the Egyptians, and the Semites, is declared by Pleti to be no other than Set or Seth, and Il is the primeval Saturn, Israel. Siva is an Ethiopian god, the same as the Chaldean Baal, Bel. Thus he is also Saturn. Saturn, El, Seth, and Cayun, or the biblical Chion of Amos, are all one and the same deity and may be all regarded in their worst aspect as Typhon the Destroyer. When the religious pantheon assumed a more definite expression, Typhon was separated from his androgyne, the good deity, and fell into degradation as a brutal unintellectual power. Such reactions in the religious feelings of a nation were not unfrequent. The Jews had worshipped Baal or Moloch, the sun god Hercules. In their early days, if they had any days at all earlier than the Persians or Maccabees, and then made their prophets denounce them. On the other hand, the characteristics of the Mosaic Jehovah exhibit more of the moral disposition of Siva than of a benevolent, long-suffering God. Besides, to be identified with Siva is no small compliment, for the latter is God of wisdom. Wilkinson depicts him as the most intellectual of the Hindu gods. He is three-eyed and, like Jehovah, terrible in his resistless revenge and wrath. And although the destroyer, yet he is the recreator of all things in perfect wisdom. He is the type of St. Augustine's God, who prepares hell for priors into his mysteries, and insists on trying human reason as well as common sense, 
by forcing mankind to view with equal reverence his good and evil acts. Notwithstanding the numerous proofs that the Israelites worshipped a variety of gods, and even offered human sacrifices until a far later period than their pagan neighbors, they have contrived to blind posterity in regard to truth. They sacrificed human life as late as 169 BC, and the Bible contains a number of such records. At a time when the pagans had long abandoned the abominable practice, and had replaced the sacrificial man by the animal, Jephthah is represented sacrificing his own daughter to the Lord for a burnt offering. The denunciations of their own prophets are the best proofs against them. Their worship in high places is the same as that of idolaters. Their prophetesses are counterparts of the Pithi and Bacantes. Pausanias speaks of women, colleges with superintend the worship of Bacchus and of the sixteen matron of Ellis. The Bible says that Deborah, a prophetess, judged Israel at that time, and speaks of Huldah, another prophetess, who dwelt in Jerusalem in the college. And two Samuel mentions wise women several times. Notwithstanding the injunction of Moses not to use either divination or augury, as to the final and conclusive identification of the Lord God of Israel with Moloch, we find a very suspicious evidence of the case in the last chapter of Leviticus. Concerning things devoted not to be redeemed, a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death, for it is most holy unto the Lord. The duality, if not the plurality, of the gods of Israel may be inferred from the very fact of such bitter denunciations. Their prophets never approved of sacrificial worship. Samuel denied that the Lord had any delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices. 1 Samuel 15.22 Jeremiah asserted unequivocally that the Lord, Yahweh Sabaoth, Eloi Israel, never commanded anything of the sort, but contrarywise. 7, 21, 24. But these prophets who opposed themselves to human sacrifices were all Nazars and initiates. These prophets led a party in the nation against the priests, as later the Gnostics contended against the Christian fathers. Hence, when the monarchy was divided, we find the priests at Jerusalem and the prophets in the country of Israel. Even Ahab and his sons, who introduced the Tyrian worship of Baal Hercules and the Syrian goddess into Israel, were aided and encouraged by Elijah and Elisha. Few prophets appeared in Judea until Isaiah, after the northern monarchy had been overthrown. Elisha anointed Jehu on purpose that he should destroy the royal families of both countries, and so unite the people into one civil polity. For the temple of Solomon, desecrated by the priests, no Hebrew prophet or initiate cared a straw. Eliah never went to it, nor Elisha, Jonah, Nahum, Amos, or any other Israelite. While the initiates were holding to the secret doctrine of Moses, the people, led by their priests, were steeped in idolatry exactly the same as that of the pagans. It is the popular views and interpretations of Jehovah that the Christians have adopted. The question is likely to be asked, in the view of so much evidence to show that Christian theology is only a potpourri of pagan mythologies, how can it be connected with the religion of Moses? The early Christians, Paul and his disciples, the Gnostics and their successors generally, regarded Christianity and Judaism as essentially distinct. The latter, in their view, was an antagonistic system, and from a lower origin. Ye received the law, said Stephen, from the ministration of angels, or aeons, and not from the Most High himself. The Gnostics, as we have seen, taught that Jehovah, the deity of the Jews, was Ildeboaf, the son of the ancient Bohu, or Chaos, the adversary of divine wisdom. The question may be more than easily answered. The law of Moses and the so-called monotheism of the Jews can hardly be said to have been more than two or three centuries older than Christianity. The Pentateuch itself, we are able to show, was written and revised upon this new departure. 
at a period subsequent to the colonization of Judea, under the authority of the kings of Persia. The Christian fathers, in their eagerness to make their new system dovetail with Judaism, and so avoid paganism, unconsciously shunned Scylla, only to be caught in the whirlpool of Cheriblis. Under the monotheistic stucco of Judaism was unearthed the same familiar mythology of paganism. But we should not regard the Israelites with less favor for having had a Moloch and being like the natives. Nor should we compel the Jews to do penance for their fathers. They had their prophets and their law and were satisfied with them. How faithfully and nobly they have stood in their ancestral faith under the most diabolical persecutions. The present remains of a once glorious people bear witness. The Christian world has been in a state of convulsion from the first to the present century. It has been cleft into thousands of sects, but the Jews remain substantially united. Even their differences of opinion do not destroy their unity. The Christian virtues inculcated by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount are nowhere exemplified in the Christian world. The Buddhist ascetics and Indian fakirs seem almost the only ones that inculcate and practice them. Meanwhile, the vices which coarse-mouthed slanderers have attributed to paganism are current everywhere among Christian fathers and Christian churches. The boasted wide gap between Christianity and Judaism that is claimed on the authority of Paul exists but in the imagination of the pious. We are not but the inheritors of the intolerant Israelites of ancient days, not the Hebrews of the time of Herod and the Roman dominion, who with all their faults kept strictly orthodox and monotheistic. But the Jews who, under the name of Jehovah Nissi, worshipped Bacchus Osiris, Dionysos, the multiform Jove of Nyssa, the Sinai of Moses, the Kabbalistic demons, allegories of the profoundest meaning, were adopted as objective entities, and a satanic hierarchy carefully drawn by the orthodox demonologists. The Rosicrucian motto, Igni Natura Renovator Integra, which the alchemists interpret as nature renovated by fire, or matter by spirit, is made to be accepted to this day as Isis Nazarenus Rex. Ludorium. The mocking satire of Pilate is accepted literally, and the Jews made to unwittingly confess thereby the royalty of Christ. Whereas, if the inscription is not a forgery of the Constantinian period, it yet is the action of Pilate, against which the Jews were the first to violently protest. IHS is interpreted Isaias Hominum Salvator and in hoc signo, whereas I.E. is one of the most ancient names of Bacchus. And more than ever do we begin to find out, by the bright light of comparative theology, that the great object of Jesus, the initiate of the inner sanctuary, was to open the eyes of the fanatical multitude to the difference between the highest divinity, the mysterious and never-mentioned I.O. of the ancient Chaldean and later Neoplatonic initiates and the Hebrew Yahuh or Yaho Jehovah. The modern Rosicrucians, so violently denounced by the Catholics, now find brought against them, as the most important charge, the fact that they accuse Christ of having destroyed the worship of Jehovah. Would to heaven he could have been allowed the time to do so, for the world would not have found itself still bewildered after 19 centuries of mutual massacres among 300 quarreling sects, and with a personal devil reigning over a terrorized Christendom. True to the exclamation of David, paraphrased in King James's version, as all the gods of all the nations are idols, i.e. devils, Bacchus, or the firstborn of the Orphic theogony, the monogenes, or the only begotten, of Father Zeus and Kor, was transformed with the rest of the ancient myths into a devil. By such a degradation, the fathers, whose pious zeal can only be surpassed by their ignorance, have unwittingly furnished evidence against themselves. They have with their own hands paved the way for many a future solution, and greatly helped modern students of the science of religions. It was in the Bacchus myth that lay concealed for long and dreary centuries 
both the future vindication of the reviled gods of the nations and the last clue to the enigma of Jehovah. The strange duality of divine and moral characteristics, so conspicuous in the Sinaitic deity, begins to yield its mystery before the untiring inquiry of the age. One of the latest contributions we find in a short but highly important paper in the Evolution, a periodical of New York, the closing paragraph of which throws a floodlight on Bacchus. The Jove of Nyssa, who was worshipped by the Israelites as Jehovah of Sinai. Such was the Jove of Nyssa to his worshippers, concludes the author. He represented to them alike the world of nature and the world of thought. He was the son of righteousness, with healing on his wings. And he not only brought joy to mortals, but opened them to hope beyond mortality and immortal life. Born a human mother, he raised her from the world of death to the supernal heir, and to be revered and worshipped, at once Lord of all worlds. He was in them all alike the Savior. Such was Bacchus, the prophet god, a change of cultus, decreed by the murderer imperial, the emperor Theodosius, at the instance of ghostly father Ambrosius of Milan, has changed his title to father of lies. His worship before universal was denominated pagan or local, and his rites stigmatized as witchcraft. His orgies received the name of witch's sabbath, and his favorite symbolical form with the bovine foot became the modern representative of the devil with the cloven hoof. The master of the house having been called Beelzebub, they of his household were alike denounced as having commerce with the powers of darkness. Crusades were undertaken, whole peoples massacred, knowledge and the higher learning were denounced as magic and sorcery. Ignorance became the mother of devotion, such as when then cherished. Galileo languished long years in prison for teaching that the sun was in the center of the solar universe. Bruno was burned alive at Rome in 1600 for reviving the ancient philosophy. Yet, queerly enough, the Liberalia had become a festival of the church. Bacchus is a saint in the calendar, four times repeated, and at many a shrine he may be seen reposing in the arms of his deified mother. The names are changed, the ideas remain as before. And now that we have shown that we must indeed bid an eternal farewell to all the rebellious angels, we naturally pass to an examination of the God Jesus, who was manufactured out of the man Jesus to redeem us from these very mythical devils, as Father Ventura shows us. This labor will, of course, necessitate once more a comparative inquiry into the history of Gautama Buddha, his doctrines and his miracles, and those of Jesus and the predecessor of both, Krishna. Chapter 11 not to commit any sin, to do good, and to purify one's mind. That is the teaching of the awakened. Better than sovereignty over the earth, better than going to heaven, better than lordship over all the worlds is the reward of the first step in holiness. Dhammapada, verses 178-183 to Creator, where are these tribunals? Where do these courts proceed? Where do these courts assemble? Where do these tribunals meet, to which the man of the embodied world gives an account for his soul? Persian Vendadad, 1989 Hail to thee, O man, who art come from the transitory place to the imperishable. Vendadad, Farg 7, 136 To the true believer, truth, whether it appears, is welcome, nor will any doctrine seem the less true or the less precious, because it was seen not only by Moses or Christ, but likewise by Buddha or Lao Tse. Max Muller Unluckily for those who would have been glad to render justice to the ancient and modern religious philosophies of the Orient, a fair opportunity has hardly ever been given to them. Of late, there has been a touching accord between philologists holding high official positions and missionaries from heathen lands. Prudence before truth when the latter endangers our sign cures. Besides, how easy to compromise with conscience. State religion is a prop of government. All state religions are exploded humbugs. Therefore, since one is as good or rather as bad as another, 
the state religion, may as well be supported. Such is the diplomacy of official science. Grote, in his History of Greece, assimilates the Pythagoreans to the Jesuits, and sees in their brotherhood but an ably disguised object to inquire political ascendancy. On the loose testimony of Heraclitus and some other writers, who accused Pythagoras of craft and described him as a man of extensive research, but artful for mischief and destitute of sound judgment, some historical biographers hastened to present him to posterity in such a character. How then, if they must accept the Pythagoras painted by the satirical Timon, a juggler of solemn speech engaged in fishing for men, can they avoid judging of Jesus from the sketch that Celsus has embalmed in his satire? Historical impartiality has not to do with the creeds and personal beliefs and exacts as much of posterity for one as for the other. The life and doings of Jesus are far less attested than those of Pythagoras, if indeed we can say that they are attested at all by any historical proof. For assuredly no one will gainsay that, as a real personage Celsus, has the advantage as regards the credibility of his testimony over Matthew or Mark or Luke or John who never wrote a line of the Gospels attributed to them respectively. With all, Celsus is at least as good a witness as Heraclitus. He was known as a scholar and a Neoplatonist to some of the fathers, whereas the very existence of the four apostles must be taken on blind faith. If Timon regarded the sublime Samian as a juggler, so did Celsus hold Jesus, or rather those who made all the pretenses for him. In his famous work, Addressing the Nazarene, he says, let us grant that the wonders were performed by you. But are they not common with those who have been taught by the Egyptians to perform in the middle of the forum for a few oboli? And we know, on the authority of the Gospel according to Matthew, that the Galilean prophet was also a man of solemn speech, and that he called himself and offered to make his disciples fishers of men. Let it not be imagined that we bring this reproach to any who revere Jesus as God. Whatever the faith, if the worshipper be but sincere, it should be respected in his presence. If we do not accept Jesus as God, we revere him as a man. Such a feeling honors him more than if we were to attribute to him the powers and personality of the Supreme, and credit him at the same time with having played a useless comedy with mankind as, after all, his mission proves scarcely less than a complete failure. Two thousand years have passed, and Christians do not reckon one-fifth part of the population of the globe, nor is Christianity likely to progress any better in the future. No, we aim but at a strict justice, leaving all personality aside. We question those who, adoring neither Jesus, Pythagoras, nor Apollonius, yet recite the idle gossip of their contemporaries. Those who in their books either maintain a prudent silence, or speak of our Savior and our Lord, as though they believed any more in the made-up theological Christ than in the fabulous foe of China. There were no atheists in those days of old, no disbelievers or materialists, in the modern sense of the word, as there were no bigoted detractors. He who judges the ancient philosophies by their external phraseology, and quotes from ancient writings, sentences seemingly atheistical, is unfit to be trusted as a critic, for he is unable to penetrate into the inner sense of their metaphysics. The views of Pyro, whose rationalism has become proverbial, can be interpreted only by the light of the oldest Hindu philosophy. From Manu down to the latest Swambhavika, its leading metaphysical feature ever was to proclaim the reality and supremacy of spirit, with a vehemence proportionate to the denial of the objective existence of our material world, passing phantom of temporary forms and beings. The numerous schools begotten by Kapila reflect his philosophy no clearer than the doctrines left as a legacy to thinkers by Timon. Pyro's prophet, as Sextus Empiricus calls him, his views on the divine repose of the soul, his proud indifference to the opinion of his fellow men, his contempt for sophistry, reflect in an equal degree stray beams on the self-contemplation of the gymnastophists and of the Buddhist Vabashika. Notwithstanding that he and his followers are termed, from their state of constant suspense, 
skeptics, doubters, inquirers, and effectics, only because they postponed their final judgment on dilemmas, with which our modern philosophers prefer dealing. Alexander-like, by cutting the Gordian knot and then declaring the dilemma a superstition, such men as Pyro cannot be pronounced atheists. No more can Capilla, or Giordano Bruno, or again Spinoza, who were all treated as atheists, nor yet the great Hindu poet, philosopher, and dialectician, Veda Yasa, whose principle that all is an illusion, save the great unknown and his direct essence, Pyro has adopted in full. These philosophical beliefs extended like a network over the whole pre-Christian world, and surviving persecution and misrepresentations form the cornerstone of every now existing religion outside Christianity. Comparative theology is a two-edged weapon, and has so proved itself. But the Christian advocates, unabashed by evidence, force comparison in the serenest way. Christian legends and dogmas, they say, do somewhat resemble the heathen, it is true. But see, while the one teaches us the existence, powers, and attributes of an all-wise, all-good Father God, Brahmanism gives us a multitude of minor gods, and Buddhism none whatever. One is fetishism and polytheism, the other bald atheism. Jehovah is the one true God, and the Pope and Martin Luther are his prophets. This is a one edge of the sword, and this is the other. Despite missions, despite armies, despite enforced commercial intercourse, the heathen find nothing in the teachings of Jesus, sublime though some are, that Krishna and Gautama had not taught them before. And so, to gain over any new converts, to keep the few already won by centuries of cunning, the Christians give the heathen dogmas more absurd than their own, and cheat them by adopting the habit of their native priests, and practicing the very idolatry and fetishism which they so disparage in the heathens. Comparative theology works both ways. In Siam and Burma, Catholic missionaries have become perfect talipoints to all external appearance, i.e., minus their virtues and throughout India, especially in the South, they were denounced by their own colleague, the Abbe Dubois. This was afterward vehemently denied. But now we have living witnesses to the correctness of the charge. Among others, Captain O'Grady, already quoted, a native of Madras, writes the following on this systematic method of deception. The hypocritical beggars profess total abstinence and horror of flesh to conciliate converts from Hinduism. I got one father, or rather he got himself gloriously drunk in my house, time and again, and the way he pitched into roast beef was a caution. Further, the author has pretty stories to tell of black-faced Christs, virgins on wheels, and of Catholic processions in general. We have seen such solemn ceremonies accompanied by the most infernal cacophony of a Singhalese orchestra, tam-tam and gongs included, followed by a like Brahmanic procession, which for its picturesque coloring and mise-en-scene looked far more solemn and imposing than the Christian Saturnalias. Speaking of one of these, the same author remarks, it was more devilish than religious. The bishop walked off Romeward, with a mighty pile of Peter's pence gathered in the minutest sums, with gold ornaments, nose rings, anklets, elbow bangles, etc., etc., in profusion, recklessly thrown in heaps at the feet of the grotesque copper-colored image of the Savior, with its Dutch metal halo and gaudily striped cummerbund and shade of Raphael, blue turban, as everyone can see, such voluntary contributions make it quite profitable to mimic the native Brahmins and bronzes. Between the worshippers of Krishna and Christ, or Avani and the Virgin Mary, there is less substantial difference, in fact, than between the two native sects, the Vishnavites and the Sivites. For the converted Hindus, Christ is a slightly modified Krishna, that is all. Missionaries carry away rich donations and Rome is satisfied. Then comes a year of famine, but the nose rings and gold elbow bangles are gone and people starve by thousands. What matters it? They die in Christ, and Rome scatters her blessings over their corpses, of which thousands float yearly down the sacred rivers to the ocean. 
So servile are the Catholics in their imitation, and so careful not to give offense to their parishioners, that if they happen to have a few higher caste converts in a church, no pariah, nor any man of the lower castes, however good a Christian he may be, can be admitted into the same church with them. And yet, they dare call themselves the servants of him who sought in preference the society of the publicans and sinners, and whose appeal, Come unto me, all ye that are heaven-laden, and I will give you rest, has opened to him the hearts of millions of the suffering and the oppressed. Few writers are as bold and outspoken as the late lamented Dr. Thomas Inman of Liverpool, England. But however small their number, these men all agree unanimously that the philosophy of both Buddhism and Brahmanism must rank higher than Christian theology and teach neither atheism or fetishism. To my own mind, says Inman, the assertion that Sakya did not believe in God is wholly unsupported. Nay, this whole scheme is built upon the belief that there are powers above which are capable of punishing mankind for their sins. It is true that these gods were not called Elohim, nor Yah, nor Jehovah, nor Javeh, nor Adonai, nor Ihe, nor Balim, nor Ashtoreth, yet for the son of Sudadana, there was a supreme being. There are four schools of Buddhist theology in Ceylon, Tibet, and India. One is rather pantheistical than atheistical, but the other three are purely theistical. On the first, the speculations of our philologists are based. As to the second, third, and the fourth, their teachings vary but in the external mode of expression. We have fully explained the spirit of it elsewhere. As to practical, not theoretical views on the nirvana, this is what a rationalist and skeptic says. I have questioned at the very doors of their temples several hundreds of Buddhists, and have not found one, but strove, fasted, and gave himself up to every kind of austerity, to perfect himself and acquire immortality, not to attain final annihilation. There are over 300 million of Buddhists who fast, pray, and toil. Why make of these three hundred million of men idiots and fools, macerating their bodies and imposing upon themselves most fearful privations of every nature, in order to reach a fatal annihilation which must overtake them anyhow? As well as this author, we have questioned Buddhists and Brahmanists and studied their philosophy. Apavark has wholly a different meaning from annihilation. It is but to become more and more like him, of whom he is one of the refulgent sparks. That is, the aspiration of every Hindu philosopher and the hope of the most ignorant is never to yield up his distinct individuality. Bell says once remarked an esteemed correspondent of the author, mundane and separate existence would look like God's comedy in our tragedy, sport to him that we work and suffer, death to us to suffer it. The same with the doctrine of metempsychosis, so distorted by European scholars. But as the work of translation and analysis progresses, fresh religious beauties will be discovered in the old faiths. Professor Whitney has in his translation of the Vedas passages in which he says, The assumed importance of the body to its old tenant is brought out in the strongest light. These are portions of hymns read at funeral services over the body of the departed one. We quote them from Mr. Whitney's scholarly work. Start onward. Bring together all thy members. Let not thy limbs be left, nor yet thy body. Thy spirit gone before, now follow after. Wherever it delights thee, go thou thither. Collect thy body with its every member. Thy limbs with help of rites I fashion for thee. If some one limb was left behind by Agni, when to thy father's world he hence conveyed you. That very one I now again supply you. Rejoice in heaven with all your limbs, ye fathers. The body, here referred to, is not the physical, but the astral one, a very great distinction, as may be seen. Again, belief in the individual existence of the immortal spirit of man is shown in the following verses of the Hindu ceremonial of incremation and burial. They who within the sphere of earth are stationed, or who are settled now in realms of pleasure, the fathers who have the earth, the atmosphere, the heaven for their seat. The four heaven, the third heaven is styled, and where the fathers have their seat. Rig Veda 10. 
with such majestic views as these people held of God and the immortality of man's spirit, it is not surprising that a comparison between the Vedic hymns and the narrow, unspiritual Mosaic books should result to the advantage of the former in the mind of every unprejudiced scholar. Even the ethical code of Manu is incomparably higher than that of the Pentateuch of Moses, in the literal meaning of which all the uninitiated scholars of two worlds cannot find a single proof that the ancient Jews believed either in a future life or an immortal spirit in man or that Moses himself ever taught it. Yet we have eminent Orientalists who begin to suspect that the dead letter conceals something not apparent at first sight. So Professor Whitney tells us that, as we look yet further into the forms of the modern Hindu ceremonial, we discover not a little of the same discordance between creed and observance. The one is not explained by the other, says the great American scholar. He adds, we are forced to the conclusion that either India derived its systems of rites from some foreign source and practiced them blindly, careless of their true import, or else those rites are the production of another doctrine of an older date, and have maintained themselves in popular usage after the decay of the creed, of which they were the original expression. This creed has not decayed, and its hidden philosophy, as understood now by the initiated Hindus, is just as it was 10,000 years ago. But can our scholars seriously hope to have it delivered unto them upon their first demand? Or do they still expect to fathom the mysteries of the world religion and its popular exoteric rites? No orthodox Brahmins and Buddhists would deny the Christian incarnation. Only they would understand it in their own philosophical way. And how could they deny it? The very cornerstone of their religious system is periodical incarnations of the deity. Whenever humanity is about merging into materialism and moral degradation, a supreme spirit incarnates himself in his creatures selected for the purpose. The messenger of the highest links itself with the duality of matter and soul, and the triad being thus completed by the union of its crown, a savior is born, who helps restore humanity to the path of truth and virtue. The early Christian church, all imbued with Asiatic philosophy, evidently shared the same belief. Otherwise, it would have neither erected it into an article of faith, the Second Advent, nor cunningly invented the fable of Antichrist as a precaution against possible future incarnations. Neither could they have imagined that Melchizedek was an avatar of Christ. They had only to turn to the Bhagavad Gita to find Krishna, or Bhagavad, saying to Arjuna, He who follows me is saved by wisdom and even by works. As often as virtue declines in the world, I make myself manifest to save it. Indeed, it is more than difficult to avoid sharing this doctrine of periodical incarnations. Has not the world witnessed at rare intervals the advent of such grand characters as Krishna, Sakyamuni, and Jesus? Like the latter two personages, Krishna seems to have been a real being, deified by his school at some time in the twilight of history and made to fit into the frame of the time-honored religious program. Compare the two redeemers, the Hindu and the Christian, the one preceding the other by some thousands of years, place between them Siddhartha Buddha reflecting Krishna and projecting into the night of the future his own luminous shadow. Out of those collected rays were shaped the outlines of the mythical Jesus, and from whose teachings were drawn those of the historical Christos. And we find that, under one identical garment of poetical legend, lived and breathed three real human figures. The individual merit of each of them is rather brought out in stronger relief than otherwise by the same mythical coloring. For no unworthy character could have been selected for deification by the popular instinct, so unerring and just when left untrammeled. Vox Populi, Vox Dei, was once true, however erroneous when applied to the present priest-ridden mob. Capilla, Orpheus, Pythagoras, Plato, Basilides, Marcian, Ammonius, and Plotinus founded schools and sowed the germs of many a noble thought, and disappearing left behind them the refulgence of demigods. But the three personalities of Krishna, Gautama, and Jesus appeared like true gods, each in his epoch, and bequeathed to humanity three religions built on the imperishable rock of ages. That all three, especially the Christian faith, have in time become adulterated, 
and the latter, almost unrecognizable, is no fault of either of the noble reformers. It is the priestly, self-styled husbandmen of the vine of the Lord, who must be held to account by future generations. Purify the three systems of the dross of human dogmas, the pure essence remaining will be found identical. Even Paul the Great, the honest apostle, in the glow of his enthusiasm, either unwittingly perverted the doctrines of Jesus, or else his writings are disfigured beyond recognition. The Talmud, the record of people who, notwithstanding his apostasy from Judaism, yet feel compelled to acknowledge Paul's greatness as a philosopher and religionist, says of Ahur, Paul, in the Yerushalmi, that he corrupted the work of that man, meaning Jesus. Meanwhile, before this smelting is completed by honest science and future generations, let us glance at the present aspect of the legendary three religions. The legends of three saviors, Krishna, epoch, uncertain, European science fears to commit itself, but the Brahmanical calculation fix it at about 6,877 years ago. Krishna descends of a royal family but is brought up by shepherds, is called the shepherd god. His birth and divine descent are kept secret from Kansa. An incarnation of Vishnu, the second person of the Trimurti, Trinity, Krishna was worshipped at Mathura on the river Jumna. See Strabo and Arian and Brampton lectures, pages 98 to 100. Krishna is persecuted by Kansa, tyrant of Madura, but miraculously escapes. In the hope of destroying the child, the king has thousands of male innocents slaughtered. Krishna's mother was Devaki, or Devanagi, an immaculate virgin, but had given birth to eight sons before Krishna. Krishna is endowed with beauty, omniscience, and omnipotence from birth, produces miracles, cures the lame and blind, and casts out demons, washes the feet of the Brahmins, and descends to the lowest regions, hell, liberates the dead and returns to Vakantha, the paradise of Vishnu. Krishna was the god Vishnu himself in human form. Krishna creates boys out of calves and vice versa. Maurice's Indian Antiquities, volume 2, page 332. He crushes the serpent's head, I bid. Krishna is Unitarian. He persecutes the clergy, charges them with ambition and hypocrisy to their faces, divulges the great secrets of the sanctuary, the unity of God and immortality of our spirit. Tradition says he fell a victim to their vengeance. His favorite disciple, Arjuna, never deserts him to the last. There are credible traditions that he died on a cross, a tree, nailed to it by an arrow. The best scholars agree that the Irish cross at Tuam, erected long before the Christian era, is Asiatic. See Round Towers, pages 296. Et Sic by O'Brien, also Religions de l'Antique. Kreuzer's Symbolique, volume 1, page 208, an engraving in Dr. Lundy's Monumental Christianity, page 160. Krishna ascends to Shwarga and becomes Nirguna. Gautama Buddha, Epoch, according to European science and the Selenese calculations, 2,540 years ago. Gautama is the son of a king. His first disciples are shepherds and mendicants. According to some, an incarnation of Vishnu. According to others, an incarnation of one of the Buddhas, and even of Ad Buddha, the highest wisdom. Buddhist legends are free from this plagiarism, but the Catholic legend that makes of him St. Josaphat shows his father, king of Kapilavastu, slaying the innocent young Christians. See Golden Legend. Buddha's mother was Maya, or Maya Deva, married to her husband, yet an immaculate virgin. Buddha is endowed with the same powers and qualities and performs similar wonders, passes his life with mendicants. It is claimed for Gautama that he was distinct from all other avatars, having the entire spirit of Buddha in him, while all others had but a part, ansa, of the divinity in them. Gautama crushes the serpent's head, i.e. abolishes the Naga worship as fetishism, but like Jesus makes the serpent the emblem of divine wisdom. Buddha abolishes idolatry, divulges the mysteries of the unity of God and the nirvana the true meaning of which was previously known only to the priests. 
Persecuted and driven out of the country, he escapes death by gathering about him some hundreds of thousands of believers in his Buddhaship. Finally dies, surrounded by a host of disciples, with Ananda, his beloved disciple and cousin, chief among them all. O'Brien believes that this Irish cross at Tuam is meant for Buddhas, but Gautama was never crucified. He is represented in many temples as sitting under a cruciform tree, which is the tree of life. In another image, he is sitting on Naga, the Raja of serpents, with a cross on his breast. Buddha ascends to Nirvana. Jesus of Nazareth, epoch, supposed to be 1,877 years ago. His birth and royal descent are concealed from Herod the tyrant. The sins of the royal family of David is worshipped by shepherds at his birth and is called the Good Shepherd. See Gospel according to John. An incarnation of the Holy Ghost, then the second person of the Trinity, now the third, but the Trinity was not invented until 325 years after his birth. Went to Mathura or Materia in Egypt and produced his first miracles there. See Gospel of Infancy. Jesus is persecuted by Herod, king of Judea, but escapes into Egypt under conduct of an angel. To assure his slaughter, Herod orders a massacre of innocents, and 40,000 were slain. Jesus' mother was Miriam, or Miriam. Married to her husband, yet an immaculate virgin, but had several children besides Jesus. See Matthew 13, 55-56. Jesus is similarly endowed. See Gospels and the Apocryphal Testament. Passes his life with sinners and publicans. Casts out demons likewise. The only notable difference between the three is that Jesus is charged with casting out devils by the power of Beelzebub, which others were not. Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, dies, descends to hell, and ascends to heaven after liberating the dead. Jesus is said to have crushed the serpent's head, agreeably to original revelation in Genesis. He also transforms boys into kids and kids into boys. Gospel of infancy. Jesus rebels against the old Jewish law, denounces the scribes and Pharisees, and the synagogue for hypocrisy and dogmatic intolerance breaks the Sabbath and defies the law, is accuser by the Jews of divulging the secrets of the sanctuary, is put to death on a cross, a tree. Of the little handful of disciples whom he converted, one betrays him, one denies him, and the others desert him at the last, except John, the disciple he loved. Jesus, Krishna, and Buddha, all three saviors, die either on or under trees, and are connected with crosses, which are symbolical of the threefold powers of creation. Jesus ascends to paradise. Result? About the middle of the present century, the followers of these three religions were reckoned as follows. Of Krishna, Brahmins, 60 million. Of Buddha, Buddhists, 450 million. Of Jesus, Christians, 260 million. Such is the present aspect of these three great religions, of which each is in turn reflected in its successor. Had the Christian dogmatizers stopped there, the results would not have been so disastrous, for it would be hard indeed to make a bad creed out of the lofty teachings of Gautama, or Krishna, as Bhagavad. But they went farther, and added to the pure primitive Christianity the fables of Hercules, Orpheus, and Bacchus, as Muslims will not admit that their Koran is built on the substratum of the Jewish Bible. So the Christians will not confess that they owe next to everything to the Hindu religions but the Hindus have chronology to prove it to them. We see the best and most learned of our writers uselessly striving to show that the extraordinary similarities, amounting to identity, between Krishna and Christ are due to the spurious gospels of the infancy and of St. Thomas having probably circulated on the coast of Malabar and giving color to the story of Krishna. Why not accept truth in all sincerity? And reversing matters, admit that St. Thomas, faithful to that policy of proselytism which marked the earliest Christians when he found in Malabar the original of the mythical Christ in Krishna, tried to blend the two when adopting in his gospel, from which all others were copied, the most important details of the story of the Hindu avatar and grafted the Christian heresy on the primitive religion of Krishna. For anyone acquainted with the spirit of Brahmanism, the idea of Brahmins accepting anything from a stranger, especially from a foreigner, is simply ridiculous. 
that they, the most fanatic people in religious matters, who during centuries cannot be compelled to adopt the most simple of European usages, should be suspected of having introduced into their sacred books unverified legends about a foreign god, is something so preposterously illogical that it is really waste of time to contradict the idea. We will not stop to examine the two well-known resemblances between the external form of Buddhistic worship, especially Lamaism and Roman Catholicism, for noticing which poor Huck paid dear, but proceed to compare the most vital points. Of all the original manuscripts that have been translated from the various languages in which Buddhism is expounded, the most extraordinary and interesting are Buddha's Dhammapada, or Path of Virtue, translated from the Pali by Colonel Rogers, and the Wheel of the Law, containing the views of a Siamese minister of state on his own and other religions, and translated by Henry Alabaster. The reading of these two books and the discovery of them in similarities of thought and doctrine, often amounting to identity, prompted Dr. Inman to write the many profoundly true passages embodied in one of his last works, Ancient Faith and Modern. I speak with sober earnestness, writes this kind-hearted, sincere scholar, when I say that after 40 years, experience among those who profess Christianity and those who proclaim, more or less quietly, their disagreement with it, I have noticed more sterling virtue and morality amongst the last than the first. I know personally many pious, good Christian people whom I honor, admire, and perhaps would be glad to emulate or to equal, but they deserve the eulogy passed thus on to them in consequence of their good sense, having ignored the doctrine of faith to a great degree and having cultivated the practice of good works. In my judgment, the most praiseworthy Christians whom I know are modified Buddhists though probably not one of them ever heard of Siddhartha. Between the Lamaco Buddhistic and Roman Catholic articles of faith and ceremonies, there are 51 points presenting a perfect and striking similarity, and four diametrically antagonistic. As it would be useless to enumerate the similarities, for the reader may find them carefully noted in Inman's work on ancient faith and modern, pages 237 to 240, we will quote but the four dissimilarities and leave every one to draw his own deductions therefrom. 1. The Buddhists hold that nothing which is contradicted by sound reason can be a true doctrine of Buddha. 1. The Christians will accept any nonsense if promulgated by the Church as a matter of faith. 2. The Buddhists do not adore the mother of Sakya, though they honor her as a holy and saint-like woman chosen to be his mother through her great virtue. 2. The Romanists adore the mother of Jesus, and prayer is made to her for aid and intercession. The worship of the Virgin has weakened that of Christ and thrown entirely into the shadow of that of the Almighty. 3. The Buddhists have no sacraments. 3. The papal followers have seven. 4. The Buddhists do not believe in any pardon for their sins, except after an adequate punishment for each evil deed, and a proportionate compensation to the parties injured. 4. The Christians are promised that if they only believe in the precious blood of Christ, this blood offered by him for the expiation of the sins of the whole of mankind, read Christians, will atone for every mortal sin. Which of these theologies most commends itself to the sincere inquirer? is a question that may safely be left to the sound judgment of the reader. One offers light, the other darkness. The wheel of the law has the following. Buddhists believe that every act, word, or thought has its consequence, which will appear sooner or later in the present or in the future state. Evil acts will produce evil consequences. Good acts will produce good consequences. Prosperity in this world or birth in heaven in some future state. This is strict and impartial justice. This is the idea of a supreme power which cannot fail, and therefore can have neither wrath nor mercy, but leaves every cause, great or small, to work out its inevitable effects. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Neither by expression nor implication points to any hope of future mercy or salvation by proxy. Cruelty and mercy are finite feelings. The supreme deity is infinite, hence it can only be just, and justice must be blind. The ancient pagans held on this question for more philosophical views than modern Christians, for they represented their themis blindfold. 
and the Siamese author of the work under notice has again a more reverent conception of the deity than the Christians have. When he thus gives vent to his thought, a Buddhist might believe in the existence of a God, sublime above all human qualities and attributes, a perfect God, above love and hatred and jealousy, calmly resting in a quiet happiness that nothing could disturb. And of such a God he would speak no disparagement, not from a desire to please him or fear to offend him, but from natural veneration. But he cannot understand a God with the attributes and qualities of men, a God who loves and hates and shows anger, a deity who, whether described to him by Christian missionaries or by Mahometans or Brahmins or Jews, falls below his standard of even an ordinary good man. We have often wondered at the extraordinary ideas of God and his justice that seem to be honestly held by those Christians who blindly rely upon the clergy for the religion and never upon their own reason. How strangely illogical is this doctrine of the atonement? We propose to discuss it with the Christians from the Buddhistic standpoint, and show at once by what a series of sophistries, directed toward the one object of tightening the ecclesiastical yoke upon the popular neck. Its acceptance as a divine command has been finally effected. Also, that it has proved one of the most pernicious and demoralizing of doctrines. The clergy say, no matter how enormous our crimes against the laws of God and of man, we have but to believe in the self-sacrifice of Jesus for the salvation of mankind, and his blood will wash out every stain. God's mercy is boundless and unfathomable. It is impossible to conceive of a human sin so damnable that the price paid in advance for the redemption of the sinner would not wipe it out if a thousandfold works. And furthermore, it is never too late to repent. Though the offender wait until the last minute of the last hour of the last day of his mortal life, before his blanched lips utter the confession of faith, he may go to paradise. The dying thief did it, and so many others as vile. These are the assumptions of the church. But if we step outside the little circle of creed and consider the universe as a whole, balanced by the exquisite adjustment of parts, how all sound logic, how the faintest glimmering sense of justice revolts against the vicarious atonement. If the criminal sinned only against himself and wronged no one but himself, if by sincere repentance he could cause the obliteration of past events, not only from the memory of man but also from that imperishable record, which no deity, not even the supremest of the supreme, can cause to disappear, then this dogma might not be incomprehensible. But to maintain that one may wrong his fellow man, kill, disturb the equilibrium of society and the natural order of things, and then through cowardice, hope, or compulsion matters not, be forgiven by believing that the spilling of one blood washes out the other blood spirit. This is preposterous. Can the results of a crime be obliterated even though the crime itself should be pardoned? The effects of a cause are never limited to the boundaries of the cause nor can the results of a crime be confined to the offender and his victim. Every good as well as evil action has its effects, as palpably as the stone flung into a calm water. The simile is trite, but it is the best ever conceived, so let us use it. The eddying circles are greater and swifter, as the disturbing object is greater or smaller, but the smallest pebble, nay, the tiniest speck, makes its ripples, and this disturbance is not alone visible and on the surface below, unseen in every direction, outward and downward. Drop pushes drop until the sides and bottom are touched by the force. More, the air above the water is agitated, and this disturbance passes, as the physicists tell us, from stratum to stratum, out into space forever and ever. An impulse has been given to matter, and that is never lost, can never be recalled. So with crime, and so with its opposite. The action may be instantaneous, the effects are eternal. When after the stone is once flung into the pond, we can recall it to the hand, roll back the ripples, obliterate the force expended, restore the etheric waves to their previous state of non-being, and wipe out every trace of the act throwing the missile, so that time's record shall not show that it ever happened. And then we may patiently hear Christians argue for the efficacy of this atonement. The Chicago Times recently printed the hangman's record of the first half of the present year, 
1877, a long and ghastly record of murders and hangings. Nearly every one of these murderers received religious consolation, and many announced that they had received God's forgiveness through the blood of Jesus, and were going that day to heaven. Their conversion was effected in prison. So how this ledger balance of Christian justice stands, these red-handed murderers urged on by the demons of lust, revenge, cupidity, fanaticism, or mere brutal thirst for blood, slew their victims in most cases without giving them time to repent or call on Jesus to wash them clean with his blood. They perhaps died sinful and, of course, consistently with theological logic, met the reward of their greater or lesser offenses. But the murderer, overtaken by human justice, is imprisoned, wept over by sentimentalists, prayed with and at pronounces the charmed words of conversion, and goes to the scaffold a redeemed child of Jesus. Except for the murder, he would not have been prayed with redeemed, pardoned. Clearly this man did well to murder, for thus he gained eternal happiness. And how about the victim, and his or her family, relatives, dependents, social relations? Has justice no recompense for them? Must they suffer in this world and the next, while he who wronged them sits beside the holy thief of cavalry, and is forever blessed? On this question the clergy kept a prudent silence. Steve Anderson was one of these American criminals, convicted of double murder, arson, and robbery. Before the hour of his death, he was converted, but the record tells us that his clerical attendants subjected to his reprieve, on the ground that they felt sure of his salvation should he die then, but could not answer for it if his execution was postponed. We address these ministers and ask them to tell us on what grounds they felt sure of such a monstrous thing. How could they feel sure with the dark future before them and the endless results of this double murder, arson, and robbery? They could be sure of nothing. But that their abominable doctrine is the cause of three-fourths of the crimes of so-called Christians, that these terrific causes must produce like monstrous effects, which in their turn will beget other results, and so roll on throughout eternity to an accomplishment that no man can calculate. Or take another crime one of the most selfish, cruel, and heartless, and yet the most frequent, the seduction of a young girl. Society, by an instinct of self-preservation, pitilessly judges the victim and ostracizes her. She may be driven to infanticide or self-murder, or, if too averse to die, live to plunge into a career of vice and crime. She may become the mother of criminals, who, as in the now-celebrated jokes of those appalling details Mr. Dugdale has published the particulars, breed other generations of felons to the number of hundreds in fifty or sixty years. All this social disaster came through one man's selfish passion. Shall he be forgiven by divine justice until his offense is expiated? And punishment fall upon only the wretched human scorpions begotten of his lust? An outcry has just been made in England over the discovery that Anglican priests are largely introducing auricular confession and granting absolution after enforcing penances. Inquiry shows the same thing prevailing more or less in the United States. Put to the ordeal of cross-examination, the clergy quote triumphantly from the English Book of Common Prayer, the rubrics which clearly give them the absorbing authority, through the power of God, the Holy Ghost, committed unto them by the bishop, by imposition of hands at their ordination. The bishop question points to Matthew 16.19 for the source of his authority to bind and loose on earth those who are to be blessed or damned in heaven, and to the apostolic succession for proof of its transmission from Simon Barona to himself. The present volumes have been written to small purpose if they have not shown One, that Jesus, the Christ God, is a myth concocted two centuries after real Hebrew Jesus died. Two, that therefore he never had any authority to give Peter or anyone else plenary power. Three, that even if he had given such authority, the word Petra, rock, referred to the revealed truths of the Petroma, not to him who thrice denied him. And that besides the apostolic succession is a gross and palpable fraud. Four, that the gospel according to Matthew is a fabrication based upon a wholly different manuscript. The whole thing, therefore, is an imposition alike upon priest and penitent. 
But putting all these points aside for the moment, it suffices to ask these pretended agents of the three gods of the Trinity how they reconcile it with the most rudimental notions of equity. That if the power to pardon sinners for sinning has been given them, they do not also receive the ability by miracle to obliterate the wrongs done against person or property. Let them restore life to the murdered, honor to the dishonored, property to those who have been wronged, and force the scales of human and divine justice to recover their equilibrium. Then may we talk of their divine commission to bind and loose. Let them say, if they can do this, that there too the world has received nothing but sophistry, believed on blind faith, we ask palpable, tangible evidence of their God's justice and mercy. But all are silent, no answer, no reply, and still the inexorable, unerring law of compensation proceeds on its unswerving path. If we but watch its progress, we will find that it ignores all creeds, shows no preferences, but its sunlight and its thunderbolts fall alike on heaven and Christian. No absolution can shield the latter when guilty. No anathema hurt the former when innocent. Away from us, such an insulting conception of divine justice as that preached by priests on their own authority. It is fit only for cowards and criminals. If they are backed by a whole array of fathers and churchmen, we are supported by the greatest of all authorities, an instinctive and reverential sense of the everlasting and ever-present law of harmony and justice. But besides that of reason, we have other evidence to show that such a construction is wholly unwarranted. The Gospels being divine revelation, doubtless Christians will regard their testimony as conclusive. Do they affirm that Jesus gave himself as a voluntary sacrifice? On the contrary, there is not a word to sustain the idea. They make it clear that he would rather have lived to continue what he considered his mission, and that he died because he could not help it, and only when betrayed. Before, when threatened with violence, he had made himself invisible by employing the mesmeric power over the bystanders, claimed by every eastern adept, and escaped. When finally he saw that his time had come, he succumbed to the inevitable. But see him in the garden, on the Mount of Olives, writhing in agony until his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood, praying with fervid supplication that the cup might be removed from him. Exhausted by his struggle to such a degree that an angel from heaven had to come and strengthen him, and say if the pictures is that of a self-immolating hostage and martyr. To crown all and leave no lingering doubts in our minds, We have his own despairing words. Not my will, but thine be done. Luke 22.42.43 Again, in the Puranas, it may be found that Krishna was nailed to a tree by the arrow of a hunter, who, begging the dying God to forgive him, receives the following answer. Go, hunter, through my favor to heaven, the abode of the gods. Then the illustrious Krishna, having united himself with his pure, own, spiritual, inexhaustible, inconceivable, unborn, undecaying, imperishable, and universal spirit, which is one with Vasudeva, abandoned his mortal body, and he became Nirguna. Wilson's Vishnu Purana, page 612. Is not this the original story of Christ forgiving the thief on the cross and promising a place in heaven? Such examples challenge inquiry as to their own origin and meaning so long anterior to Christianity, says Dr. Lundy, in Monumental Christianity, and yet to all this he adds, The idea of Krishna as a shepherd I take to be older than either the Gospel of Infancy and that of St. John, and Prophetic of Christ, page 156. Facts like these, perchance, furnished later a plausible pretext for declaring apocryphal all such works as the homilies, which proved but too clearly the utter want of an early authority for the doctrine of atonement. The homilies clash but little with the Gospels. They disagree entirely with the dogmas of the Church. Peter knew nothing of the atonement, and his reverence for the mythical father Adam would never have allowed him to admit that this patriarch had sinned and was accursed. Neither do the Alexandrian theological schools appear to have been cognizant of this doctrine, nor to Tertullian, nor was it discussed by any of the earlier fathers. Philo represents the story of the fall as symbolical, and Origen regarded it the same way as Paul, as an allegory, 
Whether they will or not, the Christians have to credit the foolish story of Eve's temptation by a serpent. Besides, Augustine has formally pronounced upon the subject. God, by his arbitrary will, he says, has selected beforehand certain persons, without regard to foreseen faith or good actions, and has irretrievably ordained to bestow upon them eternal happiness, while he has condemned others in the same way to eternal reprobation. Calvin promulgated views of divine partiality and bloodthirstiness equally abhorrent. The human race, corrupted radically in the fall with Adam, has upon it the guilt and impotence of original sin. Its redemption can be achieved only through an incarnation and a propitiation. Of this redemption, only electing grace can make the soul a participant, and such grace, once given, is never lost. This election can come only from God, and it includes only a part of the race, the rest being left to perdition. Election and perdition, the horrible decretum, are both predestined in a divine plan. That plan is a decree, and this decree is eternal and unchangeable. Justification is by faith alone, and faith is the gift of God. O divine justice, how blasphemed has been thy name! Unfortunately for all such speculations, belief in the propitiatory efficacy of blood can be traced to the oldest rites. Hardly a nation remained ignorant of it. Every people offered animal and even human sacrifices to the gods in the hope of averting thereby public calamity, by pacifying the wrath of some avenging deity. There are instances of Greek and Roman generals offering their lives simply for the success of their army. Caesar complains of it and calls it superstition of the Gauls. They devote themselves to death, believing that unless life is rendered for life, the immortal gods cannot be appeased, he writes. If any evil is about to befall either those who now sacrifice, or Egypt, may it be averted on this head, was pronounced by the Egyptian priests when sacrificing one of their sacred animals. And imprecations were uttered over the head of the expiatory victim, around whose horns a piece of Biblis was rolled. The animal was generally led to some barren region, sacred to Typhon, in those primitive ages when this fatal deity, was yet held in a certain consideration by the Egyptians. It is in this custom that lies the origin of the scapegoat of the Jews, who, when the Rufus ass god was rejected by the Egyptians, began sacrificing to another deity, the Red Heifer. Let all sins that have been committed in this world fall on me, that the world may be delivered, exclaimed Gautama, the Hindu savior, centuries before our era. No one will pretend to assert in our own age that it was the Egyptians who borrowed anything from the Israelites, as they now accuse the Hindus of doing. Bunsen, Lepsius, Champollion have long since established the precedence of Egypt over the Israelites in age as well as in the religious rites that we now recognize among the chosen people. Even the New Testament teems with quotations and repetitions from the Book of the Dead. And Jesus, if everything attributed to him by his four biographers is true, must have been acquainted with the Egyptian funeral hymns. In the Gospel according to Matthew, we find whole sentences from the ancient and sacred ritual, which preceded our era by more than 4,000 years. We will again compare. The soul under trial is brought before Osiris, the Lord of Truth, who sits decorated with the Egyptian cross, emblem of eternal life and holding in his right hand the vanus, or the flagellum of justice. The spirit begins in the hall of the two truths, an earnest appeal, and enumerates its good deeds, supported by the responses of the forty-two assessors, its incarnated deeds and accusers. If justified, it is addressed as Osiris, thus assuming the appellation of the deity whence its divine essence proceeded and the following words, full of majesty and justice, are pronounced. Let the Osiris go, ye see he is without fault, he lived on truth, and is fed on truth. The God has welcomed him as he desired, he has given food to my hungry, drink to my thirsty ones, clothed to my naked. He has made the sacred food of the gods the meat of the spirits. In the parable on the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 25, 
The Son of Man, Osiris is also called the Son, sits upon the throne of his glory, judging the nations, and says to the justified, Come ye blessed of my Father, the God, inherit the kingdom. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat, and I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. Naked, and you clothed me. To complete the resemblance, Matthew 3.12, John is made to describe Christ as Osiris, whose fan, winnow, or vanus, is in his hand, and who will purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. The same in relation to Buddhist legends. In Matthew 4.19, Jesus is made to say, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The whole adapted to a conversation between him and Simon Peter and Andrew, his brother. In Schmidt's Der Weiss und der Thor, a work full of anecdotes about Buddha and his disciples, the whole from original texts, it is said of a new convert to the faith that he had been caught by the hook of the doctrine, just as a fish who is caught at the bait and line is securely pulled out. In the temples of Siam, the image of the expected Buddha, the Messiah Maitri, is represented with a fisherman's net in hand, while in Tibet he holds a kind of trap. The explanation of it reads as follows. He, Buddha, disseminates upon the ocean a birth and decay the lotus flower of the excellent law as a bait. With the loop of devotion never cast out in vain, he brings living beings up like fishes and carries them to the other side of the river where there is true understanding. Had the Yerodite Archbishop Cave, Grabe, and Dr. Parker, who so zealously contended in their time for the admission of the epistles of Jesus Christ and Abgarus, king of Edessa, into the canon of the scripture, lived in our days of Max Muller and Sanskrit scholarship, we doubt whether they would have acted as they did. The first mention of these epistles ever made was by the famous Eusebius, this pious bishop seems to have been self-appointed to furnish Christianity with the most unexpected proofs to corroborate its wildest fancies. Whether among the many accomplishments of the bishop of Caesarea, we must include a knowledge of the Singhalese, Pahlavi, Tibetan, and other languages, we know not. But he surely transcribed the letters of Jesus and Abgarus, and the story of the miraculous portrait of Christ taken on a piece of cloth by the simple wiping of his face, from the Buddhistical canon. To be sure, the bishop declared that he found the letter himself written in Syriac, preserved among the registers and records of the city of Edessa, where Abgarus reigned. We recall the words of Babrius, Myth, O son of King Alexander, is an ancient human invention of Syrians, who lived in old time under Ninus and Belus. Edessa was one of the ancient holy cities. The Arabs venerate it to this day. And the purest Arabic is there spoken. They call it still by its ancient name Orfa, once the city Arfa, Kazda, Arfaxt. The seat of a college of Chaldeans and Magi, whose missionary, called Orpheus, brought thence the Bacchic mysteries to Thrace. Very naturally, Eusebius found there the tales which he wrought over into the story of Abgarus, and the sacred picture taken on a cloth, as that of Bhagavat, or the blessed Tathagata, Buddha, was obtained by King Binsbisara. The king having brought it, Bhagavat projected his shadow on it. This bit of miraculous stuff with its shadow is still preserved, say the Buddhists. Only the shadow itself is rarely seen. In like manner, the Gnostic author of the Gospel according to John copied and metamorphosed the legend of Ananda, who asked drink of a Matanga woman, the antitype of the woman met by Jesus at the well, and was reminded by her that she belongs to a low caste, and may have nothing to do with the holy monk. I do not ask thee, my sister, answers Ananda to the woman either thy caste or thy family. I only ask thee for water, if thou canst give me some. The Matanga woman, charmed and moved to tears, repents, joins the monastic order of Gautama, and becomes a saint, rescued from a life of unchastity by Sakyamuni. Many of her subsequent actions were used by Christian forgers to endow Mary Magdalene and other female saints and martyrs. 
And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward, says the Gospel, Matthew 10.42. Whosoever, with a purely believing heart, offers nothing but a handful of water, or presents so much to the spiritual assembly, or gives drink therewith to the poor and needy, or to a beast of the field. This notorious action will not be exhausted in many ages, says the Buddhist canon. At the hour of Gautama Buddha's birth, there were 32,000 wonders performed. The clouds stopped demovable in the sky. The waters of the rivers ceased to flow. The flowers ceased unbudding. The birds remained silent and full of wonder. All nature remained suspended in her course and was full of expectation. There was a preternatural light spread all over the world. Animals suspended their eating. The blind saw, and the lame and dumb were cured, etc. We now quote from the Protevangelion. At the hour of the nativity, as Joseph looked up into the air, I saw, he says, the clouds astonished, and the fowls of the air stopping in the midst of their flight. And I beheld the sheep dispersed, and yet the sheep stood still. And I looked into the river, and saw the kids with their mouths closed to the water and touching it, but they did not drink. Then a bright cloud overshadowed the cave. But on a sudden, the cloud became a bright light in the cave, so that their eyes could not bear it. The hand of Salom, which was withered, was straightway cured. The blind saw, the lame and dumb were cured. When sent to school, the young Gautama, without having ever studied, completely worsted all his competitors. Not only in writing, but in arithmetic, mathematics, metaphysics, wrestling, archery, astronomy, geometry, and finally vanquishes his own professors by giving the definition of 64 kinds of writings, which were unknown to the masters themselves. And this is what is said again in the Gospel of the Infancy. And when he, Jesus, was 12 years old, a certain principal rabbi asked him, Hast thou read books? And a certain astronomer asked the Lord Jesus whether he had studied astronomy. And Lord Jesus explained to him about the spheres, about the physics and metaphysics, also things that reason of man had never discovered, the constitutions of the body, how the soul operated upon the body, etc. And at this the master was so surprised that he said, I believe this boy was born before Noah. He is more learned than any master. The precepts of Hillel, who died 40 years B.C., appear rather as quotations than original expressions in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus taught the world nothing that had not been taught as earnestly before by other masters. He begins his sermon with certain purely Buddhistic precepts that had found acceptance among the Essenes, and were generally practiced by the Orphicoi and the Neoplatonists. There were the Philhellenes who, like Apollonius, had devoted their lives to moral and physical purity, and who practiced asceticism. He tries to imbue the hearts of his audience with a scorn for worldly wealth, a fakir-like unconcern for the moral, love for humanity, poverty, and chastity. He blesses the poor in spirit, the meek, the hungering, and the thirsting after righteousness. The merciful and the peacemakers and Buddha-like, leaves but a poor chance for the proud castes to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Every word of his sermon is an echo of the essential principles of monastic Buddhism. The Ten Commandments of Buddha, as found in an appendix to the Pratamoksha Sutra, Holy Burman text, are elaborated to their full extent in Matthew. If we desire to acquaint ourselves with the historical Jesus, we have to set the mythical Christ entirely aside and learn all we can of the man in the first gospel. His doctrines, religious views, and grandest aspirations will be found concentrated in his sermon. This is the principal cause of the failure of missionaries to convert Brahmanists and Buddhists. These see that the little of really good that is offered in the new religion is paraded only in theory, while their own faith demands that those identical rules shall be applied in practice. Notwithstanding the impossibility for Christian missionaries to understand clearly the spirit of a religion wholly based on that doctrine of emanation, which is so inimical to their own theology, the reasoning powers of some simple Buddhistic preachers are so high that we see a scholar like Gutzlaff utterly silenced and put to a great straits by Buddhists. 
Judson, the famous Baptist missionary in Burma, confesses in his journal the difficulties to which he was often driven by them. Speaking of a certain Oyan, he remarks that his strong mind was capable of grasping the most difficult subjects. His words, he remarked, are as smooth as oil, as sweet as honey, and as sharp as razors. His mode of reasoning is soft, insinuating, and acute, and so adroitly does he act his part that I, with the strength of truth, was scarcely able to keep him down. It appears, though, that at a later period of his mission, Mr. Judson found that he had utterly mistaken the doctrine. I begin to find, he says, that the semi-atheism, which I had sometimes mentioned, is nothing but a refined Buddhism, having its foundation in the Buddhistic scriptures. Thus he discovered at last that while there is in Buddhism a generic term of most exalted perfection actually applied to numerous individuals, as Buddha, superior to the whole host of subordinate deities, there are also lurking in the system the glimmerings of an anima mundi anterior to and even superior to Buddha. This is a happy discovery indeed. Even the so slandered Chinese believe in one highest God, the supreme ruler of the heavens. Ya Huang Shangti has his name inscribed only on the golden tablet before the altar of heaven at the great temple of Pekin, Tlantan. This worship, says Colonel Yule, is mentioned by the Mohammedan narrator of Shah Rukh's embassy, AD 1421. Every year there are some days on which the emperor eats no animal food. He spends his time in an apartment which contains no idol and says that he is worshipping the God of heaven. Speaking of Sharastani, the great Arabian scholar, Wolson says, For him, Sabianism was not astrology, as many are inclined to think. He thought that God is too sublime and too great to occupy himself with the immediate management of this world, that he has therefore transferred the government thereof to the gods, and retained only the most important affairs for himself, that further man is too weak to be able to apply immediately to the highest, that he must therefore address his prayers and sacrifices to the intermediate divinities, to whom the management of the world has been entrusted by the highest. Wolson argues that this idea is as old as the world, and that in the heathen world, this view is universally shared by the cultivated. Father Bori, a Portuguese missionary who was sent to convert the poor heathen of Cochin, China, as early as the 16th century, protests in despair in his narrative that there is not a dress, office, or ceremony in the Church of Rome, to which the devil has not here provided some counterpart. Even when the father began inveighing against the idols, he was answered that these were the images of departed great men, whom they worshipped exactly on the same principle and in the same manner as the Catholics did the images of the apostles and martyrs. Moreover, these idols have importance but in the eyes of the ignorant multitudes. The philosophy of Buddhism ignores images and fetishes. Its strongest vitality lies in its psychological conceptions of man's inner self. The road to the supreme state of felicity, called the Ford of Nirvana, winds its invisible paths through the spiritual, not physical, life of a person while on this earth. The sacred Buddhistical literature points the way by stimulating man to follow practically the example of Gautama. Therefore, the Buddhistical writings lay a particular stress on the spiritual privileges of man, advising him to cultivate his powers for the production of mipu, phenomena during life and for the attainment of nirvana in the hereafter. But turning again from the historical to the mythical narratives, invented alike about Krishna, Buddha, and Christ, we find the following. Setting a model for the Christian avatar and the archangel Gabriel to follow, the luminous Santusita Bodhisat appeared to Mahamaya like a cloud in the moonlight coming from the north, and in his hand holding a white lotus. He announced to her the birth of her son, and circumnambulating the queen's couch thrice, passed away from the Diwa Ayaka, and was conceived in the world of men. The resemblance will be found still more perfect upon examining the illustrations of medieval Psalters, and the panel paintings of the 16th century, 
in the church of Juai, for instance, in which the Virgin is represented kneeling, with her hands uplifted toward the Holy Ghost, and the unborn child is miraculously seen through her body, and then finding the same subject treated in the identical way in the scriptures in certain convents in Tibet. In the Pali Buddhistic annals and other religious records, it is stated that the Mahadevi and all her attendants were constantly gratified with the sight of the infant Bodhisattva, quietly developing within his mother's bosom and beaming already from his place of gestation upon humanity, the resplendent moonshine of his future benevolence. Ananda, the cousin and future disciple of Sakyamuni, is represented as having been born at the same time. He appears to have been the original for the old legends about John the Baptist. For example, the Pali narrative relates that Mahamaya, while pregnant with the sage, paid a visit to his mother, as Mary did to the mother of the Baptist. Immediately, as she entered the apartment, the unborn Ananda greeted the unborn Buddha Siddhartha, who also returned the salutation. And in like manner, the babe, afterward John the Baptist, leaped in the womb of Elizabeth when Mary came in. More even than that, for Didron describes a scene of salutation, painted on shutters at Lyon, between Elizabeth and Mary, in which the two unborn infants, both pictured as outside their mothers, are also saluting each other. If we turn now to Krishna, and attentively compare the prophecies respecting him, as collected in the Ramatsarian, traditions of the Atharva, the Vedangas, and the Vedantas, with passages in the Bible and apocryphal Gospels, of which it is pretended that some presage the coming of Christ, we shall find very curious facts. Following are the examples. From the Hindu books, first, he, the Redeemer, shall come crowned with lights, the pure fluid issuing from the great soul, dispersing darkness, Atharva, from the Christian books, first, the people of Galilee, of the Gentiles, which sat in darkness, saw great light. Matthew 4, from Isaiah 9, 1, 2. 2D, from the Hindu books, in the early part of the Kali Yuga, shall be born the son of the virgin, Vedanta. 2D, from the Christian books, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Isaiah 7, quoted in Matthew, I-23. 3D, from the Hindu books, the Redeemer shall come, and the accursed Rakshasa shall fly for refuge to the deepest hell, Tharva. 3D from the Christian books, Behold now Jesus of Nazareth, with the brightness of his glorious divinity, put to flight all the horrid powers of darkness, Nicodemus. Fourth, from the Hindu books, He shall come, and life will defy death and he shall revivify the blood of all beings, shall regenerate all bodies, and purify all souls. Forth from the Christian books, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. John 10.28 Fifth from the Hindu books, He shall come and all animated beings, all the flowers, plants, men, women, the infants, the slaves, shall together intone the chant of joy for he is the Lord of all creatures. He is infinite, for he is power, for he is wisdom, for he is beauty, for he is all and in all. Fifth, from the Christian books, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, for how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful, the new wine the maids. Zechariah 9. Sixth, from the Hindu books, he shall come more sweet than honey and ambrosia, more pure than the lamb without spot, I bid. Sixth, from the Christian books, behold the Lamb of God, John, I-36. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, Isaiah 53. Seventh, from the Hindu books, happy the blessed womb that shall bear him, I bid. Seventh, from the Christian books, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Luke 1. Blessed is the womb that bear thee. 11.27. Eighth, from the Hindu books, And God shall manifest his glory, and make his power resound, and shall reconcile himself with his creatures. 
Ibid. Eighth, in the Christian books, God manifested forth his glory. John, first, ep. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Corinthians 5. Ninth, in the Hindu books, it is in the bosom of a woman that the ray of the divine splendor will receive human form and shall bring forth, being a virgin, for no impure contact shall have defiled her. Badangas. Ninth, in the Christian books, being an unparalleled instance, without any pollution or defilement, and a virgin shall bring forth a son, and a maid shall bring forth the Lord. Gospel of Mary. 3. Let there be exaggeration or not in attributing to the Artharva Veda and the other books such a great antiquity. The fact remains that these prophecies and their realization preceded Christianity, and Krishna preceded Christ. That is all we need care to inquire. One is completely overwhelmed and astonishment upon reading Dr. Lundy's monumental Christianity. It would be difficult to say whether an admiration for the author's erudition or amazement at his serene and unparalleled sophistry is stronger. He has gathered a world of facts which prove that the religions, far more ancient than Christianity, of Krishna, Buddha, and Osiris, had anticipated even its minutest symbols. His materials come from no forged papyri, no interpolated gospels, but from scriptures on the walls of ancient temples, from monuments, inscriptions, and other archaic relics. Only mutilated by the hammers of iconoclasts, the canon of fanatics, and the effects of time. He shows us Krishna and Apollo as good shepherds, Krishna holding the cruciform chank in the chakra, and Krishna crucified in space, as he calls it. Monumental Christianity, figure 72. Of this figure, borrowed by Dr. Lundy from Moore's Hindu pantheon, it may be truly said that it is calculated to petrify a Christian with astonishment, for it is the crucified Christ of Romish art to the last degree of resemblance. Not a feature is lacking. And as the author says of it himself, this representation I believe to be anterior to Christianity. It looks like a Christian crucifix in many respects. The drawing, the attitude, the nail marks in hands and feet indicate a Christian origin, while the Parthian coronet of seven points, the absence of the wood and of the usual inscription, and the rays of glory above would seem to point to some other than a Christian origin. Can it be the victim man or the priest and victim both in one of the Hindu mythology who offered himself a sacrifice before the worlds were? Can it be Plato's second god who impressed himself on the universe in the form of a cross? Or is it his divine man who would be scourged, tormented, fettered, have his eyes burnt out, and lastly would be crucified? Republic, C2, page 52, Spens Trans. It is all that and much more. Archaic religious philosophy was universal. As it is, Dr. Lundy contradicts more and maintains that this figure is that of Witoba, one of the avatars of Vishnu, hence Krishna and the anterior to Christianity, which is a fact not very easily to be put down. And yet, although he finds it prophetic of Christianity, he thinks it has no relation whatever to Christ. His only reason is that in a Christian crucifix, the glory always comes from the sacred head. Here it is from above and beyond. The pundits, Witoba then, given to more, would seem to be the crucified Krishna, the shepherd god of Mathura, the savior, the lord of the covenant, as well as the lord of heaven and earth. Pure and impure, light and dark, good and bad, powerful and warlike, amiable and wrathful, mild and turbulent, forgiving and vindictive. God and a strange mixture of man, but not the Christ of the Gospels. Now, all these qualities must pertain to Jesus as well as to Krishna. The very fact that Jesus was a man upon the mother's side, even though he were a god, implies as much. His behavior toward the fig tree and his self-contradictions in Matthew, where at one time he promises peace on earth, at another the sword, etc., are proofs in this direction. Undoubtedly, this cut was never intended to represent Jesus of Nazareth. It was Watoba, as Moore was told, and as moreover the Hindu sacred scriptures state, Brahma, the sacrificer, who is at once both sacrificer and victim. It is Brahma, 
victim in his son Krishna, who came to die on earth for our salvation, who himself accomplishes the solemn sacrifice of the Sarvameda. And yet, it is the man Jesus as well as the man Krishna, for both were united to their crestos. Thus, we have either to admit periodical incarnations or let Christianity go as the greatest imposture and plagiarism of the ages. As to the Jewish scriptures, only such men as the Jesuit de Carrier and a convenient representative of the majority of the Catholic clergy can still command their followers to accept only their chronology established by the Holy Ghost. It is on the authority of the latter that we learn that Jacob went, with a family of 70 persons, all told, to settle in Egypt in AM 2298, and that in AM 2513, just 215 years afterward, these 70 persons had so increased that they left Egypt 600,000 fighting men strong, without counting women and children, which according to the science of statistics, should represent a total population of between two and three millions. Natural history affords no parallel to such fecundity, except in red herrings. After this, let the Christian missionaries laugh, if they can, at Hindu chronology and computations. Happy are those persons, but not to be envied, exclaims Bunsen, who have no misgivings about making Moses march out with more than two millions of people at the end of a popular conspiracy and rising in the sunny days of our 18th dynasty who make the Israelites conquer Canaan under Joshua. During and previous to the most formidable campaigns of conquering pharaohs in that same country, the Egyptian and Assyrian annals, combined with the historical criticism of the Bible, proved that the exodus could only have taken place under Meneptah, so that Joshua could not have crossed the Jordan before Easter 1280 the last campaign of Ramses III in Palestine being in 1281. But we must resume the thread of our narrative with Buddha. Neither he nor Jesus ever wrote one word of their doctrines. We have to take the teachings of the masters on the testimony of the disciples, and therefore it is but fair that we should be allowed to judge both doctrines on their intrinsic value. Where the logical preponderance lies may be seen in the results of frequent encounters between Christian missionaries and Buddhist theologians. Pungui, the latter usually, if not invariably, have the better of their opponents. On the other hand, the Lamb of Jehovah rarely fails to lose his temper, to the great delight of the Lama of Buddha, and practically demonstrates his religion of patience, mercy, and charity, by abusing his disputant in the most uncanonical language. This we have witnessed repeatedly. Despite the notable similarity of the direct teachings of Gautama and Jesus, we find yet their respective followers starting from two diametrically opposite points. The Buddhist divine, following literally the ethical doctrine of his master, remains thus true to the legacy of Gautama, while the Christian minister, distorting the precepts recorded by the four Gospels beyond recognition, teaches not that what Jesus taught, but the absurd, too often pernicious interpretations of fallible men, popes, Luthers, and Calvins included. The following are two instances selected from both religions and brought into contrast. Let the reader judge for himself. Do not believe in anything because it is rumored and spoken of by many, says Buddha. Do not think that is a proof of its truth. Do not believe merely because the written statement of some old sage is produced. Do not be sure that the writing has ever been revised by the said sage, or can be relied upon. Do not believe in what you have fancied, thinking that, because an idea is extraordinary, it must have been implanted by a deva or some wonderful being. Do not believe in guesses, that is, assuming something at haphazard as a starting point and then drawing conclusions from it, reckoning your two and your three and your four before you have fixed your number one. Do not believe merely on the authority of your teachers and masters, or believe the practice merely because they believe in practice. I, Buddha, tell you all, you must of yourselves know that this is evil, this is punishable, this is censured by wise men. Believe in this will bring no advantage to anyone but will cause sorrow, and when you know this, then eschew it.
It is impossible to avoid contrasting with these benevolent and human sentiments the fulminations of the Economical Council and the Pope against the employment of reason and the pursuit of science when it clashes with revelation. The atrocious papal benediction of Muslim arms and cursing of the Russian and Bulgarian Christians have roused the indignation of some of the most devoted Catholic communities. The Catholic Czechs of Prague, on the day of the recent semi-centennial jubilee of Pius IX, and again on the 6th of July, the day sacred to the memory of John Huss, the burned martyr, to mark their horror of the ultramontane policy in this respect gathered by thousands upon the neighboring Mount Shishko, and with great ceremony and denunciations burned the Pope's portrait, his syllabus, and last allucation against the Russian Tsar, saying that they were good Catholics, but better Slavs. Evidently, the memory of John Huss is more sacred to them than the Vatican Popes. The worship of words is more pernicious than the worship of images, remarks Robert Dale Owen. Grammatolatry is the worst species of idolatry. We have arrived at an era in which literalism is destroying faith. The letter killeth. There is not a dogma in the church to which these words can be better applied than to the doctrine of transubstantiation. Whoso with eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, Christ is made to say. This is a hard saying, repeated his dismayed listeners. The answer was that of an initiate. Does this offend you? It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words, ramata, or arcane utterances, that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. During the mysteries, wine represented Bacchus and bread Ceres. The hierophant initiator presented symbolically before the final revelation wine and bread to the candidate who had to eat and drink of both in token that the spirit was to quicken matter, i.e. the divine wisdom was to enter into his body through what was to be revealed to him. Jesus, in his oriental phraseology, constantly assimilated himself to the true vine. John 15.1 Furthermore, the Hierophant, the discloser of the Patroma, was called Father. When Jesus says, Drink, this is my blood, what else was meant? It was simply a metaphorical assimilation of himself to the vine, which bears the grape, whose juice is its blood, wine. It was a hint that as he had himself been initiated by the Father, so he desired to initiate others. His Father was the husbandman, himself the vine his disciples the branches. His followers, being ignorant of the terminology of the mysteries, wondered. They even took it as an offense, which is not surprising, considering the Mosaic injunction against blood. There is quite enough in the four Gospels to show what was the secret and most fervent hope of Jesus, the hope in which he began to teach, and in which he died. In his immense and unselfish love for humanity, he considers it unjust to deprive the many of the results of the knowledge acquired by the few. This result, he accordingly preaches, the unity of a spiritual God, whose temple is within each of us, and in whom we live as he lives in us, in spirit. This knowledge was in the hands of the Jewish adepts of the school of Hillel and the Kabbalists. But the scribes, or lawyers, having gradually merged into the dogmatism of the dead letter, had long since separated themselves from the Tanaim, the true spiritual teachers, and the practical Kabbalists were more or less persecuted by the synagogue. Hence we find Jesus exclaiming, Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge, the Gnosis. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering ye prevented. Luke 11.52. The meaning here is clear. They did take the key away, and could not even profit by it themselves, for the Masora, tradition, had become a closed book to themselves as well as to others. Neither Renan nor Strauss, nor the more modern Viscount Amberley, seem to have had the remotest suspicion of the real meaning of many of the parables of Jesus, or even of the character of the great Galilean philosopher. Renan, as we have seen, presented him to us as a Gallicized rabbi, le plus charmant de tout, 
still but a rabbi, and one, moreover, who does not even come out of the school of Hillel, or any school either, albeit he terms him repeatedly the charming doctor. He shows him as a sentimental young enthusiast, sprung out of the plebeian classes of Galilee, who imagines the ideal kings of his parables, the empurpled and jeweled beings of whom one reads in nursery tales. Lord Amberley's Jesus, on the other hand, is an iconoclastic idealist, far inferior in subtlety and logic to his critics. Renan looks over at Jesus with the one-sidedness of a semi-automaniac. Viscount Amberley looks down upon him from the social plane of an English lord. Apropos of this marriage feast parable, which he considers as embodying a curious theory of social intercourse, the Viscount says. Nobody can object to charitable individuals asking poor people or invalids without rank at their houses. But we cannot admit that this kind action ought to be rendered obligatory. It is eminently desirable that we should do exactly what Christ would forbid us doing, namely, invite our neighbors and be invited by them as circumstances may require. The fear that we may receive a recompense for the dinner parties we may give is surely chimerical. Jesus, in fact, overlooks entirely the more intellectual side of society, all of which unquestionably shows that the Son of God was no master of social etiquette, nor fit for society. But it is also a fair example of the prevalent misconception of even his most suggestive parables. The theory of Anquetel de Perron, that the Bhagavad Gita is an independent work, as it is absent from several manuscripts of the Mahabharata, may be as much a plea for a still greater antiquity as the reverse. The work is purely metaphysical and ethical, and in a certain sense it is the anti-Vedic, so far at least that it is in opposition with many of the later Brahmanical interpretations of the Vedas. How comes it, then, that instead of destroying the work, or at least of sentencing it as uncanonical, an expedient to which the Christian Church would never have failed to resort, The Brahmins show it the greatest reverence. Perfectly Unitarian in its aim, it clashes with the popular idol worship. Still, the only precaution taken by the Brahmins to keep its tenets from becoming too well known is to preserve it in more secretly than any other religious book, from every caste except the sacerdotal, and to impose upon that even, in many cases, certain restrictions. The grandest mysteries of the Brahmanical religion are embraced within this magnificent poem, and even the Buddhists recognize it, explaining certain dogmatic difficulties in their own way. Be unselfish, subdue your senses and passions, which obscure reason and lead to deceit, says Krishna to his disciple Arjuna, thus enunciating a purely Buddhistic principle. Low men follow examples, great men give them. The soul ought to free itself from the bonds of action and act absolutely according to its divine origin. There is but one God and all other devotas are inferior and mere forms, powers of Brahma or of myself. Worship by deeds predominates over that of contemplation. This doctrine coincides perfectly with that of Jesus himself. Faith alone, unaccompanied by works, is reduced to naught in the Bhagavad Gita. As to the Artharva Veda, It was and is preserved in such secrecy by the Brahmins that it is a matter of doubt whether the Orientalists have a complete copy of it. One who has read what Abbe Dubois says may well doubt the fact. Of the last species, the Atharva, there are very few, he says, writing of the Vedas, and many people suppose they no longer exist. But the truth is they do exist, though they conceal themselves with more caution than the others from the fear of being suspected to be initiated in the magic mysteries and other dreaded mysteries which the work is believed to teach. There were even those among the highest apoptae of the greater mysteries who knew nothing of their last and dreaded rite, the voluntary transfer of life from Hierophant to Candidate. In Ghost Land, this mystical operation of the adept's transfer of his spiritual entity, after the death of his body, into the youth he loves with all the ardent love of a spiritual parent, is superbly described. As in the case of the reincarnation of the Lamas of Tibet, an adept of the highest order may live indefinitely, 
His mortal casket wears out, notwithstanding certain alchemical secrets, for prolonging the youthful vigor far beyond the usual limits. Yet the body can rarely be kept alive beyond ten or twelve score of years. The old garment is then worn out, and the spiritual ego forced to leave it, selects for its habitation a new body, fresh and full of healthy vital principle. In case the reader should feel inclined to ridicule this assertion of the possible prolongation of human life, we may as well refer him to the statistics of several countries. The author of an able article in the Westminster Review for October 1850 is responsible for the statement that in England they have the authentic instances of one Thomas Jenkins dying at the age of 169 and Old Parr at 152 and that in Russia some of the peasants are known to have reached 242 years. There are also cases of centenarianism reported among the Peruvian Indians. We are aware that many able writers have recently discredited these claims to an extreme longevity, but we nevertheless affirm our belief in their truth. True or false, there are superstitions among the Eastern people such as have never been dreamed even by an Edgar Allan Poe or a Hoffman. And these beliefs run in the very blood of the nations with which they originated. Carefully stripped of exaggeration, they will be found to embody an universal belief in those restless, wandering, astral souls, which are called ghouls and vampires. An Armenian bishop of the 5th century named Yeznik gives a number of such narratives in a manuscript Book 1, 2030, preserved some 30 years ago in the library of the monastery of Etchmedizin. Among others, there is a tradition dating from the days of heathendom, that whenever a hero whose life is needed yet on earth falls on the battlefield, the Ereles, the popular gods of ancient Armenia, empowered to bring back to life those slaughtered in battle, lick the bleeding wounds of the victim and breathe on them until they have imparted a new and vigorous life. After that, the warrior rises, washes off all traces of his wounds, and resumes his place in the fray. But his immortal spirit has fled, and for the remainder of his days he lives a deserted temple. Once that an adept was initiated into the last and most solemn mystery of the life transfer, the awful seventh rite of the great sacerdotal operation, which is the highest theurgy, he belonged no more to this world. His soul was free thereafter, and the seven mortal sins lying in wait to devour his heart, as the soul, liberated by death, would be crossing the seven halls and seven staircases, could hurt him no more alive or dead. He has passed the twice seven trials, the twelve labors of the final hour. The high hierophant alone knew how to perform this solemn operation by infusing his own vital life and astral soul into the adept chosen by him for his successor, who thus became endowed with a double life. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. Jesus tells Nicodemus, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. This allusion, so unintelligible in itself, is explained in the Satapa Brahmana, it teaches that a man striving after spiritual perfection must have three births. First, physical from his mortal parents. Second, spiritual through religious sacrifice, initiation. Third, his final birth into the world of spirit, at death. Though it may seem strange that we should have to go to the old land of the Punjab and the banks of the sacred Ganges for an interpreter of words spoken in Jerusalem and expounded on the banks of the Jordan, the fact is evident. The second birth, or regeneration of spirit, after the natural birth of that which is born of the flesh, might have astonished a Jewish ruler. Nevertheless, it has been taught three thousand years before the appearance of the great Galilean prophet, not only in old India, but to all the apopte of the pagan initiation, who were instructed in the great mysteries of life and death. This secret of secrets, that soul is not knit to flesh, was practically demonstrated in the instance of the yogis, the followers of Kapila, having emancipated their souls from the fetters of Prakriti or Mahat. The physical perception of the senses and mind, in one sense, creation. 
They developed their soul power and will force as to have actually enabled themselves, while on earth, to communicate with the supernal worlds and perform what is bunglingly termed miracles. Men whose astral spirits have attained on earth the Nereasa or the Mukti, are half-gods, disembodied spirits. They reach moksha, or nirvana, and this is their second spiritual birth. Buddha teaches the doctrine of a new birth as plainly as Jesus does, desiring to break with the ancient mysteries, to which it was impossible to admit the ignorant masses. The Hindu reformer, though generally silent upon more than one secret dogma, clearly states his thought in several passages. Thus, he says, Some people are born again. Evildoers go to hell. Righteous people go to heaven. Those who are free from all worldly desires enter nirvana. Precepts of the Dhammapada. V. 126. Elsewhere, Buddha states that it is better to believe in a future life in which happiness or misery can be felt. For if the heart believes therein, it will abandon sin and act virtuously. And even if there is no resurrection, such a life will bring a good name and the regard of men. But those who believe in extinction at death will not fail to commit any sin that they may choose, because of their disbelief in a future. The Epistles to the Hebrews treats of the sacrifice of blood. Where a testament is, says the writer, there must be of necessity the death of the testator. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. Then again, Christ glorified not himself to be made high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Heb v. 5 This is a very clear inference that 1. Jesus was considered only in the light of a high priest, like Melchizedek, another avatar or incarnation of Christ according to the fathers, and 2. That the writer thought that Jesus had become a son of God only at the moment of his initiation by water, hence that he was not born a god, neither was he begotten physically by him. Every initiate of the last hour became, by the very fact of his initiation, a son of God. When Maxim, the Ephesian, initiated the emperor Julian into the Mithraic mysteries, he pronounced as the usual formula of the rite the following, By this blood I wash thee from thy sins. The word of the highest has entered unto thee, and his spirit henceforth will rest upon the newly born, the now begotten of the highest God. Thou art the son of Mithra. Thou art the Son of God, repeated the disciples after Christ's baptism. When Paul shook off the viper into the fire without further injury to himself, the people of Melita said that he was a god, Acts 28. He is the Son of God, the beautiful, was the term used by the disciples of Simon Magus, for they thought they recognized the great power of God in him. A man can have no god that is not bounded by his own human conceptions. The wider the sweep of his spiritual vision, the mightier will be his deity. But where can we find a better demonstration of him than in man himself, in the spiritual and divine powers lying dormant in every human being? The very capacity to imagine the possibility of thaumaturgical powers is itself evidence that they exist, says the author of Prophecy. The critic, as well as the skeptic, is generally inferior to the person or subject that he is reviewing and therefore is hardly a competent witness. If there are counterfeits, somewhere there must have been a genuine original. Blood begets phantoms, and its emanations furnish certain spirits with the materials required to fashion their temporary appearances. Blood, says Levi, is the first incarnation of the universal fluid. It is the materialized vital light. Its birth is the most marvelous of all nature's marvels. It lives only by perpetually transforming itself, for it is the universal Proteus. The blood issues from principles where there was none of it before, and it becomes flesh, bones, hair, nails, tears, and perspiration. It can be allied neither to corruption nor death. When life is gone, it begins decomposing. If you know how to reanimate it, to infuse into it life by a new magnetization of its globules, life will return to it again. The universal substance, with its double motion, is the great arcanum of being. Blood is the great arcanum of life. Blood, says the Hindu Ramatsariar, contains all the mysterious secrets of existence. 
No living being can exist without it. It is profaning the great work of the Creator to eat blood. In his turn, Moses, following the universal and traditional law, forbids eating blood. Paracelsus writes that with the fumes of blood, one is enabled to call forth any spirit we desire to see. For with its emanations, it will build itself an appearance, a visible body. Only this is sorcery. The hierophants of Baal made deep incisions all over their bodies and produced apparitions, subjective and tangible, with their own blood. The followers of a certain sect in Persia, many of whom may be found around the Russian settlements in the Temerchan, Shura, and Durbent, have their religious mysteries in which they form a large ring and whirl round in a frantic dance. Their temples are ruined, and they worship in large temporary buildings, securely enclosed and with the earthen floor deeply strewn with sand. They are all dressed in long white robes, and their heads are bare and closely shaved. Armed with knives, they soon reach a point of furious exaltation, and wound themselves and others until their garments in the sand on the floor are soaked with blood. Before the end of the mystery, every man has a companion who whirls around with him. Sometimes the spectral dancers have hair on their heads, which makes them quite distinct from their unconscious creators. As we have solemnly promised never to divulge the principal details of this terrible ceremony, which we are allowed to witness but once, we must leave the subject. In the days of antiquity, the sorceresses of Thessaly added sometimes to the blood of a black lamb that of an infant, and by this means evoked the shadows. The priests were taught the art of calling up the spirits of the dead, as well as those of the elements, but their mode was certainly not that of Thessalian sorceresses. Among the Yakuts of Siberia, there is a tribe dwelling on the very confines of the Transbacal regions near the river Vitima, eastern Siberia, which practices sorcery as known in the days of the Thessalian witches. Their religious beliefs are curious as a mixture of philosophy and superstition. They have a chief or supreme god, Aish Tayan, who did not create, they say, but only presides over the creation of all the worlds. He lives on the ninth heaven, and it is but from the seventh that all the other minor gods, his servants, can manifest themselves to their creatures. The ninth heaven, according to the revelation of the minor deities, spirits we suppose, has three suns and three moons. And the ground of this abode is formed of four lakes, the four cardinal points of soft air, ether, instead of water. While they offer no sacrifices to the supreme deity, for he needs none, they try to propitiate both the good and bad deities, which they respectively term the white and the black gods. They do it because neither of the two classes are good or bad through personal merit or demerit, as they are all subject to the supreme Aish Tion, and each has to carry on the duty assigned to him from eternity. They are not responsible for either the good or evil they produce in this world. The reason given by the Yakuts for such sacrifice is very curious. Sacrifices, they say, help each class of gods to perform their mission the better, and so please the Supreme. And every mortal that helps either of them in performing his duty must, therefore, please the Supreme as well for he will have helped justice to take place. As the black gods are appointed to bring diseases, evils, and all kinds of calamities to mankind, each of which is a punishment for some transgression, the Yakuts offer them bloody sacrifices of animals, while to the white they make pure offerings, consistently generally of an animal consecrated to some special god and taken care of with great ceremony, as having become sacred. According to their ideas, the souls of the dead become shadows and are doomed to wander on earth till a certain change takes place either for the better or worse, which the Yakuts do not pretend to explain. The light shadows, i.e. those of good people, become the guardians and protectors of those they loved on earth. The dark shadows, the wicked, always seek, on the contrary, to hurt those they knew by inciting them to crimes, wicked acts and otherwise injuring mortals. Besides these, like the ancient Chaldees, they reckon seven divine shitans, demons, or minor gods. It is during the sacrifices of blood 
which take place at night, that the Yakuts call forth the wicked or dark shadows to inquire of them what they can do to arrest their mischief. Hence, blood is necessary. For without its fumes, the ghosts do not make themselves clearly visible and would become, according to their ideas, but the more dangerous, for they would suck it from living persons by their perspiration. As to the good, light shadows, they need not be called out. Besides that, such an act disturbs them. They can make their presence felt when needed, without any preparation and ceremonies. The blood evocation is also practiced, although with a different purpose, in several parts of Bulgaria and Moldavia, especially in districts in the vicinity of the Muslims. The fearful oppressions and slavery to which these unfortunate Christians have been subjected for centuries has rendered them a thousandfold more impressible, and at the same time more superstitious than those who live in civilized countries. On every 7th of May, the inhabitants of every Moldavo Volation and Bulgarian city or village have what they term the Feast of the Dead. After sunset, immense crowds of men and women, each with a lighted wax taper in hand, resort to the burial places and prey on the tombs of their departed friends. This ancient and solemn ceremony, called Trizna, is everywhere in reminiscence of primitive Christian rites. But far more solemn yet, while in Muslim slavery, every tomb is furnished with a kind of cupboard, about half a yard high, built of four stones with hinged double doors. These closets contain what is termed the household of the defunct, namely a few wax tapers, some oil, and an earthen lamp, which is lighted on that day and burns for twenty-four hours. Wealthy people have silver lamps richly chiseled and bejeweled images, which are secure from thieves. For in the burial ground, the closets are often left open, such as the dread of the population, Muslim and Christian, of the revenge of the dead that a thief bold enough to commit any murder would never dare to touch the property of a dead person. The Bulgarians have a belief that every Saturday, and especially the eve of Easter Sunday, and until Trinity Day, about seven weeks, the souls of the dead descend on earth, some to beg forgiveness from those living, whom they had wronged others to protect and commune with their loved ones. Faithfully following the traditional rites of their forefathers, the natives on each Saturday on these seven weeks keep either lamps or tapers lighted. In addition to that, on the 7th of May, they drench the tombs with grape wine and burn incense around them from sunset to sunrise. With the inhabitants of towns, the ceremony is limited to these simple observances. With some of the rustics, though, the rite assumes the proportions of a theurgic evocation. On the eve of the Ascension Day, Bulgarian women light a quantity of tapers and lamps. The pots are placed upon tripods, and incense perfumes the atmosphere for miles around, while thick white clouds of smoke envelop each tomb, as though a veil had separated it from the others. During the evening and until a little before midnight, in memory of the deceased, Acquaintances and a certain number of mendicants are fed and treated with wine and raki, grape whiskey, and money is distributed among the poor according to the means of the surviving relatives. When the feast is ended, the guests approaching the tomb and addressing the defunct by name thank him or her for the bounties received. When all but the nearest relatives are gone, a woman, usually the most aged, remains alone with the dead and some say resorts to the ceremony of invocation. After fervent prayers repeated face down on the grave mound, more or less drops of blood are drawn from near the left bosom and allowed to trickle upon the tomb. This gives strength to the invisible spirit which hovers around to assume, for a few instants, a visible form and whisper his instructions to the Christian theurgist. If he has any to offer or simply to bless the mourner and then disappear again till the following year. So firmly rooted in this belief that we have heard, in the case of family difficulty, a Moldavian woman appealed to her sister to put off every decision till Ascension Night, when their dead father would be able to tell them of his will and pleasure in person, to which the sister consented as simply as though their parent were in the next room. That there are fearful secrets in nature may well be believed when, as we have seen in the case of the Russian Zankar, the sorcerer cannot die until he passed the world to another, and the hierophants of white magic rarely do. 
It seems as if the dread power of the word could only be entrusted to one man of a certain district or body of people at a time. When the Brahmatma was about to lay aside the burden of physical existence, he imparted his secret to his successor, either orally or by a writing placed in a securely fastened casket, which went into the latter's hands alone. Moses lays his hands upon his neophyte, Joshua, in the solitudes of Nebo, and passes away forever. Aaron initiates Eleazar on Mount Hor and dies. Siddhartha Buddha promises his mendicants before his death to live in him who shall deserve it, embraces his favorite disciple, whispers in his ear, and dies. And as John's head lies upon the bosom of Jesus, he is told that he shall tarry until he shall come. Like signal fires of the olden times, which lighted and extinguished by turns upon one hilltop after another, conveyed intelligence along a whole stretch of country, so we see a long line of wise men from the beginning of history down to our own times communicating the word of wisdom to their direct successors. Passing from seer to seer, the word flashes out like lightning, and while carrying off the initiator from human sight forever, brings the new initiate into view. Meanwhile, whole nations murder each other in the name of another word, an empty substitute accepted literally by each and misinterpreted by all. We have met a few sects which truly practice sorcery. One such is the Yazidis, considered by some a branch of the Kurds, though we believe erroneously. These inhabit chiefly the mountainous and desolate regions of Asiatic Turkey, about Mosul, Armenia, and are found even in Syria and Mesopotamia. They are called and known everywhere as devil worshippers, and most certainly it is not either through ignorance or mental obscuration that they have set up the warship and a regular intercommunication with the lowest and the most malicious of both elementals and elementaries. They recognize the present wickedness of the chief of the black powers, but at the same time they dread his power, and so try to conciliate to themselves his favors. He is in an open quarrel with Allah, they say, but a reconciliation can take place between the two at any day, and those who show marks of their disrespect to the black one now may suffer for it at some time in the future, and thus have both God and devil against them. This is simply a cunning policy that seeks to propitiate his satanic majesty, who is no other than the great Chernobog, the black god of the Viraji Rus, the ancient idolatrous Russians before the days of Vladimir. Like Wirus, the famous demographer of the 16th century, who is in his Pseudomonarchia Daemonum describes and enumerates a regular infernal court, which has its dignitaries, princes, dukes, nobles, and officers. The Yazidis have a whole pantheon of devils and use the jakshas, aerial spirits, to convey their prayers and respects to Satan, their master, and the Afrits of the desert. During their prayer meetings, they join hands and form immense rings, with their sheikh, or an officiating priest in the middle who claps his hands, and intones every verse in honor of Shitan, Satan. Then they whirl and leap in the air. When the frenzy is at its climax, they often wound and cut themselves with their daggers, occasionally rendering the same service to their neighbors. But their wounds do not heal and cicatrize as easily as in the case of lamas and holy men. For but too often they fall victims to these self-inflicted wounds. While dancing and flourishing high their daggers without unclasping hands, for this would be considered a sacrilege, and the spell instantly broken, they coax and praise Shitan, and entreat him to manifest himself in works by miracles. As their rites are chiefly accomplished during night, they do not fail to obtain manifestations of various character the least of which are enormous globes of fire which take the shapes of the most uncouth animals. Lady Hester Stanhope, whose name was for many years a power among the Masonic fraternities of the East, is said to have witnessed, personally, several of these Yazidian ceremonies. We were told by an Okal, of the sect of Druzes, that after having been present at one of the Yazidis' devil masses, as they are called, this extraordinary lady, so noted for her personal courage and daring bravery, 
fainted, and notwithstanding her usual emir's male attire, was recalled to life and health with the greatest difficulty. Personally, we regret to say all our efforts to witness one of these performances failed. A recent article in a Catholic journal on Nagualism and Voodooism charges Haiti with being the center of secret societies with terrible forms of initiation and bloody rites, where human infants are sacrificed and devoured by the adepts. Perron, a French traveler, is quoted at length describing a most fearful scene witnessed by him in Cuba. In the house of a lady whom he never would have suspected of any connection with so monstrous a sect. A naked white girl acted as a voodoo priestess, wrought up to a frenzy by dances and incantations that followed the sacrifice of a white and a black hen. A serpent, trained to its part, and acted upon the music, coiled round the limbs of the girl, its motions studied by the votaries dancing around or standing to watch its contortions. The spectator fled at last in horror when the poor girl fell writhing in an epileptic fit. While deploring such a state of things in Christian countries, the Catholic article in question explains this tenacity for ancestral religious rites as evidence of the natural depravity of the human heart and makes a loud call for greater zeal on the part of Catholics. Besides repeating the absurd fiction about devouring children, the writer seems wholly insensible to the fact that a devotion to one's faith that centuries of the most cruel and bloody persecution cannot quench makes heroes and martyrs of a people, whereas their conversion to any other faith would turn them simply into renegades. A compulsory religion can never breed anything but deceit. The answer received by the missionary Margil from some Indians support the above truism, the question being, how is it that you are so heathenish after having been Christian so long? The answer was, what would you do, father, if enemies of your faith entered your land? Would you not take all your books, investments, and signs of religion and retire to the most secret caves and mountains? This is just what our priests and prophets and soothsayers and nogalists have done to this time and are still doing. Such an answer from a Roman Catholic, questioned by a missionary of either Greek or Protestant church, would earn for him the crown of a saint in the Popish martyrology. Better a heathen religion than can extort from an Francis Xavier such a tribute as he pays the Japanese, in saying that, in virtue and probity, they surpassed all the nations he had ever seen, than a Christianity whose advance over the face of the earth sweeps aboriginal nations out of existence, as with a hurricane of fire. Disease, drunkenness, and demoralization are the immediate results of apostasy from the faith of their fathers and conversion into a religion of mere forms. What Christianity is doing for British India, we need go to no inimical sources to inquire. Captain O'Grady, the British ex-official, says, The British government is doing a shameful thing in turning the natives of India from a sober race to a nation of drunkards. And for pure greed. Drinking is forbidden by the religion alike of the Hindus and Muslims, but drinking is daily becoming more and more prevalent. What the accursed opium traffic forced on China by British greed has been to that unhappy country, the government sale of liquor is likely to become to India. For it is a government monopoly based on almost precisely the same model as the government monopoly of tobacco in Spain. The outside domestics in European families usually get to be terrible drunkards. The indoor servants usually detest drinking and are a good deal more respectable in this particular than their masters and mistresses. Everybody drinks, bishops, chaplains, freshly imported boarding school girls and all. Yes, these are the blessings that the modern Christian religion brings with its Bibles and catechisms to the poor heathen. Rum and bastardly to Hindustan, opium to China, rum and foul disorders to Tahiti, and worst of all, the example of hypocrisy in religion and a practical skepticism in atheism, which, since it seems to be good enough for civilized people, may well in time be thought good enough for those whom theology has too often been holding under a very heavy yoke. On the other hand, everything that is noble, spiritual, elevating, in the old religion, is denied 
and even deliberately falsified. Take Paul. Read the little of original that is left of him in the writings attributed to this brave, honest, sincere man, and see whether anyone can find a word therein to show that Paul meant by the word Christ anything more than the abstract ideal of the personal divinity indwelling in man. For Paul, Christ is not a person, but an embodied idea. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is reborn as after initiation. For the Lord is spirit, the spirit of man. Paul was the only one of the apostles who had understood the secret ideas underlying the teachings of Jesus, although he had never met him. But Paul had been initiated himself, and bent upon inaugurating a new and broad reform, when embracing the whole of humanity, he sincerely set his own doctrines far above the wisdom of the ages, above the ancient mysteries and final revelation to the apopti. As Professor A. Wilder well proves in a series of able articles, it was not Jesus but Paul who was the real founder of Christianity. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, says the Acts of the Apostles. Such men as Arrhenius, Epiphanius, and Eusebius have transmitted to posterity a reputation for untruth and dishonest practices. And the heart sickens at the story of the crimes of that period writes this author in a recent article. It will be remembered, he adds, that when the Muslims overran Syria and Asia Minor for the first time, they were welcomed by the Christians of those regions as deliverers from the intolerable oppression of the ruling authorities of the church. Muhammad never was, neither is he now, considered a god. Yet under the stimulus of his name, millions of Muslims have served their god with an ardor that can never be paralleled by Christian sectarianism that they have sadly degenerated since the days of their prophet, does not alter the case in hand, but only proves the more the prevalence of matter over spirits all over the world. Besides, they have never degenerated more from primitive faith than Christians themselves. Why then should not Jesus of Nazareth, a thousandfold higher, nobler, and morally grander than Muhammad, be as well revered by Christians and followed in practice? instead of being blindly adored in fruitless faith as a god, and at the same time worshipped much after the fashion of certain Buddhists, who turn their wheel of prayers. That this faith has become sterile, and is no more worthy the name of Christianity than the fetishism of Kalmucks, and that of the philosophy preached by Buddha, is doubted by none. We would not be supposed to entertain the opinion, says Dr. Wilder, that modern Christianity is in any degree identical with the religion preached by Paul. It lacks his breadth of view, his earnestness, his keen spiritual perception. Bearing the impress of the nations by which it is professed, it exhibits as many forms as there are races. It is one thing in Italy and Spain, but widely differs in France, Germany, Holland, Sweden, Great Britain, Russia, Armenia, Kurdistan, and Abyssinia. As compared with the preceding warships, the change seems to be more in name than in genius. Men had gone to bed pagans and awoke Christians. As for the Sermon on the Mount, its conspicuous doctrines are more or less repudiated by every Christian community of any considerable dimensions. Barbarism, oppression, cruel punishments are as common now as in the days of paganism. The Christianity of Peter exists no more that of Paul supplanted it, and was in its turn amalgamated with the other world religions. When mankind are enlightened, or the barbarous races and families are supplanted by those of nobler nature and instincts, the ideal excellencies may become realities. The Christ of Paul has constituted an enigma which evoked the most strenuous endeavor to solve. He was something else than the Jesus of the Gospels. Paul disregarded utterly their endless genealogies. The author of the fourth gospel, himself an Alexandrian Gnostic, describes Jesus as what would now be termed a materialized divine spirit. He was the Logos, or first emanation, the Metatron, the mother of Jesus, like the princess Maya, Danae, or perhaps Perictone, had given birth not to a love child, but to a divine offspring. No Jew of whatever sect, no apostle, no early believer, ever promulgated such an idea. Paul treats of Christ as a personage rather than as a person. 
the sacred lessons of the secret assemblies often personified the divine good and the divine truth in a human form, assailed by the passions and appetites of mankind. But superior to them and this doctrine, emerging from the crypt, was apprehended by churchlings and gross-minded men as that of immaculate conception and divine incarnation. In the old book, published in 1693 and written by the Sieur de la Louvre, French ambassador to the King of Siam, are related many interesting facts of the Siamese religion. The remarks of the satirical Frenchman are so pointed that we will quote his words about the Siamese savior, Simona Kadam. How marvelous soever they pretend the birth of their savior has been. They cease not to give him a father and a mother. His mother, whose name is found in some of their Bali, Pali books, was called, as they say, Maha Maria, which seems to signify the great Mary, for Maha signifies great. However it be, this ceases not to give attention to the missionaries, and has perhaps given occasion to the Siamese to believe that Jesus, being the son of Mary, was brother to Simona Kadam, and that, having been crucified, he was that wicked brother, whom they give to Simona Kadam under the name of Thevatat, and whom they report to be punished in hell, with a punishment which participates something of a cross. The Siamese expect another Simona Kadam, I mean, another miraculous man like him, whom they already named Honorote, and whom they say was foretold by Simona. He made all sorts of miracles. He had two disciples, both standing on each hand of his idol, one on the right hand and the other on the left. The first is named Pra-Maga, and the second Pra-Scarabao. The father of Simona Kadom was, according to this same ballet book, a king of Tevalanka, that is to say, a king of Ceylon. But the Bali books, being without a date and without the author's name, have no more authority than all the traditions, whose origin is unknown. This last argument is as ill-considered as it is naively expressed. We do not know of any book in the whole world less authenticated as to date, author's names or tradition, than our Christian Bible. Under these circumstances, the Siamese have as much reason to believe in their miraculous Simona Kadom as the Christians in their miraculously born Savior. Moreover, they have no better right to force their religion upon the Siamese or any other people against their will, and in their own country, where they go unasked, than the so-called heathen to compel France or England to accept Buddhism at the point of the sword. A Buddhist missionary, even in free-thinking America, would daily risk being mobbed, but this does not at all prevent missionaries from abusing the religion of the Brahmins, Lamas, and Bonzes publicly to their teeth, and the latter are not always at liberty to answer them. This is termed diffusing the beneficent light of Christianity and civilization upon the darkness of heathenism. And yet we find that these pretensions, which might appear ludicrous were they not to be so fatal to millions of our fellow men, who only ask to be left alone, were fully appreciated as early as in the 17th century. We find the same witty Monsieur de la Loubière, under a pretext of pious sympathy, giving some truly curious instructions to the ecclesiastical authorities at home, which embody the very soul of Jesuitism. From what I have said concerning the opinions of the Orientals, he remarks, it is easy to comprehend how difficult an enterprise it is to bring them over to the Christian religion. And of what consequence it is that the missionaries who preach the gospel in the East do perfectly understand the manners and belief of these people. For as the apostles and first Christians, when God supported their preaching by so many wonders, did not on a sudden discover to the heathens all the mysteries which we adore, but a long time concealed from them, and the catuchmans themselves, the knowledge of those which might scandalize them. It seems very rational to me that the missionaries, who have not the gift of miracles, ought not presently to discover to the Orientals all the mysteries nor all the practices of Christianity. Would be convenient, for example, if I am not mistaken, not to preach unto them without great caution the worshipping of saints, and as to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, I think it would be necessary to manage it with them, 
if I may so say, and not to speak to them of the mystery of the Incarnation, till after having convinced them of the existence of a God-Creator. For what probability is there, to begin with, to persuading the Siamese to remove Simona Kadom, Pramogla, and Praskarabau from the altars to set up Jesus Christ, St. Peter and St. Paul in their stead? Twould perhaps be more proper not to preach unto them Jesus Christ crucified, till they have first comprehended that one may be unfortunate and innocent, and that by the rule received, even amongst them, which is that the innocent might load himself with the crimes of the guilty. It was necessary that a god should become man, to the end that this man-god should, by a laborious life and a shameful but voluntary death, satisfy for all the sins of men. But before all things, it would be necessary to give them the true idea of a God-creator, and justly provoked against men. The Eucharist, after all, will not scandalize the Siamese, as it formerly scandalized the pagans of Europe, for as much as the Siamese do not believe Simona Kadom could give his wife and children to the Talapoins to eat. On the contrary, as the Chinese are respectful toward their parents, even to a scruple, I doubt not that if the gospel should be presently put into their hands, they would be scandalized at that place, where, when some told Jesus Christ that his mother and his brethren asked after him, he answered in such a manner that he seems so little to regard them, that he affected not to know them. They would not be less offended at those other mysterious words, which our divine Savior spoke to the young man, who desired time to go and bury his parents. Let the dead, said he, bury the dead. Everyone knows the trouble which the Japanese expressed to St. Francis Xavier upon the eternity of damnation, not being able to believe that their dead parents should fall into so horrible a misfortune for want of having embraced Christianity, which they had never heard of. It seems necessary, therefore, to prevent and mollify this thought by the means which the great apostles of the Indies used in first establishing the idea of an all-omnipotent, all-wise, and most just God, the author of all good, to whom only everything is due, and by whose will we owe unto kings, bishops, and magistrates, and to our parents the respects which we owe them. These examples are sufficient to show with what precautions it is necessary to prepare the minds of the Orientals to think like us, and not to be offended with most of the articles of the Christian faith. And what we ask is left to preach, with no Savior, no atonement, no crucifixion for human sin, no gospel, no eternal damnation to tell them of, and no miracles to display. What remained for the Jesuits to spread among the Siamese but the dust of the pagan sanctuaries with which to blind their eyes? The sarcasm is biting indeed. The morality to which these poor heathen are made to adhere by their ancestral faith is so pure that Christianity has to be stripped of every distinguishing mark before its priests can venture to offer it for their examination. A religion that cannot be trusted to the scrutiny of an unsophisticated people who are patterns of filial piety, of honest dealing, of deep reverence for God, and an instinctive horror of profaning His majesty must indeed be founded upon error. That it is so, our century is discovering little by little. In the general spoliation of Buddhism to make up the new Christian religion, it was not to be expected that so peerless a character as Gautama Buddha would be left unappropriated. It was but natural that after taking his legendary history to fill out the blanks left in the fictitious story of Jesus, after using what they could of Krishna's, they should take the man Sakyamuni and put him in their calendar under an Elias. This they actually did, and the Hindu savior in due time appeared on the list of saints as Josephat, to keep company with those martyrs of religion, S.S. Ora and Placida, Longinus and Amphibolus. In Palermo, there is even a church dedicated to Devo Josephat, Among the vain attempts of subsequent ecclesiastical writers to fix the genealogy of this mysterious saint, the most original was the making him Joshua, the son of Nun, 
but these trifling difficulties being at last surmounted, we find the history of Gautama copied word for word from Buddhist sacred books into the Golden Legend. Names of individuals are changed. The place of action, India, remains the same. In the Christian, as in the Buddhist legends, it can be also found in the Speculum Historial of Vincent of Beauvais, which was written in the 13th century. The first discovery is due to the historian de Couteau, although Professor Muller credits the first recognition of the identity of these two stories to M. Laboulet in 1859. Colonel Yule tells us that the stories of Barlam and Josephat are recognized by Baronius and are to be found at page 348 of the Roman Martyrology set forth by command of Pope Gregory the Thirteenth and revised by the authority of Pope Urban the Eighth, translated out of Latin into English by G.K. of the Society of Jesus. To repeat even a small portion of this ecclesiastical nonsense would be tedious and useless. Let him who doubts and who would learn the story read it as given by Colonel Yule. Some of the Christian and ecclesiastical speculations seem to have embarrassed even Domini Valentin. There be some who hold this Budum for a fugitive Syrian Jew, he writes. Others who hold him for a disciple of the Apostle Thomas. But how, in that case, he could have been born 622 years before Christ, I leave them to explain. Diego du Couto stands by the belief that he was certainly Joshua, which is still more absurd. The religious romance called the History of Barlam and Josephat was, for several centuries, one of the most popular works in Christendom, says Colonel Yule. It was translated into all the chief European languages, including Scandinavian and Slavonic tongues. The story first appears among the works of St. John of Damascus, a theologian of the early part of the 8th century. Here then lies the secret of its origin. For this St. John, before he became a divine, held a high office at the court of the Caliph Abu Jafar al-Mansur, where he probably learned the story and afterwards adapted it to the new orthodox necessities of the Buddha turned into a Christian saint. Having repeated the plagiarized story, Diego de Couto, who seems to yield up with reluctance his curious notion that Gautama was Joshua, says, to this name, Budao, the Gentiles throughout all India have dedicated great and suburb pagodas. With reference to this story, we have been diligent in inquiring in the ancient Gentiles of those parts had in their writings any knowledge of St. Josephat, who was converted by Balaam, and who in his legend is represented as the son of a great king of India, and who had just the same upbringing with all the same particulars that we have recounted of the life of Budao. And as I was traveling in the Isle of Salset, and went to see that rare and admirable pagoda, which we call the Canera Pagoda, Kanhari Caves, made in a mountain with many halls cut out of solid rock, and inquiring of an old man about the work, what he thought as to who had made it, he told us that without a doubt the work was made by order of the father of St. Josephat, to bring him up in seclusion, as the story tells. And as it informs us that he was the son of a great king in India, it may well be, as we have just said, that he was the Budao of whom they relate such marvels. The Christian legend is taken, moreover, in most of its details from the Silanese tradition. It is on this island that originated the story of young Gautama rejecting his father's throne and the king's erecting a superb palace for him, in which he kept him half-prisoner, surrounded by the temptations of life and wealth. Marco Polo told it as he had it from the Silanese, and his version is now found to be a faithful repetition of what is given in the various Buddhist books. As Marco naively expresses it, Buddha led a life of such hardship and sanctity, and kept such a great abstinence, just as if he had been a Christian. Indeed, he adds, had he but been so, he would have been a great saint of our Lord Jesus Christ. So good and pure was the life he led. To which pious apothegm, his editor, very pertinently remarks that 
Marco is not the only eminent person who has expressed this view of Sakyamuni's life in such words. And in his turn, Professor Max Muller says, And whatever we may think of the sanctity of saints, let those who doubt the right of Buddha to place among them read the story of his life as it is told in the Buddhistical canon. If he lived the life which is there described, few saints have had a better claim to the title than Buddha. And no one, either in the Greek or the Roman church, need be ashamed of having paid to his memory the honor that was intended for St. Josephat, the prince, the hermit, and the saint. The Roman Catholic Church has never had so good a chance to Christianize all China, Tibet, and Tartary as in the 13th century, during the reign of Kublai Khan. It seems strange that they did not embrace the opportunity when Kublai was hesitating at one time between the four religions of the world, and perhaps through the eloquence of Marco Polo, favored Christianity more than either Mohammedanism, Judaism, or Buddhism. Marco Polo and Ramusio, one of his interpreters, tell us why. It seems that, unfortunately for Rome, the embassy of Marco's father and uncle failed, because Clement IV happened to die just at that very time. There was no pope for several months to receive the friendly overtures of Kublai Khan. And thus the 100 Christian missionaries invited by him could not be sent to Tibet and Tartary. To those who believe that there is an intelligent deity above who takes a certain concern in the welfare of our miserable little world, this contretemps must in itself seem a pretty good proof that Buddhism should have the best of Christianity. Perhaps, who knows, Pope Clement fell sick so as to save the Buddhists from sinking into the idolatry of Roman Catholicism. From pure Buddhism, the religion of these districts has degenerated into Lamaism, but the latter, with all its blemishes, purely formalistic and impairing, but little the doctrine itself, is yet far above Catholicism. The poor Abbey Hawk very soon found it out for himself. As he moved on with his caravan, he writes, Everyone repeated to us that, as we advance toward the West, we should find the doctrines growing more luminous and sublime. La Sa was the great focus of light, the rays from which became weakened as they were diffused. One day he gave to a Tibetan Lama a brief summary of Christian doctrine, which appeared by no means unfamiliar to him. We do not wonder at that, and he even maintained that it... Catholicism, did not differ much from the faith of the Grand Lamas of Tibet. These words of the Tibetan Lama astonished us not a little, writes the missionary. The unity of God, the mystery of the Incarnation, the dogma of the real presence, appeared to us in his belief. The new light thrown on the religion of Buddha induced us really to believe that we should find among the Lamas of Tibet a more purified system. It is these words of praise to Lamaism in which Huck's book abounds, that caused his work to be placed on the index at Rome, and himself to be unfrocked. When questioned why, since he held the Christian faith to be the best of the religions protected by him, he did not attach himself to it, the answer given by Kublai Khan is as suggestive as it is curious. How would you have me to become a Christian? There are four prophets worshipped and revered by all the world. The Christians say their God is Jesus Christ. The Saracens, Mahomet, the Jews, Moses, the idolaters, Sogamon Borkan, Sakyamuni, Burkham, or Buddha. Who is the first God among the idols? And I worship and pay respect to all four, and pray that he among them who is greatest in heaven in very truth may aid me. We may ridicule the Khan's prudence. We cannot blame him for trustingly leaving the decision of the puzzling dilemma to providence itself. One of his most unsurmountable objections to embrace Christianity, he thus specifies to Marco. You see that the Christians of these parts are so ignorant that they achieve nothing and can achieve nothing, whilst you see the idolaters can do anything they please, insomuch that when I sit at a table, the cups from the middle of the hall come to me full of wine or other liquor without being touched by anybody, and I drink from them. They control storms, causing them to pass in whatever direction they please, and do many other marvels, whilst, as you know, their idols speak and give them predictions on whatever subjects they choose. But if I return to the faith of Christ and become a Christian, then my barons and others who are not converted would say, 
What has moved you to be baptized? What powers or miracles have you witnessed on the part of Christ? You know the idolaters here say that their wonders are performed by the sanctity and power of their idols. Well, I should not know what answer to make, so they would only be confirmed in their errors. And the idolaters, who are adepts in such surprising arts, would easily compass my death. But now you shall go to your Pope, and pray him on my part to send hither a hundred men skilled in your law. And if they are capable of rebuking the practices of idolaters to their faces, and of proving to them that they know too much how to do such things, but will not, because they are done by the help of the devil and other evil spirits, and if they so control the idolaters that these shall have no power to perform such things in their presence, and when we shall witness this, we will denounce the idolaters and their religion, and then I will receive baptism, and then all my barons and chiefs shall be baptized also, and thus, in the end, there will be more Christians here than exist in your part of the world. The proposition was fair. Why did not the Christians avail themselves of it? Moses is said to have faced such an ordeal before Pharaoh, and come off triumphant. To our mind, the logic of this uneducated Mongol was unanswerable. His intuition faultless. He saw good results in all religions and felt that, whether a man be Buddhist, Christian, Mohammedan, or Jew, his spiritual powers might equally be developed, his faith equally lead him to the highest truth. All he asked before making choice of a creed for his people was the evidence upon which to base faith. To judge alone by its jugglers, India must certainly be better acquainted with alchemy, chemistry, and physics than any European academy. The psychological wonders produced by some fakirs of southern Hindustan, and by the Shabarons and Hobahans of Tibet and Mongolia, alike prove our case. The science of psychology has there reached an acme of perfection never attained elsewhere in the annals of the marvelous. That such powers are not alone due to study, but are natural to every human being, is now proved in Europe and America by the phenomena of mesmerism and what is termed spiritualism. If the majority of foreign travelers and residents in British India are disposed to regard the whole as clever jugglery, not so with a few Europeans who have had the rare luck to be admitted behind the veil in the pagodas. Surely these will not deride the rites, nor undervalue the phenomena produced in the secret lodges of India. The Mahadevasthanam of the pagodas, usually termed Goparam, from the sacred pyramidal gateway by which now the buildings are erected, has been known to Europeans before now, though to a mere handful in all. We do not know whether the prolific Jacoliet was ever admitted into one of these lodges. It is extremely doubtful, we should say, if we may judge from his many fantastic tales of the immoralities of the mystical rites among the Brahmins, the fakirs of the pakotas, and even the Buddhists at all of which he makes himself figure as a Joseph. Anyhow, it is evident that the Brahmins taught him no secrets, for speaking of the fakirs and their wonders, he remarks, Under the direction of initiated Brahmins, they practice in the seclusion of the pagodas, the occult sciences. And let no one be surprised at this word, which seems to open the door of the supernatural, while there are in sciences which the Brahmins call occult, phenomena so extraordinary as to baffle all investigation. There is not one which cannot be explained and which is not subject to natural law. Unquestionably, any initiated Brahmin could, if he would, explain every phenomena, but he will not. Meanwhile, we have yet to see an explanation by the best of our physicists of even the most trivial occult phenomena produced by a fakir pupil of a pagoda. Jacolia says it will be quite impracticable to give an account of the marvelous facts witnessed by himself, but adds with entire truthfulness, let it suffice to say that in regard to magnetism and spiritism, Europe has yet to stammer over the first letters of the alphabet, and that the Brahmins have reached in these two departments of learning results in the way of phenomena that are truly stupefying. When one sees these strange manifestations, whose power one cannot deny, without grasping the laws that the Brahmins keep so carefully concealed, 
the mind is overwhelmed with wonder, and one feels that he must run away and break the charm that holds him. The only explanation that we have been able to obtain on the subject from a learned Brahmin, with whom we were on terms of the closest intimacy, was this. You have studied physical nature, and you have obtained, through the laws of nature, marvelous results, steam, electricity, etc. For 20,000 years or more, we have studied the intellectual forces, we have discovered their laws, and we obtain, by making them act alone or in concert with matter, phenomena still more astonishing than your own. Jack Oliott must indeed have been stupefied by wonders, for he says, We have seen things such as one does not describe for fear of making his readers doubt his intelligence, but still we have seen them. And truly one comprehends how, in presence of such facts, the ancient world believed in possessions of the devil and in exorcism. But yet this uncompromising enemy of priestcraft, monastic orders, and the clergy of every religion and every land, including Brahmins, Lamas, and Fakirs, is so struck with the contrast between the fact-supported cults of India and the empty pretenses of Catholicism, that after describing the terrible self-tortures of the Fakirs in a burst of honest indignation, he thus gives vent to his feelings. Nevertheless, these fakirs, these mendicant Brahmins, have still something grand about them when they flagellate themselves, when during the self-infliction martyrdom the flesh is torn out by bits, the blood pours upon the ground. But you, Catholic mendicants, what do you do today? You, grey friars, capuchins, Franciscans, who play at fakirs with your knotted cords, your flints, your hair shirts, and your rose-water flagellations, your bare feet, and your comical mortifications. Fanatics without faith, martyrs without tortures. Has not one the right to ask you, if it is to obey the law of God, that you should shut yourselves in behind thick walls, and thus escape the law of labor which weighs so heavily upon all other men? Away, you are only beggars. Let them pass on. We have devoted too much space to them and their conglomerate theology already. We have weighed both in the balance of history, of logic, of truth, and found them wanting. Their system breeds atheism, nihilism, despair, and crime. Its priests and preachers are unable to prove by works their reception of divine power. If both church and priest could but pass out of the sight of the world as easily as do their names from the eye of our reader, it would be a happy day for humanity. New York and London might then soon become as moral as a heathen city unoccupied by Christians. Paris be cleaner than the ancient Sodom, when Catholic and Protestant would be as fully satisfied as a Buddhist or Brahmin, that their every crime would be punished and every good deed rewarded. They might spend upon their own heathen what now goes to give missionaries long picnics and to make the name of Christian hated and despised by every nation outside the boundaries of Christendom. As occasion required, we have reinforced our argument with descriptions of a few of the innumerable phenomena witnessed by us in different parts of the world. The remaining space at our disposal will be devoted to like subjects. Having laid a foundation by elucidating the philosophy of occult phenomena, it seems opportune to illustrate the theme with facts that have occurred under our own eye, and that may be verified by any traveler. Primitive peoples have disappeared, but primitive wisdom survives, and is attainable by those who will, dare, and can keep silent. Chapter 12 My vast and noble capital, my day two, my splendidly adorned, and thou, my cool and delicious summer seat, my shang tu Kibung, Alas, for my illustrious name as the sovereign of the world. Alas, for my day two, seat of sanctity, glorious work in the immortal Kublai. All, all is rent from me. Colonel Yule in Marco Polo. As for what thou hearest others say, who persuade the many that the soul, when once freed from the body, neither suffers, evil, nor is conscious. I know that thou art better grounded in the doctrines received by us from our ancestors, and in the sacred orgies of Dionysus, than to believe them. For the mystic symbols are well known to us who belong to the brotherhood. Plutarch. 
The problem of life is man. Magic, or rather wisdom, is the evolved knowledge of the potencies of man's interior being, which forces are divine emanations, as intuition is the perception of their origin, and initiation are induction into that knowledge. We begin with instinct. The end is omniscience. A. Wilder Power belongs to him who knows. Brahmanical Book of Evocation It would argue small discernment on our part, were we to suppose that we had been followed thus far, through this work by any but metaphysicians or mystics of some sort. Were it otherwise, we should certainly advise such to spare themselves the trouble of reading this chapter, for although nothing is said that is not strictly true, they would not fail to regard the least wonderful of the narratives as absolutely false, however substantiated. To comprehend the principles of natural law involved in the several phenomena here and after described, the reader must keep in mind the fundamental propositions of the Oriental philosophy, which we have successfully elucidated. Let us recapitulate very briefly. First, there is no miracle. Everything that happens is the result of law eternal, immutable, ever active. Apparent miracle is but the operation of forces antagonistic to what Dr. W. B. Carpenter, F.R.S., a man of great learning but little knowledge, calls the well-ascertained laws of nature. Like many of his class, Dr. Carpenter ignores the fact that there may be laws once known, now unknown, to science. Second, nature is triune. There is a visible, objective nature, an invisible, indwelling, energizing nature, the exact model of the other, and its vital principle, and above these two, spirit, source of all forces, alone eternal and indestructible. The lower two constantly change, the higher third does not. Third, man is also triune. He has his objective, physical body, his vitalizing astral body, or soul, the real man, and these two are brooded over and illuminated by the third, the sovereign, the immortal spirit. When the real man succeeds in merging himself with the latter, he becomes an immortal entity. Fourth, magic, as a science, is the knowledge of these principles, and of the way by which the omniscience and omnipotence of the spirit and its control over nature's forces may be acquired by the individual while still in the body. Magic, as an art, is the application of this knowledge in practice. Fifth, arcane knowledge misapplied is sorcery, beneficently used, true magic or wisdom. Sixth, mediumship is the opposite of adeptship. The medium is the passive instrument of foreign influences. The adept actively controls himself and all inferior potencies. Seventh, all things that ever were, that are, or that will be, having the record upon the astral light or tablet of the unseen universe, the initiated adept, by using the vision of his own spirit, can know all that has been known or can be known. Eighth, races of men differ in spiritual gifts as in color, stature, or any other external quality. Among some peoples, seership naturally prevails. Among others, mediumship. Some are addicted to sorcery and transmit its secret rules of practice from generation to generation, with a range of psychical phenomena, more or less wide as the result. Ninth, one phase of magical skill is the voluntary and conscious withdrawal of the inner man astral form, from the outer man, physical body. In the cases of some mediums, withdrawal occurs, but it is unconscious and involuntary. With the latter, the body is more or less cataleptic at such times. But with the adept, the absence of the astral form would not be noticed, for the physical senses are alert, and the individual appears only as though in a fit of abstraction, a brown study, as some would call it. To the movements of the wandering astral from neither time nor space offer obstacles. The thaumaturgist, thoroughly skilled in occult science, can cause himself, that is, his physical body, to seem to disappear or to apparently take on any shape that he may choose. He may make his astral form visible or he may give it protean appearances. In both cases, these results will be achieved by a mesmeric hallucination of the senses of all the witnesses simultaneously brought on. This hallucination is so perfect that the subject of it would stake his life that he saw a reality. 
when it is but a picture in his own mind, impressed upon his subconscious by the irresistible will of the mesmerizer. But while the astral form can go anywhere, penetrate any obstacle, and be seen at any distance from the physical body, the latter is dependent upon ordinary methods of transportation. It may be levitated under prescribed magnetic conditions, but not pass from one locality to another except in the usual way. Hence, we discredit all stories of the aerial flight of mediums and body. For such would be miracle, and miracle we repudiate. Inert matter may be, in certain cases and under certain conditions, disintegrated, passed through walls and recombined, but living animal organisms cannot. Swedenborgians believe, and arcane science teaches, that the abandonment of the living body by the soul frequently occurs and that we encounter every day, in every condition of life, such living corpses. Various causes, among them overpowering fright, grief, despair, a violent attack of sickness, or excessive sensuality, may bring this about. The vacant carcass may be entered and inhabited by the astral form of an adept sorcerer, or an elementary, an earthbound, disembodied human soul, or very rarely an elemental. Of course, an adept of white magic has the same power, but unless some very exceptional and great object is to be accomplished, he will never consent to pollute himself by occupying the body of an impure person. In insanity, the patient's astral being is either semi-paralyzed, bewildered, and subject to the influence of every passing spirit of any sort, or it has departed forever and the body is taken possession of by some vampirish entity near its own disintegration, and clinging desperately to earth, whose sensual pleasures it may enjoy for a brief season longer by this expedient. Tenth, the cornerstone of magic is an intimate practical knowledge of magnetism and electricity, their qualities, correlations, and potencies, especially necessary as a familiarity with their effects in and upon the animal kingdom and man. There are occult properties in many other minerals, uh, equally strange with that in the lodestone, which all practitioners of magic must know, and of which so-called exact science is wholly ignorant. Plants also have like mystical properties in a most wonderful degree, and the secrets of the herbs of dreams and enchantments are only lost to European science, and useless to say to are unknown to it except in a few marked instances, such as opium and hashish. Yet the psychical effects of even these few upon the human system are regarded as evidences of a temporary mental disorder. The women of Thessaly and Epirus, the female hierophants of the rites of Sabazius, did not carry their secrets away with the downfall of their sanctuaries. They are still preserved, and those who are aware of the nature of Soma know the properties of other plants as well. To sum up all in a few words, magic is spiritual wisdom, nature the material ally, pupil and servant of the magician. One common vital principle pervades all things, and this is controllable by the perfected human will. The adept can stimulate the movements of the natural forces in plants and animals in a preternatural degree. Such experiments are not obstructions of nature, but quickenings. The conditions of intenser vital action are given. The adept can control the sensations and alter the conditions of the physical and astral bodies of other persons, not adepts. He can also govern and employ, as he chooses, the spirits of the elements. He cannot control the immortal spirit of any human being, living or dead, for all such spirits are alike sparks of the divine essence and not subject to any foreign domination. There are two kinds of seership, that of the soul and that of the spirit. The seership of the ancient Pythoness, or the modern mesmerized subject, vary but in the artificial modes adopted to induce the state of clairvoyance. But as the visions of both depend upon the greater or less acuteness of the senses of the astral body, they differ very widely from the perfect, omniscient, spiritual state, for at best, the subject can get but glimpses of truth, through the veil which physical nature interposes. The astral principle or mind called by the Hindu yogi Favatma is the sentient soul inseparable from our physical brain which it holds in subjection and is in its turn equally trammeled by it. 
This is the ego, the intellectual life principle of man, is conscious entity. While it is yet within the material body, the clearness and correctness of its spiritual visions depends on its more or less intimate relation with its higher principle. When this relation is such as to allow the most ethereal portions of the soul essence to act independently of its grosser particles and of the brain, it can unerringly comprehend what it sees. Then only is it the pure, rational, super-sentient soul. That state is known in India as the Samadhi. It is the highest condition of spirituality possible to man on earth. Fakirs try to obtain such a condition by holding their breath for hours together during their religious exercises and call this practice Dhamsadna. The Hindu terms Pranayama, Pratyahara, and Dharana all relate to different psychological states and show how much more the Sanskrit and even the modern Hindu language are adapted to the clear elucidation of the phenomena than are encountered by those who study this branch of psychological science than the tongues of modern peoples whose experiences have not yet necessitated the invention of such descriptive terms. When the body is in the state of dharana, a total catalepsy of the physical frame, the soul of the clairvoyant may liberate itself and perceive things subjectively. And yet, as the sentient principle of the brain is alive and active, these pictures of the past, present, and future will be tinctured with the terrestrial perceptions of the objective world. The physical memory and fancy will be in the way of clear vision. But the seer adept knows how to suspend the mechanical action of the brain. His visions will be as clear as truth itself, uncolored and undistorted, whereas the clairvoyant, unable to control the vibrations of the astral waves, will perceive but more or less broken images through the medium of the brain. The seer can never take flickering shadows for realities, for his memory being as completely subjective to his will as the rest of the body, he receives impressions directly from his spirit. Between his subjective and objective selves, there are no obstructive mediums. This is the real spiritual seership, in which, according to an expression of Plato, a soul is raised above all inferior good. When we reach that which is supreme, which is simple, pure, and unchangeable, without form, color, or human qualities, the god or noose. This is the state which such seers as Plotinus and Apollonius termed the union to the deity, which the ancient yogins called Isvara, and the modern called Samadhi. But this state is as far above modern clairvoyance as the stars above glowworms. Plotinus, as is well known, was a clairvoyant seer during his whole and daily life. And yet... He had been united to his God but six times during the 66 years of his existence, as he himself confessed to Porphyry. Ammonius Saccus, the God taught, asserts that the only power which is directly opposed to soothsaying and looking into futurity is memory. And Olympiodorus calls it fantasy. The fantasy, he says in Platonus Fade, is an impediment to our intellectual conceptions. And hence, when we are agitated by the inspiring influence of the divinity, if the fantasy intervenes, the enthusiastic energy ceases, for enthusiasm and the ecstasy are contrary to each other. Should it be asked whether the soul is able to energize without the fantasy, we reply, that its perception of universals proves that it is able? It has perceptions, therefore independent of the fantasy, at the same time, however, the fantasy attends it in its energies, just as a storm pursues him who sails on the sea. A medium, moreover, needs either a foreign intelligence, whether it be spirit or living mesmerizer, to overpower his physical and mental parts, or some factitious means to induce trance. An adept, and even a simple fakir, requires but a few minutes of self-contemplation. The brazen columns of Solomon's temple, the golden bells and pomegranates of Aaron, the Jupiter Capitolinus of Augustus, hung around with harmonious bells, and the brazen bulls of the mysteries when the Korah was called, were all intended for such artificial helps. So were the brazen bulls of Solomon hung around with a double row of two hundred pomegranates, which served as clappers within the hollow columns. 
The priestesses of Dodona placed themselves under the ancient oak of Zeus, the Pelagian, not the Olympian god, and listened intently to the rustling of the sacred leaves, while others concentrated their attention on the soft murmur of the cold spring gushing from underneath its roots. But the adept has no need of any such extraneous aids. The simple exertion of his willpower is all sufficient. The Artharva Veda teaches that the exercises of such willpower is the highest form of prayer and its instantaneous response. To desire is to realize in proportion to the intensity of the aspiration, and that, in its turn, is measured by inward purity. Some of these nobler Vedantic precepts on the soul and man's mystic powers have recently been contributed to an English periodical by a Hindu scholar. The Sankhya, he writes, inculcates that the soul, i.e. astral body, has the following powers. Shrinking into a minute bulk to which everything is pervious, enlarging to a gigantic body, assuming levity, rising along a sunbeam to the solar orb possessing an unlimited reach of organs, as touching the moon with the tip of a finger, irresistible will, for instance, sinking into the earth as easily as in water, dominion over all things, animate or inanimate, the faculty of changing the course of nature, ability to accomplish every desire. Further, he gives their various appellations. The powers are called 1. Anima, 2. Mahima, 3. Lagima, four garima, five prapti, six prakamya, seven vizatva, eight istwa, or divine power, the fifth predicting future events, understanding unknown languages, curing diseases, divining unexpressed thoughts, understanding the language of the heart, the sixth is the power of converting old age into youth, the seventh is the power of mesmerizing human beings and beasts and making them obedient. It is the power of restraining passions and emotions. The eighth power is the spiritual state and presupposes the absence of the above seven powers, as in the state, the yogi is full of God. No writings, he adds, revealed or sacred, were allowed to be so authoritative and final as the teaching of the soul. Some of the rishis appear to have laid the greatest stress on this supersensuous source of knowledge. From the remotest antiquity, mankind as a whole have always been convinced of the existence of a personal spiritual entity within the personal physical man. This inner entity was more or less divine according to its proximity to the crown, crestos. The closer the union, the more serene man's destiny, the less dangerous the external conditions. This belief is neither bigotry nor superstition, only an ever-present instinctive feeling of the proximity of another spiritual and invisible world, which, though it be subjective to the senses of the outward man, is perfectly objected to the inner ego. Furthermore, they believe that there are external and internal conditions which affect the determination of our will upon our actions. They rejected fatalism, for fatalism implies a blind course of some still-blinded power. But they believed in destiny, which from birth to death every man is weaving thread by thread around himself, as a spider does his cobweb. And this destiny is guided either by that presence, termed by some the guardian angel, or our more intimate astral inner man, who is but too often the evil genius of the man of flesh. Both these lead on the outward man, but one of them must prevail. Then from the very beginning of the invisible affray, the stern and implacable law of compensation steps in and takes its course, following faithfully the fluctuations. When the last strand is woven, and man is seemingly enwrapped in the network of his own doing, and he finds himself completely under the empire of this self-made destiny, it then either fixes him like an inert shell against the immovable rock, or like a feather carries him away in a whirlwind raised by his own actions. The greatest philosophers of antiquity found it neither unreasonable nor strange that souls should come to souls and impart to them conceptions of future things, occasionally by letters or by a mere touch, or by a glance reveal to them past events or announce future ones, as Ammonius tells us. Moreover, Lamprias and others held that the unembodied spirits or souls could descend on earth and become guardians of mortal men. 
We should not seek to deprive those souls which are still in the body of that power by which the former know future events and are able to announce them. It is not probable, adds Lamprius, that the soul gains a new power of prophecy after separation from the body, and which before it did not possess. We may rather conclude that it possessed all these powers during its union with the body, although in a lesser perfection. For as the sun does not shine only when it passes from among the clouds, but has always been radiant and has only appeared dim and obscured by vapors, the soul does not only receive the power of looking into futurity when it passes from the body as from a cloud, but has possessed it always, though dimmed by connection with the earthly. A familiar example of one phase of the power of the soul or astral body to manifest itself is the phenomena of the so-called spirit hand. In the presence of certain mediums, these seemingly detached members will gradually develop from a luminous nebula, pick up a pencil, write messages, and then dissolve before the eyes of the witnesses. Many such cases are recorded by perfectly competent and trustworthy persons. These phenomena are real and require serious consideration. But false phantom hands have sometimes been taken for the genuine. At Dresden, we once saw a hand and arm made for the purpose of deception. With an ingenious arrangement of springs that would cause the machine to imitate to perfection the movements of the natural member, while exteriorly it would require close inspection to detect its artificial character. In using this, the dishonest medium slips his natural arm out of his sleeve and replaces it with the mechanical substitute. Both hands may then be made to seem resting upon the table while in fact one is touching the sitters, showing itself, knocking the furniture, and making other phenomena. The mediums for real manifestations are least able, as a rule, to comprehend or explain them. Among those who have written most intelligently upon the subject of these luminous hands may be reckoned Dr. Francis Jerry Fairfield, author of Ten Years Among the Mediums, an article from whose pen appears in the library table for July 19, 1877. A medium himself, he is yet a strong opponent of the spiritualistic theory. Discussing the subject of the phantom hand, he testifies that this the writer has personally witnessed under conditions of test provided by himself in his own room, in full daylight, with the medium seated upon a sofa from six to eight feet from the table, hovering upon which the apparition, the hand, appeared. The application of the poles of a horseshoe magnet to the hand caused it to waver perceptibly, and threw the medium into violent convulsions, pretty positive evidence that the force concerned in the phenomena was generated in his own nervous system. Dr. Fairfield's deduction that the fluttering phantom hand is an emanation from the medium is logical, and it is correct. The test of the horseshoe magnet proves in a scientific way what every Kabbalist would affirm upon the authority of experience, no less than philosophy. The force concerned in the phenomena is the will of the medium exercised unconsciously to the outer man, which for the time is semi-paralyzed and cataleptic the phantom hand, and extrusion of the man's inner or astral member. This is that real self whose limbs the surgeon cannot amputate, but remain behind after the outer casing is cut off, and all theories of exposed or compressed nerve termini to the contrary notwithstanding, have all the sensations the physical parts formerly experienced. This is that spiritual astral body which is raised in incorruption. It is useless to argue that these are spirit hands, for admitting even that at every seance human spirits of many kinds are attracted to the medium, and that they do guide and produce some manifestations, yet to make hands or faces objective, they are compelled to use either the astral limbs of the medium, or the materials furnished them by the elementals, or yet the combined oral emanations of all persons present pure spirits will not and cannot show themselves objectively. Those that do are not pure spirits, but elementary and impure. Woe to the medium who falls a prey to such. The same principle involved in the unconscious extrusion of a phantom limb by the cataleptic medium applies to the projection of his entire double or astral body. This may be withdrawn by the will of the medium's own inner self, 
without his retaining in his physical brain any recollection of such an intent. That is one phase of man's dual capacity. It may also be affected by elementary and elemental spirits, to whom he may stand in the relation of mesmeric subject. Dr. Fairfield is right in one position taken in his book, viz. Mediums are usually deceased, and in many, if not most cases, the children are near connections of mediums. But he is wholly wrong in attributing all psychical phenomena to morbid physiological conditions. The adepts of Eastern magic are uniformly in perfect mental and bodily health. And in fact, the voluntary and independent production of phenomena is impossible to any others. We have known many, and never a sick man among them. The adept retains perfect consciousness, shows no change of bodily temperature or other sign of morbidity, requires no conditions, but will do his feats anywhere and everywhere. And instead of being passive and in subjection to a foreign influence, rules the forces with iron will. But we have elsewhere shown that the medium and the adept are as opposed as the poles. We will only add here that the body, soul, and spirit of the adept are all conscious and working in harmony, and the body of the medium is an inert clod. And even his soul may be away in a dream while its habitation is occupied by another. An adept can not only project and make visible a hand, a foot, or any other portion of his body, but the whole of it. We have seen one do this in full day, while his hands and feet were being held by a skeptical friend whom he wished to surprise. Little by little the whole astral body oozed out like a vapory cloud until before us stood two forms, one of which the second was an exact duplicate of the first, only slightly more shadowy. The medium not need exercise any willpower. It suffices that she or he shall know what is expected by the investigators. The medium's spiritual entity, when not obsessed by other spirits, will act outside the will or consciousness of the physical being as surely as it acts when within the body during a fit of sonambulism. Its perceptions, external and internal, will be acuter and far more developed, precisely as they are in the sleepwalker. And this is why the materialized form sometimes knows more than the medium, for the intellectual perception of the astral entity is proportionately as much higher than the corporeal intelligence of the medium in its normal state as the spirit entity is finer than itself. Generally, the medium will be found cold, the pulse will have visibly changed, and the state of nervous prostration succeeds the phenomena, bunglingly and without discrimination attributed to disembodied spirits. Whereas, but one third of them may be produced by the latter, another third by elementals, and the rest by the astral double of the medium himself. But while it is our firm belief that most of the physical manifestations, i.e. those which neither need nor show intelligence nor great discrimination, are produced mechanically by the sinleka, double, of the medium, as a person in sound sleep will when apparently awake do things of which he will retain no remembrance, the purely subjective phenomena are but in a very small proportion of cases due to the action of the personal astral body. They are mostly, and according to the moral, intellectual, and physical purity of the medium, the work of either the elementary or sometimes very pure human spirits. Elementals have not to do with subjective manifestations. In rare cases, it is the divine spirit of the medium himself that guides and produces them. As Babu Piri Chand Mitra says in a letter to the president of the National Association of Spiritualists, Mr. Alexander Calder, A spirit is an essence or power, and has no form. The very idea of form implies materialism. The spirits, astral souls we should say, can assume forms for a time, but form is not their permanent state. The more material is our soul, the more material is our conception of spirits. Epimenides, the Orphikos, was renowned for his sacred and marvelous nature and for the faculty his soul possessed of quitting its body, as long as often as it pleased. The ancient philosophers who have testified to this ability may be reckoned by dozens. Apollonius left his body at a moment's notice, but it must be remembered Apollonius was an adept, a magician. Had he been simply a medium, he could not have performed such feats at will. 
Empedocles of Agrigentum, the Pythagorean thaumaturgist, required no conditions to arrest a water spout which had broken over the city. Neither did he need any to recall a woman to life, as he did. Apollonius used no darkened room in which to perform his ethrobatic feats. Vanishing suddenly in the air before the eyes of Domitian and a whole crowd of witnesses, many thousands, he appeared an hour after in the grotto of Petulia. But investigation would have shown that his physical body, having become invisible by the concentration of a casa about it, he could walk off unperceived to some secure retreat in the neighborhood, and an hour after his astral form appeared at Petuli to his friends and seemed like to be the man himself. No more did Simon Magus wait to be entranced to fly off in the air before the apostles and crowds of witnesses. It requires no conjuration and ceremonies. Circle-making and incensing are mere nonsense and juggling, says Paracelsus. The human spirit is so great a thing that no man can express it. As God himself is eternal and unchangeable, so also is the mind of man. If we rightly understood its powers, nothing would be impossible to us on earth. The imagination is strengthened and developed through faith in our will. Faith must confirm the imagination, for faith establishes the will. A singular account of the personal interview of an English ambassador in 1783 with the reincarnated Buddha, barely mentioned in Volume 1, an infant of 18 months old at the time, is given in the Asiatic Journal from the narrative of an eyewitness himself, Mr. Turner, the author of The Embassy to Tibet. The cautious phraseology of a skeptic, dreading public ridicule, ill conceals the amazement of the witness, who at the same time desires to give facts as truthfully as possible. The infant Lama received the ambassador and his suite with a dignity and decorum so natural and unconstrained that they remained in a perfect maze of wonder. The behavior of this infant, says the author, was that of an old philosopher. Grave and sedate and exceedingly courteous. He contrived to make the young pontiff understand the inconsolable grief into which the governor general of Galagata, Calcutta, the city of palaces, and the people of India were plunged when he died, and the general rapture when they found that he had resurrected in a young and fresh body again, at which compliment the young lama regarded him and his suite with looks of singular complacency and courteously treated them to a confectionery from a golden cup. The ambassador continued to express the governor-general's hope that the lama might long continue to illumine the world with his presence, and that the friendship which had heretofore subsisted between them might be yet more strongly cemented, for the benefit and advantage of the intelligent votaries of the lama, all which made the little creature look steadfastly at the speaker, and graciously bow and nod, and bow and nod, as if he understood and approved of every word that was uttered. As if he understood. If the infant behaved in the most natural and dignified way during the reception, and when their cups were empty of tea, became uneasy and throwing back his head and contracting the skin of his brow, continued making a noise till they were filled again, why could he not understand as well as what was said to him? Years ago, a small party of travelers were painfully journeying from Kashmir to Leh, the city of Ladakh, central Tibet. Among our guides, we had a Tartar, shaman, a very mysterious personage, who spoke Russian, a little English, and not at all, and yet who managed, nevertheless, to converse with us, and proved of great service. Having learned that some of our party were Russians, he had imagined that our protection was all-powerful, and might enable him to safely find his way back to his Siberian home from which, for reasons unknown, some twenty years before, he had fled, as he told us, via Kiachka and the great Gobi Desert, to the land of the Chagars. With such an interested object in view, we believed ourselves safe under his guard. To explain the situation briefly, our companions had formed the unwise plan of penetrating into Tibet under various disguises, None of them speaking the language, although one, a Mr. K, had picked up some cousin Tartar and thought he did. As we mention this only incidentally, 
We may as well say at once that two of them, the brothers N, were very politely brought back to the frontier before they had walked 16 miles into the weird land of eastern Baud, and Mr. K, an ex-Lutheran minister, could not even attempt to leave his miserable village near Ley, as from the first days he found himself prostrated with fever and had to return to Lahore via Kashmir. But one sight seen by him was as good as if he had witnessed the reincarnation of Buddha itself. Having heard of this miracle from some old Russian missionary, in whom he thought he could have more faith than in Abbey Huck, it had been for years his desire to expose the great heathen jugglery. As he expressed it, K was a positivist and rather prided himself on this anti-philosophical neologism. But his positivism was doomed to receive a death blow. About four days' journey from Islamabad, at an insignificant mud village, whose only redeeming feature was its magnificent lake, we stopped for a few days' rest. Our companions had temporarily separated from us, and the village was to be our place of meeting. It was there that we were apprised by our shaman that a large party of Lamaic saints, on pilgrimage to various shrines, had taken up their abode in an old cave temple and established a temporary vihara therein. He added that, as the three honorable ones were said to travel along with them, the holy bhikshu monks were capable of producing the greatest miracles. Mr. K, fired with the prospect of exposing this humbug of the ages, proceeded at once to pay them a visit, and from that moment the most friendly relations were established between the two camps. The Vihar was in a secluded and most romantic spot secured against all intrusion. Despite the effusive attentions, presence, and protestations of Mr. K, the chief, who was a Pasi Buru, an aesthetic of great sanctity, declined to exhibit the phenomena of the incarnation until a certain talisman in possession of the writer was exhibited. Upon seeing this, however, preparations were at once made, and an infant of three or four months was procured from its mother, a poor woman of the neighborhood. An oath was first of all exacted of Mr. K, that he would not divulge what he might see or hear for the space of seven years. The talisman is a simple agate or carnelian known among the Tibetans and others as Ayu, a naturally possessed, or had been endowed with very mysterious properties. It has a triangle engraved upon it, with which are contained a few mystical words. Several days passed before everything was ready, nothing of a mysterious character occurring, meanwhile, except that At the bidding of a bhikshu, ghastly faces were made to peep at us out of the glassy bosom of the lake. As we sat at the door of the vihar upon its bank, one of these was the countenance of Mr. K's sister, whom he had left well and happy at home, but who, as we subsequently learned, had died some time before he had set out on the present journey. The sight affected him at first, but he called his skepticism to his aid and quieted himself with theories of cloud shadows and reflections of tree branches, etc., such as people of his kind fall back upon. On the appointed afternoon, the baby being brought to the Vihara was left in the vestibule or reception room, as Kay could go no further into the temporary sanctuary. The child was then placed on a bit of carpet in the middle of the floor and every one not belonging to the party being sent away, two mendicants were placed at the entrance to keep out intruders. Then all the lamas seated themselves on the floor, with the backs against the granite walls, so that each was separated from the child by a space at least of ten feet. The chief, having had a square piece of leather spread for him by the deservant, seated himself at the farthest corner. Alone, Mr. K placed himself close by the infant and watched every movement with intense interest. The only condition exacted of us was that we should preserve a strict silence and patiently await further developments. A bright sunlight streamed through the open door. Gradually, the superior fell into what seemed a state of profound meditation, while the others, after a sotto voce, short invocation, became suddenly silent, and looked as if they had been completely petrified. It was oppressively still, and the crowing of the child was the only sound to be heard. After we had sat there a few moments, the movements of the infant's limbs suddenly ceased, 
and his body appeared to become rigid. Kay watched intently every motion, and both of us, by a rapid glance, became satisfied that all present were sitting motionless. The superior, with his gaze fixed upon the ground, did not even look at the infant. But pale and motionless, he seemed rather like a bronze statue of a talipoint in meditation than a living being. Suddenly, to our great consternation, we saw the child, not raise itself, but, as it were, violently jerked into a sitting posture, a few more jerks, and then, like an automaton, set in motion by concealed wires. The four-month baby stood upon his feet. Fancy our consternation, and in Mr. K.'s case, horror. Not a hand had been outstretched, not a motion made, nor a word spoken. And yet, here was a baby in arms, standing erect and firm as a man. The rest of the story we will quote from a copy of notes written on this subject by Mr. K. The same evening, and given to us in case it should not reach its place of destination, or the writer failed to see anything more. After a minute or two of hesitation, writes K, the baby turned his head and looked at me with an expression of intelligence that was simply awful. It sent a chill through me. I pinched my hands and bit my lips till blood almost came to make sure that I did not dream. But that was only the beginning. The miraculous creature, making, as I fancied, two steps towards me, resumed his sitting posture, and without removing his eyes from mine, repeated, sentence by sentence, in what I supposed to be Tibetan language, the very words which I had been told in advance are commonly spoken at the incarnations of Buddha, beginning with, I am Buddha, I am the old Lama, I am his spirit in a new body, etc., I felt a real terror. My hair rose upon my head and my blood ran cold. For my life I could not have spoken a word. There was no trickery here, no ventriloquism. The infant lips moved and the eyes seemed to search my very soul with an expression that made me think it was the face of the superior himself. His eyes, his very look that I was gazing upon. It was as if his spirit had entered the little body and was looking at me through the transparent mask of the baby's face. I felt my brain growing dizzy. The infant reached toward me and laid his little hand upon mine. I started as if it had been touched by a hot coal, and, unable to bear the scene any longer, covered my face with my hands. It was but for an instant, but when I removed them, the little actor had become a crowing baby again, and a moment after, lying upon his back, set up a fretful cry. The superior had resumed his normal condition, and conversation ensued. It was only after a series of similar experiments, extending over ten days, that I realized the fact that I had seen the incredible, astounding phenomenon, described by certain travelers, but always by me denounced as an imposture. Among a multitude of questions unanswered, despite my cross-examination, the superior let drop one piece of information which must be regarded as highly significant. What would have happened, I inquired, through the shaman, if while the infant was speaking in a moment of insane fright at the thought of its being the devil, I had killed it? He replied that if the blow had not been instantly fatal, the child alone would have been killed. But I continued, suppose that it had been as swift as a lightning flash. In such case was the answer, you would have killed me also. In Japan and Siam, there are two orders of priests, of which one are public and deal with the people, and the other strictly private. The latter are never seen. Their existence is known but to very few natives, never to foreigners. Their powers are never displayed in public, nor ever at all except on rare occasions of the utmost importance, at which times the ceremonies are performed in subterranean or otherwise inaccessible temples. And in the presence of a chosen few whose heads answer for their secrecy. Among such occasions are deaths in the royal family, or those of high dignitaries affiliated with the order. One of the most weird and impressive exhibitions of the power of these magicians is that of the withdrawal of the astral soul from the cremated remains of human beings. A ceremony practiced likewise in some of the most important lamasseries of Tibet and Mongolia. In Siam, Japan, and Great Tartary, 
It is the custom to make medallions, statuettes, and idols out of the ashes of cremated persons. They are mixed with water into a paste, and after being molded into the desired shape, are baked and then gilded. The Lamissary of Utai, in the province of Chansi, Mongolia, is the most famous for that work, and rich persons send the bones of their defunct relatives to be ground and fashioned there. When the adept in magic proposes to facilitate the withdrawal of the astral soul of the deceased, which otherwise they think might remain stupefied for an indefinite period within the ashes, the following process is resorted to. The sacred dust is placed in a heap upon a metallic plate, strongly magnetized to the size of a man's body. The adept then slowly and gently fans it with the talipat, nang, a fan of peculiar shape and inscribed with certain signs, muttering at the same time a form of invocation. The ashes soon become, as it were, imbued with life, and gently spread themselves out into a thin layer which assumes the outline of the body before cremation. Then there gradually arises a sort of whitish vapor, which after a time forms into an erect column and compacting itself, is finally transformed into the double, or ethereal, astral counterpart of the dead, which in its turn dissolves away into thin air and disappears from mortal sight. The magicians of Kashmir, Tibet, Mongolia, and Great Tartary are too well known to need comments. If jugglers they be, we invite the most expert jugglers of Europe and America to match them if they can. If our scientists are unable to imitate the mummy embalming of the Egyptians, how much greater would be their surprise to see, as we have, dead bodies preserved by alchemical art, so that after the lapse of centuries, they seem as though the individuals were but sleeping. Their complexions were as fresh, the skin as elastic, the eyes as natural and sparkling as though they were in full flesh of health. And the wheels of life had been stopped but the instant before. The bodies of certain very eminent personages are laid upon catafalques in rich mausoleums, sometimes overlaid with gilding and even plates of real gold. Their favorite arms, trinkets, and articles of daily use gathered about them, and a suit of attendants, blooming young boys and girls, but still corpses, preserved like their masters, stand as if ready to serve when called. In the convent of Great Kurin, and in one situated upon the holy mountain, Botala, there are said to be several such sepulchres, which have been respected by all the conquering hordes that have swept through those countries. Abbey Hawk heard that such exist, but did not see one, strangers of all kinds being excluded, and missionaries and European travelers not furnished with the requisite protection, being the last of all persons who would be permitted to approach the sacred places. Huck's statement that the tombs of Tartar sovereigns are surrounded with children, who were compelled to swallow mercury until they were suffocated, by which means the color and freshness of the victims is preserved so well that they appear alive, is one of these idle missionary fables which impose only upon the most ignorant who accept on hearsay. Buddhists have never immolated victims, whether human or animal. It is utterly against the principles of their religion, and no Lamaist was ever accused of it. When a rich man desired to be interred in company, messengers were sent throughout the country with the Lama embalmers, and children just dead in the natural way were selected for the purpose. Poor parents were but too glad to preserve their departed children in this poetic way, instead of abandoning them to the decay and wild beasts. At the time when Abbey Huck was living in Paris, after his return from Tibet, he related, among other unpublished wonders, to a Mr. Arsenif, a Russian gentleman, the following curious fact that he had witnessed during his long sojourn at the Lamissary of Konboom. One day, while conversing with one of the Lamas, the latter suddenly stopped speaking and assumed the attentive attitude of one who is listening to a message being delivered to him, although he, Huck, heard never a word. Then I must go, suddenly broke forth the Lama, as if response to the message. Go where, inquired the astonished Lama of Jehovah, Huck. And with whom are you talking? To the Lamasary of, was the quiet answer. The Chabaron wants me, it was he who summoned me. Now this Lamasary was many days' journey from that of Konbun, 
in which the conversation was taking place. But what seemed to astonish Huck the most was that instead of setting off on his journey, the Lama simply walked to a sort of cupola room on the roof of the house in which they lived. And another Lama, after exchanging a few words, followed them to a terrace by means of the ladder, and passing between them, locked and barred his companion in. Then turning to Huck, after a few seconds of meditation, he smiled and informed the guest that he had gone. But how could he? Why have you locked him in? And the room has no issue, insisted the missionary. And what good would a door be to him, answered the custodian. It is he himself who went away. His body is not needed, and so he left it in my charge. Notwithstanding the wonders which Huck had witnessed during his perilous journey, his opinion was that both of the Lamas had mystified him. But three days later, not having seen his habitual friend and entertainer, he inquired after him and was informed that he would be back in the evening. At sunset, and just as the other Lamas were preparing to retire, Huck heard his absent friend's voice calling as if from the clouds to his companion to open the door for him. Looking upward, he perceived the traveler's outline behind the lattice of the room where he had been locked in. When he descended, he went straight to the Grand Lama of Konboom and delivered to him certain messages and orders from the place which he pretended he had just left. Huck could get no more information from him as to his aerial voyage. But he always thought, he said, that this farce had something to do with the immediate and extraordinary preparations for the polite expulsion of both the missionaries, himself and the father Gabe, to Chorgortan, a place belonging to the Kumbum. The suspicion of the daring missionary may have been correct in view of his impudent inquisitiveness and indiscretion. If the abbey had been versed in Eastern philosophy, he would have found no great difficulty in comprehending both the flight of the lama's astral body to the distant lamasary, while his physical frame remained behind, or the carrying on of a conversation with the chaperon that was inaudible to himself. The recent experiments with the telephone in America, to which allusion was made in Chapter 5 of our first volume, but which we have been greatly perfected since those pages went to press, proved that the human voice and the sounds of instrumental music may be conveyed along a telegraphic wire to a great distance. The hermetic philosophers taught, as we have seen, that the disappearance from sight of a flame does not imply its actual extinction. It is only passed from the visible to the invisible world, and may be perceived by the inner sense of vision, which is adapted to the things that the other and more real universe. The same rule applies to sound, as the physical ear discerns the vibrations of the atmosphere up to a certain point, not yet definitely fixed, but varying with the individual. So the adept, whose interior hearing has been developed, can take the sound at this vanishing point and hear its vibrations in the astral light indefinitely. He needs no wires, helices, or sounding boards. His willpower is all sufficient. Hearing with the spirit... Time and distance offer no impediments, and so we may converse with another adept at the Antipodes with as great ease as though they were in the same room. Fortunately, we can produce numerous witnesses to corroborate our statement, who, without being adepts at all, have nevertheless heard the sound of aerial music and of the human voice, whether neither instrument nor speaker were within thousands of miles of the place where we sat. In their case, they actually heard interiorly, though they had supposed their physical organs of hearing alone were employed. The adept had, by a simple effort of willpower, given them for the brief moment the same perception of the spirit of sound as he himself constantly enjoys. If our men of science could only be induced to test instead of deriding the ancient philosophy of the Trinity of all the natural forces, they would go by leaps toward the dazzling truth instead of creeping snail-like as at present. Professor Tyndall's experiments off the South Foreland at Dover in 1875 fairly upset all previous theories of the transmission of sound, and those he has made with sensitive flames bring him to the very threshold of arcane science. One step further, as he would comprehend how adepts can converse at great distances. But that step will not be taken. Of his sensitive, in truth magical flame, he says, 
The slightest tap on a distant anvil causes it to fall to seven inches. When a bunch of keys is shaken, the flame is violently agitated and emits a loud roar. The dropping of a sixpence into a hand already containing a coin knocks the flame down. The creaking of boots sets it in violent commotion. The crumpling or tearing of a bit of paper or a rustle of a silk dress does the same. Responsive to every tick of a watch held near it, it falls and explodes. The winding up of a watch produces tumult. From a distance of thirty yards we may chirrup to this flame and cause it to fall and roar. Repeating a passage from the Fairy Queen, the flame sits and selects the manifold sounds of my voice, noticing some by a slight nod, others by a deeper bow, while to others it responds by violent agitation. Such are the wonders of modern physical science, but at what cost of apparatus and carbonic acid and coal gas, of American and Canadian whistles, trumpets, gongs, and bells? The poor heathen have none such impedimenta but will, European science believe it, nevertheless, produce the very same phenomena. Upon one occasion, when, in a case of exceptional importance, an oracle was required, we saw the possibility of what we had previously vehemently denied. Namely, a simple mendicant cause a sensitive flame to give responsive flashes without a particle of apparatus. A fire was kindled of branches of the beel tree, and some sacrificial herbs were sprinkled upon it, the mendicant sat nearby, motionless, absorbed in contemplation. During the intervals between the questions, the fire burned low and seemed ready to go out. But when the interrogatories were propounded, the flames leaped, roaring skyward, flickered, bowed, and sent fiery tongues flaring toward the east, west, north, or south, each motion having its distinct meaning in a code of signals well understood. Between whiles it would sink to the ground, and the tongues of flame would lick the sod in every direction, and suddenly disappear, leaving only a bed of glowing embers. When the interview with the flame spirits was at an end, the bhikshu, mendicant, turned toward the jungle where he abode, keeping up a wailing, monotonous chant, to the rhythm of which the sensitive flame kept time, not merely like Professor Tyndall's when he read The Fairy Queen by simple motions, but by a marvellous modulation of hissing and roaring until he was out of sight. Then, as if its very life were extinguished, it vanished, and left a bed of ashes before the astonished spectators. Both in western and eastern Tibet, as in every other place where Buddhism predominates, there are two distinct religions, the same as it is in Brahmanism, the secret philosophy and the popular religion. The former is that of the followers of the doctrine of the sect of the Sutrantika. They closely adhere to the spirit of Buddha's original teachings, which show the necessity of intuitional perception, and all deductions therefrom. These do not proclaim their views, nor allow them to be made public. All compounds are perishable, were the last words uttered by the lips of the dying Gautama, when preparing under the Sal tree to enter into Nirvana. Spirit is the soul, elementary, and primordial unity, and each of its rays is immortal, infinite, and indestructible. Beware of the illusions of matter. Buddhism was spread far and wide over Asia, and even farther, by Dharm Asoka. He was the grandson of the miracle worker Chandragupta, the illustrious king who rescued the Punjab from the Macedonians, if they ever were at Punjab at all, and received Megasenes at his court at Pataputra. Dharma Asoka was the greatest king of the Maurya dynasty. From a reckless profligate and atheist, he became Pridasi, the beloved of the gods, and never was the purity of this philanthropic view surpassed by any earthly ruler. His memory has lived for ages in the hearts of Buddhists, and has been perpetuated in the human edicts engraved in several popular dialects on the columns and rocks of Allahabad. Delhi, Guzarat, Peshawar, Orissa, and other places. His famous grandfather had united all India under his powerful scepter. When the Nagas, or serpent worshippers of Kashmir, had been converted through the efforts of the apostles sent out by the Shvaviras of the Third Councils, the religion of Gautama spread like wildfire. Gandhara, 
Kabul, and even many of the satrapies of Alexander the Great accepted the new philosophy. The Buddhism of Nepal being the one which may be said to have diverged less than any other from the primeval ancient faith. The Lamaism of Tartary, Mongolia, and Tibet, which is a direct offshoot of this country, may be thus shown to be the purest Buddhism. For we say it again, Lamaism, properly, is but an external form of rites. The Upasakas and Upasakis, or male and female semi-monastics and semi-laymen, have equally with the Lama monks themselves to strictly abstain from violating any of Buddha's rules and must study Mipo and every psychological phenomena as such. Those who become guilty of any of the five sins lose all right to congregate with the pious community. The most important of these is not to curse upon any consideration for the curse returns upon the one that utters it, and often upon his innocent relatives who breathe the same atmosphere with him. To love each other, and even our bitterest enemies, to offer our lives even for animals, to the extent of abstaining from defensive arms, to gain the greatest of victories by conquering oneself, to avoid all vices, to practice all virtues, especially humility and mildness to be obedient to superiors, to cherish and respect parents, old age and learning, virtuous and holy men, to provide food, shelter and comfort for men and animals, to plant trees on the roads and dig wells for the comfort of travelers. Such are the moral duties of Buddhists. Every Ani or Bhikshuni, none, is subjected to these laws. Numerous are the Buddhists and the Lamaic saints who have been renowned for the unsurpassed sanctity of their lives and their miracles. So Tissu, the emperor's spiritual teacher, who consecrated Kublai Khan, the Nadir Shah, was known far and wide as much for the extreme holiness of his life as for the many wonders he wrought. But he did not stop at fruitless miracles, but did better than that. Tissu purified completely his religion, and from one single province of southern Mongolia is said to have forced Kubla to expel from convents 500,000 monkish impostors, who made a pretext of their profession to live in vice and idleness. Then the Lamaists had their great reformer, the Chaberon Son Capo who was claimed to have been immaculately conceived by his mother, a virgin from Koko Nor, 14th century, who was another wonder worker. The sacred tree of Kun Boom, the tree of the 10,000 images, which in consequence of the degeneration of the true faith has ceased budding for several centuries, now shot forth new sprouts and bloomed more vigorously than ever from the hair of this avatar of Buddha, says the legend. The same tradition makes him Sun Kapo ascend to heaven in 1419. Contrary to the prevailing idea, few of these saints are Kublai Khan's or Chaberon's reincarnations. Many of the lamasaries contain schools of magic, but the most celebrated is the collegiate monastery of the Shu Tuk, where there are over 30,000 monks attached to it, the lamasary forming quite a little city. Some of the female nuns possess marvelous psychological powers. We have met some of these women on their way from Lhasa to Kandy, the Rome of Buddhism, with its miraculous shrines and Gautama's relics. To avoid encounters with Muslims and other sects, they travel by night alone, unarmed and without the least fear of wild animals, for these will not touch them. At the first glimpses of dawn, they take refuge in caves and viharas, prepared for them by their co-religionists at calculated distances. For notwithstanding the fact that Buddhism has taken refuge in Ceylon, and nominally there are but few of the denomination in British India, yet the secret boyads, brotherhoods, and Buddhist viharas are numerous, and every Jain feels himself obliged to help, indiscriminately, Buddhist or Lamaist. Ever on the lookout for occult phenomena, hungering after sights, one of the most interesting that we have seen was produced by one of these poor traveling bhikshu. It was years ago, and at a time when all such manifestations were new to the writer. We were taken to visit the pilgrims by a Buddhist friend, a mystical gentleman born at Kashmir, of Kachi parents, but a Buddhist lamaist by conversion, and who generally resides at Lhasa. 
Why carry about this bunch of dead plants? inquired one of the Bukshuni, an emaciated, tall and elderly woman, pointing to a large nosegay of beautiful, fresh and fragrant flowers in the writer's hands. Dead, we asked inquiringly. Why, they had just been gathered in the garden. And yet they are dead, she gravely answered. To be born in this world, is this not death? See how these herbs look when alive in the world of eternal light, in the gardens of our blessed foe? Without moving from the place where she was, sitting on the ground, the Ani took a flower from the bunch, laid it on her lap, and began to draw it together, by large handfuls, as it were, invisible material from the surrounding atmosphere. Presently a very, very faint nodule of vapor was seen, and this slowly took shape and color until poised in midair appeared a copy of the bloom we had given her. Faithful to the last tint and to the last petal it was, and lying on its side like the original, but a thousandfold more gorgeous in hue and exquisite in beauty, as the glorified human spirit is more beauteous than its physical capsule. Flower after flower to the minutest herb was thus reproduced and made to vanish, reappearing at our desire, nay, at our simple thought. Having selected a full-blown rose, we held it at arm's length, and in a few minutes our arm, hand, and the flower, perfect in every detail, appeared reflected in the vacant space, about two yards from where we sat. But while the flower seemed immeasurably beautified, and as ethereal as the other spirit flowers, the arm and hand appeared like a mere reflection in a looking-glass, even to a large spot on the forearm, left on it by a piece of damp earth which had stuck to one of the roots. Later we learned the reason why. A great truth was uttered some fifty years ago by Dr. Francis Victor Brousset, when he said, If magnetism were true, medicine would be an absurdity. Magnetism is true. And so we shall not contradict the learned Frenchman as to the rest. Magnetism, as we have shown, is the alphabet of magic. It is idle for anyone to attempt to understand either the theory or the practice of the latter until the fundamental principle of magnetic attractions and repulsions throughout nature is recognized. Many so-called popular superstitions are but evidences of an instinctive perception of this law. An untutored people are taught by the experience of many generations that certain phenomena occur under fixed conditions. They give these conditions and obtain the expected results. Ignorant of the laws, they explain the fact by supernaturalism, for experience has been their sole teacher. In India, as well as in Russia and some other countries, there is an instinctive repugnance to stepping across a man's shadow, especially if he have red hair. And in the former country, natives are extremely reluctant to shake hands with persons of another race. These are not idle fancies. Every person emits a magnetic exhalation or aura. And a man may be in perfect physical health, but at the same time his exhalation may have a more biffic character for others, sensitive to such subtle influences. Dr. Esdale and other mesmerists long since taught us that Oriental people, especially Hindus, are more susceptible than the white-skinned races. Baron Reichenbach's experiments, and in fact the world's entire experience, prove that these magnetic exhalations are most intense from the extremities. Therapeutic manipulations show this. Handshaking is, therefore, most calculated to communicate antipathetic magnetic conditions. And the Hindus do wisely in keeping their ancient superstition, derived from Manu, constantly in mind. The magnetism of a red-haired man, we have found, in almost every nation, is instinctively dreaded. We might quote proverbs from the Russian, Persian, Georgian, Hindustani, French, Turkish, and even German, to show that treachery and other vices are popularly supposed to accompany the rufous complexion. When a man stands exposed to the sun, the magnetism of that luminary causes his emanations to be projected toward the shadow and the increased molecular action develops more electricity. Hence, an individual to whom he is antipathetic, though neither might be sensible of the fact, would act prudently in not passing through the shadow. Careful physicians wash their hands upon leaving each patient. Why, then, should they not be charged with superstition as well as the Hindus? The sporules of disease are invisible, but no less real, as European experience demonstrates.
While Oriental experience for a hundred centuries has shown that the germs of moral contagion linger about localities, and impure magnetism can be communicated by the touch. Another prevalent belief in some parts of Russia, particularly Georgia, Caucasus, and in India, is that in case the body of a drowned person cannot be otherwise found, if a garment of his be thrown into the water, it will float until directly over the spot and then sink. We have even seen the experiment successfully tried with the sacred cord of a Brahmin. It floated hither and thither, circling about as though in search of something, until suddenly darting in a straight line for about 50 yards. It sank, and at that exact spot the divers brought up the body. We find this superstition even in America. A Pittsburgh paper of very recent date describes the finding of the body of a young boy named Reed in the Monongahela by a like method. All other means having failed, it says. A curious superstition was employed. One of the boy's shirts was thrown into the river where he had gone down, and it, is said, floated on the surface for a time and finally settled to the bottom at a certain place which proved to be the resting place of the body, and which was then drawn out. The belief that the shirt of a drowned person, when thrown into the water, will follow the body is well spread, absurd as it appears. This phenomena is explained by the law of the powerful attraction existing between the human body and objects that have been long worn upon it. The oldest garment is most effective for the experiment. A new one is useless. From time immemorial in Russia, in the month of May on Trinity Day, maidens from city and village have been in the habit of casting upon the river wreaths of green leaves, which each girl has to form herself, and consulting their oracles. If the wreath sinks, it is a sign that the girl will die unmarried within a short time. If it floats, she will be married the time depending upon the number of verses she can repeat during the experiment. We positively affirm that we have personal knowledge of several cases. Two of them are intimate friends, where the augury of death proved true, and the girls died within twelve months. Tried on any other day than Trinity, the result would doubtless be the same. The sinking of the wreath is attributable to its being impregnated with the unhealthy magnetism of a system which contains the germs of early death, such magnetisms having an attraction for the earth at the bottom of the stream. As for the rest, we are willing to abandon it to the friends of coincidence. The same general remark as to superstition having a scientific basis applies to the phenomena produced by fakirs and jugglers which skeptics heap into the common category of trickery. And yet, to a close observer, even to the uninitiated, an enormous difference is presented between the kamiya, phenomena, of a fakir, and the batbazi, juggler, of a trickster, and the necromancy of a jadugar, or sahir, so dreaded and despised by the natives. This difference, imperceptible, nay, incomprehensible to the skeptical European, is instinctively appreciated by every Hindu, whether of high or low caste, educated or ignorant. The Kangalan, or witch, who uses her terrible abichar, mesmeric powers, with intent to injure, may expect death at any moment, for every Hindu finds it lawful to kill her. A bakabaz, or juggler, serves to amuse. A serpent charmer, with his Baini, full of venomous snakes, is less dreaded, for his powers of fascination extend but to animals and reptiles. He is unable to charm human beings, to perform that which is called by the natives mantar puka, to throw spells on men by magic. But with the yogi, the sannyasi, the holy men who acquire enormous psychological powers by mental and physical training, the question is totally different. Some of these men are regarded by the Hindus as demigods. Europeans cannot judge of these powers, but in rare and exceptional cases. The British resident who is encountered in the Maidans and public places where he regards as frightful and loathsome human beings, sitting motionless in the self-inflicted torture of the Urdwa Bahu, with arms raised above the head for months and even years, need not suppose they are the wonder-working fakirs. The phenomena of the latter are visible only through the friendly protection of a Brahmin, 
or under peculiarly fortuitous circumstances. Such men are little accessible as the real notch girls, of whom every traveler talks, but very few have actually seen, since they belong exclusively to the pagodas. It is surpassingly strange that, with the thousands of travelers and the millions of European residents who have been in India, and have traversed it in every direction, so little is yet known of that country and the lands which surround it. It may be that some readers will feel inclined not merely to doubt the correctness, but even openly contradict our statement. Doubtless, we will be answered that all that is desirable to know about India is already known. In fact, this very reply was once made to us personally. That resident Anglo-Indians should not busy themselves with inquiries is not strange. For, as a British officer remarked to us on one occasion, Society does not consider it well-bred to care about Hindus or their affairs, or even show astonishment or desire information upon anything they may see extraordinary in that country. But it really surprises us that at least travelers should not have explored more than they have this interesting realm. Hardly fifty years ago, in penetrating the jungles of the Blue, or the Nilgiri Hills in southern Hindustan, a strange race, perfectly distinct in appearance and language from any other Hindu people, was discovered by two courageous British officers who were tiger hunting. Many surmises, more or less absurd, were set on foot, and the missionaries, always on the watch to connect every mortal thing with the Bible, even went so far as to suggest that this people was one of the lost tribes of Israel supporting their ridiculous hypothesis upon the very fair complexions and strongly marked Jewish features. The latter is perfectly erroneous, the todas, as they are called, not bearing the remotest likeness to the Jewish type, either in feature, form, action, or language. They closely resemble each other, and, as a friend of ours expressed himself, the handsomest of the todas resemble the statue of the Grecian Zeus in majesty and beauty of form more than anything he had yet seen among men. Fifty years have passed since the discovery, but though since that time towns have been built on these hills and the country has been invaded by Europeans, no more has been learned of the todas than at first. Among the foolish rumors current about this people, the most erroneous are those in relation to their numbers and to their practicing polyandry. The general opinion about them is that, on the account of the latter custom, their number has dwindled to a few hundred families, and the race is fast dying out. We had the best means of learning much about them, and therefore state most positively that the Todas neither practice polyandry, nor are they as few in number as supposed. We are ready to show that no one has ever seen children belonging to them. Those that may have been seen in their company have belonged to Badagas, a Hindu tribe totally distinct from the Todas in race, color, and language, and which includes the most direct worshippers of this extraordinary people. We say worshippers, for the Badagas clothe, feed, serve, and positively look upon every Toda as a divinity. They are giants in stature, white as Europeans, with tremendously long and generally brown wavy hair and beard, which no razor ever touched from birth handsome as a statue of Phidias, or Praxilides. The Toda sits the whole day inactive, as some travelers who have had a glance at them affirm. From the many conflicting opinions and statements we have heard from the very residents of Otakamund and other little new places of civilization scattered about the Nigeri Hills, we call the following. They never use water. They are wonderfully handsome and noble-looking, but extremely unclean. Unlike all other natives, they despise jewelry and never wear anything but a large black drapery or blanket of some woolen stuff with a colored stripe at the bottom. They never drink anything but pure milk. They have herds of cattle, but neither eat their flesh, nor do they make their beasts of labor plow or work. They neither sell nor buy. Their bodegas feed and clothe them. They never use nor carry weapons, not even a simple stick. The Todas can't read and won't learn. They are the despair of the missionaries and apparently have no sort of religion, beyond the worship of themselves as the lords of creation. We will try to correct a few of these opinions, as far as we have learned from a very holy personage, a Brahmanam guru, who has our great respect. 
Nobody has ever seen more than five or six of them at one time. They will not talk with foreigners, nor was any traveler ever inside their peculiar long and flat huts, which apparently are without either windows or chimney and have but one door. Nobody ever saw the funeral of a Toda, nor very old men among them, nor are they taken sick with cholera, while thousands die around them during such periodical epidemics. Finally, though the country all around swarms with tigers and other wild beasts, neither tiger, serpent, nor any other animal so ferocious in those parts was ever known to touch either a tota or one of their cattle, though, as said above, they never use even a stick. Furthermore, the totas do not marry at all. They seem few in number, for no one has or ever will have a chance of numbering them, as soon as their solitude was profaned by the avalanche of civilization, which was perchance due to their own carelessness, the totas began moving away to other parts as unknown and more inaccessible than the Nagiri Hills had formerly been. They are not born of tota mothers, nor of tota parentage. They are the children of a certain very select sect, and are set apart from their infancy for special religious purposes. Recognized by a peculiarity of complexion and certain other signs, such a child is known as what is vulgarly termed a toda, from birth. Every third year, each of them must repair to a certain place for a certain period of time, where each of them must meet their dirt is but a mask, such as a sannyasi puts on in public in obedience to his vow. Their cattle are, for the most part, devoted to sacred uses. And though their places of worship have never been trodden by a profane foot, they nevertheless exist, and perhaps rival the most splendid pagodas, goparams, known to Europeans. The Bodhagas are their special vassals, and has been truly remarked, worship them as half-deities, for their birth and mysterious powers entitle them to such a distinction. The reader may rest assured that any statements concerning them that clash with the little that is above given are false. No missionary will ever catch one with his bait, nor any badaga betray them, though he were cut to pieces. They are a people who fulfill a certain high purpose and whose secrets are inviolable. Furthermore, the Todas are not only such a mysterious tribe in India. We have named several in a preceding chapter. And how many are there besides these that will remain unnamed, unrecognized, and yet ever present? What is now generally known of shamanism is very little, and that has been perverted like the rest of the non-Christian religions. It is called the heathenism of Mongolia, and wholly without reason, for it is one of the oldest religions of India. It is spirit worship, or belief in the immortality of souls, and that the latter are still the same men they were on earth, though their bodies have lost their objective form, and man has exchanged his physical for a spiritual nature. In its present shape, it is an offshoot of primitive theurgy and a practical blending of the visible with the invisible world. Whenever a denizen of earth desires to enter into communication with his invisible brethren, he has to assimilate himself to their nature, i.e., he meets these beings halfway, and furnished by them with a supply of spiritual essence, endows them in his turn with a portion of his physical nature, thus enabling them sometimes to appear in a semi-objective form. It is a temporary exchange of natures, called theurgy. Shamans are called sorcerers because they are said to evoke the spirits of the dead for purposes of necromancy. The true shamanism, striking features of which prevailed in India in the days of Megasthenes, 300 BC, can no more be judged by its degenerated scions among the shamans of Siberia than the religion of Gautama Buddha can be interpreted by the fetishism of some of his followers in Siam and Burma. It is in the chief lamasseries of Mongolia and Tibet that it has taken refuge, and there shamanism, if we so must call it, is practiced to the utmost limits of intercourse allowed between man and spirit. The religion of the lamas has faithfully preserved the primitive science of magic and produces as great feats now as it did in the days of Kublai Khan and his barons. The ancient mystic formula of the king Shrangcha Tsan Gampo, the Om Mani Padme Hom, affects its wonders now as well as in the 7th century. 
Avalokitsavara, highest of the three bodhisattvas and patron saint of Tibet, projects his shadow full in the view of the faithful at the lamasery of Ga Gadan, founded by him, and the luminous form of Son Kapa, under the shape of a fiery cloudlet that separates itself from the dancing beams of the sunlight, holds converse with a great congregation of lamas, numbering thousands, the voice descending from above, like the whisper of the breeze through foliage. Anon, say the Tibetans, the beautiful appearance vanishes in the shadows of the sacred trees in the park of the Lamasery. At Garma Kyan, the mother cloister, it is rumored that bad and unprogressed spirits are made to appear on certain days, and forced to give an account of their evil deeds. They are compelled by the Lamaic adepts to redress the wrongs done by them to mortals. This is what Huck naively terms personating evil spirits, i.e. devils. Were the skeptics of various European countries permitted to consult the accounts printed daily, at Moru, and in the City of Spirits, of the business-like intercourse which takes place between the Lamas and the invisible world, they would certainly feel more interest in the phenomena described so triumphantly in the spiritualistic journals. At Buddha-la, or rather Fotla, Buddha's mount, in the most important of the many thousand lamasaries of that country, the scepter of the Bodhisgat is seen floating, unsupported, in the air and its motions regulate the actions of the community. Whenever a lama is called to account in the presence of the superior of the monastery, he knows beforehand it is useless for him to tell an untruth. The regulator of justice, the scepter, is there, and its waving motion, either approbatory or otherwise, decides instantaneously and unerringly the question of his guilt. We do not pretend to have witnessed all this personally. We wish to make no pretensions of any kind. Suffice it, with respect to any of these phenomena, that what we have not seen with our own eyes has been so substantiated to us that we endorse its genuineness. A number of lamas in Sikkim produced Mipo, miracle, by magical powers, the late patriarch of Mongolia, Gejin Chutuku, who resided at Urga, a veritable paradise, was the 16th incarnation of Gautama therefore a bodhisattva. He had the reputation of possessing powers that were phenomenal, even among the thaumaturgists of the land of miracles par excellence. Let no one suppose that these powers are developed without a cost. The lives of most of these holy men, miscalled idle vagrants, cheating beggars, who are supposed to pass their existence in preying upon the easy credulity of their victims, are miracles in themselves, miracles because they show what a determined will and a perfect purity of life and purpose are able to accomplish, and to what degree of preternatural asceticism a human body can be subjected and yet live and reach a ripe old age. No Christian hermit has ever dreamed of such refinement of monastic discipline, that the aerial habitation of a Simon Stylite would appear child's play before the fakirs and the Buddhists' inventions of will tests. But the theoretical study of magic is one thing, the possibility of practicing it quite another. At Brassispungs, the Mongolian college, where over 300 magicians, sorciers as the French missionaries call them, teach about twice as many pupils from 12 to 20, the latter have many years to wait for their final initiation. Not one in a hundred reaches the highest goal, and out of the many thousand lamas occupying nearly an entire city of detached buildings clustering around it, not more than two percent become wonder workers. One may learn by heart every line of the hundred and eight volumes of the Kadjur, and still make but a poor practical magician. There is but one thing which leads surely to it, and this particular study is hinted at by more than one hermetic writer. One, the Arabian alchemist, Abipili, speaks thus, I admonish thee, whosoever thou art that desirest to dive into the inmost parts of nature, if that thou seekest thou findest not within thee, thou wilt never find it without thee. If thou knowest not the excellency of thine own house, 
Why dost thou seek after the excellence of other things? O man, know thyself. In thee is hid the treasure of treasures. In another alchemical tract, Demana Benedicto, the author expresses his ideas of the philosopher's stone in the following terms. My intent is for certain reasons not to prate too much of the matter, which yet is but one only thing, already too plainly described, for it shows and sets down such magical and natural uses of it, the stone, as many that have had it never knew nor heard of, and such as, when I beheld them, made my knees tremble and my heart to shake, and I to stand amazed at the sight of them. Every neophyte has experienced more or less such a feeling, but once that is overcome, the man is an adept. Within the cloisters of Jashi Lumbo and Zidang, these powers inherent in every man, called out by so few, are cultivated to their utmost perfection. Who in India has not heard of the Banda Chan Rambuchi, the Hutukutu of the capital of Higher Tibet? His brother of Ceylon was famous throughout the land, and one of the most famous brothers was a Peleng, an Englishman, who had arrived one day during the early part of this century from the West, a thorough Buddhist, and after a month's preparation was admitted among the Ceylans. He spoke every language, including the Tibetan, and knew every art and science, says the tradition. His sanctity and the phenomena produced by him caused him to be proclaimed a chaperone after a residence of but a few years. His memory lives to the present day among the Tibetans, but his real name is a secret with the chaperones alone. The greatest of the Mipu, said to be the object of the ambition of every Buddhist devotee, was, and yet is, the faculty of walking in the air. The famous king of Siam, Pia Metak, the Chinese, was noted for his devotion and learning. But he attained this supernatural gift only after having placed himself under the direct tuition of a priest of Gautama Buddha. Crawford and Finlayson, during their residence at Siam, followed with great interest the endeavors of some Siamese nobles to acquire this faculty. Numerous and varied are the sects in China, Siam, Tartary, Tibet, Kashmir, and British India, which devote their lives to the cultivation of supernatural powers, so-called. Discussing one of such sects, the Taoists, Samido says, they pretend that by which means of certain exercises and meditations one shall regain his youth, and others will attain to be shen sen, i.e. terrestrial beauty, in whose state every desire is gratified, whilst they have the power to transport themselves from one place to another, however distant, with speed and facility. This faculty relates but to the projection of the astral entity in a more or less corporealized form and certainly not to bodily transportation. This phenomena is no more a miracle than one's reflection in a looking glass. No one can detect in such an image a particle of matter, and yet there stands our double, faithfully representing even to each single hair on our heads. If by this simple law of reflection our double can be seen in a mirror, how much more striking a proof of its existence is afforded in the art of photography? It is no reason, because our physicists have not yet found the means of taking photographs, except at a short distance, that the acquirement should be impossible to those who have found these means in the power of the human will itself, freed from terrestrial concern. Our thoughts are matter, says science. Every energy produces more or less a disturbance in the atmospheric waves. Therefore, as every man, in common with every other living and even inert object, has an aura of his own emanation surrounding him, and moreover is enabled by a trifling effort to transport himself in imagination wherever he likes. Why is it scientifically impossible that his thought, regulated, intensified, and guided by that powerful magician, the educated will, may become corporealized for the time being, and appear to whom it likes, a faithful double of the original. Is the proposition in the present state of science any more unthinkable than the photograph or telegraph or less than 40 years ago, or the telephone less than 14 months ago? If the sensitized plate can so accurately seize upon the shadow of our faces, then this shadow or reflection, although we are unable to perceive it, must be something substantial. 
and if we can, with the help of optical instruments, project our semblance upon a white wall at several hundred feet distance, sometimes, then there is no reason why the adepts, the alchemists, the savants of the secret art, should not have already found out that which scientists deny today, but many discover true tomorrow. I.e., how to project electrically their astral bodies in an instant, through thousands of miles of space, leaving their material shells with a certain amount of animal vital principle to keep the physical life going, and acting within their spiritual ethereal bodies as safely and intelligently as when clothed with covering of flesh. There is a higher form of electricity than the physical one known to experimenters. A thousand correlations of the latter are as yet veiled to the eye of the modern physicist, and none can tell where end its possibilities. Schott explains that by Cyan, or Xin Cyan, are understood in the old Chinese conception, and particularly in that of the Tao Kyo, Taoist sect persons who withdraw to the hills to lead the life of anchorites, and who have attained, either through their aesthetic observances or by the power of charms and elixirs, to the possession of miraculous gifts and of terrestrial immortality. This is exaggerated, if not altogether erroneous. What they claim is merely their ability to prolong human life. And they can do so, if we have to believe human testimony. What Marco Polo testifies in the 13th century is corroborated in our own days. There are another class of people called Chugi, Yogi, he says, who are indeed properly called Abramans, Brahmins, who are extremely long-lived, every man of them living to 150 or 200 years. They eat very little, rice and milk chiefly, and these people make use of a very strange beverage, a potion of sulfur and quicksilver mixed together, and they drink this drink twice every month. This, they say, gives them long life, and it is a potion that they are used to take from their childhood. Bernier shows, says Colonel Yule, the yogis very skillful in preparing mercury so admirably that one or two grains taken every morning restored the body to perfect health, and adds that the mercurius vitae of Paracelsus was a compound in which entered antimony and quicksilver. This is a very careless statement, to say the least, and we will explain what we know of it. The longevity of some lamas and talipoins is proverbial, and it is generally known that they use some compound which renews the old blood, as they called it. And it was equally a recognized fact with the alchemists that a judicious administration of aura of silver does restore health and prolongs life itself to a wonderful extent. But we are fully prepared to oppose the statements of both Bernier and Colonel Yule, who quotes him, that it is mercury or quicksilver which the yogis and the alchemists used. The yogis, in the days of Marco Polo, as well as in our modern times, do use that which may appear to be quicksilver, but it is not. Paracelsus, the alchemists, and other mystics, meant by mercurius vitae, the living spirit of silver, the aura of silver, not the argent vive. And this aura is certainly not the mercury known to our physicians and druggists. There can be no doubt that the imputation that Paracelsus introduced mercury into medical practice is utterly incorrect. No mercury, whether prepared by a medieval fire philosopher or a modern self-styled physician, can or ever did restore the body to perfect health. Only an unmitigated charlatan ever used such a drug, and it is the opinion of many that it is with the wicked intention of presenting Paracelsus in the eyes of posterity as a quack that his enemies have invented such a preposterous lie. The yogis of the olden times, as well as modern lamas and talipoins, use certain ingredients with a minimum of sulfur and a milky juice which they extract from a medicinal plant. They must certainly be possessed of some wonderful secrets, as we have seen them healing the most rebellious wounds in a few days, restoring broken bones back to good use in as many hours as it would take days to do by means of common surgery. A fearful fever contracted by the writer near Rangoon after a flood of the Irrawaddy River was cured in a few hours by the juice of a plant called, if we mistake not, Kukushan. Though there may be thousands of natives ignorant of its virtues who are left to die of fever. 
This was in return for a trifling kindness we had done to a simple mendicant, a service which can interest the reader but little. We have heard of a certain water also, called ab i Hyatt, which the popular superstition thinks hidden from every mortal eye, except that of the holy sannyasi, the fountain itself being known as the ab i Hiwan i It is more than probable, though, that the Talapoins will decline to deliver up their secrets, even to the academicians and missionaries, as these remedies must be used for the benefit of humanity, never for money. At the great festivals of Hindu pagodas, at the marriage feasts of rich high castes, everywhere where large crowds are gathered, Europeans find guni, or serpent charmers, fakirs, mesmerizers, thalm-working sannyasi, and so-called jugglers. To deride is easy, to explain rather more troublesome, to science impossible. The British residents of India and the travelers prefer the first expedient. But let anyone ask one of these Thomases how the following results, which they cannot and do not deny, are produced. When crowds of guni and fakirs appear with their bodies encircled with cobras de capello, their arms ornamented with bracelets of corilillos, diminutive snakes inflicting certain death in a few seconds, and their shoulders with necklaces of trigonocephali, the most terrible enemy of naked Hindu feet whose bite kills like a flash of lightning. The septic witness smiles and gravely proceeds to explain how these reptiles, having been thrown in cataleptic torpor, were all deprived from the guni of their fangs. They are harmless, and it is ridiculous to fear them. Will the Saib caress, one of my nag, asks once a guni approaching our interlocutor, who had been thus humbling his listeners with his herpetological achievements for a full half hour. Rapidly jumping back, the brave warrior's feet, proving no less nimble than his tongue, Captain B's angry answer could hardly be immortalized by us in print. Only the goonies' terrible bodyguard saved him from an unceremonious thrashing. Besides, say a word, and for a half rupee, any professional serpent charmer will begin creeping about and summon around in a few moments numbers of untamed serpents of the most poisonous species, and will handle them and encircle his body with them. On two occasions in the neighborhood of Trincomal, a serpent was ready to strike at the writer, who had once nearly sat on its tail, but both times, at a rapid whistle of the guni whom he had hired to accompany us, it stopped hardly a few inches from our body, as if arrested by lightning and slowly sinking its menacing head to the ground, remained stiff and motionless as a dead branch, under the charm of the kilna. Will any European juggler, tamer, or even mesmerizer risk repeating just once an experiment that may be daily witnessed in India, if you know where to go see it? There's nothing in the world more ferocious than a royal Bengal tiger. Once the whole population of a small village, not far from Dhaka, situated on the confines of a jungle, was thrown into a panic at the appearance of an enormous tigress at the dawn of the day. These wild beasts never leave their dens but at night, when they go searching for prey and for water. But this unusual circumstance was due to the fact that the beast was a mother, and she had been deprived of her two cups, which had been carried away by a daring hunter, and she was in search of them. Two men and a child had already become her victims, when an aged fakir, bent on his daily round, emerging from the gate of the pagoda, saw the situation and understood it at a glance. Chanting a mantra, he went straight to the beast, which with flaming eye and foaming mouth crouched near a tree ready for a new victim. When, at about ten feet from the tigress, without interrupting his modulated prayer, the words of which no layman comprehends, he began a regular process of mesmerization. As we understood it, he made passes. A terrific howl which struck a chill into the heart of every human being in the place was then heard. This long, ferocious, drawling howl gradually subsided into a series of plaintive broken sobs, as if the bereaved mother was uttering her complaints. And then, to the terror of the crowd, which had taken refuge on trees and in the houses, the beast made a tremendous leap on the holy man, as they thought. They were mistaken. She was at his feet, rolling in the dust and writhing. 
a few moments more, and she remained motionless, with her enormous head laid on her forepaws, and her bloodshot but now mild eye riveted on the face of the fakir. Then the holy man of prayers sat beside the tigress and tenderly smoothed her striped skin and patted her back, until her groans became fainter and fainter. And half an hour later, all the village was standing around this group, the fakir's head lying on the tigress's back as on a pillow, his right hand on her head, and his left thrown on the sod under the terrible mouth, from which the long red protruding tongue was gently licking it. This is the way the fakirs tame the wildest beasts in India. Can European tamers, with their white hot iron rods, do as much? Of course, every fakir is not endowed with such a power. Comparatively, very few are. And yet the actual number is large. How they are trained to these requirements in the pagodas will remain an eternal secret. To all except the Brahmins and the adepts in occult mysteries. The stories that there are to considered fables of Krishna and Orpheus charming the wild beasts thus receives its corroboration in our day. There is one fact which remains undeniable. There is not a single European in India who could have or has ever boasted of having penetrated into the enclosed sanctuary within the pagodas. Neither authority nor money has ever induced a Brahmin to allow an uninitiated foreigner to pass the threshold of the reserved precinct. To use authority in such a case would be equivalent to throwing a lighted taper into a powder magazine. The Hindus, mild, patient, long-suffering, whose very apathy saved the British from being driven out of the country in 1857, would raise their hundred millions of devotees as one man. At such a profanation, regardless of sects or castes, they would exterminate every Christian. The East India Company knew this well and built her stronghold on the friendship of the Brahmins and by paying subsidy to the pagodas. And the British government is as prudent as its predecessor. It is the castes and non-interference with the prevailing religions that secure its comparative authority in India. But we must once more recur to shamanism, that strange and most despised of all surviving religions, spirit worship. Its followers have neither altars nor idols, and it is upon the authority of a shaman priest that we state that their true rites, which they are bound to perform only once a year, on the shortest day of winter, cannot take place before any stranger to their faith. Therefore, we are confident that all descriptions hitherto given in the Asiatic Journal and other European works are but guesswork. The Russians, who from constant intercourse with the shamans in Siberia and Tartary, would be the most competent of all persons to judge of their religion, have learned nothing except of the personal proficiency of these men in what they are half inclined to believe clever jugglery. Many Russian residents, though, in Siberia, are firmly convinced of the supernatural powers of the shamans. Whenever they assemble to worship, it is always in an open space, or a high hill, or in the hidden depths of a forest. In this reminding us of old Jewitical rites, their ceremonies upon the occasions of births, deaths, and marriages are but trifling parts of their worship. They comprise offerings, the sprinkling of the fire with spirits and milk, and weird hymns, or rather magical incantations, intoned by the officiating shaman, and concluding with a chorus of the persons present. The numerous small bells of brass and iron worn by them on the priestly robe of a deerskin, or the pelt of some other animal reputed magnetic are used to drive away the malevolent spirits of the air, a superstition shared by all the nations of old, including Romans and even the Jews, whose golden bells tell the story. They have iron staves also covered with bells for the same reason. When, after certain ceremonies, the desired crisis is reached, and the spirit has spoken, and the priest, who may be either male or female, feels its overpowering influence, the hand of the shaman is drawn by some occult power toward the top of the staff, which is commonly covered with hieroglyphics. With his palm pressing upon it, he is then raised to a considerable height in the air, where he remains for some time. Sometimes he leaps to an extraordinary height, and according to the control, for he is often but an irresponsible medium, pours out prophecies and describes future events. 
Thus it was that in 1847, a shaman in a distant part of Siberia prophesied and accurately detailed the issue of the Crimean War. The particulars of the prognostication, being carefully noted by those present at the time, were all verified six years after this occurrence. Although usually ignorant of even the name of astronomy, let alone having studied the science, they often prophesy eclipses and other astronomical phenomena. When consulted about thefts and murders, they invariably point out the guilty parties. The shamans of Siberia are all ignorant and illiterate. Those of Tartary and Tibet, few in number and most learned men in their own way, and will not allow themselves to fall under the control of spirits of any kind. The former are mediums in the full sense of the word, the latter magicians. It is not surprising that pious and superstitious persons, after seeing one of such crises, should declare the shaman to be under demoniacal possession, as in the instances of Corybantic and Bacantic fury among the ancient Greeks, the spiritual crisis of the shaman exhibits itself in violent dancing and wild gestures. Little by little, the lookers-on feel the spirit of imitation aroused in them. Seized with an irresistible impulse, they dance and become in their turn ecstatics. And he who begins by joining the chorus gradually and unconsciously takes part in the gesticulations until he sinks in the ground exhausted and often dying. O young girl, a god possesses thee. It is either Pan or Hecate, or the venerable Corybantes, or Sibyl that agitates thee, the chorus says, addressing Phaedra and Euripides. This form of psychological epidemic has been too well known from the time of the Middle Ages to cite instances from it. The Cororia Sanctiviti is an historical fact and spread throughout Germany. Paracelsus cured quite a number of persons possessed of such a spirit of imitation. But he was a Kabbalist and therefore accused by his enemies of having cast out the devils by the power of a stronger demon, which he was believed to carry about him within the hilt of his sword. The Christian judges of those days of horror found a better and a surer remedy. Voltaire states that, in the district of Jura, between 1598 and 1600, over 600 lycanthropes were put to death by a pious judge. But while the illiterate shaman is a victim, and during his crisis sometimes sees the persons present, under the shape of various animals, and often makes them share his hallucination, his brother shaman, learned in the mysteries of the priestly colleges of Tibet, expels the elementary creature, which can produce the hallucination as well as a living mesmerizer not through the help of a stronger demon, but simply through his knowledge of the nature of the invisible enemy. Where academicians have failed, as in the cases of Savon Wa, a shaman, or a lama, would have soon put an end to the epidemic. We have mentioned a kind of carnelian stone in our possession, which had such an unexpected and favorable effect upon the shaman's decision. Every shaman has such a talisman which he wears attached to a string and carries under his left arm. Of what use is it to you, and what are its virtues, was the question we often offered to our guide. To this he never answered directly, but evaded all explanation, promising that as soon as an opportunity was offered, and we were alone, he would ask the stone to answer for himself. With this very indefinite hope, we were left to the resources of our own imagination. But the day on which the stone spoke came very soon. It was during the most critical hours of our life, at a time when the vagabond nature of a traveler had carried the writer to far-off lands, where neither civilization is known nor security can be guaranteed for one hour. One afternoon, as every man and woman had left the yurta, tartar tent, that had been our home for over two months, to witness the ceremony of the Lamaic exorcism of Shutgaur, accused of breaking and spiriting away every bit of the poor furniture and earthenware of a family living about two miles distant. The shaman, who had become our only protector in those dreary deserts, was reminded of his promise. He sighed and hesitated, but after a short silence left his place on the sheepskin, and going outside, placed a dried-up goat's head with its prominent horns over a wooden peg, and then dropping down the felt curtain of the tent, remarked that now no living person would venture in, for the goat's head was a sign that he was at work. After that, placing his hand in his bosom, he drew out the little stone, about the size of a walnut, 
and carefully unwrapping it, proceeded as it appeared to swallow it. In a few moments, his limbs stiffened, his body became rigid, and he fell cold and motionless as a corpse. But for a slight twitching of his lips at every question asked, the scene would have been embarrassing, nay, dreadful. The sun was setting, and were it not that dying embers flickered at the center of the tent, complete darkness would have been added to the oppressive silence which reigned. We have lived in the prairies of the West, and in the boundless steppes of southern Russia, but nothing can be compared with the silence at sunset on the standy deserts of Mongolia, not even the barren solitudes of the deserts of Africa, though the former are partially inhabited, and the latter utterly void of life. Yet there was the writer alone with what looked no better than a corpse lying on the ground. Fortunately, this state did not last long. Mahandu uttered a voice, which seemed to come from the bowels of the earth, on which the shaman was prostrated. Peace be with you. What would you have me do for you? Startling as the fact seemed, we were quite prepared for it, for we had seen other shamans pass through similar performances. Whoever you are, we pronounced mentally, go to K and try to bring that person's thought here. See what the other party does and tell what we are doing and how situated. I am there, answered the same voice. The old lady, Kokona, is sitting in the garden. She is putting on her spectacles and reading a letter. The contents of it, and hasten, was the hurried order while preparing a notebook and pencil. The contents were given slowly, as if, while dictating, the invisible presence desired to afford us time to put down the words phonetically, for we recognized the Valachian language, of which we knew nothing beyond the ability to recognize it. In such a way, a whole page was filled. Look west, toward the third pole of the yurta, pronounced the Tartar in his natural voice, though it sounded hollow as if coming from afar. Her thought is here. Then, with a convulsive jerk, the upper portion of the shaman's body seemed raised, and his head fell heavily on the writer's feet, which he clutched with both hands. The position was becoming less and less attractive, but curiosity proved a good ally to courage. In the west corner was standing lifelike but flickering, unsteady and mist-like, the form of a dear old friend, a Romanian lady of Valacia, a mystic by disposition but a thorough disbeliever in this kind of occult phenomena. Her thought is here, but her body is lying unconscious. We could not bring her here otherwise, said the voice. We addressed and supplicated the apparition to answer, but all in vain. The features moved, and the form gesticulated as if in fear and agony, but no sound broke forth from the shadowy lips. Only we imagined, perchance it was a fancy, hearing as if from a long distance the Romanian words, Non se pot. It cannot be done. For over two hours, the most substantial, unequivocal proofs that the shaman's astral soul was traveling at the bidding of our unspoken wish were given us. Ten months later, we received a letter from our Valachian friend in response to ours, in which we'd enclosed the page from the notebook, inquiring of her what she had been doing on that day and describing the full scene. She was sitting, she wrote, in the garden on that morning, prosaically occupied in boiling some conserves. The letter sent to her was word for word the copy of the one received by her from her brother. All at once, in consequence of heat, she thought, she fainted, and remembered distinctly dreaming she saw the writer in a desert place, which she accurately described, and sitting under a gypsy's tent, as she expressed it. Henceforth, she added, I can doubt no longer. But our experiment was proved still better. We had directed the shaman's inner ego to the same friend heretofore mentioned in this chapter, the Kuchi of Lhasa, who travels constantly to British India and back. We know that he was apprised of our critical situation in the desert. For a few hours later came help, and we were rescued by a party of 25 horsemen who had been directed by their chief to find us at the place where we were, which no living man endowed with common powers could have known. The chief of this escort was a chaperon, an adept, whom we had never seen before, nor did we after that, for he never left his sume, lamissary, and we could have no access to it, but he was a personal friend of the Kuchi. The above will, of course, provoke naught but incredulity in the general reader, but we write for those who will believe, 
who, like the writer, understand and know the illimitable powers and possibilities of the human astral soul. In this case, we willingly believe, nay, we know, that the spiritual double of the shaman did not act alone. For he was no adept, but simply a medium. According to a favorite expression of his, as soon as he placed the stone in his mouth, his father appeared, dragged him out of his skin, and took him wherever he wanted, and at his bidding. One who has only witnessed the chemical, optical, mechanical, and sleight-of-hand performances of European prestidigitators is not prepared to see, without amazement, the open-air and off-hand exhibitions of Hindu jugglers, to say nothing of fakirs. Of the mere displays of deceptive dexterity we make no account, for Houdin and others far excel them in that respect, or do we dwell upon feats that permit of confederacy, whether resorted to or not. It is unquestionably true that non-expert travelers, especially if of an imaginative turn of mind, exaggerate inordinately, but our remark is based upon a class of phenomena not to be accounted for upon any of the familiar hypotheses. I have seen, says a gentleman who resided in India, a man throw up into the air a number of balls numbered in succession from one upwards. As each went up, and there was no deception about their going up, the ball was seen clearly in the air, getting smaller and smaller, till it disappeared altogether out of sight. When they were all up, twenty or more, the operator would politely ask which ball you wanted to see, and then would shout out, number one, number fifteen, and so on, as instructed by the spectators. When the ball demanded, would bound down to his feet violently from some remote distance. These fellows have very scanty clothing and apparently no apparatus whatever. Then I have seen them swallow three different colored powders, and then, throwing back the head, wash them down with water, drunk in the native fashion, in a continuous stream from alata, or brass pot, held at arm's length from the lips, and keep on drinking till the whole swollen body could no longer hold another drop, and water overflowed from the lips. Then these fellows, after squirting out the water in their mouths, have spat out the three powders on a clean piece of paper, dry and unmixed. In the eastern portion of Turkey and Persia have dwelt from time immemorial the warlike tribes of Kurdistan. This people of purely Indo-European origin, without a drop of Semitic blood in them, though some ethnologists seem to think otherwise, notwithstanding their brigand-like disposition, unite in themselves the mysticism of the Hindu and the practices of the Assyrian Chaldean magicians. Vast portions of whose territory they have helped themselves to, and will not give up, to please either Turkey or even all Europe. Nominally, Mohammedans, of the sect of Omar, their rites and doctrines are purely magical and magian. Even those who are Christian Nestorians are Christians but in name. The Kaldani, numbering nearly 100,000 men, with their two patriarchs, are undeniably rather Manichaeans than Nestorians. Many of them are Yazids. One of these tribes is noted for its fire-worshipping predilections. At sunrise and sunset, the horsemen alight and, turning towards the sun, mutter a prayer, while at every new moon they perform mysterious rites throughout the whole night. They have a tent set apart for the purpose, and its thick, black, woolen fabric is decorated with weird signs, worked in bright red and yellow. In the center is placed a kind of altar, encircled by three brass bands, to which are suspended numerous rings by ropes of camel hair, which every worshipper holds with his right hand during the ceremony. On the altar burns a curious old-fashioned silver lamp, a relic found possibly among the ruins of Persepolis. This lamp, with three wicks, is an oblong cup with a handle to it, and is evidently of the class of Egyptian sepulchral lamps, once found in such profusion in the subterranean caves of Memphis, if we may believe Kircher. It widened from its end toward the middle, and its upper part was the shape of a heart the apertures for the wicks forming a triangle, and its center being covered by an inverted heliotrope attached to a gracefully curved stalk proceeding from the handle of the lamp. The ornament clearly bestoke its origin. It was one of the sacred vessels used in sun worship. The Greeks gave the heliotrope its name from its strange propensity to ever incline towards the sun. The ancient magi used it in their worship. 
and who knows, but Darius had performed the mysterious rites with its triple light illuminating the face of the King Hierophant. If we mention the lamp at all, it is because there happened to be a strange story in connection with it. What the Kurds do during their nocturnal rites of lunar worship, we know but from hearsay, for they conceal it carefully, and no stranger could be admitted to witness the ceremony. But every tribe has one old man, sometimes several, regarded as holy beings, who know the past and can divulge the secrets of the future. These are greatly honored and generally resorted to for information in cases of theft, murders, or danger. Traveling from one tribe to the other, we pass some time in company with these cords. As our object is not autobiographical, we omit all details that have no immediate bearing on some occult facts, and even of these have room but for a few. We will then simply state that a very expensive saddle, a carpet, and two Circassian daggers, richly mounted and chiseled in gold, had been stolen from the tent, and that the cords, with the chief of the tribe at the head, had come, taking Allah for their witness that the culprit could not belong to the tribe. We believed it, for it would have been unprecedented among these nomadic tribes of Asia, as famed for the sacredness in which they hold their guests, as for the ease with which they plunder and occasionally murder them, when once they have passed the boundaries of their Aul. A suggestion was then made by a Georgian belonging to our cavern to have resort to the light of the Kudian, sorcerer of their tribe. This was arranged in great secrecy and solemnity, and the interview appointed to take place at midnight, when the moon would be at its full. At the stated hour, we were conducted to the above-described tent. A large hole or square aperture was managed in the arched roof of the tent, and though it poured in vertically the radiant moonbeams, mingling with the vacillating triple flame of the little lamp, after several minutes of incantations, addressed, as it seemed to us, to the moon, the conjurer, an old man of tremendous stature, whose pyramidal turban touched the top of the tent, produced a round looking glass of the kind known as Persian mirrors. Having unscrewed its cover, he then proceeded to breathe on it for over ten minutes and wipe off the moisture from the surface with a package of herbs, muttering incantations the while sotto voce. After every wiping, the glass became more and more brilliant till its crystal seemed to radiate refulgent phosphoric rays in every direction. At last the operation was ended. The old man, with the mirror in his hand, remained as motionless as if he had been a statue. Look, Hanum, look steadily, he whispered, hardly moving his lips. Shadows and dark spots began gathering, where one moment before nothing was reflected but the radiant face of the full moon. A few more seconds, and there appeared the well-known saddle, carpet, and daggers which seemed to be rising as from a deep, clear water, and becoming with every instant more definitely outlined. Then a still darker shadow appeared, hovering over these objects, which gradually condensed itself, and then came out as visibly as at the small end of a telescope, the full figure of a man crouching over them. I know him, exclaimed the writer. It is the Tartar who came to us last night, offering to sell his mule. The image disappeared, as if by enchantment. The old man nodded assent, but remained motionless. Then he muttered again some strange words, and suddenly began a song. The tune was slow and monotonous, but after he had sung a few stanzas in the same unknown tongue, without changing either rhyme or tune, he pronounced, recitative-like, the following words in his broken Russian. Now, Hanum, look well, whether we will catch him, the fate of the robber, we will learn this night, etc. The same shadows began gathering, and then, almost without transition, we saw the man lying on his back in a pool of blood, across the saddle, and the two other men galloping off at a distance. Horror-stricken and sick at the sight of this picture, we desired to see no more. The old man, leaving the tent, called some of the cords standing outside, and seemed to give them instructions. Two minutes later, a dozen horsemen were galloping off at full speed down the side of the mountain on which we were camped. Early in the morning, they returned with the lost objects. The saddle was all covered with coagulated blood, and of course, abandoned to them. The story they told was that upon coming in the sight of the fugitive, they saw disappearing over the crest of a distant hill two horsemen, and upon riding up, the Tartar thief was found dead upon the stolen property, exactly as we had seen him in the magical glass. 
He had been murdered by the two banditti, whose evident design to rob him was interrupted by the sudden appearance of the party sent by the old Kudian. The most remarkable results are produced by the eastern wise men, by simply act of breathing upon a person, whether with good or evil intent. This is pure mesmerism, and among the Persian dervishes who practice it in the animal magnetism is often reinforced by that of the elements. If a person happens to stand facing a certain wind, there is always danger, they think, and many of the learned ones in occult matters can never be prevailed upon to go at sunset in a certain direction from whence blows the wind. We have known an old Persian from Baku, on the Caspian Sea, who had the most unenviable reputation for throwing spells through the timely help of this wind, which blows but too often at that town, as its Persian name itself shows. If a victim, against whom the wrath of the old fiend was kindled, happened to be facing this wind, he would appear, as if by enchantment, cross the road rapidly, and breathe in his face. From that moment, the latter would find himself afflicted with every evil. He was under the spell of the evil eye. The employment of the human breath by the sorcerer as an adjunct for the accomplishment of his nefarious purpose is strikingly illustrated in several terrible cases recorded in the French annals, notably those of several Catholic priests. In fact, the species of sorcery was known from the oldest times. The Emperor Constantine, in Statue 4, Code de Malef, etc., prescribed the severest penalties against such as would employ sorcery to do violence to chastity and excite unlawful passion. Augustine, Sight de Du, warns against it. Jerome, Gregory, Nazianzen, and many other ecclesiastical authorities lead the denunciation of a crime not uncommon among the clergy. Baffet, Book 5, Title 19, Chapter 6, relates the case of the cure of Piphane, who accomplished the ruin of a highly respected and virtuous lady parishioner, the Dame de Lou, by resort to sorcery, and was burned alive for it by the Parliament of Grenoble. In 1611, a priest named Goffredi was burned by the Parliament of Provence for seducing a penitent at the confessional, named Magdalene de la Palude, by breathing upon her, and thus throwing her into a delirium of sinful love for him. The above cases are cited in the official report of the famous case of Father Gerard, a Jesuit priest of very great influence, who in 1731 was tried before the Parliament of Aix, France, for the seduction of his parishioner, Catherine Cadier of Toulon, and certain revolting crimes in connection with the same. The indictment charged that the office was brought about by resort to sorcery. M. Cadier was a young lady noted for her beauty, piety, and exemplary virtues. Her attention to her religious duties was exceptionally rigorous, and that was the cause of her perdition. Father Gerard's eye fell upon her, and he began to maneuver for her ruin. Gaining the confidence of the girl and her family by his apparent great sanctity, he one day made a pretext to blow his breath upon her. The girl became instantly affected with a violent passion for him, she also had ecstatic visions of a religious character, stigmata, or blood marks of the passion, and hysterical convulsions. The long-sought opportunity of seclusion, with his penitent finally offering, the Jesuit breathed upon her again, and before the poor girl recovered her senses, his object had been accomplished. By sophistry and the excitation of her religious fervor, he kept up this illicit relation for months without her suspecting that she had done anything wrong. Finally, however, her eyes were opened, her parents informed, and the priest was arraigned. Judgment was rendered October 12, 1731. Of 25 judges, 12 voted to send him to the stake. The criminal priest was defended by all the power of the Society of Jesus, and it is said that a million francs were spent in trying to suppress the evidence produced at the trial. The facts, however, were printed in a work in five volumes, 16 months, now rare, entitled Recule General de Pieces Continues au Praques du Pierre Jean Baptiste Gerard Jewitt, etc., etc. We have noted the circumstance that while under the sorcerous influence of Father Gerard and in illicit relations with him, 
M. Kadir's body was marked with the stigmata of the passion, viz. the bleeding wounds of the thorns on her brow, of nails in her hands and feet, and of a lance cut in her side. It should be added that the same marks were seen upon the bodies of six other penitents of this priest, viz. Madame Guyul, Logier, Grodier, Alamand, Batterel, and Riboul. In fact, it became commonly remarked that the Father Gerard's handsome parishioners were strangely given to ecstasies and stigmata. Add this to the fact that, in the case of Father Gaufridi, above noted, the same thing was proved upon surgical testimony to have happened to M. de Paulet, and we have something worth the attention of all, especially spiritualists, who imagine these stigmata are produced by pure spirits. Barring the agency of the devil, whom we have quietly put to rest in another chapter, Catholics would be puzzled, we fancy, despite all their infallibility, to distinguish between the stigmata of the sorcerers and those produced through the intervention of the Holy Ghost or the angels. The church records abound in instances of alleged diabolical imitations of these signs of saintship, but as we have remarked, the devil is out of court. By those who have followed us thus far, it will naturally be asked, to what practical issue this book tends? Much has been said about magic and its potentiality, much of the immense antiquity of its practice. Do we wish to affirm that the occult sciences ought to be studied and practiced throughout the world? Would we replace modern spiritualism with the ancient magic? Neither. The substitution could not be made, nor the study universally prosecuted without incurring the risk of enormous public dangers. At this moment, a well-known spiritualist and lecturer on mesmerism is imprisoned on the charge of raping a subject whom he had hypnotized. A sorcerer is a public enemy, and mesmerism may most readily be turned into the worst of sorceries. We would have neither scientists, theologians, nor spiritualists turn practical magicians but all to realize that there was true science, profound religion, and genuine phenomena before this modern era. We would that all who have a voice in the education of the masses should first know and then teach that the safest guides to human happiness and enlightenment are those writings which have descended to us from the remotest antiquity, and that nobler spiritual aspirations and a higher average morality prevail in the countries where the people take their precepts as the rule of their lives. We would have all to realize that magical, i.e. spiritual powers, exist in every man, and those few to practice them who feel called to teach, and are ready to pay the price of discipline and self-conquests, which their development exacts. Many men have arisen who had glimpses of the truth, and fancied they had it all. Such have failed to achieve the good they might have done and sought to do, because vanity has made them thrust their personality into such undue prominence as to interpose it between their believers and the whole truth that lay behind. The world needs no sectarian church, whether of Buddha, Jesus, Mahomet, Swedenborg, Calvin, or any other. There being but one truth, man requires but one church, the temple of God within us, walled in by matter, but penetrable by anyone who can find the way, the pure in heart see God. The trinity of nature is the lock of magic. The trinity of man is the key that fits it. Within the solemn precincts of the sanctuary, the supreme had and has no name. It is unthinkable and unpronounceable, and yet every man finds in himself his God. Who art thou, O fair being? inquires the disembodied soul in the Corda Avesta at the gates of paradise. I am, O soul, thy good and pure thoughts, thy works and thy good law thy angel, and thy God. Then man, or the soul, is reunited with itself, for this Son of God is one with him. It is his own mediator, the God of his human soul, and his justifier. God not revealing himself immediately to man, the Spirit is his interpreter, says Plato in the banquet. Besides, there are good many reasons why the study of magic, except in its broad philosophy, is nearly impracticable in Europe and America. Magic being what it is, the most difficult of all sciences to learn experimentally, its acquisition is practically beyond the reach of the majority of white-skinned people, and that whether their effort is made at home or in the East. 
Probably not more than one man in a million of European blood is fitted, either physically, morally, or psychologically, to become a practical magician. And not one in ten millions could be found endowed with all these three qualifications as required for the work. Civilized nations lack the phenomenal powers of endurance, both mental and physical, of the Easterns. The favoring temperamental idiosyncrasies of the Orientals are utterly wanting in them. In the Hindu, the Arabian, the Tibetan, an intuitive perception of the possibilities of occult natural forces in subjection to human will comes by inheritance, and in them, the physical senses as well as the spiritual are far more finely developed than in the Western races. Notwithstanding the notable difference of thickness between the skulls of a European and a Southern Hindu, this difference being a purely climactic result, due to the intensity of the sun's rays, involves no psychological principles. Furthermore, there would be tremendous difficulties in the way of training, if we can so express it. Contaminated by centuries of dogmatic superstition, by an inadascible, though quite unwarranted, sense of superiority over those whom the English term so contemptuously niggers, the white European would hardly submit himself to the practical tuition of either Copt, Brahmin, or Lama. To become a neophyte, one must be ready to devote himself, heart and soul, to the study of mystic sciences. Magic, the most imperative of mistresses, brooks no rival. Unlike other sciences, a theoretical knowledge of formulae without mental capacities or soul powers is utterly useless in magic. The spirit must hold in complete subjection the combativeness of what is loosely termed educated reason, until facts have vanquished cold human sophistry. Those best prepared to appreciate occultism are the spiritualists, although, through prejudice, until now they have been the bitterest opponents to its introduction to public notice. Despite all foolish negations and denunciations, their phenomena are real. Despite also their own assertions, they are wholly misunderstood by themselves. The totally insufficient theory of the constant agency of disembodied human spirits in their production has been the bane of the cause. A thousand mortified rebuffs have failed to open their reason or intuition of the truth. Ignoring the teachings of the past, they have discovered no substitute. We offer them philosophical deduction instead of unverifiable hypothesis, scientific analysis and demonstration instead of undiscriminating faith. Occult philosophy gives them the means of meeting the reasonable requirements of science and frees them from the humiliating necessity to accept the oracular teachings of intelligences, which as a rule have less intelligence than a child at school. So based and so strengthened, modern phenomena would be in a position to command the attention and enforce the respect of those who carry with them public opinion. Without invoking such help, spiritualism must continue to vegetate, equally repulsed, not without cause, both by scientists and theologians. In its modern aspect, it is neither a science, a religion, nor a philosophy. Are we unjust? Does any intelligent spiritualist complain that we have misstated the case? To what can he point us but a, to a confusion of theories, a tangle of hypotheses mutually contradictory? Can he affirm that spiritualism, even with its 30 years of phenomena, has any defensible philosophy? Nay, that there is anything like an established method that is generally accepted and followed by its recognized representatives? And yet... There are many thoughtful, scholarly, earnest writers among the spiritualists scattered the world over. There are men who, in addition to a scientific mental training and a reasoned faith in the phenomena per se, possess all the requisites of leaders of the movement. How is it then that, except throwing off an isolated volume or so, or occasional contributions to journalism, they all refrain... <coughs> How is it then that except for throwing off an isolated volume or so, or occasionally contributions to journalism, they all refrain from taking an active part in the formation of a system of philosophy? This is from no lack of moral courage, as their writings well show, nor because of indifference, for enthusiasm abounds, and they are sure of their facts, nor is it from lack of capacity, because many are men of the mark, the peers of our best minds. It is simply for the reason that, Almost without exception, 
they are bewildered by the contradictions they encounter and wait for their tentative hypothesis to be verified by further experience. Doubtless, this is the part of wisdom. It is that adopted by Newton, who with the heroism of an honest, unselfish heart, withheld for 17 years the promulgation of his theory of gravitation, only because he had not verified it to his own satisfaction. Spiritualism, whose aspect is rather that of aggression than of defense, has tended toward iconoclasm, and so far has done well. But in pulling down, it does not rebuild. Every really substantial truth that erects is soon buried under an avalanche of chimeras, until all are in one confused ruin. At every step of advance, at the acquisition of every new vantage, ground of fact, some cataclysm, either in the shape of fraud and exposure, or of premeditated treachery, occurs and throws the spiritualists back powerless because they cannot, and their invisible friends will not, or perchance can, less themselves, make good their claims. Their fatal weakness is that they have but one theory to offer in explanation for their challenged facts the agency of human disembodied spirits, and the medium's complete subjection to them. They will attack those who differ in views with them, with a vehemence only warranted by a better cause. They will regard every argument contradicting their theory as an imputation upon their common sense and powers of observation, and they will positively refuse even to argue the question. How, then, can spiritualism be ever elevated to the distinction of a science? This, as Professor Tyndall shows, includes three absolutely necessary elements, observation of facts, induction of laws from these facts, and verification of those laws by constant practical experience. What experienced observer will maintain that spiritualism presents either one of these three elements? The medium is not uniformly surrounded by such test conditions that we may be sure of the facts. The inductions from the supposed facts are unwarranted in the absence of such verification. And as a corollary, there has been no sufficient verification of those hypotheses by experience. In short, the prime element of accuracy has, as a rule, been lacking. That we may not be charged with desire to misrepresent the position of spiritualism, at the date of this present writing, or accused of withholding credit for advances actually made, we will cite a few passages from the London Spiritualist of March the 2nd, 1877, at the fortnight meeting. Held February 19th, a debate occurred upon the subject of ancient thought and modern spiritualism. Some of the most intelligent spiritualists of England participated. Among these was Mr. W. Stainton Moses M.A., who has recently given some attention to the relation between ancient and modern phenomena. He said, Popular spiritualism is not scientific. It does very little in the way of scientific verification. Moreover, Exoteric spiritualism is, to a large extent, devoted to presumed communion with personal friends, or to the gratification of curiosity, or the mere evolution of marvels. The truly esoteric science of spiritualism is very rare, and not more rare than valuable. To it we must look to the origination of knowledge, which may be developed exoterically. We produced too much on the line of the physics. Our tests are crude, and often illusory. We know too little of the protean power of spirit. Here the ancients were far ahead of us and can teach us much. We have not introduced any certainty into the conditions, a necessary prerequisite for true scientific experiment. This is largely owing to the fact that our circles are constructed on no principle. We have not even mastered the elementary truths which the ancients knew and acted on. Example, the isolation of mediums. We have been so occupied with wonder hunting that we have hardly tabulated the phenomena or propounded one theory to account for the production of the simplest of them. We have never faced the question, what is the intelligence? This is the great blot, the most frequent source of error, and here we might learn with advantage from the ancients. There is the strongest disinclination among spiritualists to admit the possibility of the truth of occultism. In this respect, they are as hard to convince, as is the outer world, of spiritualism. Spiritualism starts with a fallacy, viz. that all phenomena are caused by the action of departed human spirits. They have not looked into the powers of the human spirit. They do not know the extent to which spirit acts, how far it reaches, what it underlies. Our position could not be better defined. 
If spiritualism has a future, it is in the keeping of such men as Mr. Staint and Moses. Our work is done. Would that it were better done. But despite our inexperience in the art of bookmaking and the serious difficulty of writing in a foreign tongue, we hope that we have succeeded in saying some things that will remain in the minds of the thoughtful. The enemies of truth have been all counted and all passed in review. Modern science, powerless to satisfy the aspirations of the race, makes the future a void and bereaves man of hope. In one sense, it is like the Batal Pachisi, the Hindu vampire of popular fancy, which lives in dead bodies and feeds but on the rottenness of matter. The theology of Christendom has been rubbed threadbare by the most serious minds of the day. It is found to be, on the whole, subversive rather than promotive of spirituality and good morals. Instead of expounding the rules of divine law and justice, it teaches but itself. In place of an ever-living deity, it preaches the evil one and makes him indistinguishable from God himself. Lead us not into temptation is the aspiration of Christians. Who, then, is the tempter? Satan? No, the prayer is not addressed to him. It is that tutelar genius who hardened the heart of the Pharaoh, put an evil spirit into Saul, sent lying messengers to the prophets, and tempted David to sin. It is the Bible God of Israel. Our examination of the multitudinous religious faiths that mankind, early and late, have professed most assuredly indicates that they have all been derived from one primitive source. It would seem as if they were all but different modes of expressing the yearning of the imprisoned human soul for intercourse with supernal spheres. As the white ray of light is decomposed by the prism into the various colors of the solar spectrum, So the beam of divine truth, in passing through the three-sided prisms of man's nature, has been broken up into very colored fragments called religions. And as the rays of the spectrum, by imperceptible shadings, merge into each other, so the great theologies, that have appeared at different degrees of divergence from the original source, have been connected by minor schisms, schools, and offshoots from the one side or the other. Combined, their aggregate represents one eternal truth. Separate, they are but shades of human error and the signs of imperfection. The worship of the Vedic Petris is fast becoming the worship of the spiritual portion of mankind. It but needs the right perception of things objective to finally discover that the only world of reality is the subjective. What has been contemptuously termed paganism was ancient wisdom replete with deity, and Judaism and its offspring. Christianity and Islamism derived whatever of inspiration they contain from this ethnic parent. Pre-Vedic Brahmanism and Buddhism are the double source from which all religions sprung. Nirvana is the ocean to which all tend. For the purposes of a philosophical analysis, we need not take account of the enormities which have blackened the record of many of the world's religions. True faith is the embodiment of divine charity. Those who minister at its altars are but human. As we turn the blood-stained pages of ecclesiastical history, we find that whoever may have been the hero, and whatever costumes the actors may have worn, the plot of the tragedy has ever been the same. But the eternal night was in and behind all, and we pass from what we see to that which is invisible to the eye of sense. Our fervent wish has been to show true souls how they may lift aside the curtain, and in the brightness of that night made day, Look with undazzled gaze upon the unveiled truth. The End